This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 1 Happy Home in Sunrise Alley. I see the parks are full of rich folks dolling up the dogs, feeding them candy and sending them out for an airing in their automobiles. So it's up to the poor people to look after the homeless children, isn't it? Mickey. Ah, kid, come on, be square. You look out what you say to me. But ain't you going to keep your word? Mickey, do you want your head busted? Nah, but I did your work so you could loaf. Now I want the pay you promised me. Let's see you get it. Better take it from me, hadn't you? You're twice my size. You know I can't, Jimmy. And you know it too, don't you? Now look here, kid. It's cause you're getting so big that folks will buy quicker of a little fellow like me. So you've laid in the sun all afternoon while I've been running my legs about off to sell your papers. And when the last one is gone, I come and pay you what they sold for. Now it's up to you to do what you promised. Why didn't you keep it when you had it? Cause that ain't business. I did what I promised fair and square. I was giving you a chance to be square too. Oh well, next time you won't be such a fool. Jimmy turned to step from the gutter to the sidewalk. Two things happened to him simultaneously. Mickey became a projectile. He smashed with the force of a wiry fist on the larger boy's head. While above both, an athletic arm gripped him by the collar. Douglas Bruce was hurrying to see a client before he should leave his office. But in passing a florist's window, his eye was attracted by a sight so beautiful, he paused an instant, considering. It was spring. The Indians were coming down to Multiopolis to teach people what the wood gods had put into their hearts about flower magic. The watchers had scarcely realized the exquisite loveliness of a milk-white birch basket filled with bog moss of silvery green, in which were set maiden hair and three yellow lady slippers, until beside it was placed another woven of osiers, blood-red, moss-carpeted and bearing five pink moccasin flowers, faintly lined with red lavender, and between them rosemary and white lady's tresses. A flush crept over the lean face of the Scotsman, he saw a vision. Over those baskets bent the face of a girl, beautiful as the flowers. Plainly as he visualized the glory of the swamp, Douglas Bruce pictured the woman he loved above the orchids. While he lingered, his heart warmed, glowing, his wonderful spring day made more beautiful by a vision not adequately describable. On his ear fell Mickey's admonition, "'Be square!' He sent one hasty glance toward the gutter. In it stood a sullen-faced newsboy of a size that precluded longer success at paper-selling because public sympathy goes to the little fellows. Before him stood one of these same little fellows, lean, tow-haired, and blue-eyed, clean of face, neat in dress, and with a particular modulation in his voice that caught Douglas squarely in the heart. He turned again to the flowers. But as his eyes reveled in beauty, his ears, despite the shuffle of passing feet and the clamor of cars, lost not one word of what was passing in the gutter, and with each slow anger surged higher. Mickey, well aware that his first blow would be all the satisfaction coming to him, put the force of his being into his punch. At the same instant, Douglas thrust forced a hand that had pulled for Oxford and was yet in condition. "'Ah, oh, you big stiff!' gasped Jimmy, twisting at an astonished neck to see what was happening above and in his rear so surprisingly. Had that little Michael O'Halloran gone mad to hit him? Mickey, standing back, his face upturned, was quite as surprised as Jimmy. "'What did he promise you for selling his papers?' demanded a deep voice. Tw Tw Twenty-five, answered Mickey, with all the force of inflection in his power. And if you heard us, mister, you heard him own up he was owing it. I did, answered Douglas Bruce tersely. Then to Jimmy, hand him over twenty-five cents. Jimmy glared upward, but what he saw and the tightening of the hand on his collar were convincing. 
He drew from his pocket five nickels, dropping them into the outstretched hand of Douglas, who passed them to Mickey, the soiled fingers of whose left hand closed over them, while his right snatched off his cap. Fear was on his face, excitement was in his eyes, triumph was in his voice, while a grin of comradeship curved his lips. "'Many thanks, boss,' he said, "'and would you add to them by keeping that stranglehold "'till you give me just two seconds the start of him?' "'He wheeled, darting through the crowd. "'Mickey!' cried Douglas Bruce. "'Mickey, wait!' "'But Mickey was half a block away, turning into an alley. "'The man's grip tightened his twist. "'You'll find Mickey's admonition good,' he said. "'I advise you to take it. Be square. "'And two things first. I've got an eye on the Mickeys of this city. If I ever again find you imposing on him or anyone else, I'll put you where you can't. Understand? Second, who is he? Mickey, answered the boy. Mickey who? asked Douglas. How do I know? queried Jimmy. You don't know his name? pursued Douglas. Nah, I don't, said the boy. Where does he live? continued Douglas. I don't know, answered Jimmy. "'If you have a charge to prefer, I'll take that youngster in for you,' offered a policeman, passing on his beat. "'He was imposing on a smaller newsboy. I made him quit,' Douglas explained. "'That's all.' "'Oh,' said the officer, withdrawing his hand. Away sped Jimmy. With him went all chance of identifying Mickey, but Bruce thought he would watch for him. He was such an attractive little fellow. Mickey raced through the first alley, down a street, then looked behind. Jimmy was not in sight.' "'Got him to dodge now,' he muttered. "'If he ever gets a grip on me, he'll hammer me meller. "'I'm going to have a bulldog if I half starve to buy it. "'Maybe the pound would give me one. I'll see tomorrow.' "'He looked long, then started homeward, "'which meant to jump on a car and ride for miles, "'then follow streets and alleys again. "'Finally he entered a last alley that faced due east. "'A compass could not have pointed more directly toward the rising sun.' Well, there was at least half an hour each clear morning when rickety stairs, wavering fire escapes, flapping washes, and unkempt children were submerged in golden light. Long ago it had been named. By the time of Mickey's advent, Sunrise Alley was as much a part of the map of Multiopolis as Biddle Boulevard, and infinitely more pleasing in name. He began climbing interminable stairs, at the top of the last flight, he unlocked his door to enter his happy home. For Mickey had a home, and it was a happy one. No one else lived in it, while all it contained was his. Mickey knew three things about his father. He had one. He was not square, and he drank himself to death. He could not remember his father, but he knew many men engaged in the occupation of his passing. So he well understood while his mother never expressed any regrets. Vivid in his mind was her face, anxious and pale, but twinkling, her body frail and overtaxed, but hitting back at life uncomplainingly. Bad things happened, but she explained how they might have been worse. So fed on this sop and watching her example, Mickey grew like her. The difficult time was while she sat over a sewing machine to be with him. When he grew stout-legged and self-reliant, he could be sent after the food, to carry the rent, and to sell papers. Then she could work by the day, earn more, and have better health, while what both brought home paid the rent of the top room back of as bad a shamble as a self-respecting city would allow, kept them fed satisfyingly, if not nourishingly, and allowed them to slip away many a nickel for the rainy day that she always explained would come. And it did. One morning she could not get up. The following, Mickey gave all their savings to a man with a wagon to take her to a nice place to rest. The man was sure about it being a nice place. She had told Mickey so often what to do if this ever happened, that when it did, all that was necessary was to remember what he had been told. After it was over and the nice place had been paid for, with the nickels in the sewing machine, with enough left for the first month's rent, Mickey faced life alone. But he knew exactly what to do, because she had told him. She had even written it down, lest he forget. It was so simple that only a boy who did not mind his mother could have failed. The formula worked perfectly. Morning. Get up early. Wash your face. Brush your clothes. Eat what was left from supper for breakfast. Put your bed to air. 
then go out with your papers. Don't be afraid to offer them, or to do work of any sort you have strength for. But be deadly afraid to beg, to lie, or to steal. While if you starve, freeze, or die, never, never touch any kind of drink. Any fellow could do that. Mickey told dozens of them so. He got along so well he could pay the rent each month, dress in whole clothing, have enough to eat, often cooked food on the little gasoline stove, if he was not too tired to cook it, and hide nickels in the old place daily. He had a bed and enough cover. He could get water in the hall at the foot of the flight of stairs leading to his room for his bath, to scrub the floor and wash the dishes. From two years on he had helped his mother with every detail of her housekeeping. He knew exactly what must be done. It was much more dreadful than he thought it would be to come home alone and eat supper by himself. But if he sold papers until he was almost asleep where he stood, he found he went to sleep as soon as he had reached home and had supper. He did not awaken until morning. Then he could hurry his work and get ahead of the other boys and maybe sell to their customers. It might be bad to be alone, but always he could remember her and make her seem present by doing every day exactly what she told him. Then, after all, being alone was a very wonderful thing, compared with having parents who might beat and starve him, and take the last penny he earned, not leaving enough to keep him from being hungry half the time. When Mickey looked at some of the other boys and heard many of them talk, he almost forgot the hourly hunger for his mother in thankfulness that he did not have a father and that his mother had been herself. Mickey felt sure that if she had been any one of the mothers of most other boys he knew, he would not have gone home at all. He could endure cold, hunger, and loneliness, but he felt that he had no talent for being robbed, beaten, and starved. Well, lately he had fully decided upon a dog for company, when he could find the right one. Mickey unlocked his door, entering for his water bucket. Such was his faith in his environment that he relocked the door while he went to the water tap. Returning to the room, he again turned the key, then washed his face and hands. He looked at the slip nailed on the wall where she had put it. He knew every word of it, but always it comforted him to see her familiar writing, to read aloud what to do next, as if it were her voice speaking to him. Evening, make up your bed. Mickey made his. Wash any dirty dishes. He had a few, so he washed them. Sweep your floor. He swept. Always prepare at least one hot thing for supper. He shook the gasoline tank to the little stove. It sounded full enough, so he went to the cupboard his mother had made from a small packing case. There were half a loaf of bread wrapped in its oiled paper, with two bananas discarded by Joe of the fruit stand. He examined his pocket, although he knew perfectly what it contained. Laying back enough to pay for his stock the next day, then counting in his twenty-five cents, he had forty cents left. He put thirty in the rent box, starting out with ten. Five paid for a bottle of milk, three for cheese, two for an egg for breakfast. Then he went home. At the foot of the fire escape that he used in preference to the stairs, he met a boy he knew tugging a heavy basket. Taken in for a nickel, said the boy. Thanks, said Mickey. It's my time to dine. Sides, I've been done once today. If you'll take it, I'll pay first, he offered. "'How far?' questioned Mickey. "'Oh, right over there,' said the boy indefinitely. "'Sure,' said Mickey. "'Cross my palm with the silver.' The nickel changed hands. Mickey put the cheese and egg in his pocket, the milk in the basket, then restarted. The place where they delivered the wash made Mickey feel almost prosperous. He picked up his milk bottle and stepped from the door when a long, low wail that made him shudder reached his ear. "'What's that?' he asked the woman." A stiff was carried past today. Maybe they ain't took the kids yet. Mickey went slowly down the stairs, his face sober. That was what his mother had feared for him. That was why she had trained him to care for himself, to save the penny so that when she was taken away, he still would have a home. It sounded like a child. He was halfway up the long flight of stairs before he realized that he was going. He found the door at last, then stood listening. He heard a long-drawn, heart-breaking moaning. Presently he knocked. A child's shriek was the answer. Mickey straightway opened the door. The voice guided him to a heap of misery in a corner. 
"'What's the matter, kid?' inquired Mickey, huskily. The bundle stirred, while a cry issued. He glanced across the room. What he saw reassured him. He laid hold of the tatters, beginning to uncover what was under them. He dropped his hands, stepping back when a tangled yellow mop and a weazened, bloated girl face peered at him with wildly frightened eyes. "'If you'd put the wind you're wasting into words, we'd get something done quicker,' advised Mickey. The tiny creature clutched the filthy covers and stared. "'Did, did you come to get me?' she quavered. "'No,' said Mickey. "'I heard you from below, so I came to see what hurt you. "'Ain't you got folks?' She shook her head. "'They took Granny in a box, and they said they'd come right back and get me. "'Oh, please, please don't let them.' "'Why, they'd be good to you,' said Mickey largely. "'They'd give you—' "'He glanced at all the things the room lacked, then enumerated. "'A clean bed, lots to eat, a window you could be seeing from, a doll, maybe.' "'No, no,' she cried. "'Granny always said some day she'd go and leave me. "'Then they'd they'd get me. "'She's gone. "'The big man said they'd come right back. "'Oh, don't let them. "'Oh, hide me, quick!' "'Well, well, if you're so afraid, "'why don't you cut and hide yourself, then?' he asked. "'My back's bad. "'I can't walk,' the girl answered. "'Oh, Lord, when did you get hurt?' said Mickey. "'It's always been bad. "'I ain't ever walked,' she said. "'Well,' breathed Mickey, aghast, "'and knowing she'd have to leave you some day, "'your granny went and scared you stiff "'about the home folks taking you. "'When it was the only place for you to be going? "'Talk about women have the sense to vote. "'I won't go. I won't. "'I'll scratch them. I'll bite them.' "'Then in swift change, "'Oh, boy, please, 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 please don't let them get me.' "'Mickey took both the small bony hands reaching for him. He was so frightened with their hot, tremulous clutch that he tried to pull away, dragging the tiny figure half to light and bringing from it moans of pain. "'Oh, my back! Oh, you're hurting me! Oh, don't leave me! Oh, boy! Oh, oh, dear sweet boy! Please don't leave me!' When she said, "'Oh, dear boy!' Mickey heard the voice of his mother in an hourly phrase. He crept closer, enduring the touch of the grimy claws. "'My name's Mickey,' he said. "'What's yours?' Peaches, she answered. Peaches when I'm good, crippled brat when I'm bad. Believe if you had your chance you could look the peaches, said Mickey. But what were you bad for? So she'd hit me, answered Peaches. But if you me just pulling you a little hurt you so, what happened when she hit you? asked Mickey. Like knives stuck into me, said Peaches. Then what did you be bad for? marveled Mickey. "'Didn't you ever get so tired of one thing "'you'd take something that hurt just for a change?' "'My eye,' said Mickey. "'I don't know one fellow who'd do that, Peaches.' "'Mickey, hide me! Oh, hide me! "'Don't let them get me,' she begged. "'Why, kid, you're crazy,' said Mickey. "'Now let me tell you, where they're going to take you "'looks like a nice place. Honest it does. "'I've seen lots of them. "'You get a clean, soft bed all by yourself.' Three big hot meals a day, things to read and to play with. Honest peaches, you do. I wouldn't tell you if it wasn't so. If I'll stay with you till they come, then go with you to the place till you see how nice it is, will you be good and go? She burrowed in the covers, screeching again. You're scared past all reason, said Binky. You don't know of anything. But maybe the Orphings' home ain't so good as they look. If they are, why was Mother frightened silly about them getting me? Always, she said, she just had to live until I got so big they wouldn't get me, and I kept them from getting me by doing what she told me. Wonder if I could keep them from getting you. There's nothing of you. If I could move you there, I bet I could feed you more than your granny did. Well, I know I could keep you cleaner. You could have my bed, a window to look from, and clean covers. Mickey was thinking aloud. Having you to come home to would be lots nicer than nothing. "'You beat a dog all hollow, cause you can talk. "'If I could get you there, I believe I could be making it. "'Yes, I believe I could do a lot better than this, "'and I believe I'd like you, Peaches. "'You are such a game little kid.' "'She could lift me with one hand,' she panted. "'Oh, Mickey, take me, hurry!' "'Let me see if I can manage you,' said Mickey. "'Have you got to be took any particular way?' "'Mickey, ain't you got folks that beat you?' she asked. "'I ain't got folks now,' said Mickey, "'and they didn't beat me when I had them. "'I'm all for myself, 
"'And if you say so, I guess from now on I am for you. "'Want to go?' "'Her arms wound tightly around his neck, "'her hot little face pressed against it. "'Put one arm across my shoulders and the other round my legs,' she said. "'But I got to go down a lot of stairs. "'It's miles and miles,' said Mickey. "'And I ain't got but five cents. "'I spent it all for grub. "'Peaches, are you hungry?' No, she said stoutly. Mickey, hurry! But honest, I can't carry you all that way. I would if I could, Peaches. Honest, I would. Oh, Mickey, dear Mickey, hurry, she begged. Get down and cover up till I think, he ordered. Say, you look here. If I tackle this job, do you want a change bad enough to be mean for me? Just a mate, little maybe, said Peaches. But I won't hit you, explained Mickey. You can if you want to, she said. I won't cry. "'Give me a good crack now and see if I do.' "'You make me sick at my stomach,' said Mickey. "'Lord, kid, snuggle down till I see. "'I'm going to get you there some way.' "'Mickey went back to the room where he helped deliver the clothes basket. "'How much can you earn the rest of the night?' he asked the woman. "'Maybe ten cents,' she said. "'Well, if you will loan me that basket and ten cents and come with me an hour,' "'There's that back and just a dollar in it for you, lady,' he offered. "'She turned from him with a sneering laugh. "'Honest, lady,' said Mickey, "'this is how it is. "'That crying got me, so I went Anthony Comstockin'. "'There's a kid with a lame back all alone up there, "'half-starved and scared fighting wild. "'We could put her in that basket, she's just a handful, "'and take her to a place she wants to go. "'We could ride most of the way on the cars, and then a little walk, "'and get her to a cleaner, better room "'where she'd be taken care of, "'and in an hour you'd be back "'with enough nickels in your pocket "'to make a great, big, round, "'shining, full-moon cartwheel. "'Dearest lady, doesn't the prospect please you? "'It would,' she said, "'if I had the cartwheel now. "'In which case you wouldn't go,' said Mickey. "'Dearest lady, it isn't business "'to pay for undone work. "'And it isn't business "'to pay your employer's fare "'to get your job either,' she retorted. "'No, that beats business a mile,' said Mickey. "'That's an investment. "'You invest ten cents and an hour's time on a gamble. "'Now look what you get, lady. "'A nice restful ride on the cars, your ten cents back, "'a whole big shining round Lady Liberty Bird, "'if you trust in God as the coin says the bird does, "'and more than that, dearest lady, "'you go to bed feeling your pin feather sprouting.' "'cause you've done a kind deed to a poor crippled orphan. "'If I've really thought you had the money,' she said. "'Honest, lady, I got the money,' said Mickey. "'And sides, I got a surprise party for you. "'When you get back, you may go to that room "'and take every scrap that's in it. "'Now, come on. "'You're going to be enough of a sporting lady "'to try a chance like that, ain't you? "'Maybe a gold mine up there, for all I know. "'Put something soft in the bottom of the basket "'while I fetch the kid.' "'Mickey ran up the stairs. "'Now, Peaches,' he said, "'I guess I got it fixed. "'I'm going to carry you down. "'A nice lady is going to put you in a big basket. "'Then we'll take you to the cars "'and get you to my house. "'But you got to promise, cross your heart, "'you won't squeal, nor say a word, "'cause the police will get you, sure, if you do. "'They'll think the woman is your mama, "'so it will be all right, see?' "'Peaches nodded. "'Mickey wrapped her in the remnants of a blanket.' "'carried her downstairs and laid her in the basket. "'By turning on her side and drawing up her feet, "'she had more room than she needed. "'They won't let us on the car,' said the woman. "'Dearest lady, wait and see,' said Mickey. "'Now, Peaches, shut your eyes, also your mouth. "'Don't you take a chance of saying a word. "'If they won't stand the basket, we'll carry you. "'But it would hurt you less, "'while it would come in handy when we run out of cars.' "'We didn't take coin only for going, dearest lady. "'You'll be silver-plated coming back.' "'You little fool,' said the woman, "'but she stooped to her end of the basket. "'Ready, Peaches?' said Mickey. "'And if it hurts, "'member, it will soon be over, "'and you'll be where nobody will ever hurt you again.' "'Hurry,' begged the child. "'Down the long stairs they went, "'and to the car line. "'Crowded car after car whirled past.' Finally, one came not so full. It stopped to let off passengers. Mickey was at the conductor's elbow. "'Please, mister, a lame kid,' he pleaded. "'We want to move her. "'Please, please help us on.' "'Can't,' said the conductor. "'Take a taxi.' "'Broke my limousine,' said Mickey. 
"'Ah, oh, come on, mister, ain't you got kids of your own?' "'Get out of the way!' shouted the conductor. "'Hang on to back with the basket!' cried the woman. With peaches laid over her shoulder, she swung to the platform and found a seat, while Mickey grabbed the basket and ran to the back, screaming after her, "'I got my fare, only pay for yourself!' Mickey told the conductor to tell the lady where to leave the car. When she stepped down, he was ready for the basket. Peaches, panting and in cold perspiration was with pain, was laid in it. "'Lovely part of the village, ain't it, lady?' said Mickey. "'See the castles of the millionaires piercing the sky? "'See the automobiles at the curb? "'See the lovely ladies and gents promenading the streets enjoying the spring?' "'Every minute Mickey talked to keep the woman from noticing how far she was going. "'But soon she growled, "'How many miles further is it?' "'Just around a corner, up an alley, and down a side street. "'A step. Nothing at all. "'Nice promenade for a spry, lovely young lady like you. "'Evening walk. Smell spring in the air. "'Most there now, Peaches. "'Where are you taking this kid? "'How'll I ever get back to the car line?' asked the woman. "'Mickey ignored the first question. "'Well, I'll be escorting you, of course, dearest lady,' he said. "'At the point of rebellion, Mickey spoke. "'Now set the basket down right here,' he ordered. "'I'll be back in no time with the ladybird.' "'He returned in a few minutes. "'Into her outstretched palm he counted twenty-two nickels, "'picked the child from the basket, "'darted around a corner, calling, "'Back in a minute!' and was gone. "'Now, Peaches, we got some steps to climb,' he said. "'Grip my neck tight and stand just a little more.' "'I ain't hurt,' she asserted. "'I like seeing things. "'I never saw so much before. "'I ain't hurt much. "'Your face, your breathing, and the sweating on your lips "'is a little disproving,' said Mickey. "'But I'll have to take your word for it, "'cause I can't help it. "'But it'll soon be over, so you may rest.' "'Mickey climbed a flight, then sat down until he could manage another. "'The last flight he rested three times.' One reason he laid peaches on the floor was because he couldn't reach the bed. After a second's pause, he made a light and opened the milk bottle. "'Connect with that,' he said. "'I have to take the lady back to the cars.' "'Go slow,' said Mickey. "'You better save half to have with your some bread for your supper. "'Now I got to leave you a little bit, but you needn't be afraid, "'cause I'll lock you in. Nobody will get you here.' "'Now for the cars,' said Mickey to his helper. "'What did them folks say?' she asked. "'Tickled all over,' said Mickey promptly. "'That bundle of dirty rags,' she scoffed. "'They're going to throw away the rags and wash her,' said Mickey. "'She's getting her supper now.' "'Sounds like lying,' said the woman. "'But maybe it ain't. "'Save me. "'I can't see why anybody would want a kid at any time, "'let alone a reekin' bunch of skin and crooked bones. "'You've known folks to want a dog, ain't you?' said Mickey. "'Sure something that can think and talk back must be a lot more amusing.' I see the parks are full of the rich folks dolling up the dogs, feeding them candy, and sending them out for an airing in their automobiles. So it's up to the poor people to look after the homeless children, isn't it? Do you know the folks that took her? Sure I do, said Mickey. Do you live close, she persisted. Yes, I'm much obliged for your help, dearest lady. When you get home, go up to the last attic back, and if there's anything there you want, help yourself. Peaches don't need it now, and there's no one else. Thank you, and good-bye. Don't fly before your wings grow, cause I know you'll feel like trying tonight. Mickey hurried back to his room. The milk bottle lay on the floor, the child asleep beside it. The boy gazed at her. There were strange, peculiar stirrings in his lonely little heart. She was so grimy he scarcely could tell what she looked like, but the grip of her tiny hot hands was on him. Presently he laughed. "'Well, fellers, look what I've annexed, and I was hunting a dog. "'Well, she's lots better. She won't eat much more. She can talk, "'and she'll be something alive waiting when I come home. "'Gee, I'm glad I found her.' "'Mickey set the washtub on the floor near the sleeping child, "'and filling the dishpan with water, put it over the gasoline burner. "'Then he produced soap, a towel, and comb. "'He looked at the child again. And going to the box that contained his mother's clothing, he hunted out a nightdress. Then he sat down to wait for the water to heat. The door slammed when he went after a bucket of cold water and awakened the girl. She looked at him, then at his preparations. "'I ain't going to be washed,' she said. "'It'll hurt me. Put me on the bed.' 
"'Put you on my bed dirty like you are?' cried Mickey. "'I guess not. "'You are going to be soaped, lady. "'If it hurts, you can be consoling yourself "'thinking it will be the last time. "'Cause after this, you'll be washed every day "'so you won't need skin it alive but once.' "'I won't! I won't!' she cried. "'Now looky here,' said Mickey. "'I'm the boss of this place. "'If I say wash, it's wash. "'See? "'I ain't going to have a dirty girl with mats in her hair "'living with me. "'You beg me and beg me to bring you. "'Now you'll be cleaned up or you'll go back. "'Which is it, back or soap?' "'The child stared at him, then around the room. "'Soap,' she conceded. "'That's a lady,' said Mickey. "'Course it's soap, all clean and sweet, smelling like a flower. "'See my mammy's nice white nighty for you? "'How bad is your back, Peaches? Can you sit up?' "'A little while,' she answered. "'My legs won't go.' "'Never you mind,' said Mickey. "'I'll work hard and get a doctor, so some day they will.' "'They won't ever,' insisted Peaches. "'Granny carried me to the big doctor's once, "'and my backbone is weak, and I won't ever walk. "'They all said so.' Poot! Doctors don't know everything, scorned Mickey. That was a long ago, maybe. By the time I can earn enough to get you a dress and shoes, a doctor will come along who's found out how to make backs over. There's one that put different legs on a dog. I read about it in the papers I sold. We'll save our money and get him to put another back on you, just a bully back. Oh, Mickey, will you? she cried. Sure, said Mickey. Now you sit up and I'll wash you like Mammy always did me. Peaches obeyed. Mickey soaped a cloth, knelt beside her, then he paused. Say, Peaches, when was your hair combed last? I don't know, Mickey, she answered. There's more dirt in it than there is on your face. If you got shears, just cut it off, she suggested. Sure, said Mickey. He produced shears, and lifting string after string, cut all of them the same distance from her head. Girls shouldn't be short like boys, he explained. "'Now hang your head over the edge of the tub "'and shut your eyes so I can wash it,' he ordered. "'Mickey soaped and scoured until the last tangle was gone, "'then rinsed and partly dried the hair "'which felt soft and fine to his fingers. "'Believe it's going to curl,' he said. "'Always did,' she answered. "'Mickey emptied and rinsed the tub at the drain "'then started again on her face and ears, "'which he washed thoroughly. "'He pinned a sheet around her neck, "'then she divested herself of the rags.' Mickey lifted her into the tub, draped the sheet over the edge, poured in the water, and handed her the soap. "'Now you scour while I get supper,' he said. Peaches did her best. Mickey locked her in and went after more milk. He wanted to add several extras, but remembering the awful hold the dollar had made in his finances, he said grimly, "'No siree, with a family to keep, and likely to need a doctor at any time, and a carol back to buy, there's no frills for Mickey.' Seeing what she ain't had, she ought to be thankful just for milk. So he went back, lifted Peaches from the tub, and laid her on the floor, where he dried her with the sheet. Then he put the nightdress over her head. She slipped her arms in the sleeves, and he stretched her on his bed. She was so lost in the garment, he tied a string under her arms to hold it, and cut off the sleeves at her elbows. The pieces he saved for washcloths. Mickey spread his sheet over her, rolled the bed before the window where she could have air, see sky and housetops, then brought her supper. It was a cup of milk with half the bread broken in, and a banana. Peaches was too tired to eat, so she drank the milk while Mickey finished the remainder. Then he threw her rags from the window and spread his winter covers on the floor for his bed. Soon both of them were asleep. End of chapter 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran. By Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 2. Moccasins and Lady Slippers. Tuck this in the toe of your shoe. Three times tonight. It was in his eyes and on his tongue, and his slowness let the moment pass, but it must come soon. Leslie No messenger boy for those, said Douglas Bruce, as he handed the florist the price set on the lady's slippers. Leave them where people may enjoy them until I call. As he turned, another man was inquiring about the orchids, and he too preferred the slippers. 
but when he was told they were taken, he had wanted the moccasins all the time anyway. The basket was far more attractive. He refused delivery, and returning to his waiting car, smiling over the flowers. He also saw a vision of the woman into whose sated life he hoped to bring a breath of change with the wonderful gift. He saw the basket in her hands, and thrilled in anticipation of the favors her warmed heart might prompt her to bestow upon him. In the mists of early morning, the pink orchids surrounded by rosemary and ladies' tresses had glowed and gleamed from the top of a silvery moss mound four feet deep, under a big tamarack in a swamp, through the bog of which the squaw plunged to her knees at every step to uproot them. In the evening glow of electricity snapped from their stems, the beautiful basket untouched, the moccasins lay on the breast of a woman of fashion, and with every second of contact with the warmth of her body, drooped lower, until clasped in the arms of her lover they were quite crushed, and so flung from an automobile to be ground to pulp by passing wheels. The slippers had a happier fate. Douglas Bruce carried them reverently. He was sure he knew the swamp in which they grew. As he went his way, he held the basket velvet-white in strong hands and swayed his body with the motion of the car lest one leaf be damaged. When he entered the hall, down the stairs came Leslie Winton. "'Why, Douglas, I wasn't expecting you,' she said. Douglas Bruce held up the basket. "'Joy!' she cried. "'Oh, joy unspeakable!' "'Who has been to the Tamarack Swamp?' "'A squaw was leaving Lowry's just as he put these in his window,' answered Douglas. "'Bring them,' she said. "'He followed to a wide side veranda, "'set the basket on a table in a cool spot, and drew a chair near it. "'Leslie Winton seated herself, leaned on the table, and studied the orchids. "'Unconsciously she made the picture Douglas had seen.' She reached up slim fingers and delicate touchings here and there of moss, corolla, and slipper. Never in all my days, she said, never in all my days. I shall keep the basket always and the slippers as long as I possibly can. See this one. It isn't fully opened. I should have them for a week at least. Please hand me a glass of water. Douglas started to say that ice water would be far too cold. But with the wisdom of a wise man waited, and as always was joyed at the waiting, for the girl took the glass, and cupping her hands around it sat talking to the flowers, and to him, as she warmed the water with the heat from her body. Douglas was so delighted with the unforeseen second that had given him first chance at the orchids, and so this unexpected call, that he did not mind the attention she gave the flowers. He had reasons for not being extravagant, but seldom had a like sum brought such returns. He began drawing interest as he watched Leslie. Never had her form seemed so perfect, her dress so becoming and simple. How could other women make a vulgar display in the same pattern that clothed her modestly? How wonderful were the soft coils of her hair, the tints paling and flushing on her cheeks, her shining eyes. Why could not all women use her low, even, perfectly accented speech and deliberate self-control? He was in daily intercourse with her father, a high official of the city, a man of education, social position, and wealth. Mr. Winton had reared his only child according to his ideas, but Douglas, knowing these things, believed in blood also. As Leslie turned and warmed the water she meant presently to administer to the flowers, watching her, the thought was strong in his mind, what a woman her mother must have been. Each day he was with Leslie, he saw her do things that no amount of culture could instill. Instinct and tact are inborn. Careful rearing may produce a good imitation. They are genuine only with blood. Leslie had always filled his ideal of a true woman. To ignore him for his gift would have piqued many a man. Douglas Bruce was pleased. You wonders, she said softly. Oh, you wonders. When the mist lifted in the marshes this morning and the first ray of gold touched you to equal goldness, you didn't know you were coming to me. I almost wish I could put you back. Just now you should be in such cool mistiness and you should be hearing a hermit thrush sing vespers, a cedar bird call, and a whippoorwill cry. But I'm glad I have you. Oh, I'm so glad you came to me. 
I never materialized a whole swamp with such vividness as only this part of it brings. Douglas, when you caught the first glimpse of these, how far into the swamp did you see past them? To the heart of the swamp, and of my heart. I can see it as perfectly as I ever did, she said. But I eliminate the squaw, possibly because I didn't see her. And however exquisite the basket is, she broke the law when she peeled a birch tree. I'll wager she brought this to Lowry, covered carefully. And I'm not sure, but there should have been a law she broke when she uprooted these orchids. Much as I love them, I doubt if I can keep them alive and bring them to bloom next season. I'll try, but I don't possess flower magic in the highest degree. She turned the glass and touched it with questioning palm. Was it near the warmth of bog water? After all, was bog water warm? Next time she was in a swamp, she would plunge her hand deeply in the mosses and feel the exact temperature to which these roots had been accustomed. Then she spoke again. Yes, Douglas, I eliminate the squaw. These golden slippers are of the swamp to me. But I see you kneeling to lift them. I am so glad I'm the woman they made you see. Douglas sat forward and opened his lips. Was not this the auspicious moment? Did the squaw bring more, she questioned? Yes, he answered. Pink moccasins in a basket of red osiers with the same moss and rosemary and white tresses. Would you rather those? She set down the glass and drew the basket toward her with both hands. Her touch of it and the look on her face made Douglas think of a young mother clasping her baby. As she parted the mosses and dropped in the water, she slowly shook her head. One must have seen them to understand what that would be like, she said. I know it was beautiful, but I'm sure I would have selected the gold had I been there. Oh, I wonder if the woman who has the moccasins will give them a drink tonight, and will she try to preserve their roots? She will not, said Douglas emphatically. How can you possibly know, queried the girl. I saw the man who ordered them, laughed Douglas. Oh, said Leslie comprehendingly. I'd stake all I'm worth. The moccasins are drooping against a lavender dress. The roots are in a garbage can, and the cook or maid has the basket, he said. Douglas, how could you? exclaimed Leslie. I couldn't, positively couldn't. Mine are here. The slow color crept into her cheek. I'll make these roots bloom next spring, and you shall see them in perfection, she promised. That would be wonderful, he exclaimed warmly. Tell me, were there yet others, she asked hastily. Only these, he said. But there was something else. I came within a second of losing them. While I debated, or rather while I possessed these, and worshipped before the others, there was a gutter row that almost made me lose yours. In the gutter again, she laughed. Once again, he admitted, such a little chap with an appealing voice, and his inflection was the smallest part of what he was saying. Ah, oh, kid, come on, be square. Oh, Leslie. Why, Douglas, the girl cried, tell me. Of all the wooden-headed slowness, he exclaimed, I've let him slip again. Let who slip again, queried Leslie. My little brother, answered Douglas. Oh, Douglas, you didn't really, she protested. Yes, I did, he said. I heard a little lad saying the things that are in the blood and bone of the men money can't buy and corruption can't break. I heard him plead like a lawyer and argue his case straight. I lent a hand when his elegance failed, got him his desserts, and let him go. I did have an impulse to keep him. I did call after him, but he disappeared. Douglas, we can find him, she comforted. I haven't found either of the others I realized I had been interested in after I let them slip, he answered. And this boy was both of them rolled into one, and ten more like them. Oh, Douglas, I'm so sorry. But maybe some other man has already found him, said Leslie. No, you could always pick the brothered boys, said Douglas. The first thing that happens to them is a clean-up and better clothing, and an air of possessed importance. No man has attached this little fellow. Douglas, describe him, she commanded. I'll watch for him. How did he look? What was the trouble? One at a time, cautioned the man. He was a little chap, such a white, thin, clean, threadbare little chap, with such a big voice, so wonderfully intoned, and such a bigger principle for which he was fighting. One of these overgrown newsboys the public won't stand for unless he's in the way while they're making a car had hired him to sell his papers while he loafed. Mickey. Mickey? repeated Leslie questioningly. The big fellow called him Mickey. No doubt a mother who adored him named him Michael, 
and thought him like unto God when she did it. The big fellow had loafed all afternoon, and when Mickey came back and turned over the money and waited to be paid off, his employer laughed at the boy for not keeping it when he had it. Mickey begged him to be square and told him that was not business. Not business, mind you. And the big fellow jeered at him and was starting away. Mickey had reached him at the same time, so I got in the gutter again, and I also let the rarest boy I ever saw escape me. I don't see how I can be so slow. I don't see how I did it. I don't either, she said, with a twinkle that might have referred to the first of the two exclamations. It must be your scotch habit of going slow and surely. But cheer up. We'll find him. I'll help you. Have you reflected on the fact that this city covers many square miles, of which a fourth is outskirts, and from them three thousand newsboys gathered at the last Salvation Army banquet for them? That's where we can find him, she cried. Thanksgiving or Christmas? Of course we'll see him then. Mickey didn't have a Salvation Army face, he said. I am sure he is a freelance, and a rare one besides. This is May. I want my little brother to go on my vacation with me. I want him now. Would it help any if I'd be a sister to you? Not a bit, said Douglas. I don't in the very least wish to consider you in the light of a sister. You have another place in my heart, very different and all your own. But I do wish to make of Mickey the little brother I never have had. Minton was telling me what a rejuvenation he's getting from the boy he picked up. Already he has him in his office and is planning school and partnership with a man he can train as he chooses. But Minturn has sons of his own, protested Leslie. Oh, no, not in the least, exclaimed Douglas. Minturn has sons of his wife's, and she presently upsets and frustrates Minturn's every idea for them, and he is helpless. You will remember she has millions, and he has what he earns. He can't separate his boys, splendid physical little chaps, from their mother's money and influence, and educate them to be a help to him. They are to be made into men of wealth and leisure. Minturn will evolve his little brother into a man of brains and efficiency. But Minturn is a power, cried the girl. Not financially, explained Douglas. Nothing but money counts with his wife. In telling me of this boy, Minturn confessed that he was forced, forced, mind you, to see his sons ruined while he is building a street gammon as he would them if permitted. How sad, Douglas, cried Leslie. Your voice is bitter. Can't he do something? Not a bloomin' thing, answered Douglas. She has the money. She is their mother. Her character is unimpeachable. If Minturn went to the extremes, the law would give them to her, and she would turn them over to ignorant servants who would corrupt them and be well paid for doing it. Why, Minturn told me that, but I can't repeat that. Anyway, he made me eager to try my ideas on a lad who would be company for me when I can't be here and don't wish to be with other men. Are you still going to those brotherhood meetings? I am, and I always shall be. Nothing in life gives me such big returns for the time invested. There is a world of talk breaking loose about the present unrest among women. I happen to know that the unrest is as deep with men. For each woman I personally know bitten by unrest, I know two men in the same condition. As long as men and women are forced to combine to uphold society, it is my idea that it would be a good thing if there was to be a sisterhood organization, and then the two societies frankly brought together and allowed to clear up the differences between them. But why not? asked the girl eagerly. Because we are pursuing false ideals and have a wrong conception of what is worthwhile in life, answered the Scotsman. Because the sexes, except in rare, very rare instances, do not understand each other, and every day are drifting farther apart. And most of the married folk I know are the farthest apart of all. Leslie, what is it in marriage that constrains people? We can talk and argue and agree or dis disagree on anything. Why can't the Minturns? From what you say, it would seem to me it's her idea of what is worthwhile in life, said Leslie. Exactly, cried Douglas. But he can sway men. He can do powerful work. He could induce her to marry him. Why can't he control his own blood? If she should lose her money and become dependent on him for support, he could, said Leslie. He should do it anyway, insisted Douglas. Do you think you could, she queried. 
"'I never thought myself in his place,' said Douglas. "'But I believe I will. "'And if I see glimmerings, I'll suggest them to him.' "'Good boy,' said the girl lightly. "'And then she added, "'Do you mind if I think myself in her place "'and see if I can suggest a possible point "'at which she can be reached? "'I know her. "'I shouldn't consider her happy. "'At least not what I call joy. "'What do you call joy?' asked Douglas. "'Being satisfied with your environment.' Douglas glanced at her, then at her surroundings, and looking into her eyes, laughed quizzically. "'But if it were different, I am perfectly confident that I should work out joy from life,' insisted Leslie. "'It owes me joy. I'll have it if I fight for it.' "'Leslie, Leslie, be careful. You are challenging Providence. "'Stronger men than I have wrought chaos for their children,' said a warning voice as her father came behind her chair." "'Chaos or no, still I'd put up my fight for joy, Daddy,' laughed the girl. "'Only see, preciousest. "'One minute,' said her father, shaking hands with Douglas. "'Now what is it, Leslie?' "'Oh, I do see.' "'Take my chair and make friends,' said the girl. "'Mr. Winton seated himself and began examining and turning the basket. "'Indians?' he queried. "'Yes,' said Douglas. "'A particularly greasy squaw. "'I wish I might truthfully report an artist's Indian of the Minnehaha type.' "'But, alack, it was the same one I've seen ever since I've been in the city, "'and that you've seen for years before my arrival.' "'Mr. Winton still turned the basket. "'I've bought their stuff for years, "'because neither Leslie nor her mother "'ever would tolerate fat carnations and overgrown roses, "'so long as I could find a scrap of arbutus "'or a violet or a wake robin from the woods. "'We've often motored up and penetrated the swamp "'I fancy these came from for some distance.' "'But later in the season, it's so very boggy now. "'Aren't these rather wonderful?' he turned to his daughter. "'Perfectly, Daddy, perfectly,' she said. "'But I don't mean for the Creator,' explained Mr. Winton. "'I'm accustomed to his miracles. "'Every day I see a number of them. "'I mean for the squaw.' "'I'd have to know the squaw and understand her viewpoint,' said Leslie. "'She had it in her tightly clenched fist, laughed Douglas. "'One, I'm sure, anyway, not over two. "'That hasn't a thing to do with the art with which she made the basket "'and filled it with just three perfect plants,' said Leslie. "'You think there is real art in her anatomy?' queried Mr. Winton. "'Bear witness, O oh, you treasures of gold,' cried Leslie, waving toward the basket. "'There was another,' exclaimed Douglas, as he again described the osier basket. "'Mr. Winton nodded. He looked at his daughter. "'I like to think, young woman,' "'That you were born with, and I have cultivated what might be called artistic taste in you,' he said. "'Granted the freedom of the Tramorac Swamp, could you have done better?' "'Not so well, Daddy, not nearly so well. "'I never could have defaced what you can see was a noble big tree by cutting that piece of bark. "'And I might have worshipped until dragged away, but so far as art and I are concerned, "'the slippers would still be under their Tamarack.' "'You are begging the question, Leslie,' laughed her father." I was not discussing the preservation of the wild. I was inquiring into the state of your artistic ability. If you had no hesitation about taking the flowers, could you have gone to that swamp and collected the material and fashioned and filled a more beautiful basket than this? How can I tell, Daddy? asked the girl. There's only one way to learn. I'll forget my scruples, you get me a pair of rubber boots, and we'll drive to the tamarack swamp and experiment. "'We'll do it,' cried Mr. Winton. "'The very first half-day I can spare, we'll do it. "'And you, Douglas, you will want to come with us, of course.' "'Why, of course,' laughed Leslie. "'Because he started the expedition with his golden slippers, "'and when it comes to putting my girl and, incidentally, my whole family "'in competition with an Indian squaw on a question of art, "'naturally her father and one of her best friends would want to be present.' "'But maybe Minnie went alone, and what chance would her work have with you two for judges?' asked Leslie. "'We needn't be the judges,' said Douglas Bruce quietly. "'We can put this basket in the basement in the coolest, dampest place, and it will keep perfectly for a week. "'When you make your basket, we can find the squaw and bring her down with us. "'Lowry could display the results side by side. "'We could call up whomever you consider the most artistic man and woman in the city and get their decision.' "'You'd be willing to abide by that, wouldn't you?' "'Surely, but it wouldn't be fair to the squaw,' explained Nett Leslie. "'I'd have had the benefit of her art to begin on.' "'It would,' said Mr. Winton. 
Does not every artist, living, sc painter, sculptor, writer, what you will, have the benefit of all the art that has gone before? You agree? Leslie turned to Douglas. Your father's argument is a truism. But I will know that I am on trial. She didn't. Is it fair to her? persisted Leslie. For begging the question, commend me to a woman, said Mr. Winton. The point we began at was not what you could do in a contest with her. She went to the swamp and brought from it some flower baskets. It is quite fair to her to suppose that they are her best art. Now what we are proposing to test is whether the finest product of our civilization as embodied in you can go to the same swamp and from the same source of supply surpass her work. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly clear, Daddy, and it would be fair, conceded Leslie. But it is an offense punishable with a heavy fine to peel a birch tree. And I wouldn't do it, even if it were not. Got her to respect the law, anyway, said Mr. Winton to Douglas. The proposition, Leslie, was not that you do the same thing, but that from the same source you outdo her. You needn't use birch bark if it involves your law-abiding soul. Then it's all settled. You must hurry and take me before the lovely plants have flowered, said Leslie. I'll go day after tomorrow if it is a possible thing, promised Mr. Winton. In order to make our plan work, it is necessary that I keep these orchids until that time, said Leslie. You have a better chance than the lady who drew the osier basket has of keeping hers, said Mr. Winton. If I remember, I have seen the slippers in common earth quite a distant from the lake, while the moccasins demand bog moss, water, and swamp mist and dampness. I have seen slippers in the woods myself, said Leslie. I think the conservatory will do, and they are going there right now. I have to be fair to Minnie. Let me carry them for you, offered Douglas, arising. Excuse us. Back in a second, Daddy, said Leslie. I am interested, excited, and eager to make the test, yet in a sense I do not like it. But why, asked Douglas. Can't you see, countered Leslie. No, said Douglas. It's shifting my sense of possession, explained the girl. The slippers are no longer my beautiful gift from you. They are perishable things that belong to an Indian squaw. And in justice to her, I have to keep them in perfect condition so that my work may not surpass hers with the unspeakable art of flower freshness. And instead of thinking them the loveliest thing in the world, I will now lie awake half the night, no doubt, studying what I can possibly find that is more beautiful. Douglas Bruce opened his slow lips and took a step in her direction. Dinner is served, announced her father. He looked inquiringly toward his daughter. She turned to Douglas. Unless you have a previous engagement, you will dine with us, won't you? she asked. I should be delighted, he said heartily. When the meal was over and they had returned to the veranda, Leslie listened quietly while the men talked most of the time. But when she did speak, what she said proved that she always had listened to and taken part in the discussions of men, until she understood and can speak of business or politics intelligently. Have you ever considered an official position, Douglas? inquired Mr. Winton. I have an office within my gift, or so nearly that I can control it, and it seems to me you would be a good man. Surely we could work together in harmony. It never has appealed to me that I wanted work of that nature, answered Douglas. It's unusually kind of you to think of me and make the offer. But I am satisfied with what I am doing, and there is a steady increase in my business that gives me confidence. What's your objection to office? asked Mr. Winton. That it takes your time from your work, answered Douglas. That it changes the nature of your work. That if you let the leaders of a party secure you a nomination and the party elect you, you are bound to their principles, at least there is a tacit understanding that you are, and if you should happen to be afflicted with principles of your own, then you have got to sacrifice them. Afflict is a good word in this instance, said Mr. Winton. It is painful to a man of experience to see you young fellows of such great promise come up and kick yourself half to death against the pricks of established business, parties, and customs, but half of you do it. In the end, all of you come limping in, poor, disheartened, defeated, and then swing to the other extreme by being so willing for a change you take almost anything, and so the dirty jobs naturally fall to you. I grant much of that, Douglas said in his deliberate way, 
but happily I have sufficient annual income from my father's estate to enable me to live until I become acquainted in a strange city and have time to establish the kind of business I would care to handle. I am thinking of practicing corporation law. I specialized in that, so I may have the pleasure before so very long of going after some of the men who do what you so aptly term the dirty jobs. A repetition of the customary chorus, said Mr. Winton, differing only in that it is a little more emphatic than usual. I predict that you will become an office holder having party affiliations inside ten years. Possibly, said Douglas, but I'll promise you this. It will be a new office no man ever had before has held in the gift of a party not now in existence. Oh, you dreamers, said Mr. Winton. What a wonderful thing it is to be young and setting out to reform the world, especially on a permanent income. That's where you surpass most reformers. But I said nothing about reform, corrected Douglas. I said I was thinking of corporation law. I'm accustomed to it, and you wouldn't scare Leslie if you said reform, remarked Mr. Winton. She's a reformer herself, you know. But only sweatshops, child labor, civic improvement, preservation of the wild, and things like that, cried Leslie so quickly and eagerly that both men laughed. God be praised, exclaimed the father. God be fervently praised, echoed her lover. Before she retired, Leslie visited the slippers. I'd like to know, she said softly as she touched a bronze striped calyx. I'd like to know how I am to penetrate your location and find and fashion anything to outdo you and the squaw, you wood creatures, you. Then she bent above the flowers and whispered, Tuck this in the toe of your slipper. Three times tonight it was in his eyes and on his tongue, and his slowness let the moment pass. But it must come soon. I can bide a wee for my Scots manny, dear Lord. I can bide forever if I must. For it's he only and no other, world without end. Amen. The moccasins soon had been ground to pulp and carried away on a non-skid tire, and at three o'clock in the morning a cr- This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 3 S.O.S. Next time I yell for help, I won't ask to have anybody sent. I'll ask him to help me save our souls myself. Mickey. Mickey, his responsibility weighing upon him, slept lightly and awakened early, his first thought of peaches. He slipped into his clothing and advanced, peering at her through the grayness. His heart beat wildly. Ah, oh, you poor kid, you poor little kid, he whispered to himself as he had fallen into the habit of doing for company. The scaring, the jolting, the scouring, and everything were too much for you. You're gone, sure. You're just like them at the morgue. Ah, oh, Peaches, I didn't mean to hurt you. Peaches, I was trying to be good to you. Honest, I was. Peaches, ah!、Oh. As his fright increased, Mickey raised his voice until his last wail reached the consciousness of the sleeping child. She stirred slightly, her head moving on the pillow. Mickey almost fell, so great was his relief. He stepped closer, gazing in awe. The sheared hair had dried in the night, tumbling into a hundred golden ringlets. The tiny, clean face was white, so white that the blue of the closed eyes showed starkly through the lids. The blue veins streaked the temples and the little claws lying relaxed on the sheet. Mickey slowly broke up inside. A big, hard lump grew in his throat. He shut his lips tight and bored the tears from his eyes with his wiry fists. He began to mutter his thoughts to regain self-control. Gee, kid, but you had me scared to the limit, he said. I thought you were gone, sure. Honest, I did. Ain't I glad, though. But you're the whitest thing. You're like, I'll tell you what you're like. You're like the lily flowers in the store windows at Easter. You're white like them, and your hair is a little bit of gold decorating them. 
If I'd known it was like that, I wouldn't a cut it. If I'd spend a month untangling it, honest, I wouldn't, kid. I'm awful sorry. Gee, but it would have been pretty spread over Mother's pillow. Mickey gazed, worshipped, and rejoiced as he bent lower from time to time to watch the fluttering breath. You're so clean now, you just smell good. But I gotta go easy. The dirt covered you, so I didn't see how sick you were. You'll go out like a candle. That's what you'll do. I mustn't let even the wind blow cold on you. I couldn't stand it if I was to hurt you. I'd just go and lay down before the cars or jump down an elevator hole. Gee, I'm glad I found you. I wouldn't trade you for the smartest dog that's being rode around in the parks, nor for the parks, nor for the trees, nor the birds, nor the buildings, nor the swimming places, nor the automobiles, nor nothing, not nothing you could mention at all, not eating, not seeing. Nor having, nor, not no single thing, nothing at all, Lily. Lily, he repeated, little Snow White Lily. Peaches is a good name for you if you are referring to sweetness, but it doesn't fit you for color. Least I never saw none white. Lily fits you better. If you'd have been a dog, I was going to name you partner, but you're mine just as much as if you was a dog. So I'll name you if I want to. Lily, that's what God made you. That's what I'm going to call you. The god thought evoked by creation remained in Mickey's heart. He glanced at the sky clearing from the graying mists of morning, while the rumble of the streets came up to him in a dull roar. Oh God, I guess I've been forgetting my praying some since Mother went. I'd nothing but myself, and I ain't worth bothering you about. But oh God, if you are going to do any big things today, why not do some for Lily? Can't be many that needs it more. If you saw her yesterday, you must see. If you'll look down now, that she's better off. She's worlds better off. Wonder if you sent me to get her so she would be better off. Gee, why didn't you send one of the millionaires who could have dressed her up, fed her, and took her to the country where the sun would shine on her? Ain't never touched her. I bet a Liberty Bird. But if you did the sending, you sent just me, so she's my job, and I'll do her. But I wish you'd help me or send me help, O、oh、God. It's an awful job to tackle all alone, for I'm going to be scared stiff if she gets sick. I can tell by how I felt when I thought she was gone. So if you sent me, God, it's up to you to help me. Come on now, if you see the sparrows when they fall, you just good-naturedly ought to see Lily Peaches, 'cause she's always been down, and she can't ever get up unless we can help her. Help me all you can, O、oh、God, and send me help to help her all I can. Cause she can use all the help she can get, and then some. Amen. Mickey took one of Peach's hands in his. I ain't the time now, but tonight I got to cut your nails and clean them. Then I guess you'll do to start on. He said as he squeezed the hand. Lily, Lily Peaches, wake up! It's morning now. I gotta go out with the papers to earn supper tonight. Wake up! I must wash you and feed you, and fore I go. Peaches opened her eyes, drawing back, startled. "Easy now," cautioned Mickey. "Easy now. Don't be scared. Nobody can get you here. What you want for breakfast, flowersy girl, little Lily White?" An adorable smile illumined the tiny face at the first kindly awakening it had ever known. "You, you won't let them get me, will you?" she triumphed. "You know it," he answered conclusively. "Now I'll wash your face." Cook your breakfast and fix you at the window where maybe you can see birds going across. Think of that, Lily Birds. My name's Peaches," said the girl. "So 'tis," said Mickey. "But since you arrived to such bettered conditions, you got to be a lady of fashion. Now, Peaches, every single kid in the park is named two names these days. Phila can't have a foot race for falling over Mary Elizabeths and Louisa Ellens." I can't do so much just to start on, 'cause I can't earn the boodle. But fast as I get it, you're going to line up. But naturally, just at starting, you must begin on things that are not expensive. Now names don't cost anything, so I can be giving you six if I like. And you are a lily, so right now I'm naming you Lily. But two's the style. Keep your peaches if it suits you. Lily just flies out of my mouth when I look at you. This was wonderful. No cursing, no beating, no wailing over a lame back brat to feed. 
Mickey liked to give her breakfast. Mickey named her for the wonderful flower like Granny had picked up before a church one day. A few weeks ago, and in a rare sober moment, had carried to her. Mickey had made her feel clean, so rested and so fresh, she wanted to roll over the bed. With child impulse, she put up her arms. Mickey stooped to them. You gonna have two names too, she said. You got her be fashionable. I ist love you everything, washing and breakfast and the bed and winder and off the floor. Oh, I just love you sick for the winder and off the floor. You gonna be. She paused in a deep study to think of a word anywhere near adequate, and ended in a burst that was her best emanation. Lovest, Mickey, lovest. She hugged him closely and then lifted her chin and pursed her lips. Mickey pulled back, a dull color in his face. Now nix on the mushing, he said. I'll stand for a hug once a day, but nix on the smear. You'd let a dog, she whimpered. I ain't kissed nothing since Granny sold the doll a lady gave me. The time we went to the doctor's, and took the money to get drunk on and beat me more'n I needed for a change, 'cause I cried for it. I thought you might. Ah, well, go on then if you're going to bawl," said Mickey. "But put it there." He stepped as far back as he could, leaned over, and swept the hair from his forehead, which he brought in range of her lips. He had to brace himself to keep from flinching at their cold touch, and straightened in relief. Now that's over," he said briskly. "I'll wash you and get your breakfast. You do a lot of washing, don't you?" inquired Peaches. You want the sleep out of your eyes," coaxed Mickey. He brought the basin and a cloth and washed the child's face and hands gently as was in his power. "Flowersy girl," he said, "if you'd looked like last night like you do this morning, I'd never tackled getting you here in the world. I'd have thought you'd break sure." "Go on, kid," she said. "I can stand a lot. I've been knocked around something awful. She dragged me by one hand or the hair when she was tight." And threw me in a corner and took the. Peaches glanced over the bed, refusing to call her former estate by the same name. Took the place herself. You ain't hurting me. You can jerk a lot. I guess you've been jerked enough, Lily Peaches. He said. I guess jerking ain't going to help your back any. I think we better be easy with it till we lay up the money to carol it. He put different legs on a dog. Course he can put a new back on you. Dogs doesn't count. Only with rich folks that rides 'em and feeds 'em cake. But where'll you find another girl that'll spare her back for me, Mickey Lovest? Asked Peaches. Gee, Lily, he cried. I didn't think of that. I wish I hadn't promised you. Of course he could change the backs, but where'd I get one? I'll just have to let him take mine. I don't want no boy's back. Flashed Peaches. I won't go out and sell papers and wash you and feed you and let you stay here in this nice bed. I don't want no new back ground like it is here. I won't have no dogs back even. I won't have no back. Course I couldn't let you work and take care of me, Lily. He said. Course I couldn't. I was just thinking what I could do. I'll write a letter and ask the Carroll man if a dog's back would do. I could get one your size at the pound, maybe. Peaches arose at him with hands like claws. "You fool!" she shrieked. "You big damn fool! A dog's back! I won't! You try it, and I'll scratch your eyes out! You stop right now on backs and go hell bent and get my breakfast! I'm hungry! I like my back! I will have it! You!" Mickey snatched his pillow from the floor, using it as a press to press the child against hers. Then he slipped it down a trifle at one corner and spoke. Now you cut that out, Miss Chicken, right off," he said sternly. "I won't take no tantrums from a dog, so I won't from you. You'll make your back worse acting like that than beating would make it. And besides, if you're going to live with me, you must be a lady. No lady says such words as you used, and neither does no gentleman, 'cause I don't myself. Now you either say, 'Mickey, please get me my breakfast, and I'll get you one with a big surprise.'" Or you'll lay here alone and hungry till I come back tonight, and it'll be a whole day. See? If I wasn't a poor crippled kid, you wouldn't say that to me," she wailed. "And if you wasn't a poor crippled kid, you wouldn't say swearin's to me," said Mickey. "'Cause you know I'd lick the stuffin' out of you. And if you could see yourself, you'd know that you're, you'd need stuffin' in more than you need it out. I'm amazed at you. Forget that you ever heard such stuff, and be a nice lady, won't you?" 
My time's getting short and I gotta go, or the other kids will sell to my paper men. Then we'll have no supper. Now you say, Mickey, please get my breakfast like a lady, or you won't get a bite. Mickey, please get my breakfast, she imitated. Mickey advanced threateningly with the pillow. Won't do, he said. That ain't like no lady. That's like me. You'll say it like yourself or you won't get it. She closed her lips, burying her face in her own pillow. All right, said Mickey, then I'll get my own. If you don't want any, I'll have twice as much. He laid the pillow on the foot of the bed and said politely, Excuse me, Lily, till I get me a bottle of milk. Soon he returned and with his first glimpse of the bed stood aghast. It was empty. His eyes searched the room. His pallet on the floor outlined a tiny form. A dismayed half-smile flashed over his face. He took a step toward her and then turned, getting out a cloth he had not used since being alone. Near the bed, he set the table, covered it, and laid a plate, knife, fork, and spoon. Because he was watching Peaches, he soon discovered she was peeking out at him, so he paid strict attention to the burner he was lighting. Then he sliced bread, put on a toaster, set the milk on the table, broke an egg in a saucer, and turned the toast. Soon the odors filled the room, also a pitiful sound. Mickey knew Peaches must have hurt herself sliding from the bed. Although her arms were strong for the remainder of her body, she had no way to reach his pallet but to roll across the floor. She might have bruised herself badly. He was amazed, disgusted, yet compassionate. He went to her and turned back the comfort. You must be speaking a little louder, Lily, he said gently. I wasn't quite hearing you. Only muffled sobbing, Mickey dropped the cover. I want my breakfast, said a very small voice. You mean, Mickey, please get my breakfast, flowers, a girl, he corrected gently. Oh, I hurt myself so, Peaches wailed. Oh, Mickey, I fell and broke my back clear in two. Taint like rolling off my rags. Oh, Mickey, it's so far to the floor from your bed. Oh, Mickey, even another girl's back or yours or a dog's or anybody's couldn't fix it now. It'll hurt for days. Mickey, why did I ever? Oh, what made me? Mickey, love us, please, please put me back on the nice fine bed and do please give me some of that bread. Mickey lifted her crooning incoherent things. He wiped her face and hands. "'combed her hair and pushed the table against the bed. "'He broke toast in a glass and poured milk over it. "'Then he cooked the egg and gave her that, "'keeping only half the milk and one slice of bread. "'He made a sandwich of more bread and the cheese, "'put a banana with it, "'set a cup of water in reach, and told her that was her lunch, "'to eat it when the new moon whistle blew. "'Then he laid all the picture books he had on the back of the bed, "'put the money for his papers in his pocket,' and locking her in, ran down Sunrise Alley fast as he could. He was one hour late. He had missed two regular customers. They must be made up and more. Light air, cleanness, and kindness would increase Peach's appetite, which seemed big now for the size of her body. Mickey's face was very sober when he allowed himself to think of his undertaking. How would he make it? He had her now. He simply must succeed. The day was half over before Mickey began to laugh for no apparent reason. He had realized that she had not said what he required of her after all. Gee, I'm up against it, said Mickey. I didn't suppose she'd act like that. I thought she'd keep on being like she was when she woke up. I never behaved like that. Then in swift remorse, but I had the finest mother a fellow ever had to tell me, while she ain't had anyone, and only got me now. So I'll have to tell her. Of course, I can't do everything at once. So far as that goes, she didn't do any worse than the millionaires' kids in the park who roll themselves in the dirt, bump their own heads, and scream and fight. I guess my kids know worse than other people's. I can train her like Mother did me. Then we'll be enough alike we can live together, and even when she was the worst, I liked her. I liked her cartloads. So Mickey shouldered the duties of paternity and began thinking for his child, his little, neglected, bad, sick child. His wits and feet always had been nimble. That day he excelled himself. Anxiety as to how much he must carry home at night to replace what he had spent in moving peaches to his room, three extra meals to provide before tomorrow night, something to interest her through the long day, it was a contract, surely. 
Mickey faced it gravely, but he did not flinch. He did not know how it was to be done, but he did know it must be done. Get her they should not. Whatever it had been his mother feared for him, nameless though the horror was, from that he must save Lily. Mickey had thought it must be careless nurses or lack of love. Yesterday's paper had said there were some children at one of the homes no one ever visited. They were sick for love. Would not some kind people come to see them? It must have been that she feared. He could not possibly know it was the stigma of having been a charity child she had been combating with all her power. They had not got him, they must not get his lily. Yet stirrings in Mickey's brain told him he was not going to be sufficient alone. There were emergencies he did not know how to manage. He must have help. Mickey resolved the problem in his worried head without reaching a solution. His necessity drove him. He darted, dodged, and took chances. Far down the street he selected his victim and studied his method of assault as he approached. For Mickey did victimize people that day. He sold them papers when they did not want them. He bettered that and sold them papers when they had them. He snatched up lost papers, smoothed and sold them over. Every gay picture and broken toy dropped from an automobile he caught up and pocketed for her. A woman stumbling, alighting from a passing car, Mickey dropped his papers and sprang forward. Her weight bore him to the pavement, but he kept her from falling, and even as he felt her on her feet, he snatched under the wheels for her purse. Is that all your stuff, lady? he asked. Thank you. I think so, she said. Wait a minute. To lend hand was an hourly occurrence with Mickey. She had been most particular to teach him that. He was gathering up and smoothing his papers, several of which were soiled. The woman opened the purse he had rescued and took therefrom a bill which she offered him. Thanks, said Mickey. My shoulder is worth considerable to me, but nothing like that to you, lady. Well, she said, are you refusing the money? Sure, said Mickey. I ain't a beggar. Just a balance on my shoulder and picking up your purse ain't worth an endowment. I'll take five cents each for three soiled papers if you say so. You amazing boy, said the woman. Don't you understand that if you hadn't offered your shoulder I might now be lying senseless? You saved me a hard fall while my dress would have been ruined. You step over here a minute. What's your name? Michael O'Halloran was the answer. Where do you live? Sunrise Alley. It's miles on the cars, then some more walkin', explained Mickey. Whom do you live with? Myself, said Mickey. Alone? All but Peaches, said Mickey. Lily Peaches. Who is Lily Peaches? She's about so long, Mickey showed how long, and about so wide, he showed how wide, and white like Easter church flowers. Her back's bad. I'm her governor. She's my child. If you won't take the money for yourself, then take it for her, offered the woman. If you have a little sick girl to support, you surely can use it. Um, said Mickey. You kind of ball a fellow up and hang him on the ropes. Honest you do, lady. I can take care of myself. I know I can, because I've done it three years. But I don't know how I'm going to make it with Lily, for she needs a lot. She may get sick any day, so I ain't sure how I'm going to manage well with her. How long have you taken care of her? Since last night, exclaimed Mickey. Oh, how old is she? Questions seemed endless. I don't know, answered Mickey. Her granny died and left her lying on rags in a garret. I found her screeching, so I took her to my castle and washed her and fed her. You should see her now. I believe I should, said the woman. Let's go at once. You know, Michael, you can't care for a girl. I'll put her in one of the beautiful children's homes. Now nix on the children's home, fair lady, he cried angrily. I guess you'll find her for you take her. I found her first. She's mine. I guess you'll find her for you take her to the children's home where the doctors slice up poor kids for practice so they'll know how to get money for doing it on the rich ones. I've annexed Lily Peaches and you don't get her, see? I see, said the woman, but you're mistaken. Skew's crossing your wire, but I don't think I am, said Mickey. The only way you can know is to have been there yourself. I don't think you got that kind of a start or want it for kids of your own. My mother killed herself to keep me out of it, and if it had been so grand, she'd wanted me there. Nix on the orphan home talk. Lily ain't going to be raised in droves, nor flocks, nor herds. See? Lily's going to have a home of her own and a man to take care of her by herself. Mickey backed away, swallowing a big lump in his throat and blinked down angry tears. 
This morning, he said, I asked God to help me, and for a minute I was so glad, cause I thought he'd help by sending you, and you could tell me how to do. But if God can't beat you, I can get along by myself. You can't take care of a girl by yourself, she insisted. The law won't allow you. Oh, can't I, scoffed Mickey. Well, you're mistaken, cause I am, and I ain't getting along bully. You ought to seen her last night, and then this morning. Next time I yell for help, I won't ask to have anybody sent. I'll ask him to help me save our souls myself. Ever see that big, white, wonderful Jesus at the cathedral door, ma'am, holding the little child in his arms so loving? I don't suppose he stopped to ask whether it was a girl or a boy, for he took it up. He just opened his arms to the first child that needed him, and if I remember right, he didn't say, Suffer little children to be sent to the orphan's home. Mammy never read it to me that way. It was suffer them to come to me and be took up and held tender. See? Nick's on the Orphings Home, people. They ain't in my class. Beauteous lady, adieu. Farewell, I depart. Mickey wheeled, vanishing. It was a wonderful exhibition of curves, leaps, and darts. He paused for breath when he felt safe. So that's the dope, he marveled. I can't take care of a girl going to take her away from me. I'd like to know why. Men all the time take care of women. I see boys taking care of girls I know their mother left with them every day. I'd like to know why. Mother said I was to take care of her. She said that's what men were made for. Cause he didn't take care of her was why she was glad my father was dead. I guess I know what I'm doing, but I've learned something. Nick's on the easy talk after this and telling anybody you meet all you know. Shut mouth from now on. What's your name, little boy? Andrew Carnegie. Where do you live? Castle on the Hudson. A mouth just tight shut about Lily after this, and nicks on the swell dames. Next one can bust her crust for all I care. I won't touch her. On that instant precisely that thing occurred at Mickey's very feet. With his lips not yet closed, he knelt to shove his papers under a woman's head, then went racing up the stone steps she had rolled down. His quick eye catching and avoiding the bit of fruit on which she had slipped, he returned in a second with help. As the porter lifted the inert body, Mickey slid his hands under her head and advised, "Keep her straight." Into one of the big hospitals, he helped carry a blue and white clad nurse, on and on up the elevators and into a white porcelain room, where they laid her on a glass table. Mickey watched with pink, frightened eyes. Doctors and nurses came running. He stood waiting for his papers. He was rather sick, yet he remembered he had five there he must sell. Better clear out of here now, suggested a surgeon. My paper, said Mickey, she fell right across my feet. I slid them under to make a head more pillow like on the stones. Maybe I can sell some of them. The surgeon motioned to a nurse at the door. Take this youngster to the office and pay him for the papers he has spoiled, she ordered. Will she? Is she going to? wavered Mickey. I'm not sure, said the surgeon. From the bleeding, probably concussion, but she will live. Do you know how she came to fall? There was a smear of something on the steps she didn't see, explained Mickey. Thank you. Go with the nurse, said the surgeon. Then to an attendant, take Miss Alden's number and see to her case. She was going after something. Mickey turned back. Paper, maybe, he suggested, pointing to her closed hand. The surgeon opened it and found a nickel. He handed it to Mickey. If you have a clean one left, let this nurse take it to Miss Alden's case, and say she had been assigned another duty. See to sending a substitute at once. Every paper proved to be marked. I can bring you a fresh one in a second, lady. Offered Mickey. I got the money. All right, she said. Wait with it in the office, and then I'll pay you. I'm sent for a paper. I'm to be let in as soon as I get it. Announced Mickey to the porter. I ain't taking chances of being turned down," he said to himself as he stopped a second to clean the step. He returned and was waiting when the nurse came. She was young and fair-faced. Her hair was golden, and as she paid Mickey for his papers, he wondered how soon he could have Lily looking like her. He took one long survey as he pocketed the money, thinking he would rush home at once. But he wanted to fix in his mind now how Lily must appear to be right. For he thought a nurse in the hospital would be right. The nurse knew she was beautiful, and to her, Mickey's long look was tribute, male tribute, a small male indeed, 
but such a winning one, so she took the occasion to be her loveliest and smile her most attractive smile. Mickey surrendered. He thought she looked like an angel. That made him think of heaven. Heaven made him think of God. God made him think of his call for help that morning, the call that had made him think of the answer. The beautiful woman before him made him think that possibly she might be the answer instead of the other one. He rather doubted it, but it might be a chance. Mickey was alert for chances for peaches, so he smiled again. Then he asked, "Are you in such an awful hurry?" "I think we owe you more than merely paying for your papers," she said. "What is it?" Again, Mickey showed how long and how wide Lily was, and with hair like yours and eyes and cheeks that would be if she had her chance, and nobody to give her that chance but just me," he said. "Me and Lily are all each other's got," he explained hastily. We're home folks. We're a family. We don't want no bunching in corps and squads. We're nicks on the orphans' home business. But you must know, ma'am, would you? Oh, would you tell me just how I should be taking care of her? I'm doing everything like my mother did to me. But I was well and strong. Maybe Lily, being a girl, should have things different. A body so beautiful as you would tell me, wouldn't you? Then a miracle happened. The nurse, so clean, she smelled like a drug store. So lovely, she shone as a sunrise. Laid an arm across Mickey's shoulders. "You come with me," she said. She went to a little room, and all alone, she asked Mickey questions. With her, his eyes straight on hers, he answered. She told him surely he could take care of Lily. She explained how. She rang for a basket and packed it full of things he must have, showing him how to use them. She told him to come each Saturday at four o'clock as she was going off duty, and tell her how he was getting along. She gave him a thermometer and told him how to learn if the child had a fever. She told him about food and she put in an ointment, instructing him to rub the little back with it, so the bed would not be so tiresome. She showed him how to arrange the pillows when he left. The tears were rolling down Mickey's cheeks. Both of them were so touched, she laid her arm across his shoulder again and went as far as the elevator, while a passport to her at any time was in his pocket. I suspect other folks tell you you are beautiful like flowers or music or colors," said Mickey in farewell. "But you look like a window in heaven to me, and I can get right through you to God and all the beautiful angels. But what gets me is why the other one had to bust her crust to make you come true." The nurse was laughing and wiping her eyes at the same time. Mickey gripped the basket until his hands were stiff as he sped homeward, at least two hours early and happy about it. At the last grocery, he remembered every word and bought milk, bread, and fruit with care for a sick lady. He explained, so the grocer who knew him used care. Triumphing, Mickey climbed the stairs. He paused a second in deep thought at the foot of the last flight. Then ascended, whistling to let Peaches know that he was coming, and on his threshold recited, "Onct was a little kid named Lily. Was so sweet she'd knock you silly. Yellow hairs and millioning curls, beat a mile all other girls. She was on his bed. She was on his pillow. She had been lonely. Both arms were stretched toward him. Mickey, hurry!" she cried. "Mickey, let me hold you till I'm sure." Mickey, all day I didn't hardly durst breathe, fear the door'd open and they'd get me. Oh, Mickey, you won't let them, will you? Mickey dropped his bundles and ran to the bed. This time he did not shrink from her wavering clasp. It was delight to come home to something alive, something that belonged to him, something to share with, something to think and work for, something that depended upon him. Now Nick's on the scare talk. He comforted. Forget it. I've lived here three years alone, and not a single time has anybody come to get me. So they won't you. There's only one thing can happen to us: if I get sick or spend too much on eating and don't pay the rent, the man that owns this building will fire us out. If we, if we, Mickey repeated impressively, pay our rent regular in advance, nobody will ever come, not ever. So don't worry. Then what's all them bundles? Fretted Peaches. You earn to a got so much, you'll never get the next rent paid. They'll get me sure. Now throttle your engine, advised Mickey. Stop your car. Smash down on the brakes. They are things the city you reside in furnishes its taxpayers. 
or something like that. And I pay my rent, so this is my share. And it's things for you, to make you comfortable. Which are you worst, tiredest, or hungriest, or hottest? I don't know. Then I'll make a clean getaway, said Mickey. Washing is cooling, and it freshens you up a lot. So Mickey brought his basin again, and bathed the tired child gently as any woman could have done it. See what I got, he cried as he opened bundles and explained. I'm going to see if you have a fever. Peaches rebelled at the thermometer. Now come on in, urged Mickey. Slide straight home to your base. If I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to do it right. You can't lay there eating wrong things if you have a fever. No siree. You don't get to see in any more of these bundles, nor any supper, nor talk to any more till you put this little glass thing under your tongue and hold it there just this way. Mickey showed how. Three minutes by the clock. Then I'll know what to do with you next. I'll sit beside you and hold your hands and tell you about the pretty lady that sent it. Mickey wiped the thermometer on the sheet and then presented it. Peaches took one long look at him and opened her lips. Mickey inserted the tube, set the clock in sight, and taking both her hands, he held them closely and talked as fast as he could to keep her from using them. He was not half finished the day when the time was up. If he had done it right, Peaches had very little, if any, fever. Now turn over so I can rub your back to make it all nice and rested, he said, and then I'll get supper. I don't want my back rubbed, she protested. My back's all right now. Nothing to do with going to have it rubbed, said Mickey. It would be a silly girl who would have a back that wouldn't walk, and then wouldn't even try having it doctored so that it would get better. Just try, Lily, and if it doesn't help, I won't do it any more. Peaches took another long look at Mickey, questioning in nature, then turned her back to him. Gosh, kid, your back looks just like horses going to the fertilizer plant, he said. Ain't that swearin's? asked Peaches promptly. First cousin, answered Mickey. Excuse me, Lily. If you could see your back, you'd excuse worse than that. Feelin' will do for me, said Peaches. I live with it. Ah, go on, said Peaches. I ain't goin' screechin', even if you hurt awful. And you touch like a sparer, lookin' for crumbs. Mickey, can we put out a few? For the sparrows? Sure, cried Mickey. They're the ones that God sees, especially when they fall. Sure, put out some in a minute. Still now. Mickey poured on ointment, then began softly rubbing it into the dreadful back. His face was drawn with anxiety and filled with horror. He was afraid, but the nurse said this he should do, and Mickey's first lesson had been implicit obedience to those in power. So he rubbed gently as he was fearful. When Peaches made no complaint, a little stronger and a little stronger until he was tired. Then he covered her, telling her to lie on it and see how it felt. Peaches looked at him with wondering eyes. Mickey, she said, nothing in all my life ever felt like that. And the nice cool washing you do? Mickey, love us next time I act mean about what you want to do to me, slap me good and hold me and go on and do it. Now Nick's on the beaten, said Mickey. I never had any from my mother, but the kids who lost sales to me took my nickels and give me plenty. You ought to know, Lily, that I'm trying hard as I can to make you feel good and to take care of you. What I want to do, I think will make you better, so I'm just naturally going to do it, cause you're mine and you got to do what I say, but I won't say anything that'll hurt you and make you worse. If you must take time to think new things over, I can wait. But I can't hit you, Lily. You're too little, too sick, and I like you too well. I wish you'd be a lady. I wish you wouldn't ever be bad again. Oh, I feel so good. Peaches stretched like a kitten. Mickey, bet I can walk afore long if you do that often. Mickey, I just love you and love you. Mickey, say that at the door over again. What? Queried Mickey. Once the little kid named Lily prompted Peaches. Mickey laughed and obeyed. Neatly, he put away all that had been supplied him. Before lighting the burner, he gave Lily a drink of milk, and tried arranging both pillows to prop her up as he had been shown. When the water boiled, he dropped in two bouillon cubes the nurse had given him and set out some crackers he had bought. He put the milk in two cups, and when he cut the bread, 
he carefully collected every crumb, putting it on the sill in the hope that a bird might come. The thieving sparrows, used to watching windows and stealing from stores set out to cool, were soon there. Peaches, to whom anything with feathers was a bird, was filled with joy. The odor of the broth was delicious. Mickey danced, turning handsprings, and made the funniest remarks. Then he fixed the bowl on a paper, broke the crackers in her broth, growing unspeakably happy at her delight as she tasted it. Every Saturday you get a box of that from the nurse lady, he boasted. Pretty soon you'll be so fat I can't carry you, and so well you can have supper ready when I come. Then we can... Mickey stopped short. He had started to say, go to the parks. But if other ladies were like the first one he had talked with, and if, as she said, the law would not let him keep Peaches, he had better not try to take her where people would see her. Can what? asked Peaches. Have the most fun, exclaimed the Mickey. We can sit in the window to see the sky and birds, you can have the shears and cut pictures from the papers I'll bring you. Well, I'll read all my story books to you. I got three that she gave me for Christmas presents, so I could learn to read them. Mickey, could I ever learn to read them? Sure, cried Mickey. Surest thing you know. You are awful smart, Lily. You can learn in no time. And then you can read while I'm gone, so it won't seem so long. I'll teach you. Mother taught me. I can read the papers I sell. Honest, I can. I often pick up torn ones I can bring to you. It's lots of fun to know what's going on. I sell many more by being able to tell what's in them than kids who can't read. I look all over the front page and make up a spiel to, on the cars. I always fold my papers neat and keep them clean. Today it was like this. Here's your nice clean morning paper. Sterilized, deodorized, vulcanized. Mickey, what does that mean? asked Peaches. Now you see how it comes in, said Mickey. If you could read the papers, you'd know sterilized is what they do to the milk in a hot weather to save the slum kids. That's us, Lily. Deodorized is taking the bad smell out of things. Vulcanized is something they do to stiffen things. I guess it's what your back needs. Is all them things done to the papers, asked Peaches. Well, not all of them, laughed Mickey. But they are starting on some of them. And all would be a good thing. The other kids who can't read don't know those words, so I study them out and use them. It catches the crowd for they laugh, and they pay me for making them, see? This world down on the streets is in such a mix, a laugh is the scarcest thing there is, so they pay for it. No grouchy sad cat working on your sympathy kid sells many. I can beat one with a laugh every inning. What's inning, Mickey? came the next question. Playing a side at a ball game. Now, Ty Cobb, go on with what you say about the papers, interrupted Peaches. All right, said Mickey. Here's your nice, clean morning paper. Sterilized, deodorized, vulcanized. I like to sell them. You like to buy them. Sometimes I sell them, sometimes I don't. Latest war news. Japan takes England. England takes France. France takes Germany. Germany takes Belgium. Belgium takes the cake. Here's your paper, nice clean paper. Rush this way. Change your change for a paper. Yes, I like to sell them. And on and on that way all day, till they're gone. And everyone I can pick up and smooth out is gone. And if they're torn and dirty, I carry them back on the cars and sell them for pennies to the poor folks walking home. Mickey, will we always be slum kids? Not on your tin type, cried Mickey. If this is the slum kids, I like it, protested Peaches. Well, Sunrise Alley ain't so slummy as where you was, Lily, explained the boy. This is grand, said Peaches, fine and grand. No lady needn't have better. She wouldn't say so, said Mickey, but Lily, you got something most of the millionaire's ladies hasn't. What, Mickey? she asked interestedly. One man all to yourself, who will do what you want, if you ask pretty. And he ain't going to drag you around and make you do things you don't like to and hit you and swear at you and get drunk. Gee, I bet the worst you ever had didn't hurt more than I've seen some of the swell dames hurt sometimes. It'd make you sick, Lily. I guess as it would, said the girl. Because Granny told me the same thing. Lots of times she said that she couldn't see so much in being rich if you had to be treated like she saw rich ladies. She said all they got out of it was nice dresses and struttin' where their men wasn't around. Nelse the money was therein, and then they made the men pay. 
She said it was bout half and half. So tis, cried Mickey. Tell you, Lily, don't let's ever be rich. Let's just have enough. Mickey, what is enough? asked Peaches. Why, plenty, but not too much, explained Mickey judicially. Not enough to fight over, just enough to be comfortable. Mickey, I'm comfortable as an angel now. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 4 Bearer of the Morning. I can wash, sir, I can spin, sir, I can sew and mend and babies tend. Leslie Douglas, called Leslie over the telephone, I have developed nerves. Why? inquired he. Dad has just come in with a pair of waist-high boots and a scalping knife, I think, answered Leslie. Are you going to bring a blanket and a war bonnet? The blanket I can, the bonnet I might, said Douglas. How early will you be ready, she asked. Whenever you say, he replied. Five, she queried. Very well, he answered. And Leslie, I would suggest a sweater, short, stout skirts, and heavy gloves. Do you know if you are susceptible to poison vines? I have handled anything wild as I pleased all my life, she said. I am sure there is no danger from that source. But, Douglas, did you ever hear or see of a massasagua? You are perfectly safe on that score, he said. I am going along especially to take care of you. All right, then I won't be afraid of snakes, she said. I have waiters, too, he said, and I'm going into the swamp with you. Wherever you wish to go, I will precede you and test the footing. Very well. I have lingered on the borders long enough. Tomorrow will be my initiation. By night, I'll have learned the state of my artistic ability with natural resources. And I'll know whether the heart of the swamp is the loveliest sight I ever have seen. And I will have proved how I line up with a squaw woman. Leslie, I'm now reading a most interesting human document, said Douglas. And in it I have reached the place where Indians, in the heart of terrific winter, killed and heaped up a pile of deer in early day in Minnesota, then went to camp rejoicing while their squaws were left to walk twenty-eight miles and each carry back on her shoulder a deer frozen stiff. Leslie, you don't line up. You're not expected to. Do you believe that, Douglas? asked the girl. It's history, dear, not fiction, he answered. Douglas, she warned. Leslie, I beg your pardon. That was a slip, cried he. Oh, she breathed. Leslie, will you do something for me, he questioned. What, she retorted. Listen with one ear. Stop the other and tell me what you hear, he ordered. Yes, she said. Did you hear, Leslie? he asked anxiously. I heard something. I don't know what, she answered. Can you describe it, Leslie? Just a rushing beating sound. What is it, Douglas? My heart, Leslie, sending to you each throbbing stroke of my manhood, pouring out its love for you. Oh, cried the astonished girl. Will you listen again, Leslie? begged the man. No, she said. You don't want to hear what my heart has to say to you, he asked. Not over a wire, not so far away, she panted. Then I'll shorten the distance. I'm coming, Leslie. What shall I do, she gasped. She stared around her, trying to decide whether she would remain where she was or follow her impulse to hide when her father entered the room. Daddy, she cried. If you want to be nice to me, go away a little while. Go somewhere a few minutes and stay until I call you. Leslie, what's the matter? he asked. I've been talking to Douglas, and Daddy, he's coming like a charging Highland trooper. Daddy, I heard him drop the receiver and start. Please, please go away a minute. Even the dearest father in the world can't do anything now. We must settle this ourselves. I'm not allowed a word, he protested. 
Daddy, you've had two years. If you know anything to say against Douglas and haven't said it in all that time, why should you begin now? You couldn't help knowing. Daddy, do go. There he is. I hear him. Mr. Winton took his daughter in his arms and gripped her tight, kissed her tenderly, and left the room. A second later, Douglas Bruce entered. Rushing to Leslie, he caught her to his breast roughly, while with a strong hand he pressed her ear against his heart. Now you listen, my girl, he cried. You listen at close range. Leslie remained quiet a long second. Then she lifted her face, adorable, misty-eyed, and tenderly smiling. Douglas, I never listened to a heart before. How do I know what it is saying? I can't tell whether it is talking about me or protesting against the way you have rushed around. No levity, my lady," he said grimly. "This is serious business. You listen while I interpret. I love you, Leslie. Every beat, every stroke, love for you. I claim you, my mate, my wife. I want you. He held her from him, looking into her eyes. Now, Leslie, the answer he cried. May I listen to it, or will you tell me? Is there any answer? What is your heart saying? May I hear, or will you tell me? I want to tell you," said the girl. "I love you, Douglas. Every beat, every stroke, love for you. I want you. I claim you." Early the next morning, they inspected their equipment carefully. Then drove north to the tamarack swamp, where they arranged that Leslie and Douglas were to hunt material, while Mister Winton and the driver went to the nearest Indian settlement to find the squaw who had made the other basket and explain the situation to her enough to induce her to come with them. If you have experienced the same emotions, you will know how Douglas and Leslie felt when, hand in hand, they entered the swamp on a perfect morning in late May. If you have not, mere words are inadequate. Through fern and brake, head high, through sumac, willow, elder, buttonbrush, golden yellow, and blood-red osiers, past northern holly, over spongy moss carpet of palest silvery green, up piled for ages, over red veined pitcher plants spilling their fullness, among scraggy, odorous tamaracks. Beneath which cranberries and rosemary were blooming, through ethereal pale mists of dawn, in their ears lark song of the morning from the fields, hermit thrushes in the swamp, bell birds tolling molten voices, in a minor strain a swelling chorus of sparrows, titmice, warblers, vireos went two strong, healthy young people, newly promised for better or worse. They could only look. Stammer, flush, and utter broken exclamations all about better. They could not remotely conceive that life might serve them the cruel trick of worse. Leslie sank to her knees. Douglas lifted her up, set her on the firmest location he could see, adoring her with his eyes and reverent touch. Since that first rough grasp, as he drew her to him, Leslie had felt positively fragile in his hands. She smiled at him, her most beautiful smile, when wide-eyed with emotion. Douglas, why just now, when you've waited two years? She asked. Wanted a degree of success to offer, he answered. Leslie disdained the need for success. Wanted you to have time to know me as completely as possible. Leslie intimated that she could learn faster. Wanted to have the acknowledged right to put my body between yours. And any danger this swamp might have to offer today. Exactly what I thought," cried she. "Wise girl," commented the man. "Douglas, I must hurry," said Leslie. "It may take a long time to find the flowers I want. Well, I've no idea what I shall do for a basket." Then they proceeded to hurry by adoring each other for fifteen minutes more, while the water arose higher around their ankles. Finally, they went on in search of flowers. I saw osiers, yellow and red in quantities, but where are the orchids? We must make our way farther in and search," he said. "Douglas, listen," breathed Leslie. "I hear exquisite music," he answered. "But don't you recognize it?" she cried. "It does seem familiar, but I'm not sufficiently schooled in music." 
the girl began to softly whistle. By Jove, cried the man, what is that, Leslie? D. Provenza from Traviata, she answered. But I must stop listening for birds, Douglas, when I can scarcely watch for flowers or vines. I have to keep all the time looking to make sure that you are really my man. And I that you are my woman. Leslie, that expression and in this location, the fact that you are in competition with a squaw and the Indian talk we have indulged in lately, all conspire to remind me that a few days ago, while I was still a searcher myself, I read a poem called Song of the Search. That was the biggest thing of its kind that I have yet found in our language. It was so great that I reread it until I am sure I can do it justice. Listen, my bearer of mourning, my bringer of song. Douglas stood straight as a tamarack, his feet sinking in the little moss, while from his heart he quoted Constance Skinner's wonderful poem. I descend through the forest alone. Rose-flushed are the willows, stark and a-quiver, in the warm, sudden grasp of spring. Like a woman, when her lover has suddenly swiftly taken her, I hear the secret rustle of little leaves waiting to be born. The air is a wind of love from the wings of eagles mating. O oh, eagles, my sky is dark with your wings. The hills and the waters pity me. The pine trees reproach me. The little moss whispers under my feet. Son of earth, brother, why comest thou hither alone? Oh, the wolf has his mate on the mountain. Where art thou, spring daughter? I tremble with love as reeds by the river. I burn as the dusk in the red-tinted west. I call thee aloud as the deer calls the doe. I await thee as hills wait the morning. I desire thee as eagles the storm. I yearn to thy breast as night to the sea. I claim thee as the silence claims the stars. O earth, earth, great earth, mate of God and mother of me, say where is she, the bearer of morning, my bringer of song? Love in me waits to be born. Where is she, the woman? Where is she, the woman? The answer is here. Bearer of morning, bringer of song, I adore you. O、oh, Douglas, how beautiful, cried Leslie. My man, can we think of anything save ourselves today? Can we make that basket? It would be a bad start to give up our first undertaking together, he said. Of course, she cried, we must, we simply must find things. Father may call any minute. Let go my hand and follow behind me. Keep close, Douglas. I should go before to clear the way, he suggested. No, I may miss rare flowers if you do, she objected. Go slowly, so I can watch before and overhead. He cautioned. Yes, she answered. There, there, Douglas. Ah, there they are. He exulted. But I can't take them. She protested. Only a few, Leslie. Look before you. See how many there are. He said. Douglas, could there be more wonderful flowers than the moccasins and slippers? She asked. Scarcely more wonderful. There might be more delicate and lovely. Farther, let us go farther," she urged. Her cry closed the man's arms around her. "Oh, my heavenly Father!" breathed the girl. "Dear Lord," said Douglas. Then there was a long silence, during which, clasping each other, they stood on the edge of a small open space, breathlessly worshiping. And it was the Almighty they were now adoring. Here, the moss lay in a flat carpet, tinged deeper green. Water willow rolled its ragged red dish tan hoops with swelling bloom and leaf buds. Overflowing pitcher plants grew in irregular beds on slender stems, lifting high their flat buds. But scattered in groups here and there, sometimes with massed similar colors, sometimes in clumps and variegated patches, stood the rare early fringed orchis, some almost white. Others pale lavender, and again the deeper color of the moccasins. While everywhere on stems, some a foot high, nodded the exquisite lavender and white showy orchis. Count, he commanded. Leslie pointed a slender finger, indicating each as she spoke. One, two, three, thirty-two. 
under the sweep of your arms, Douglas, and more, more by the hundred. Surely if we are careful not to kill them, the Lord won't mind if we take out a few for people to see, will he? He must have made them to be seen, said Douglas. And worship, cried the girl. Douglas, why didn't the squaw? asked Leslie. Maybe she didn't come this far, he said. Perhaps she knows by experience that these are too fragile to remove. You may not be able to handle them, Leslie. I'm going to try, she said. But first I must make my basket. We'll go back to the osiers to weave it and then come here to fill it. Oh, Douglas, did you ever see such flower perfection in all your life? Only in books. In my home country, applied botany is a part of every man's education. I never have seen ragged or fringed orchids growing before. I have read of many fruitless searches of the white ones. So have I. They seem to be the rarest. Douglas, look there. There was a group of purple lavender, white-lipped bloom, made by years of spreading from one root, until above the rank moss and beneath the dark tamarack branch the picture appeared inconceivably delicate. Yes, the most exquisite flowers I have ever seen, he said enthusiastically. And there, Douglas, she pointed to another group, just the shade of the lavender on the toe of the moccasin, and in a great ragged mass. Would anyone believe it? Not without seeing it, he said emphatically. And there, Douglas, exactly the color of the moccasin. See that cluster? There are no words, Douglas. Shall you go further, he asked. No, she answered. I'm going back to weave my basket. There is nothing to surpass the orchids in rarity and wondrous beauty. Good, he cried. I'll go ahead and you follow. So they returned to the osiers. Leslie pondered deeply a few seconds, then resolutely putting Douglas aside, she began cutting armloads of pale yellow osiers. Finding a suitable place to work, she swiftly and deftly selected perfect, straight, evenly colored ones, cutting them the same length, then binding the tip ends firmly with raffia she had brought to substitute for grass. Then with fine slip she began weaving, gradually separating the twigs while inwardly giving thanks for the lessons she had taken in basketry. At last she held up a big pointed yellow basket. Ready, she said. Beautiful, cried Douglas. Leslie carefully lined the basket with moss in which the flowers grew, working the heads between the open spaces she had left. She bent three twigs, dividing her basket top in exact thirds. One of these she filled with the whitest, one with stronger, and one with the deepest lavender, placing the tallest plants in the center so the outside ones would show completely. Then she lifted by the root exquisite showy orchis, lavender-hooded, white-lipped, the tiniest plants she could select and set them around the edge. She bedded the moss-wrapped roots in the, in the basket and began bordering the rim and entwining the handle with a delicate vine. She looked up at Douglas, her face thrilled with triumph, flushed with exertion. Her eyes, humid with feeling, while he gazed at her, stirred to the depth of his heart, with sympathy and the wonder of possession. Bearer of morning you win, he cried triumphantly. There is no use going further. Let me carry that to your father, and he too will say so. I have a reason for working out our plan, she said. Yes, may I know, he asked. Surely, she answered. You remember what you told me about the Minturns. I can't live in a city and not have my feelings harrowed every day. And while I'd like to change everything wrong, I know I can't all of it. So what I can't cope with must be put aside. But this refuses. It is insistent. When you really think of it, that is so dreadful, Douglas. If they once felt what we do now, could it all go? There must be something left. You mention him oftener than any other one man, so you must admire him deeply. I know her as well as any woman I meet in society, better than most. I had thought of asking them to be the judges. She is interested in music and art. It would please her and be perfectly natural for me to ask her. You are in intimate terms with him from your office being opposite. 
There could be no suspicion of any ulterior motive in having them. I don't know that it would accomplish anything, but it would let them know, to begin with, that we consider them friends, so it would be natural for them to come with us. If we can't manage more than that today, it will give us ground to try again. Splendid, he said, a splendid plan. It would let them see that at least our part of the world thinks of them together and expects them to be friends. Splendid. I have finished, said Leslie. I quite agree, answered Douglas. No one could do better. That is the ultimate beauty of the swamp made manifest. There is the horn your father is waiting. A surprise was also waiting. Mr. Winton had not only found the squaw who brought the first basket, but he had made her understand so thoroughly what was wanted that she had come with him, while at his suggestion she had replaced the moccasin basket as exactly as she could and also made an effort at decoration. She was smiling woodenly when Leslie and Douglas approached, but as Leslie's father glimpsed and cried out over her basket, the squaw frowned, drawing back. Where you find em? she demanded. In the swamp? Leslie nodded backwards. The squaw grunted disapprovingly. Lowry no buy em. Sell slipper. Sell moccasin. No sell weed. Leslie looked with shining eyes at her father. That lies with Lowry, he said. I'll drive you there and bring you back, and you'll have the ride and the money for your basket. That's all that concerns you. We won't come here to make any more. The squaw smiled again. So they started to the city. They drove straight to the Winton residence for the slippers, while Mr. Winton and the squaw went to take the basket to Lowry's and leave Douglas at his office. Leslie and his car went to Mrs. Minturn's. Don't think I'm crazy, laughed Leslie as Mrs. Minturn came down to meet her. I want to use your exquisite taste and art instinct a few minutes. Please do come with me. We've a question up. You know the wonderful stuff the Indians bring down from the swamps to sell on the streets and to the florists? Indeed, yes, I often buy of them in the spring. I love the wild white violets especially. What is it you want? Why, you see, said Leslie, looking eagerly at Mrs. Minturn, you see there are three flower baskets at Lowry's. Douglas Bruce is going to buy me the one I want most for a present, to celebrate a very important occasion. And I can't tell which is most artistic. I want you to decide. Your judgment is so unfailing. Will you come? Only a little spin. Leslie, you aren't by any chance asking me to select your betrothal gift, are you? Leslie's face was rose flush, smiling wonderment. She had hastily slipped off her swamp costume. Joy that seemed as if it must be imperishable shone on her brightly illumined face. With tightly closed, smile-curved lips, she vigorously nodded. The elder woman bent to kiss her. Of course I'll come, she laughed. I feel thrilled and flattered, and I congratulate you sincerely. Bruce is a fine man, and I think he'll make a big fortune soon. Oh, I hope not, said Leslie. Are you crazy, demanded Mrs. Minturn. You said you didn't want me to think you so. You see, said Leslie, Mr. Bruce has a living income, so have I, from my mother. Fortunes seem to me to work more trouble than they do good. I believe poor folk are happiest. They get most out of life. And after all, what gives deep heartfelt joy is a thing to live for, isn't it? But we must hurry. Mr. Lowry didn't promise to hold the flowers long. I'll be ready in a minute, but I see where Douglas Bruce is giving you wrong ideas, said Mrs. Minturn. He needs a good talking to. Money is the only thing worthwhile, and the comfort and the pleasure it brings. Without it you are crippled, handicapped, a slave crawling while others step over you. I'll convince him. Back in a minute. When Mrs. Minturn returned, she was in a delightful mood, her face eager, her dress beautiful. Leslie wondered if this woman ever had known a care. Then remembered that not long before she had lost a little daughter. Leslie explained as they went swiftly through the streets. You won't mind waiting only a second until I run up to Mr. Bruce's office, she asked. He was ready, so together they stopped at Mr. Minturn's door. Douglas whispered, 
Watch the office boy. He is Minturn's little brother I told you about. Leslie nodded and entered gaily. Please ask Mr. Minturn if he will see Miss Winton and Mr. Douglas Bruce a minute, she said. An alert, bright-faced lad bowed politely, laid aside a book, and entered the inner office. Now let me, said Leslie. Good May, Mr. Minturn, she cried, positively enchanting. Take that forbidding look off your face. Come for a few minutes Maying. It will do you much good and me more. All my friends are pleasuring me today, so I want as good a friend of Mr. Bruce as you to be in something we have planned. You just must. Has something delightful happened? asked Mr. Minturn, retaining the hand Leslie offered him as he turned to Douglas Bruce. You must ask Miss Winton, he said. Mr. Minturn's eyes questioned her sparkling face, while again, with closed lips, she nodded. My most earnest congratulations to each of you. May life grant you even more than you hope for, and from your faces that is no small wish to make for you. Surely I'll come. What is it you have planned? Something lovely, said Leslie. At Lowry's are three flower baskets that are rather bewildering. I am to have one of them for my betrothal gift, but I can't decide. I appealed to Mrs. Minturn to help me, and she agreed. She is waiting below. Mr. Bruce named you for him, so you two and Mr. Lowry are to choose the most artistic basket for me. And if I don't agree, I needn't take it. But I want to see what you think. You'll come, of course. Mr. Minturn's face darkened at the mention of his wife, while he hesitated and looked penetratingly at Leslie. She was guileless, charming, and eager. Very well, Mr. Minturn said gravely. I'm surprised, but also pleased. Beautiful young ladies have not appealed to me so often of late that I can afford to miss the chance of humoring the most charming of her sex. How lovely! Laughed Leslie. Douglas, did you ever know Mr. Minturn could flatter like that? It's most enjoyable. I shall insist on more of it at every opportunity. Really, Mr. Minturn, society has missed you of late, and it is our loss. We need men who are worth while. Now it is you who flatter," smiled Mr. Minturn. "See, my captive!" cried Leslie as she emerged from the building and crossed the walk to the car. Mr. Bruce and Mr. Minturn are great friends, so as we passed his door, we brought him along by force. It certainly would require that to bring him anywhere in my company," said Mrs. Minturn coldly. The shock of the cruelty of the remark closed Douglas's lips. But it was Leslie's day to bubble, so she resolutely set herself to heal and cover the hurt. I think business is a perfect bugbear," she said as she entered the car. "I'm going to have a prenuptial agreement as to just how far work may trespass on Douglas's time, and how much belongs to me. I think it can be arranged. Daddy and I always have had lovely times together, and I would call him successful, wouldn't you?" A fine businessman," said Mr. Minturn heartily. "You could have had much greater advantages if he had made more money," said Mrs. Minturn. "The advantage of more money, yes," retorted Leslie quickly. "But would the money have been of more advantage to me than the benefits of his society and his personal hand in my rearing? I think not. I prefer my daddy." When you take your place in society as the mistress of a home, you will find that millions will not be too much," said Mrs. Minturn. "If I had millions, I'd give most of them away and just go on living about as I do now with Daddy," said Leslie. "Leslie, where did you get bitten with this awful common? What kind of an idea shall I call it? You haven't imbibed socialistic tendencies, have you? Haven't a smattering of what they mean," laughed Leslie. The istics scare me completely. Just social ideas are all I have. Thinking home better than any other place on earth, the way you can afford to have it. Merely being human, kind and interested in what my men are doing and enjoying, and helping anyone who crosses my path and seems to need me. Oh, I get such joy, such delicious joy from life. If I were undertaking wild-eyed reform, I'd sell my car and walk and do settlement work," said Mrs. Minturn scornfully. 
Then Leslie surprised all of them. She leaned forward, looked beamingly into the elder woman's face, and cried enthusiastically, I am positive you'd be stronger and much happier if you would. You know there is no greater fun than going to the end of the car line and then walking miles into the country, especially now in bloom time. You see sights no painter ever transferred even a good imitation of to canvas. You hear music. I wish every music lover with your trained ear could have spent an hour in that swamp this morning. You'd soon know where Verdi and Strauss found some of their loveliest themes and where Beethoven got the bird notes for the brook scene of the pastoral symphony. Think how interested you'd be in a yellow and black bird singing the spinning song from Martha, while you couldn't accuse the bird of having stolen it from Floteau, could you? Surely the birds hold right of priority. If you weren't a little fool and talking purposely to irritate me, you'd almost cause me to ask if you seriously meant that, said Mrs. Minturn. Why, laughed Leslie, determined not to become provoked on this her great day, that is a matter you can test for yourself. If you happen to score of Martha, get one, and I'll take you where you can hear a bird sing that strain. Then you may judge for yourself. I don't believe it, said Mrs. Minturn tersely, but if it were true, that would be the most wonderful experience I ever had in my life. And it would cost you only ten cents, scored Leslie. You needn't ride beyond the end of the car line for that, while a woman who can dance all night surely can walk far enough past that to reach any old orchard. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Money in large quantities isn't necessary to provide the most interesting things in the world, while millions don't bring happiness. I can find more in what you would class almost poverty. Why don't you try it, suggested Mrs. Minturn. But I have, said Leslie, and I enjoy it. I could go with the man I love as I do Daddy and make a home and get joy I never have found in society from just what we two could do with our own hands in the woods. I don't like a city. If Daddy's business didn't keep him here, I would be in the country this minute. Look at us poor souls trying to find pleasure in a basket from the swamp. Well, we might have the whole swamp. I'd be happy to live at its door, if I might. Now try a basket full of it. There are three. You are to examine each of them carefully, then write on a slip of paper which you think the most artistic. You are not to say things that will influence each other's decisions, or Mr. Lowry's. I want a straight opinion from each of you. They entered the florists, and on a glass table faced the orchids. The slippers placed first the fringe basket next, and then the moccasins. Mr. Winton and the squaw were waiting, while the florist was smiling in gratification, but the Minturns went to the flowers without a word. They simply stood and looked. Each of the baskets was in perfect condition. The flowers were as fresh as at home in the swamp. Each was a thing of wondrous beauty. Each deserved the mute tribute it was exacting. Mr. Minturn studied them with gradually darkening face. Mrs. Minturn repeatedly opened her lips as if she would speak, but did not. She stepped closer and gently turned the flowers and lightly touched the petals. Beautiful, she said at last. Beautiful. Another long silence. Then, honestly, Leslie, did you hear a bird sing that strain from Martha? Yes, said Leslie, I did. And if you will go with me to the swamp where these flowers came from, you shall hear one sing a strain that will instantly remind you of the opening chorus, while another renders di Provenza il mar from Traviata. The lady turned again to the flowers. She was thinking something deep and absorbing, but no one could have guessed exactly what it might be. Finally, I have decided, she said. Shall we number these one, two, and three and so indicate them? Yes, said Leslie, a little breathlessly. Put your initials to the slips and I'll read them, offered Douglas. Then he smilingly read aloud, Mr. Lowry, one, Mrs. Minturn, two, Mr. Minturn, three. I cast the deciding vote, cried Leslie, one. The squaw seemed to think of a war whoop, but decided against it. Now be good enough to state your reasons, said Mr. Winton. 
Why do you prefer the slipper basket, Mr. Lowry? It satisfies my sense of the artistic. Why the fringe basket, Mrs. Minturn? Because it contains daintier, more wonderful flowers than the others, and it is by far the most pleasing production. Now, Minturn, your turn. Why do you like the moccasin basket? It makes the deepest appeal to me, he answered. But why, persisted Mr. Winton? If you will have it, the moccasins are the color I once loved on the face of my little daughter. Now, Leslie, said Mr. Winton, hurriedly, as he noted Mrs. Minturn's displeased look. Must I tell, she asked. Yes, said her father. Douglas selected it for me, so I like it best. But Leslie, cried Douglas, there were only two baskets when I favored that. Had the fringed orchids been here then, I most certainly would have chosen them. I think yours far the most exquisite. I claim it now. Will you give it to me? Surely I'd love to, laughed the girl. You have done your most exquisite work on the fringed basket, said Mrs. Minturn to the squaw. No make, said she promptly, pointing to Leslie. Leslie Winton, did you go to the swamp to make that basket, demanded Mrs. Minturn. Yes, answered Leslie. Did you make all of them? Only that one, replied Leslie. Why, marveled the lady. To see if I could go to the tamarack swamp and bring from it with the same tools and material a more artistic production than an Indian woman. Well, you have, conceded Mrs. Minturn. The majority is against me, said Leslie. Majorities mean masses, and masses are notoriously insane, said Mrs. Minturn. But this is a small select majority, said Leslie. Craziest of all, said Mrs. Minturn decidedly. If you have finished with us, I want to thank you for the pleasure of seeing these. And Leslie, some day I really think I shall try that bird music. The idea interests me more than anything I have ever heard of. If it were true, it would indeed be wonderful. It would be a new experience. If you want to hear for yourself, make it soon, because now is nesting time. Not again until next spring will the music be so entrancing. I can go any day. I'll look over my engagements and call you. If one ever had a minute to spare. Another of the joys of wealth, said Leslie. Only the poor can afford to loaf and invite their souls. The flowers you will see will delight your eyes quite as much as the music your ears. I doubt your logic, but I'll try the birds. Are you coming, Mr. Minturn? Not unless you especially wish me. Are these for sale? he asked, picking up the moccasins. Only those, replied the florist. Send your bill, he said, turning with the basket. How shining a thing is consistency, sneered his wife. You condemn the riches you never have been able to amass, but at the same time spend like a millionaire. I never said I was not able to gain millions, replied Mr. Minturn coldly. I have had frequent opportunities. I merely refused them, because I do not consider them legitimate. As for my method in buying flowers, in this one instance, price does not matter. You can guess what I shall do with them. I couldn't possibly, answered Mrs. Minturn. The only sure venture I could make is that they will not by any chance come to me. No, these go to baby Elizabeth, he said. Do you want to come with me to take them to her? With an audible sneer, she passed him. He stepped aside, gravely raising his hat, while the others said goodbye to him and followed. Positively insufferable, cried Mrs. Minturn. Every one of my friends say they do not know how I endure his insults, and I certainly will not many more. I don't. I really don't know what he expects. Mr. Winton and Douglas Bruce were confused, while Leslie was frightened, but she tried turning the distressing occurrence off with excuses. Of course he intended no insult, she soothed. He must have adored his little daughter, and the flowers reminded him. I am so much obliged for your opinion, I shall be glad to take you to the swamp any time. Your little sons, would they like to go? It is a most interesting and instructive place for children. For heaven's sakes, don't mention children, cried Mrs. Minturn. They are a bother and a curse. Oh, Mrs. Minturn, exclaimed Leslie. 
Of course I don't mean quite that, but I do very near. Mine are perfect little devils. All the trouble James and I ever had come through them. His idea of a mother is a combined doctor, wet nurse, and nursery maid. Well, I must say, I far from agree with him. What are servants for if not to take the trouble of the children off your hands? Leslie was glad to reach the rich woman's door and deposit her there. As the car sped away, the girl turned a despairing face toward Douglas. For the love of Moik, she cried, isn't that shocking? Poor Mr. Minturn. I don't pity him half so much as I do her, he answered. What must a woman have suffered or been through to warp, twist, or harden her like that? Society life, answered Leslie, as it is lived by people of wealth who are aping royalty in the titled classes. A branch of them, possibly. I know some titled and wealthy people who would be dumbfounded over that woman's ideas. So do I, said Leslie. Of course, there are exceptions. Sometimes the exception becomes bigger than the rule, but not in our richest society. Douglas, let's keep close together. Oh, don't let's ever drift into such a state as that. I should have asked them for lunch, but I couldn't. If that is the way she is talking before her friends, surely she won't have many soon. Then her need for a real woman like you will be all the greater, answered Douglas. I suppose you should have asked her, but I'm delighted that you didn't. Today began so nearly perfect, I want it to end with only you and your father. Will he resent me, Leslie? It all depends on us. If we are selfish and leave him alone, he will feel it. But if we can make him realize gain instead of loss, he will be happier than he is now. I wish I hadn't felt obliged to reject his offer the other night. I'm very sorry about it. I'm not, said Leslie. You have a right to live your life in your own way. I have seen enough of running for office, elections, and appointments that I hate it. You do the work you educated yourself for, and I'll help you. Then my success is assured, laughed Douglas. Leslie, may I leave my basket here? Will you care for it like yours, and may I come to see it often? No, you may come to see me and look at the basket incidentally, she answered. Do you think Mrs. Minturn will go to the swamp to listen to those birds, he asked. Eventually she will, answered the girl. I may have to begin by taking her to an orchard to hear a bird of gold sing a golden song about sewing and mending and baby tending to start on. But when she hears that, she will be eager for more. How interesting, cried Douglas. Bearer of morning, sing that song to me now. Leslie whistled the air, beating time with her hand, then sang the words, I can wash, sir, I can spin, sir, I can sew and mend and babies tend. Oh, you bringer of song, exulted Douglas. I'd rather hear you sing that than any bird. But from what she said, Nellie Minturn won't care particularly for it. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Chapter 5 Little Brother. If it's the big brother bee you got in your bonnet, pull its stinger and let it die an unnatural death. Mickey. Now what am I going to do yet to make the day shorter, Lily? asked Mickey. I guess I got everything, she answered. There's my lunch. Here's my pictures to cut. Here's my lesson to learn. There's my sky and bird crumbs. Mickey, sometimes they hop right in on the sheet. Yesterday one tried to get my lunch. Ain't they sassy? Yes, said Mickey. They fight worse than rich folks. I don't know why the Almighty pays attention if they fall. Maybe nobody else cares, said Peaches. And he feels obliged, cause he made em. Gee, you fa say the funniest things, kid, laughed Mickey, as he digested the idea. Wonder if he cares for us, cause he made us. Maybe he didn't make us, suggested Peaches. Well, 
"'We got one consoling thing,' said Mickey. "'If he made any of them, he made us. "'And if he didn't make us, he didn't make none of them, "'cause everybody comes in and goes out the same way. "'She said so.' "'Then of course it's so,' agreed Peaches. "'That gives us as good a chance as anybody.' "'Of course it does, if we got sense to take it,' said Mickey. "'We got to wake up and make something of ourselves.' Let me see if you know your lesson for today yet. There is the picture of the animal. There is the word that spells it. Now what is it? Milk, answered Peaches, her eyes mischievous. Mickey held over the book, chuckling. All right, there is the word for that, too. For being so smart, Miss Chicken, you can learn it for you get any more to drink. If I have good luck today... I'm going to blow in about six o'clock with a slate and a pencil for you, and then you can print the words you learn and make the pictures. That'll make the day go a lot faster. Oh, it goes fast enough now, said Peaches. I love the days with you and the window and the birds. I wish they'd sing more, though. When your back gets well, I'll take you to the country, where they sing all the time, promised Mickey. "'where there are grass and trees and flowers "'and water to wade in, and... "'Mickey, stop and go on,' cried Peaches. "'Sooner you start, the sooner I'll get my next verse. "'I want just Norfolk a good one tonight.' "'She held up her arms. "'Mickey submitted to a hug and a little cold dab on his forehead, "'counted his money, locked the door, and ran.' On the car he sat in deep thought, then suddenly sniggered out loud. He had achieved the next installment of the doggerel to which every night Peaches insisted on having a new verse added as he entered. He secured his papers, and, glimpsing the headlines, started on his beat, crying them lustily. Mickey knew that washing, better air, enough food, and oil rubbing were improving Peaches. What he did not know was that adding the interest of her presence to his life, even though it made his work heavier, was showing on him. He actually seemed bigger, stronger, and his face brighter and fuller. He swung down the street, thrusting his papers right and left, crossed and went up the other side, watching closely for a customer. It was ten o'clock, and opportunities with the men were almost over. Mickey turned to scan the street for anything even suggesting a sale. He saw none and started with his old cry, watching as he went. I like to sell papers. Sometimes I sell them, sometimes I don't. Then he saw her. She was so fresh and joyous. She walked briskly. Even his beloved nurse was not so wonderful. Straight toward her went Mickey. I like to sell papers. Sometimes I sell them. Sometimes I don't. Morning paper, lady. Sterilized, deodorized, vulcanized. Nice clean paper. The girl's eyes betokened interest. Her smiling lips encouraged Mickey. He laid his chin over her arm, leaned his head against it, and fell in step with her. Sometimes I sell them. Sometimes I don't. If I sell them, I'm happy. If I don't, I'm hungry. If you buy them, you're happy. Paper lady? Not today, thank you, she said. I'm shopping, so I don't wish to carry it. Mickey saw Peach's slate vanishing. It was a beautiful slate, small so it would not tire her bits of hands, and its frame was covered with red. His face sobered. His voice changed, taking on unexpected modulations. Ah, oh, lady, I thought you'd buy my paper. Far down the street, I saw you coming. Lady, I like your gentle voice. I like your pleasant smile. You don't want a nice, sterilized paper, lady? The lady stopped short. She lifted Mickey's chin in a firm grip, looking intently into his face. "'Just by the merest chance, could your name be Mickey?' she asked. "'Sure, lady, Mickey, Michael O'Halloran.' Her smile became even more attractive. 
"'I really don't want to be bothered with the paper,' she said. "'But I do wish a note delivered. "'If you'll carry it, I'll pay you the price of half a dozen papers.' "'Gets the slate!' cried Mickey, bouncing like a rubber boy. "'Sure I will. "'Is it ready, lady?' "'One minute,' she said. "'She stepped to the inside of the walk, opened her purse, "'wrote a line on a card, slipped it in an envelope, "'addressed it, and handed it to Mickey. "'You can read that?' she asked. "'I've read worse writing than that,' he assured her. "'You ought to see the hieroglyphics some of the diamond-studded dames put up.' "'Mickey took a last glimpse at the laughing face, then wheeling ran. "'Presently he went into a big building, studied the address board, "'then entered the elevator and following a corridor reached the number. "'He paused a second, glancing around. "'When he saw the name on the opposite door, a flash passed over his face.' "'Ugh!' he muttered. "'Member now, been to this place before. "'Glad she ain't sending a letter to that man.' "'He stepped inside the open door before him, "'crossed the room, "'and laid the note near a man "'who was bending over some papers on a desk. "'The man reached a groping hand, "'tore open the envelope, "'taking therefrom a card on which was penciled, "'Could this by any chance be your little brother?' He turned hastily, glancing at Mickey, then in a continuous movement arose with outstretched hand. "'Why, little brother,' he cried, "'I'm so glad to see you.' Mickey's smile slowly vanished as he whipped his hands behind him, stepping back. "'Nothing doing, boss,' he said. "'You're off your trolley. I've no brother. My mother had only me.' "'Don't you remember me, Mickey?' inquired Douglas Bruce. Sure, said Mickey, you made Jimmy pay up. Has he bothered you again? asked the lawyer. Nope, answered Mickey. Sit down, Mickey, I want to talk with you. I'm much obliged for you helping me out, said Mickey. But I guess you got other business, and I know I have. What is your business? was the next question. Selling papers. What's yours? was the answer. "'Trying to be a corporation lawyer,' explained Douglas. "'I've been here only two years, and it is slow getting a start. "'I often have more time to spare than I wish I had, "'while I'm lonesome no end.' "'Is your mother dead?' asked Mickey solicitously. "'Yes,' answered Douglas. "'So's mine,' he commented. "'You do get lonesome. "'Of course she was a good one.' "'The very finest, Mickey,' said Douglas. "'And yours?' "'Same here, mister,' said Mickey, with conviction. "'Well, since we are both motherless and lonesome, "'suppose we be brothers,' suggested Douglas. "'Ah!' Mickey shook his head. "'No?' questioned Douglas. "'What's the use?' cried Mickey. "'You could help me with my work and share my play, "'while possibly I could be of benefit to you.' "'I just wondered if you wasn't getting to that,' commented Mickey.' "'Gettin' to what?' inquired Douglas. "'Goin' to do me good,' explained Mickey. "'The swell stiffs are always goin' to do us fellas good. "'Mostly, they do. "'They do us good and brown. "'They pick us up a while and make lapdogs of us. "'Then when we've lost our appetites for our jobs "'and got to have a hankerin' for fetch and carry business, "'away they go and forget us, "'so we're a lot worse off than we were before.' "'Some of the fellows come out of it knowing more ways to be mean "'than they ever learned on the street,' explained Mickey. "'If it's that big brother bee you got in your bonnet, "'pull its stinger and let it die an unnatural death. "'Nope, none, good-bye.' "'Mickey, wait!' cried Douglas. "'My business calls and I must go "'way to my ranch in Idaho,' gaily sang Mickey. "'I'd like to shake you,' said Douglas Bruce.' "'Well, go on,' said Mickey. "'I'm here, and you're big enough. "'If I thought it would jolt out your fool notions "'and shake some sense in, I would,' said Douglas indignantly. "'Now look here, Kitchener,' said Mickey. "'Did I say one word that ain't so, and that you don't know is so? "'Well, what you said is not even half a truth, young man. "'I do know cases where idle rich men have tried the little brother plan as a fad, "'and made a failure of it. 
but for a few like that, I know dozens of sincere, educated men who are honestly giving a boy they fancy a chance. I can take you into the office of one of the most influential men in this city, right across the hall there, and show you a boy he liked, who has in a short time become his friend, an invaluable helper, and hourly companion, and out of it that boy will get a fine education, good business training, and a start in life that will give him a better chance to begin on than the man who was helping him had. Mickey laughed boisterously, then sobered suddenly. Excuse me, brother, he said politely, but that's most too funny for any use. Once I took a whirl with that gentleman myself, whether he does or not, I know the place where he ought to get off, see? Answer me this. Why would he be spending money and taking all that time for a newsie, when he hardly knows his own kids if he sees them, and they're the wickedest little rippers in the park? Just why, now? Douglas Bruce closed the door. Then he came back, and placing a chair for Mickey, he took one opposite. Sit down, Mickey, he said patiently. There's a reason for my being particularly interested in James Minturn. And the reason hinges on the fact you mention that he can't control his own sons, yet he can make a boy he takes comfort in of a street gammon. Mickey's eyes narrowed while he sat very straight in the chair he had accepted. If he's made so much of him, it sort of proves he wasn't a gammon. Some of the boys are a long shot closer gentlemen than the guys who are experimenting with them, cause they were born rich and can afford it. If your friend's going to train his pickup to be what he is, then that boy would stand a better chance on his own side the curb. See, I've been right up against that gentleman with the documents, so I know him, also her. Gee, tear up de choiled and give me de papers was meant for a joke, but I saw that lady and gentleman do it. See, and she was the prettiest little pink and yellow thing. Lord. I can see her gasping and blinking now, makes me sick. If the boy across the hall had seen what I did, he'd run a mile and never stop. Douglas Bruce stared aghast. At last, he said slowly, "Mickey, you are getting mighty close the very thing I wish to know. If I tell you what I know of James Minturn, will you tell me what you know and think?" "Sure," said Mickey readily. I got no reasons for loving him. I wouldn't convoy a millioning to the mint for that gentleman. Mickey, shall I go first, or will you? I will," said Mickey instantly. "Cause when I finish, you'll save your breath. See? I see," said Douglas Bruce. "Proceed." Well, twas over two years ago," said Mickey, leaning forward to look Bruce in the eyes. I hadn't been up against the game so awful long alone. Twas summer and my papers were all gone and I was tired, so I went over in the park and sat on a seat, just watchin' folks. Pretty soon, long comes walkin' a nice lady with a sweet voice and kind eyes. She sat down close to me and says, "It's a nice day." We got chummy like. When right up at the fountain before us stops as swell an automobile as there is, one of the brown French governess ladies with the hatchet face got out, and unloaded three kids, two boys and a girl. She told the kids if they didn't sit on the benches, she socked them on hard, and keep their clothes clean so she wouldn't have to wash and dress them again that day, she'd knock the livers out of them. And walked off with the entrance policeman. Soon as she and Bobby got interested, the kids began sliding off the bench and running around the fountain. The girl was only about two or three, a fat, toddly thing, trying to do what her brothers did, and taking it like the gamest kid you ever saw. When they pushed her off the seat and tripped her and abused her like a dog, me and the woman were getting madder every minute. Go tell your nurse," says she. But the baby thing just glanced where nurse was and kind of shivered and laughed, and ran on round the fountain. When the big boy stuck his foot out, so she fell. Nursey saw and started for her, 
but she scrambled up and went kiting for the bench and climbed on it. So nurse told her she'd cut the blood out of her if she did that again, then went back to her policeman. Soon as she was gone, those little devils began coaxing their sister to get down and run again. At last she began to smile the cunningest and slipped to the walk, then a little farther and a little farther, all the time laughing and watching the nurse. The big boy, he said, You ain't nothing but a girl. You can't step on the edge like I can and then step back. She says, Can too. She did to show him, and just as she did, she saw that he was going to push her. Then she tried to get back, but he did push, and over she went, not real in, but her arms in and her dress front some wet. She screamed, and the little devil that pushed her grabbed her, pretending to be pulling her out. Honest he did. Up came nurse, just frothing, and in language we couldn't understand, she ripped and raved, and she dragged little pink back. Then she grabbed her by the hair and cracked her head two or three times against the stone. The lady screamed, and so did I, and we both ran at her. The boys just shouted and laughed, and the smallest one he up and kicked her while she was down. The policeman walked over, laughing too, but he told nurse that was too rough. Then my lady pitched in, so he told her to tend her business, that those kids were too tough to live and deserved all they got. The nurse laughed at her, and went back to the grass with the policeman. The baby lay there on the stones and never made a sound. She just kind of gasped and blinked and lay there, till my lady went almost wild. She went to her and stooped to pick her up, when she got awful sick. The policeman said something to the nurse, so she came and dragged the kid away and said, The little pig has gone and eaten too much again, and now I'll have to take her home and wash and dress her all over. Then she gave her an awful shake. The policeman said she'd better cut that out, because it might have been the bumping. And she said, Good for her if t'was. The driver pulled up just then, and he asked if the brat had been stuffing too much again. She said, yes. And the little boy, he said, she pounded her head on the stone good. And the nurse hit him across the mouth till she knocked him against the car. And she said, want to try that again? Open your head to say that again, and I'll smash you too. Eating too much made her sick. She looked at the big boy fierce-like, so he laughed and said, of course eating too much made her sick. She nodded at him and said, course. You get two dishes of ice and two pieces of cake for remembering. Then she loaded them in and they drove away. My lady was as white as marble and she said, Is there any way to find out who they are? I said, Sure, half a dozen. Boy, she said, Get their residence for me and I'll give you a dollar. Ought to have seen me fly. Car was chuffing away, waiting to get the traffic cop sign when to cut in on the avenue. I'd just took a dodge and hung on to the extra tire under the top where nobody saw me. And when they stopped, I got the house number they went in. Little Pink was lying all white and limber yet, and Nurse looked worried as she carried her up. She said something fierce to the boys. The big one rang, and they went inside. I saw a footman take the girl. I heard the nurse begin the eat-too-much story. Then I cut back to the park. The lady said, Get it? I said, Sure, dead easy. She said, Can you take me? I said, Glad to. She said, That was the dreadfulest sight I ever saw. That child's mother is going to know right now what kind of a nurse she is paying to take care of her children. You come show me, she said. So we went. Will you come in with me? She asked when we got there, and I said yes. Well, we rang, and she asked Pleasant to see the lady of the house on a little matter of important business. So pretty soon, here comes one of the diamond-studded fashion paper ladies, all smiling sweet as honey. She asked what the business was. 
My nice lady, she said her name was Mrs. John Wilson, and her husband was a banker in Plymouth, Illinois, and she was in the city shopping and went to the park to rest and was talking to me when an automobile let out a nurse and two boys and a lovely little pink girl. She gave the number plate and asked, Was the car and the children hers? The diamond lady slowly sort of began to freeze over, and when the nice lady got that far, she said, I have an engagement. Kindly state in a few words what you want. My lady sort of stiffened up, and then she said, I saw... This boy here saw, and the park policeman nearest the entrance fountain of the park saw your nurse take your little girl by the hair, strike her head against the fountain curb three times because her brother pushed her in. She lay insensible until the car came, and she has just been carried into your house in that condition. I could see the footman peeking, and at that he cut up the stairs. The diamond-studded lady stiffened up, and she said, So, you are one of those meddling, interfering country jays that come here and try to make us lose our good servants, so you can hire them later. I've seen that done before. Lucette is invaluable, she said, and perfectly reliable. Takes all the care of those dreadful little imps from me. Now you get out of here. And she reached for the button. My lady just sat still and smiled. Do you really think I'd take the trouble to come here in this way if I couldn't prove I had seen the thing happen? she asked. God only knows what you country women do, the woman answered. We would stand between our children and beastly cruelty, my lady said. Your child's condition is all the proof my words need. You go examine her head and feel the welt on it. See how ill she is, and you will thank me. Your nurse is not reliable. Keep her, and your children will be ruined if not killed. Raving, sneered the diamond lady. But I know you're kind, so I'll go, as it's the only way to get rid of you. Now what do you think happened next? Well, sir, about three minutes in walked the footman and salutes, sneering like a cat. And he says, Madam's compliments. She finds her little daughter in perfect condition, sweetly sleeping, and her son's having dinner. She asks you to see how quickly you can leave her residence. My woman looked at me, and I said, It's all over but burying the kid if it dies. Come on, lady. They'll be glad to plant it and get it out of the way. So I started, and she followed. And just as he let me out the door, I handed him this. I saw you listen and cut to tell, and I bet you helped put the kid to sleep, but you better look out. She gave it to that baby too rough for any use. He started for me, but I flew. When we got on the street, the lady was all used up, so she couldn't say anything. She had me call a taxi to take her to her hotel. I set down her name she gave me, her house, and her street number. I cut to a newsie's directory and got the name of the owner of the palace place, and it was Mrs. James Minturn. Next morning, coming down on the cars, I was hunting headliners to make up a new call like I always do. And there I saw in big type, Mr. and Mrs. James Minturn prostrate over the sudden death of their lovely little daughter from poisoning. From an ice she ate. I read it every word, even what the doctor said, and how investigation of where the source of the ice came from was to be made. What do you think of it? I have no doubt, but it's every word horrible truth, answered Douglas. Sure, said Mickey. I just hiked to the park and walked up to the cop and I showed him the paper, and he looked awful glum. I can point him out to you and give you the lady's address, and there was plenty more who saw parts of it could be found, if anyone was on the kid's side. Sure, it's the truth. Well, I kept thinking it over. 
One day, about three weeks later, blessed if that same car didn't stop at the same fountain, and the same nurse got out with the boys, and she set them on the same bench and told them the same thing, and then she went into another palaver with the same policeman. I looked on pretty much interested, and before long the boys got to running again, and one tripped the other, and she saw and came running and fetched him a crack. Like to split his head, and pushed him down still and white. So I said to myself, "All right for you, lady. Tried a lady and got nothing. Here's where a gentleman tries a gentleman and sees what he gets." I marched into the door just across the hall from you here, and faced Mr. James Minturn. I gave him names and dates and addresses, even the copper's name I'd got. I told him all I've told you and considerable more. He wasn't so fiery as the lady, so I told him the whole thing. But he never opened his trap. He just sat still and stony. Listen till I quit, and finally he heaved a big breath and looked at me sort of dazed like, and he said, "What do you want, boy?" That made me red hot, so I said. I want you to know that I saw the same woman bust one of your boys a good crack over the head a few minutes ago. That made him jump, but he didn't say or do anything. So I got up and went, and the same woman was in the park with the same boys yesterday, and they're the biggest little devils there. What's your answer? A heartbroken man said Douglas Bruce. Now let me tell you, Mickey. Then he told Mickey all he knew of James Minturn. All the same, he ought to be able to do something for his own kids, instead of the boys who don't need it half so bad. Commented Mickey. Why, honest, I don't know one street kid so low that he'd kick a little girl after she'd been beat up scandalous for his meanness to start on. Honest, I don't. I don't care what he is doing for the boy he has got. That boy doesn't need half so much help as his own. I can prove it to you if you'll come with me to the park most any morning. All right, I'll come," said Douglas promptly. "Well, I couldn't say that they would be there this minute," said Mickey, "but I can call you up the first time I see they are." "All right, I'll come if it's possible. I'd like to see for myself." So this gives you a settled prejudice against the Big Brother movement, Mickey. In my brogans, what would it give you? A hard jolt," said Douglas emphatically. "Then what's the answer? That it is more unfair than I thought you could be to deprive me of my little brother because you deem the man across the hall unfit to have one. Do I look as if you couldn't trust me, Mickey? No, you don't. But neither does Mister James Minturn. He looks as if a fellow could get a grip on him. And pull straight across Belgium, hanging on. But you know, I saw the same woman. I know, Mickey. But that only proves that there are times when even the strongest man can't help himself. Then, like Olhan, I trot one fifty-four and a half to the judge of the juvenile court," said Mickey. And I'd yell long and loud, and I'd put up the proof. That would get the lady down to brass tacks. But with Mrs. Minturn's position, and the stain, such a proceeding would put on the boys. Cut out the boys," advised Mickey. "They're gold-plated, stain and wouldn't stick to them. So, you are going to refuse education, employment, and a respectable position because you disapprove of one man among millions?" demanded Douglas. "That lets me out," said Mickey. "She educated me a lot." No day is long enough for the work I do right now. You can take my word for it that I'm respectable, same as I'm taking yours that you are. All right," said Douglas. "We will let it go then. Maybe you're right. At least you are not worth the bother it requires to wake you up. Will you take an answer to the note you brought me? Now the returns are coming in," said Mickey. "Sure, I will. But she is in the big store shopping. I'll find out," said Douglas. He picked up the telephone and called the Winton residence. On learning Leslie was still away, 
he left a request that she call him when she returned. I would spend the time talking with you, he said to Mickey, if I could accomplish anything. As I can't, I'll go on with my work. You busy yourself with anything around the rooms that interests you. Mickey grinned half abashed. He took a long survey of the room they were in, arose, and standing in the door leading to the next, he studied that. To him, busy meant work. Presently he went into the hall and returned with a hand broom and dustpan he had secured from the janitor. He carefully went over the floor, removing anything he could see that he thought should not be there, and then began on the room adjoining. Next he appeared with a cloth and dusted the furniture and window seats. Once he met Douglas's eye and smiled. Your janitor didn't have much of a mother, he commented. I could beat him to his base of rod. Job is yours any time you want it. Morning papers, caroled Mickey. Sterilized, deodorized, vulcanized. I like to sell them. Defeated again, Bruce turned to his work and Mickey to his. He straightened every rug, pulled a curtain, set a blind at an angle that gave the worker more light and better air. He was investigating the glass when the telephone rang. Hello, Leslie. It certainly was. How did you do it? Not so hilarious as you might suppose. Leslie, I want to say something, not for the wire. Will you hold the line a second until I start Mickey with it? All right. She is there now, Mickey. Can you find your way? Sure, laughed Mickey. If you put the address on, she started me from the street. The address is plain. For straightening my rooms and carrying the note, will that be about right? A ladybird? Gee, cried Mickey. I didn't suppose you was a plute. And I don't suppose so yet. You want a little brother bad if you're willing to buy one. This number ain't far out, and I wouldn't have sold more than three papers this time of day. Twenty-five is about right. But you forgot cleaning my room, said Douglas. Mickey grinned, his face flushed. Me to you, he said. Nothing. Just a little matter of keeping in practice. Goodbye, and be good to yourself. Douglas turned to the telephone. Leslie, he said, I'm sending Mickey back to you with a note. Not because I had anything to say I couldn't say now, but because I can't manage him. I pretended I didn't care and let him go. Can you help me? See if you can't interest him in something that at least will bring him back, or show us where to find him. Certainly, thank you very much. When Mickey delivered the note, the lovely young woman just happened to be in the hall. She told him to come in until she read it, to learn what Mr. Bruce wanted. Mickey followed into a big room, looked around, then a speculative, appreciative gleam crossed his face. He realized the difference between a home and a showroom. He did not know what he was seeing or why it affected him as it did. Really, the thought that was in his mind was that this woman was far more attractive but had less money to spend on her home than many others. He missed the glitter but enjoyed the comfort, for he leaned back against the chair offered him, thinking what a cool, restful place it was. The girl seemed in no hurry to open the letter. Have trouble finding Mr. Bruce? she asked. Easy. I'd been to the same building once before. And I suppose you'd be there many times again, she suggested. I'm going back right now if you want to send an answer to this letter, he said. And if it requires none, she questioned. Then I'm going to try to sell the rest of these papers, get a slate for Lily, and go home. Is Lily your little sister, she asked. Mickey straightened, firmly closing his lips. He had done it again. Just a little girl, I know, he said cautiously. A little bit of a girl, she asked. About the littlest girl you ever saw, said Mickey, unconsciously interested in the subject. And you are going to take her a slate to draw pictures on? How fine! I wish you'd carry your package for me, too. I was arranging my dresser this morning, and I put the ribbons I don't want into a box for some child. Maybe Lily would like them for her doll. Lily hasn't any doll, he said. She had one, but her granny sold it and got drunk on the money. 
Mickey stopped suddenly. In a minute more he would have another orphan's home argument on his hands. Scandalous, cried Mitt Leslie. In my room there is a doll just begging to go to some little girl. If you took it to Lily, would her granny sell it again? Not this morning, said Mickey. You see, miss, a few days ago she lost her breath. Permanent. No, if Lily had a doll, nobody would take it from her now. I'll bring it at once, she offered, and the ribbons. Never mind, said Mickey, I can get her a doll. But you haven't seen this one, cried Leslie. You save your money for oranges. Without waiting for a reply, she left the room. Presently, returning with a box and a doll that seemed to Mickey quite as large as peaches, it had a beautiful face, hair, real hair that could be combed, and real clothes that could be taken off. Leslie had dressed it for a birthday gift for the little daughter of one of her friends, but by making haste she could prepare another. Mickey gazed in bewilderment. He had seen dolls, even larger and more wonderful than that, in the shop windows, but connecting such a creation with his room and peaches required mental adjustments. I guess you better not, he said with conviction. But why not? asked Leslie in amazement. Well, for about fifty reasons, replied Mickey. You see, Lily is a poor kid, and her back is bad. That doll is so big she couldn't dress it without getting all tired out. And what's the use showing her such dresses when she can't have any herself? She's got the best she ever had, and the best she can't can have right now. So that ain't the kind of doll for Lily. It's too big and too, too gladsome. I see, laughed Leslie. Well, Mickey, you show me what would be right size of a doll for Lily. I'll get another and dress it as you say. How would that do? You needn't, said Mickey. Lily's happy now. But wouldn't she like a doll? persisted Leslie. I never knew a girl who didn't love a doll. Wouldn't she like a doll? Most to death, I spect, said Mickey. I know she said she cried for the one her granny sold, till she beat her. Yes, I guess she'd like a doll, but I can get her one. But you can't make white nighties for Lily to put on it to take to bed with her, and cunning little dresses for morning, and a street dress for afternoon, and a party dress for evening, tempted the girl. Lily has been on the street twice, and she never heard of a party. Just nighties and a morning dress would do. And there's no use for me to be sticking. If you like to give dolls away, Lily might as well have one, for she just, I don't know what she would do about it, conceded Mickey. All right, said Leslie, I'll dress it this afternoon, and tomorrow you can come for it in the evening before you go home. If I'm not here, the package will be ready. Take the ribbons now, she'll like them for her hair. Her hair's too short for a ribbon, said Mickey. Then a headband, this way, said Leslie. She opened a box and displayed a wonderment of ribbon bands and bits of gay color. Gee, gasped Mickey, I couldn't pick up that much brightness for her in a year. You save what you find for her? asked Leslie. Sure, said Mickey. You see, miss, things are pretty plain where she is, so all the brightness I can take her ain't going to hurt her eyes. Thank you, heaps. Is there going to be any answer to the letter? Why, I haven't read it yet, cried the girl. No, anybody could see that someone else is rustling for your grub, commented Mickey. That's so, too, laughed Leslie, darling old daddy. Just about right, is he? queried Mickey interestedly. Just exactly right, said Leslie. Grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Please make Lily's more like she's used to. See? Mickey, I do see, said Leslie. I beg your pardon. Lily's doll shall not tire her or make her discontented with what she has. Thank you for a good idea. Mickey returned to the street shortly after noon, with more in his pocket than he usually earned in a day, where by expert work he soon disposed of his last paper. He bought the slate, then hurried home carrying it and the box. At the grocery he carefully selected food again, then he threw open the door and achieved this. Once a little kid named Peaches swelled my heart until it eaches. If you think I'd trade her for a dog, your think tank has slipped a cog. Peaches laughed, stretching her hands as usual. Mickey stooped for her caress, scattering the ribbons over her as he arose. She gasped in delighted amazement. Oh, Mickey, where did you ever? Mickey, where did you get them? Mickey, you didn't st- You just better choke on that, miss, yelled Mickey. No, I didn't st- and I don't st, and nothing I ever bring you will be st, and you needn't ever put no st at me again, see? Mickey, I didn't mean that. Course you wouldn't. Course I know you couldn't. Mickey, that's the best poetry piece yet. Did you bring the slate? Sure, said Mickey, somewhat mollified, but still injured. I must have dropped it with the banquet. Peaches pushed away the billow of color, taking the slate. Her fingers picking at the string reminded Mickey of a sparrow feet, but he watched until she untied and removed the paper, which he folded to lay away. She picked up the pencil, meditating. Mickey, she said, make my hand do a word. Sure, said Mickey. What do you want to write first, flowersy girl? Peaches looked at him reproachfully. Of course, there wouldn't be but one I'd want to do first of all, she said. Hold my hand tight, and big and plain, up at the top, make it right. Mickey lovest. Sure, said the boy in a hushed voice. He gripped the hand, bending above her, but suddenly collapsed, buried his face in her hair, and sobbed until he shook. Peaches crouched down, lying rigid. She was badly frightened. At last she could endure it no longer. Mickey, she gasped. Mickey, what did I do? Mickey, don't write it if you don't want to. Mickey arose, wiping his face on the sheet. You just bet I want to write that, Lily, he said. I never wanted to do anything more in all my life. Then why, she began. Never you mind why, miss, said Mickey. Grasping her hand, he traced the words. Peaches looked at them a long time. "'then carefully laid the slate aside. "'She began fingering the ribbons. "'Let me wash you,' said Mickey, "'and rub your back to rest you from all this day. "'Then I'll comb your hair and you pick the prettiest one. "'I'll put it on the way she showed me, "'so you'll be a fashionable lady. "'Who showed you, Mickey, and gave you such pretties? "'A girl I carried a letter to. "'After you're bathed and have had some supper, I'll tell you.' Then Mickey began to work. He sponged peaches, rubbed her back, laid her on his pallet, putting fresh sheets on her bed, and carefully preparing her supper. After she had eaten, he again ran the comb through her ringlet, telling her to select the ribbon he should use. No, you, said peaches. Mickey squinted. So exacting was the work of deciding. Red he discarded with one sweep against her white cheeks. Green went with it. Blue almost made him shudder. But a soft, warm pink pleased him, so Mickey folded it into the bands in which it had been creased before, binding it around Peach's head as Leslie had shown him. Then, with awkward fingers, did his best on a big bow. He crossed the room and picked up a mirror, which he held before her, reciting, Once a little kid named Peaches swelled my heart. Peaches took the mirror. "'studying the face intently. "'She glanced over her shoulder "'so Mickey piled the pillows higher. "'Then she looked at him. "'Mickey scrutinized her closely. "'You're clean, kid, clean as a plate,' he assured her. "'Honest you are. "'You needn't worry about that. 
I'll always keep you washed clean. She was most particular about that than anything else. Don't you fret about my having a dirty girl around. You're clean, all right. Peaches sighed as she returned the mirror. Mickey replaced it, laid the slate and ribbons in reach, washed the dishes, then the sheets he had removed, and then their soiled clothing. Peaches lay folding and unfolding the ribbons, asking questions while Mickey worked, or with the pencil tracing her best imitations of the name on the slate. By the time he had finished everything to be done, and drawn a chair beside the bed to see if she had learned her lesson for the day, it was cool evening. She knew all the words he had given her, so he proceeded to write them on the slate, then told her about the big man named Douglas Bruce, and the lovely girl named Leslie Winton, also every word he could remember about the house she lived in. Then he added, "Lily, do you like being surprised better, or do you like to think things over?" "I don't know," said Peaches. "Well, before long, I'll know," said Mickey. "What I was thinking was this: you are going to have something. I just wondered whether you'd rather know it was coming." Or have me walk in with it and surprise you, Mickey? Just walk in," she decided. "All right," said Mickey. "Mickey, write on the other side of my slate what you said at the door tonight," she coaxed. "Get a little book and write 'em all down, Mickey. I want to learn all of them when I can read. Let me tell you, you make all you can think of, then make more and make 'em and make 'em and make 'em, and when you get big as you're gonna be." Make books of 'em and be p- a poet man instead of selling papers. Sure," said Mickey. "I'd just as lief be a poet man as not. I'd write a big one all about a little yellow-haired girl named Lily Peaches, and I'd put it on the front page of the Herald. Honest, I would. I'd like to." "Gee," said Peaches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter Six: The Song of a Bird. Are you sure that they didn't go through the same good time you are having right now, before they lost the men they loved and married, and became mothers who later deliberately orphaned their own children? Leslie, Leslie said the voice of Mrs. James Minturn over the telephone. Is there any particular time of the day when that bird of yours sings better than at another? Morning, Mrs. Minturn. Five, the latest. At that time, one hears the full chorus and sees the perfect beauty. Really, I wouldn't ask you if I were not sure, positively sure, that you'd find the trip worthwhile. I'll be ready in the morning, but that's an unearthly hour," came the protest. "It is almost unearthly sights and sounds to which you are going," answered Leslie. "And be sure you wear suitable clothing. What do you call suitable clothing?" High, heavy shoes," said Leslie. "Short, stout skirts." As if I had such things," laughed Mrs. Minturn. "Let me send you something of mine," offered Leslie. "I've enough for two." "You're not figuring on really going in one of those awful places, are you?" questioned Mrs. Minturn. "Surely," cried Leslie. "The birds won't sing to an automobile, and you wouldn't miss seeing such flowers on their stems as you saw at Lowry's for any money." It will be something to tell your friends about. Send what I should have. I'd ride a llama through a sea of champagne for a new experience. Mrs. Minturn turned from the telephone with a contemptuous sneer on her face, but Leslie's gay laugh persisted in her ears. Restlessly she moved through her rooms, thinking what she might do to divert herself, and shrinking from all the tiresome things she had been doing for years. Until there was not a drop of the fresh juice of life to be extracted from them, I'm going to take a bath, go to bed early, and see if I can't sleep," she muttered. 
I don't know what it is that James is contemplating, but his face haunts me. Really, if he doesn't be more civil and stop his morose glowering when I do see him, I'll put him or myself where we won't come in contact. He makes it plain every day that he blames me about Elizabeth. Why should he? He couldn't possibly know of the call of that wild-eyed reformer. So unfortunate that she should come just at that time, too. Of course, hundreds of children die from spoiled milk every summer, the rich as well as the poor. I'll never get over regretting that I didn't finish what I started to do. But I'd scarcely touched her in her life. She always was so pink and warm, and that awful whiteness chilled me to the soul. I wish I had driven myself, forced myself. Then I could defy James with more spirit. That's what I lack, spirit. Maybe this trip to the swamp will steady my nerves. Something must be done soon. I believe he is thinking of doing it. Pooh! What could he do? There isn't an irregularity in my life he can lay his fingers on. She rang for her maid and, cancelling two engagements for the evening, went to bed but not to sleep. When she was called early in the morning, she gladly arose and was dressed in Leslie Winton's short skirts, a waist of khaki, and high shoes near enough to her size to be comfortable. Her bath had refreshed her. A cup of hot coffee stimulated her. And despite the lack of sleep, she felt better than she had that spring as she went down to the car. On the threshold, she met her husband. Evidently, he had been out all night on strenuous business. His face was haggard, his eyes bloodshot, while in both hands he gripped a small, square, paper-wrapped package. They looked at each other a second that seemed long to both. Then the woman laughed. Evidently, in accounting is expected, she said, "Leslie Witten at the door, and the roll of music I carry should be sufficient to prove why I'm going out at this hour. You heard us make the arrangement. Thank heaven, I have no interest in knowing where you've been, or what your precious package contains." His expression and condition frightened her. For the weight of a straw overbalance, he said, only for a hint that you have a soul. I'd freeze it for all time with the contents of this package. A threat! You to me? She cried in amazement. Verily, Madame, he said, I wish you all the joy of the birds and flowers this morning. You've gone mad! She cried. Contrarily, I have come to my senses after years of insanity. He said, I will see you when you return. She stood bewildered, watching him go down the hall and enter his library. That and his sleeping room were the only places in the house sacred to him. No one entered. No one, not even the incorrigible children, touched anything there. She slowly went to the car, trying to rally to Leslie's greeting, struggling to fix her mind on anything pointed out to her as something she might enjoy. At last, she said, "I don't know what is the matter with me, Leslie. James is planning something. I haven't an idea what." But his grim, reproachful face is slowly driving me wild. I'm getting so I can't sleep. You saw him come as I left. He talked positively crazy, as if he had the crack of doom in his hands and was prepared to crack it. He said he would see me when I came back. Indeed, he will to his sorrow. He will be as he used to be, or we will separate. The idea was scarcely a cent to his name. Of his undertaking to dictate to me, to me, do you blame me, Leslie? You heard him the other day. You know how he insulted me. Leslie leaned forward, laying a firm hand in a grip on Mrs. Minturn's arm. Since you ask me, she said, I will answer. If you find life with Mr. Minturn insufferable, an agony to both of you, I would separate and speedily. If it has come to a place where you can't see each other or speak without falling into unpleasantness, then I'd keep apart. That is exactly the case," cried Mrs. Minturn. "Oh, Leslie, I'm so glad you agree with me, but I haven't finished," said Leslie. "You interrupted me in the middle. If you are absolutely sure you can't go on peaceably, I would stop. But if I once had loved a man enough to give my life and my happiness into his keeping," To make him the father of my children, 
I would not separate from him until I had exhausted every resource to see if I couldn't in some possible way end with credit. If you had been through what I have, said Mrs. Minturn, you wouldn't endure it any longer. Perhaps, said Leslie. But you see, dear Mrs. Minturn, I am handicapped by not knowing what you have been through. To your world you appear to be a woman of great wealth who does exactly as she pleases and pays her own bills. You seem to have unlimited money, power, position, leisure for anything you fancy. I'll wager you don't know the names of half the servants in your house. A skillful housekeeper takes the responsibility off your hands. You never are seen in public with your children. Competent nurses care for them. You don't appear with your husband any more, yet he is a man of fine brain, unimpeachable character, who handles big affairs for other men. And father says he believes his bank account would surprise you. He has been in business for years. Surely all he makes doesn't go to other men. You know, I never thought of that, cried Mrs. Minturn. He had nothing to begin on, and I've always kept our establishment. He's never paid for more than his clothing. Do you suppose that he has made money? I know he has, said Leslie. Not so fast as he might. Not so much as he could, for he is incorruptible. But money, yes, he is a powerful man, not only in the city, but all over the state. Some of these days you're going to wake up to find him a senator or a governor. You seem to be the only person who doesn't know it or who doesn't care if you do. But when it comes about, as it will, you'll be so proud of him. Dear Mrs. Minturn, please, please go slowly. Don't, oh, don't let anything happen that will make a big regret for you both. Leslie, where did you get all this? asked Mrs. Minturn, in tones of mingled interest and surprise. From my father, answered Leslie, and from Douglas Bruce. Douglas's office is across the hall from Mr. Minturn's. They meet daily, and from the first they have been friends. Mr. Minturn took Douglas to his clubs, introduced him, and helped him into business. So often they work together. Why, only yesterday Douglas came to me filled with delight. Mr. Minturn secured an appointment for him to make an investigation for the city, which will be a great help to Douglas. It will bring him in contact with prominent men, give him big work and a sample of how mercenary I am, it will bring him big pay, and he knows how to use the money in a big way. Douglas knows Mr. Minturn so well and respects him so highly, yet no one can know him as you do. That is quite true. I live with him. I know the real man, cried Mrs. Minturn. How mean of you, laughed Leslie, to distort my reasoning like that. I didn't ask you to think up all the little things that have massed into one big grievance against him. I meant stop that for today, out here in the country where everything is so lovely, and go back where I am. He surely has an advocate. Leslie, when did you start making a special study of Mr. Minturn? When Douglas Bruce began speaking to me so frequently of him, answered Leslie. Then I commenced to watch him and to listen to what people were saying about him, and to ask Daddy. It's very funny that everyone seems so well informed and so enthusiastic just at the time when I feel that life is unendurable with him, said Mrs. Minturn. I can't understand it. Mrs. Minturn, try, oh, do try to get my viewpoint before you do anything irreparable, begged Leslie. Away up here in the woods, let's think it out. Let's discuss James Minturn in every phase of his nature and see if the big manly part doesn't far outweigh the little irritations. Let's see if you can't possibly go to the meeting he wants when we return with a balance struck in his favor. A divorced woman is always, well, it's disagreeable. Alone you'd feel stranded. Attempt marrying again, where would you find a man with half the points that count for good to replace him? In after years, when your children realize the man he is, how are you going to explain to them why you couldn't live with him? From your rush of words, it is evident that you have your arguments at hand, said Mrs. Minturn. You've been thinking more about my affairs than I ever did. You bring up points I have never have thought of. You make me see things that would not have occurred to me. Yet, as you put them, they have awful force. 
You haven't exactly said it, but what you mean is that you believe me in the wrong. So do all my friends. All of you sympathize with Mr. Minturn. All of you think him a big man worthy of every consideration and me deserving none. You're putting that too strongly, retorted Leslie. You are right about Mr. Minturn, but I won't admit that I find you worthy of no consideration at all, or I wouldn't be imploring you to give yourself a chance at happiness. "'Give myself a chance at happiness?' "'Dear Mrs. Minturn, yes,' said Leslie. "'All your life, so far, you have lived absolutely for yourself, "'for your personal pleasure. "'Has happiness resulted?' "'Happiness?' cried Mrs. Minturn in amazement. "'You little fool! "'With my husband practically a madman, my children incorrigible, "'my nerves on edge until I can't sleep, "'because one thought comes over and over.' "'Well, you achieved it in society,' said Leslie. "'It's the result of doing exactly what you wanted to. "'You can't say James Minturn was to blame "'for what you had the money and the desires to do. "'You can't think your babies would have preferred their mother "'to the nurses and governesses they have had. "'If you say another word about that, "'I'll jump from the car and break my neck,' threatened Mrs. Minturn. "'I don't care if I do. "'I'm the most miserable woman alive. "'No one sympathizes with me.' "'That is untrue,' said Leslie, "'renewing her grip to reassure and to stop the jumping "'if it really impended. "'I care, or I wouldn't be doing what I am now. "'And as for sympathy, I haven't a doubt, "'but every woman of your especial set "'will weep tears of condolences with you "'if you tell them what you have me. "'There is Mrs. Clinton and Mrs. Farley "'and a dozen women among your dearest friends "'who have divorced their husbands "'and are freelances or remarried.' "'You can have friends enough to suit you in any event.' "'Fools! Shallow-pated fools!' cried Mrs. Minturn. "'Not enough brains enough among them to discuss a mosquito intelligently. "'They never read anything. "'Their idea of any art would convulse you. "'They don't know a note of real music.' "'But they are your best friends,' interposed Leslie. "'What, then, is their attraction?' "'I'm sure I don't know,' said Mrs. Minturn. I suppose it's unlimited means to follow any fad or fancy, to live extravagantly as they choose, to dress faultlessly as they have taste, freedom to go as they please. Oh, they do have a good time. Are you sure that they didn't go through the same good time you were having right now, before they lost the men they loved and married, and then became mothers who later deliberately orphaned their own children? Leslie, for God's sake, where did you learn it? cried Mrs. Minturn. "'How can you hit like that? "'You make me feel like a... like a... oh, Lord!' "'Don't let's talk any more, Mrs. Minturn,' suggested Leslie. "'You know what all refined, home-loving people think. "'You know society and what it has to offer. "'You're making yourself unhappy, and I am helping you, "'doing most of it, perhaps. "'But if someone doesn't tell you, "'but if someone doesn't stop you, "'you may lose the love of a good man.' the respect of the people worthwhile, and later of your own children. See, here is the swamp, and this is as close as we can go with the car. Is this where you found the flowers for your basket? Yes, said Leslie. No snakes, no quicksands? Snakes don't like this kind of moss, answered Leslie. This is an old lake bed grown up with tamaracks and a bog of a thousand years. Looks as if ten thousand might come closer. "'Were you ever in such a place?' asked Leslie. "'Never,' said Mrs. Minturn. "'Well, to do this to perfection,' said Leslie, "'we should go far enough for you to see the home life "'of our rarest wild flowers "'and to get the music full effect. "'We must look for a high place "'to spread this waterproof sheet I have brought along, "'then nestle down and keep still. "'The birds will see us going in, "'but if we move quietly as possible "'and make ourselves inconspicuous,' They will soon forget us. Have you the score? Yes, answered Mrs. Minturn. Go ahead. Leslie had not expected Mrs. Minturn's calm tones and placid acceptance of the swamp. The girl sent one searching look the woman's way. Then came enlightenment. This was a stunt. Mrs. Minturn had been doing stunts in the hope of new sensations all her life. What others could do, she could, if she chose. In this instance, she chose to penetrate a tamarack swamp 
at six o'clock in the morning to listen to the notes of a bird. I'll select the highest places and go as nearly where we were as I can, said Leslie. If you step in my tracks, you'll be all right. Why, you're not afraid, are you? asked Mrs. Minturn. Not in the least, said Leslie. Are you? No, said Mrs. Minturn. One strikes almost everything motoring through the country, in the mountains or at sea and traveling. This looks interesting. How deep could one sink anyway? Deeply enough to satisfy you, laughed Leslie. Come quietly now. Grasping the score she carried, Mrs. Minturn unconcernedly plunged after Leslie. Purposely the girl went slowly, stooping beneath branches, skirting two wet places, slipping over the high hummocks, turning to indicate by gesture a moss bed, a flower, or glancing upward to try to catch a glimpse of some entrancing musician. Once Leslie turned to look back and saw Mrs. Minturn on her knees, separating the silvery-green moss heads and thrusting her hand deeply to learn the length of the roots. She noticed the lady's absorbed face and the wet patches spreading around her knees. Leslie fancied she could see Mrs. Minturn entering the next gathering of her friends, smiling faintly and crying, Dear people, I've had a perfectly new experience! She could hear every tone of Mrs. Minturn's voice saying, Ferns as luxuriant as anything in Florida, moss beds several feet deep, a hundred birds singing, and all before sunrise, my dears. When Mrs. Minturn arose, Leslie went forward slowly until she reached the moccasin flowers, but remembering she did not stop. The woman did. She stooped, and Leslie winced as she snapped one to examine it critically. She held it up in the gray light, turning it. Did you ever see little Elizabeth? she asked. Yes, said Leslie. Do you think... she stopped abruptly. That one is too deep, said Leslie. The color he saw was on a freshly opened one like that. She pointed to a paler moccasin of exquisite pink with red lavender veining. Mrs. Minturn assented. He can't forget anything, she said, or let anyone else... He always will keep harping. We were peculiarly unfortunate that day, said Leslie. He really had no intention of saying anything if he hadn't been forced. Oh, he doesn't require forcing, said Mrs. Minturn. He's always at the overflow point about her. Perhaps he was very fond of her, suggested Leslie. He was perfectly foolish about her, said Mrs. Minturn impatiently. I lost a nurse or two through his interference. When I got such a treasure as Lucette, I just told her to take complete charge, make him attend his own affairs, and not try being a nursery maid. It really isn't done these days. Leslie closed her lips, moving forward until she reached the space where the ragged boys and the fringed girls floated their white banners, where the lacy yellow and lavender blooms caressed each other. There on the highest place she could select, across a moss-covered log, she spread the waterproof sheet and, seating herself, motioned Mrs. Minturn to do the same. She reached for the music and, opening it, ran over the score. Her finger paused on the note she had whistled, while with eager face she sat waiting. Mrs. Minturn dropped into an attitude of tense listening. The sun began dissipating the gray mists and heightening the exquisite tints of all sides. Every green imaginable was there, from palest silver to the deepest, darkest shades, all dew-wet, rankly growing, gold-tinted and showing clearer every minute. Gradually, Mrs. Minturn relaxed, made herself comfortable as possible, then turned to the orchids of an open space. The color flushed and faded on her tired face. She nervously rolled the moccasin stem in her fingers, or looked long at the delicate flower. She was thinking so intently that Leslie saw she was neither seeing the swamp nor hearing the bird. It was then that a little gray singer straying through the tamarack sent a wireless to his mate in the bushes of borderland, in which he wished to convey to her all there was in his heart about the wonders of spring, the joy of mating, the love of her and their nest. He waited a second, then tucking his tail, swelled his throat and made sure he had done his best. At the first measure, Leslie thrust the sheet before Mrs. Minturn, pointing to the place. 
Instantly the woman scanned the score, then leaned forward listening. As the bird flew, Leslie faced Mrs. Minturn with questioning eyes. She cried softly, He did it! Perfectly! If I hadn't heard, I never would have believed. There is another that can do this from Verde's Traviata. Leslie whistled the notes. Get the strain in your mind, and we may hear him also. Again they waited. Leslie realized that Mrs. Minturn was not listening, and would have to be recalled if the bird sang. Leslie sat silent. The same bird sang, and others. But to the girl had come the intuition that Mrs. Minturn was having her hour in the garden. So wisely she remained silent. After an interminable time, she arose, making her way forward as far as she could penetrate and still see the figure of the woman, then hunting an old stump, climbed upon it and did some thinking herself. At last she returned to the motionless figure. Mrs. Minturn was leaning against the tamarack's scraggy trunk, her head resting on a branch, lightly sleeping. A rivulet staining her cheeks from what each eye showed where slow tears had slipped from under her closed lids, after she had been too unconscious to dry them. Leslie's heart ached with pity. She thought she had never seen anyone seem so sad, so alone, so punished for sins of inheritance and rearing. She sat beside Mrs. Minturn, waiting until she awakened. "'Why, I must have fallen asleep,' she cried. "'For a minute,' said Leslie. "'But I feel as if I had been rested soundly a whole night,' said Mrs. Minturn. "'I'm so refreshed. "'And there goes that bird again. "'Birdie to take his notes. "'Who would have ever thought of it? "'Leslie, did you bring any lunch? "'I'm famished.' "'We must go back to the car,' said Leslie.' They spread the waterproof sheet on the ground where it would be bordered with daintily traced partridge berry and white-lined plantain leaves, and sitting on it ate their lunch. Leslie did what she could to interest Mrs. Minturn and cheer her, but at last the lady said, Thank you, dear, you are very good to me, but you can't entertain me today. Some other time we'll come back and bring the scores you suggest and see what we can really hear from these birds. But today I've got the battle of my life to fight. Something is coming. I should be in a measure prepared. And as I don't know what to expect, it takes all the brains I have to figure things out. You don't know, Mrs. Minturn? asked Leslie. No, she said wearily. I know James hates the life I lead. He thinks my time wasted. I know he's a disappointed man because he thought when he married me he could cut me out of everything worthwhile in the world. "'and set me to waiting on him and nursing his children. "'Every single thing I have done since, or wanted, or had, "'has been a disappointment to him. "'I know now he never would have married me "'if he hadn't figured he was going to make me over, "'shape me and my life to suit his whims, "'and throw away my money to please his fancies. "'He has been utterly discontented since Elizabeth was born. "'Why, Leslie, we haven't lived together since then.' He said, if I was going to persist in bringing orphans into the world, babies I wouldn't mother myself or allow him to father, there would be no more children. I laughed at him because I didn't think he meant it, but he did. So that ended even a semblance of content. Half the time I don't know where he is or what he's doing. He seldom knows where I am. If we appear together, it is accidental. I thought I had my mind made up to leave him, and soon... But what you say, coupled with doubts I had myself, have set me to thinking till I don't know. I hate a scandal. You know how careful I always have been. All my closest friends have jeered me for a prude. There isn't a flaw he can find. There has been none. Certainly not, said Leslie. Everyone knows that. Leslie, you don't know, do you? asked Mrs. Minturn. He didn't say anything to Bruce, did he? You want an honest answer? questioned Leslie. "'Of course I do,' cried Mrs. Minturn. "'Douglas did tell me, in connection with Mr. Minturn "'joining the Brotherhood and taking a gammon from the streets into his office, "'that he said he was scarcely allowed to see his own sons, "'not to exercise the slightest control, "'so he was going to try his theories on a little brother. "'But Douglas wouldn't mention it only to me, "'and of course I wouldn't repeat it to anyone. 
Mr. Minturn seemed to feel that Douglas thought it was peculiar for a man having sons to take so much pains with a newsboy. They're great friends, so he said that much to Bruce. He said that much, scoffed Mrs. Minturn. Well, even so, that is very little compared with what you said about him to me, retorted Leslie. You shouldn't complain on that score. I suppose in your eyes I shouldn't complain about anything, said Mrs. Minturn. A world of things, Mrs. Minturn, but not the ones you do, said Leslie. Oh, cried Mrs. Minturn. I think your grievance is that you were born in and reared for society, said Leslie. And in your extremity it has failed you. I believe I can give you more help today than any woman of your age in intimate association. That's true, Leslie, quite true, exclaimed Mrs. Minturn eagerly. And I need help. Oh, I do. You poor soul, you, comforted Leslie. Turn where you belong. Turn to your own blood. My mother would jeer me for a weakling, said Mrs. Minturn. She has urged me to divorce James ever since Elizabeth was born. I didn't mean your mother, said Leslie. I meant closer relatives. I meant your husband and sons. My husband would probably tell me he had lost all respect for me, while my sons would very likely pull my hair and kick my shins if I knelt to them for sympathy, said Mrs. Minturn. They are perfect little animals. Oh, Mrs. Minturn, cried Leslie, amazed. Then you simply must take them in charge and save them. They are so fine-looking, while you're their mother. You are. It means giving up life as I have always known it, just about everything, said Mrs. Minturn. Look at yourself now, said Leslie. I should think you would be glad to give up your present state. Leslie, do you think it wrong to gather those orchids? I think it unpardonable sin to exterminate them, answered Leslie. If you have any reason for wanting a few and merely gather the flowers, leaving the roots to spread and bloom another year, I should say take them. Will you wait in the car until I go back, she asked. I will go with you, offered Leslie. But I wish to be alone, said Mrs. Minturn. You're not afraid you won't become lost? I am not afraid, and I will not lose myself, said Mrs. Minturn. Must I hurry? Take all the time you want, said Leslie. It was mid-afternoon when she returned, her hands filled with a dripping moss ball in which she had embedded the stems of a mass of feathery pink fringed orchids. Her face was flushed with tears, but her eyes were bright, her step quick and alert. Leslie, what do you think I'm going to do? she cried. Then, without awaiting a reply, I'm going to ask James to go with me to take these to Elizabeth. "'to beg him to forgive my neglect of her, "'to pledge the rest of my life to him and the boys.' "'Leslie caught Mrs. Minturn in her arms. "'Oh, you darling!' she exulted. "'Oh, you brave, wonderful girl!' "'After all, it's no more than fair,' Mrs. Minturn said. "'I have had everything my way since we were married, "'and I did love James. "'He's the only man I have ever really wanted. "'Leslie, he will forgive me and start over, won't he?' "'He'll be at your feet,' cried Leslie. "'Fortunately, I have decided to be at his,' said Mrs. Minturn. "'I've reached the place where I will even wipe James Jr.'s nose and dress Malcolm, "'and fix James's stud if it will help me to sleep, "'and have only a tinge of what you seem to be running over with. "'Leslie, you are the most joyous soul I know.' "'You see, I never had to think about myself,' said Leslie. "'Daddy always thought for me.' "'so there was nothing left for me to spend my time and thought on but him. "'It was a beautiful arrangement. "'Leslie, this is your car. "'But won't you, dear, drive fast?' begged Mrs. Minturn. "'Of course, Nellie,' exclaimed the girl. "'Leslie, will you stand by me and show me the way all you can?' "'asked Mrs. Minturn anxiously. "'I'll lose every friend I have got. "'My house must be torn down and built up from the basement on a new system as to management.' "'and I haven't any idea how to do it. "'Oh, I hope James can help me. "'You may be sure James will know and can help you,' comforted Leslie. "'You'll be leaving for the seashore in a few days. "'Install a complete new retinue and begin all fresh. "'Half the servants you keep, really competent and interested in their work, "'would make you far more comfortable than you are now.' "'Yes, I think that too,' agreed Mrs. Minturn eagerly. 
Some way I feel as if I were turning against Lucette. I never want to see her again after I tell her to go. Not that I know what I shall do without her. The boys will probably burn down the house, and where I'll find a woman who will tolerate them, I don't know. Employ a man until you get control, suggested Leslie. They are both old enough. Hire a man and explain all you want to him. If you can't find a woman, they'd be afraid of a man. Afraid, cried Mrs. Minturn. They're afraid of Lucette. I can't understand it. I wonder if James... Poor James, laughed Leslie. Honestly, Nellie, don't impose too much of your... your work on him. Undertake it yourself. Show him what a woman you are. Great heavens, Leslie, you don't know what you're saying, cried Mrs. Minturn. My only hope lies in deceiving him. If I showed him the woman I am, as I saw myself back there in that swamp an hour ago, he'd take one look and strangle me for the public good. How ridiculous, exclaimed Leslie. Why must a woman always rush from one extreme to the other? Choose a middle course and keep it. That's what I am telling you I must do, said Mrs. Minturn. Leslie, it is wonderful how I feel. I'm almost flying. Do you honestly think it is possible that there is going to be something new, something interesting, something really worthwhile in the world for me? I know it, said Leslie. Such interest, such novelty, such joy as you have never experienced. With that hope in her heart, her eyes filled with excitement, Nellie Minturn rang her bell, ran past her footman, and hurried up the stairs. She laid her flowers on a table, summoned her maid, then began throwing off her hat and outer clothing. Do you know if Mr. Minturn is here? she asked the instant the girl appeared. Yes, he began the maid. Never mind what he. Get out the prettiest, simplest dress I own and the most becoming, she ordered. Something white with a trace of modesty about it, if I have it. Be quick. Can't you see him in a hurry? Mrs. Minturn, I think you will thank me for telling you there is an awful row in the library, said the maid. An awful row? Mrs. Minturn paused. Yes, I think they are killing Lucette, explained the maid. She's shrieked bloody murder two or three times. Who? What do you mean? demanded Mrs. Minturn. She slipped on the bathrobe she had picked up and stood holding it together, gazing at the maid. Mr. Minturn came in a few seconds ago with two men. One was a park policeman we know. They went into the library and sent for Lucette. There she goes again. Is there any way I could see, could hear what is going on without being seen? There's a door to the den from the back hall, and that leads to the library, suggested the maid. You'd have a chance there. Show me. Help me, begged Mrs. Minturn. As they passed the table, the orchids hanging over the edge caught on the trailing robe and started to fall. Mrs. Minturn paused to push them back, then studied the flowers an instant and catching up the bunch carried it along. She closed the den door after her without a sound, and creeping beside the wall hid behind the door curtain and peeped into the library. There were two men who evidently were a detective and a policeman. She saw Lucette backed against the wall, her hands clenched, her eyes wild with fear. She saw her husband's back, and on the table beside him a little box open, its wrappings near, and its contents terrifying the woman, as no doubt it would her when he turned. To sum up, then, said Mr. Minturn, in tones she never before had heard, I can put on oath this man who will be forced to tell what he witnessed or be impeached by others who saw it at the time, and are ready to testify to what he said. I can produce the boy who came to tell me the part he took in it. I have the affidavit and have just come from the woman who interfered and followed you here in an effort to save Elizabeth. I have this piece of work in my hands, done by one of the greatest scientists and two of the best surgeons living. Although you shrink from it, I take pleasure in showing it to you. This ragged seam is an impress of the crack you made in a tiny skull lying in a vault out at Forest Hill. He paused, holding a plaster cast before the woman. It's a little bit of a thing, he said deliberately. She was a tiny creature to have been done to death at your hands. I hope you will see that small pink face as I see it and feel the soft hair in your fingers. And, after all, I can't go on with that. 
but I am telling you and showing you exactly what you are facing because you must go from this house with these men. Your things will be sent. You must leave this city and this country on the boat they take you to, and where you go you will be watched. If you ever dare take service handling a child again, I shall have you promptly arrested and forced to answer for the cold-blooded murder of my little daughter. Live you must, I suppose, but not longer by the torture of children. Go before I strangle you as you deserve. How Mrs. Minturn came to be standing beside her husband, she never afterward knew, only that she was, pulling down his arm to stare at the white cast. Then she looked up at him and said simply, But Lucette didn't murder her. It was I. I was her mother. I knew she was beaten. I knew she was abused. I didn't stop my pleasure to interfere, lest I should lose a minute by having to see to her myself. A woman did come to me, and a boy. I knew they were telling the truth. I didn't know it was so bad, but I knew it must have been dreadful to bring them. I had my chance to save her. I went to her as the woman told me to. And because she was quiet, I didn't even turn her over. I didn't run a finger across her little head. I didn't call a surgeon. I preferred an hour of pleasure to taking the risk of being disturbed. I am quite as guilty as Lucette. Have them take me with her. James Minturn stepped back, gazing at his wife. Then he motioned the men toward the door. So with the woman they left the room. Lucette just had her sentence, he said. Now for yours. Words are useless. I am leaving your house with my sons. They are my sons, and with the proof I hold, you will not claim them. If you do, you will not get them. I am taking them to the kind of a house I deem suitable for them, and to such care as I can provide. I shall keep them in my presence constantly as possible until I see just what harm has been done and how to remedy what can be changed. I shall provide such teachers as I see fit for them and devote the remainder of my life to them. I am taking them and nothing but them. They are mine, and before God I claim them. All I ask of you is to spare them the disgrace of forcing me to prove my right to them, for ever having them realize just what happened to their sister and your part in it. She held the flowers toward him. I... I brought these, she began, then paused. You won't believe me if I should tell you. You are right, perfectly justified. Of course, I shall not bring this before the public. Go. At the door, he looked back. She had dropped into a chair beside This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 7 Peaches' Preference in Blessings. God ain't made a sweeter girl. And Lily, it keeps my heart a whirl. If I was to tell an awful whopper, I'd get took by the cross old copper. Mickey. Thus chanted Mickey at his door, his hands behind him. Peaches stretched both hers toward him as usual. But he stood still and swung in front of him a beautiful doll for a little sick girl. A baby doll in a long snowy dress and a lace cap. It held outstretched arms, but was not heavy enough to tire small wavering hands. Peaches lunged forward until only Mickey's agility saved her from falling. He tossed the doll on the bed and caught the child. The lump in his throat so big his voice was strained as he cried, Why, you silly thing! With her safe, he again pro-offered it. Peaches shut her eyes and buried her face on his breast. Oh, don't let me see it. Take it away. Why, Lily, I thought you'd be crazy about it, marveled Mickey. Honest, I did. The prettiest lady sent it to you, let me tell you. Giving them up is worser'n never having them. 
Take it away, wailed Peaches. Why, Lily, said Mickey, I never was stuck up about my looks, but I didn't suppose I looked so like a granny that you'd think that of me. Don't I seem man enough to take care of a little flowersy girl without selling her doll? There's where I got your granny skinned a mile. I don't booze and I never will. Mother hammered that into me. Now look, what a pretty it is. You'll just love it. I wouldn't take it. I'd lay out anybody who would. Come on now, negotiate it. Get your flippers on it. He was holding the child gently and stroking her tumbled hair. When he put her from him to see her face, Mickey was filled with envy because he had been forced to admit the gift was not from him. He shut his lips tight, but his face was grim as he studied Peach's flushed cheeks and wet eyes, and noticed the shaking eagerness for the doll she was afraid to look at. He reached over and put it into her arms. Then piled the pillows so she could see better, talking the while to comfort her. Course it's yours. Course nobody is going to take it. Course you shall always have it, and maybe a grown-up lady doll by Christmas. Who knows? In utter content, Peaches sank against the pillows, watching Mickey while she gripped the baby. Thank you, Mickey lovest," she said. "Oh, thank you for this precious child." You got to thank a lady, about twice my height, with dark hair, pink cheeks, and beautiful dresses. She's got a big rest house, a lover man, and an automobile. I wish you could see Lily," he said. "If I was on the rags in the corner, I'd have this child, wouldn't I?" scoffed Peaches, still clutching the doll, but her gaze on Mickey. What happened was that she liked you for something and give you the baby, so you brought it to me. Thank you, Mickey, for this precious child. Peaches lifted her lips. Mickey met them more obsessed than before. Then she turned away, clasping the doll. Mickey could see the tears were slipping from under the child's closed lids, but her lips were on the doll's face, so he knew she was happy. He stole out to bring in his purchases for supper, and begin his evening work. He gave Peaches a drink, her daily rub, cleaned the room without making dust as the nurse had shown him, and brought water. He shook his fist at the faucet. Now hereafter, nicks on the butting in, he said belligerently. Maybe I couldn't have got that doll, but I could have got one she'd have liked just as well, and earned it extra in one day. There's one feature of the Big Brother business that I was a little too fast on. He's the finest man that ever wanted me, while his rooms are done shameful. I could put a glitter on them so he could see himself with the things he has to work with, and he said any time I wanted it, the job was mine. It wouldn't be cheating him any if I took it, and did better work than he's getting, and my steady papers are sure in the morning. That would be sure in the afternoon. And if I cut ice with a buzz saw, I might get through in time to pick up something else before coming home. And being sure beats hoping a mile, yes, ten miles. Maybe I'll investigate that business a little further, 'cause hereafter I provide for my own family. See, Lily was grand about it. Gee, she's smart to think it out that way, all in a minute. But by and by, she's going to have a lot of time to think. Then she'll be remembering about the lady I got to tell her of, stead of me, as she should. Guess I'll run my own family. I'll take another look at cleaning that office. There ain't any lapdog business in a straight job, and being paid for it if you do it well. Mickey turned the faucet and marched up the stairs with head high and shoulders square. His face was grave while he worked, but Peaches was so happy she did not notice. When he came with her supper, she kissed the doll, then insisted on Mickey kissing it also. Such was the state of his subjugation. He commenced with, "Ah," and ended up by doing as he was told. He even helped lay the doll beside Peaches exactly as her fancy dictated, and covered it with her sheet, putting its hands outside. 
Peaches was enchanted. She insisted on offering it a drink of her milk first, and was so tremulously careful lest she spill a drop that Mickey had to guide her hand. He promised to wash the doll's dress if she did have an accident, or when it became soiled, and bowed his head meekly to the crowning concession by sitting on the edge of the bed, after he had finished his evening work, and holding the doll where she could see it, exactly as instructed, while he told her about his wonderful adventure. "'Began yesterday,' explained Mickey. "'You know I told you there was going to be a surprise. "'Well, this is it. "'When the lady gave me the ribbons for you, "'she told me to come back tonight and get it. "'Of course, I could have got it myself. "'I would have got it for Christmas.' "'Oh, Mickey, love us, does Christmas come here?' "'Surest thing you know,' said Mickey. "'A fat stocking, full of every single thing the nurse lady tells Santa Claus, "'a little, a little flowersy girl that ain't so strong yet may have, "'and a big lady doll and a picture book.' "'But I never had no stocking,' said Peaches. "'Well, you'll have by that time,' promised Mickey.' "'Oh, Mickey, I'm so glad. "'I want to say a prayin's at you found me "'stead of some other kid,' exalted Peaches. "'Yes, miss, and that's one thing I forgot,' said Mickey. "'We'll begin tonight. "'You ain't a properly raised lady unless you say your prayers. "'I know the one she taught me. "'Tonight will be a good time, "'cause you'll be so thankful for your pretty ribbons and your baby.' "'that you'll just love to say a real thankful prayer. "'Mickey, I ain't gonna say prayin's. "'I just said I was,' explained Peaches. "'I never said none for Granny, "'cause she only told me to when she was drunk. "'No, and you never had a box of ribbons "'to make you look so sweet, "'or a baby to stay with you while I'm gone. "'If you ain't thankful enough for them to say your prayers, "'you shouldn't have em, nor any more.' "'nor Christmas, nor anything, but just, just like you was.' "'Peaches blinked, gasped, digested the statements, and yielded wholly. "'I guess I'll say them,' she conceded. "'Mickey, when shall I?' "'Tonight, before you go to sleep,' said Mickey. "'Now tell me about the baby,' urged Peaches. "'Sure, I was. "'I could have got it myself, just like I was telling you.' "'But the ones in the stores have such funny clothes. "'They look so silly. "'I knew I couldn't wash them, "'and of course they'd get dirty like everything does. "'And we couldn't have them dirty. "'So I thought it over, and I said to Mickey Boy, "'If the Joy Lady is so anxious to get the baby "'and sew its clothes herself, "'why, I'll just let her. "'So I did let her, but it took some time to make them, "'so I had to wait to bring it till tonight.' I was to go to her house after it, and when I got there, she was coming home in her car from a long drive. And, gee, Lily, I wish you could have seen her. She's the prettiest lady, the most joyous lady I ever saw. Prettier than the nurse lady, asked Peaches. Well, different, explained Mickey. Nurse lady is all gold like the end of Sunrise Alley at four o'clock in the morning. This lady has dark hair and eyes. Both of them are as pretty as women are made, but they are not the same. Nurse lady is when the sun comes up and warms and comforts the world, but the doll lady is like all the stars twinkling in the moonlight on the park lake and music playing and everybody dancing. The doll lady is joy, just the joy lady. Gee, Lily, you should have seen her face when the car stopped while I was coming down the steps. "'Was she so glad to see you?' asked Peaches. "'Twasn't me,' said Mickey. "'Twas on her face before she saw me. "'She was just gleaming and shining and spilling over joy. "'She isn't the kind that would dance on the street, "'nor where it ain't nice to dance. "'But she was dancing inside just the same. "'She pulled me right into that big fine car, "'so I sat on the seat with her, "'and we went sailing and skating and flying along, "'and all the boys guyin' me, but I didn't care. "'I like to ride in her car. "'I never rode in a car like that before. "'She went a whizzin' right to the office of the big man, "'where maybe I'll work, 
"'I guess I'll go see him tomorrow. "'I got a hankerin' for knowin' what I'm going to do "'and where I'm going to be paid for it. "'Well, she went spinning there, and she said, "'You, wait a minute!' "'Then she ran in, and pretty soon out she came with him. "'His name is Mr. Douglas Bruce, "'and I guess it would be a little closer "'what she'd think right if I'd use it. "'And hers he calls her by is Leslie. "'Ain't that pretty?' "'When he says Leslie, sounds as if he kissed the name as it came through. "'Honest it does. "'I'll bet he says it just like you say Lily.' "'I wonder now,' grinned Mickey. "'Well, he came out, and what she told him set him crazy, too. "'They just talked a streak, but he shook hands with me, and he, she said, "'You tell the driver where to go, Mickey.' "'And I said, "'Go where, miss?' "'And she said, "'To take you home.' And I said, You don't need. And she said, I'd like to. And I saw she didn't care what she did, so I just sent him to the end of the car line and saved my nickel. And then I come on here, and both of them... What? asked Peaches eagerly. Mickey changed the wanted to come to see you that had been on his lips. If he told Peaches that, and she asked for them to come, and they came and then thought he was not taking care of her right, and took her away from him, then what? Said goodbye the nicest, he substituted, and I'm going to see if she wants any more letters carried as soon as my papers are gone in the morning. And if she does, I'm going to take them, and if one of them is to him, I'm going to ask him more about the job he offered me, and if we can agree, I'm going to take it. Then I can buy you what you want myself, because I'll know every day exactly what I'll have, and when the rent is counted out, and for the papers, all the rest will be for eating, and what you need, and to save for your new back. My, I wished I had it now, cried Peaches. I wished I could have rode in that car, too. Wasn't it perfectly grand, Mickey? Grand as any king, said Mickey. What is a king? asked Peaches. One of the big bosses across the ocean, explained Mickey. You'll learn them when you get farther with your lessons. They own most all the money and the finest houses and all the people. Just own them. Own them so they can tell good friends to go to it and kill each other, even relations. And do they do it? marveled Peaches. Sure they do it, cried Mickey. Why, they're doing it right now. I could bring a paper and read you things that would make you so sick you couldn't sit up. What kind of things, Mickey? About kings making all the fathers kill each other and burn down each other's houses and blow up the cities and eat all the food themselves and leave the mothers with no home and no groceries, no stove and no beds, and the bullets flying and the cities burning and no place to go and the children starving and dying. Gee, I ain't ever going to tell you any more, Lily. It's too awful. You'd feel better not to know. Honest, you would. Wish I hadn't told you anything about it at all. Where's your slate? We got to do lessons for it gets so dark and we get so sleepy we can't see. Peaches proudly handed him the slate. In wavering lines and tremulous curves ran her first day's work alone. Over erasures and with relinings in hills and deep depressions, which it is possible Mickey read because he knew what it had to be, he proudly translated, Mickey lovest. Then the lines of the night before, then cow and milk. And then Mickey whooped because he faintly recognized an effort to draw a picture of the cow and the milk bottle. Grand, Lily, he cried. Gee, you're the smartest kid I ever knew. You'll know all I do for long, and then you'll need your back, so you can get ready to go to the young lady's seminary. What's that? interestedly asked Peaches. A school where other nice girls go, and where you learn all that I don't know to teach you, said Mickey. I won't go, said Peaches. Oh, yes, you will, miss, said Mickey, because you're my family, so you'll do as I say. Will you go with me? asked Peaches. Sure, I'll take you there in a big o uh, Oh, I don't know as I will either. We'll have to save our money if we both go. 
We'll go on a street car and walk up Grand Avenue among the trees, and I'll take you in, see if your room is right and everything, and all the girls will like you cause you're so smart, and your hair's so pretty, and then I'll go to a boys' school close by, and learn how to make poetry pieces that beat any in the papers. Every time I make a new one, I'll come and ask, "Is Miss Lily, Miss Lily Peaches, gee kid, what is your name?" Mickey stared at Peaches while she stared back at him. "I don't know," she said. "Do you care, Mickey?" "What was your granny's?" asked Mickey. "I don't know," answered Peaches. "Was she your mother's mother?" persisted Mickey. "Yes," replied Peaches. "Did you ever see your father?" Mickey went on. I don't know nothing about fathers," she said. Mickey heaved a deep sigh. "Well, that's over," he said. "I know something about fathers. I know a lot. I know that you are no worse off not knowing who your father was than to know he was so mean that you're glad he's dead. Your way leaves you hoping that he was just awful nice and got killed or was taken sick or something." My way, there ain't no doubts in your mind. You are plumb sure he wasn't decent. Don't you bother none about fathers. My, I'm glad, Mickey cried, Peaches joyously. So am I," said Mickey emphatically. "We don't want any fathers coming here to butt in on us. Just as we get your back, Carol, and you ready to start school. Can I go without a name, Mickey?" asked Peaches. "Of course not," said Mickey. You have to put your name on a roll the first thing, then you must be introduced to the head lady and all the girls. What'll I do, Mickey? Anxiously inquired Peaches. Well, for smart as you are in some spots, you're awful dumb in others. Commented Mickey. What'll you do, Saphead? Gee, ain't you mine? Ain't you my family? Ain't my name good enough for you? Your name will be Miss Lily Peaches O'Halloran. That's a name good enough for a queen lady. What's a queen? Inquired Peaches. Wife of those kings we was talking about. Sure, said Peaches. None of them have a nicer name than that. Mickey is my bow straight. Nah, it ain't, said Mickey. Take the baby till I fix it. It's about slipped off. There, that's better. Mickey, let me see, suggested Peaches. Mickey brought the mirror. She looked so long he grew tired and started to put it back, but she clung to it. Just lay it on the bed, she said. No,、nah, I don't, Miss Chicken O'Halloran. He said, "Mirrors cost money, and if you pull the sheet in the night and slide ours off, and it breaks, we got seven years of bad luck coming, and we are nix on changing the luck we have right now. It's good enough for us." Think of them Belgian kids where the kings are making the fathers fight. This goes where it belongs. Then you take your drink, let me beat your pillow, and you fix your baby, and then we'll say our prayers and go to sleep. Mickey replaced the mirror and carried out the program he had outlined. When he came to the prayer, he ordered Peaches to shut her eyes, fold her hands, and repeat after him. Now I lay me down to sleep. Peaches' eyes opened. Oh, is it a poetry prayer, Mickey? She asked. Yes, kind of one. Say it, answered Mickey. Peaches obeyed, repeating the words lingeringly and in her sweetest tones. Mickey thrilled to his task. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. He proceeded. What's my soul, Mickey? She asked. The very nicest thing inside of you, explained Mickey. Go on. Like my heart? Questioned Peaches. Yes, only nicer," said Mickey. "Shut your eyes and go on." Peaches obeyed. "If I should die before I wake," continued Mickey. Peaches' eyes flashed open. She drew back in horror. "I won't!" she cried. "I won't say that. That's what happened to Granny, and I saw. She was the awfulest. And then the men came. I won't." Mickey opened his eyes, looking at Peaches, his lips in a set line, his brow wrinkled in thought. Well, I don't know what they went and put that in for," he said indignantly, scaring little kids into fits. It's all right when you don't know what it means, but when kids have been through what we have, it's different. I wouldn't say it either. You wait a minute; I can beat that myself. Let me think. Now, hmm, I got it. Shut your eyes and go on. 
"'If I should come to live with thee?' "'Well, I ain't going,' said Peaches flatly. "'I'm going to stay right here with you. "'I'd a lot rather than anywhere, "'King's house or anywhere.' "'I never saw such a kid,' wailed Mickey. "'I think that's pretty. "'I like it heaps. "'Come on, Peaches, be good. "'Listen.' "'The next line goes, "'Open loving arms to shelter me "'like the big white Jesus at the cathedral door. "'Come on now.' "'I won't. "'I'm going to live right here, "'and I don't want no big white Jesus arms. "'I want yours. "'If an I go anywhere, "'you got to lift me yourself "'and let me take my precious child along.' "'Lily, you're the worst kid I ever saw,' said Mickey. "'No, you ain't either. I know a lot worse than you. "'You just don't understand. "'I guess you better pray something you do understand. "'Let me think again. "'Now try this. "'Keep me through the starry night.' "'Sure, I just love that,' crooned Peaches. "'Wake me safe with sunrise bright,' prompted Mickey, "'and the child smiling repeated the words.' "'Now come some blesses,' said Mickey. "'I don't know just how to manage em. "'You haven't a father to bless, "'and your mother got was coming to her long ago. "'Blessin' her now wouldn't help any if it wasn't pleasant. "'Same with your granny, only more recent. "'I'll tell you, now I know. "'Bless the sunshine lady for all the things to make me comfortable, "'and bless the moonshine lady for the ribbons and the doll.' Ah! cried Peaches, staring up at him in rebellion. "'Now you go on, Miss Chicken,' ordered Mickey, losing patience. "'And then you end with amen, which means so be it, or make it happen that way, or something like that. "'Go to it now.' "'Peaches shut her eyes, refolded her hands, and lifted her chin. "'After a long pause, Mickey was on the point of breaking. "'She said sweetly, "'Bless Mickey lovest, and bless him, and bless him million times.' "'and bless him for the bed and the window, "'and bless him for finding the nurse lady "'and bringing the ribbons and the doll, "'and bless him for the slate and the teachings, "'and bless him for everything I just love and love. "'Amen. Hard.' "'When Peaches opened her eyes, "'she found Mickey watching her, "'a commingling of surprise and delight on his face. "'Then he bent over and laid his cheek against hers.' "'You fool little kid,' he whispered tenderly. "'You precious fool little flowersy kid. "'You make a fellow love you till he nearly busts inside. "'Kiss me good night, Lily.' "'He slipped the ribbon from her hair, straightened the sheets, "'arranged as the nurse had taught him, "'laid the doll as Peaches desired, "'and then screened by the foot of the bed, "'undressed and stretched himself on the floor. The same moon that peeped in the window to smile at her broadest at peaches and her precious child, and touched Mickey's face to wondrous beauty. At that hour also sent shining bars of light across the veranda where Leslie sat and told Douglas Bruce about the trip to the swamp. I never knew I could be so happy over anything in all this world that didn't include you and Daddy. But of course this does, in a way, you at least. "'Much as you think of, and are with Mr. Minturn, "'you can't help being glad that joy has come to him at last. "'Why don't you say something, Douglas? "'I have been effervescing ever since you came to the office after me, "'and I find now that the froth is off. "'I'm getting to the solid facts in the case. "'And, well, I don't want to say a word to spoil your joyous day, "'but I'm worried, bringer of song.' "'Worried?' cried Leslie. "'Why?' "'You don't think he wouldn't be pleased. "'You don't think he might not be responsive, do you? "'Think of the past years of neglect, insult, and humiliation,' suggested Douglas. "'Think of the future years of loving care, reparation, and joy,' commented Leslie. "'Please, God, they outweigh,' said Douglas. "'Of course they will. "'It must be a few things I've seen lately that keep puzzling me. "'What have you seen, Douglas?' questioned Leslie. "'Deals in real estate,' he answered. "'Consultations with detectives and policemen, scientists and surgeons. "'But what could that have to do with Nellie Minturn?' "'Nothing, I hope,' said Douglas. "'But there has been a grimness about Minturn lately, "'a going ahead with jaws set that looks ugly for what opposes him. "'And you tell me they have been in opposition ever since they married.' "'I can't put him from my thoughts as I saw him last. "'And I can't her,' said Leslie. 
She was a lovely picture as she came across the silver moss carpet. You know that gray green. Douglas, her face flushed, her eyes wet, her arms full of those perfectly beautiful lavender pink fringed orchids. She's a handsome woman, dearest, and she never looked quite so well to me as when she came picking her way beneath the dark tamarack boughs. She was going to ask him to go with her to take her flowers to Elizabeth, and over that little white casket she intended. Why, Douglas, he couldn't. He simply couldn't. Suppose he had something previously worked out that cut her off. Oh, Douglas, what makes you think such a thing? What Minturn said to me this morning with such bitterness on his face and in his voice as I have never before encountered in man, Douglas answered. He said, prompted Leslie, "This is my last day as a laughing stock for my fellow man. Tomorrow I shall hold up my head." Why didn't you tell me that before? Demanded Leslie. Didn't realize until just now that you and she hadn't seen him, that you were acting on presumption. I'm going to call her," cried Leslie. "I wouldn't advise Douglas. Why not? After as far as she went today, if she had anything she wanted you to know, wouldn't she feel free to call you? You're right," conceded Leslie. "Even after today, for me to call would be an intrusion. Let's not talk of it any further. Don't you wish we could take a peep at Mickey carrying the doll to the little sick girl? I surely do," answered Douglas. What do you think of him, Leslie? Great, simply great," replied the girl. Douglas, you should have heard him educate me on the doll question. How? He asked interestedly. From the first glimpse I had of him, the thought came to me, "That's Douglas's little brother." She explained. When you telephoned and said you were sending him to me, just one idea possessed me: to get what you wanted. Almost without thought at all, I tried the first thing he mentioned, which happened to be a little sick neighbor girl. He told me about. All girls like a doll, and I had one dressed for a birthday gift for a namesake of mine, and time a plenty to fix her another. I brought it to Mickey and thought he'd be delighted. Was he rude? Inquired Douglas anxiously. Not in the least, she answered. Only casual. Merely made me see how thoughtless and unkind and positively vulgar my idea of pleasing a poor child was. Leslie, you shock me! Exclaimed Douglas. I mean every word of it," said the girl. "Now listen to me. It is thoughtless to offer a gift headlong without considering a second, is it not? Merely impulsive," replied Douglas. Identically the same thing," declared Leslie. "Listen," I said. Without thought about suitability, I offered an extremely poor child the gift I had prepared for a very rich one. Mickey made me see in ten words that it would be no kindness to fill his little friend's head with thoughts that would sadden her heart with envy, make her feel all she lacked more keenly than ever, give her a gift that would breed dissatisfaction instead of joy. If that isn't vulgarity, what is? Mickey's Lily had no business with a doll so gorgeous. The very sight of it brings longing instead of comfort. It was unkind to offer a gift so big and heavy it would tire and worry her. There are some ideas there on giving, aren't there? Though said Leslie, Mickey took about three minutes to show me that Lily was satisfied as she was, so no one would thank me for awakening discontent in her heart. He measured off her size and proved to me that a small doll, that would not tire her to handle, would be suitable, and so dressed that its clothes could be washed and would be as plain as her own. Even further, once my brain began working, I saw that a lady doll with shoes and stockings to suggest outdoors and walking was not a kind gift to make a bedridden child. Douglas, after Mickey started me. I arose by myself to the point of seeing that a little cuddly baby doll, helpless as she, one that she could nestle and play with, lying in bed, would be the proper gift for Lily. Think of a newsy making me see that! Isn't he wonderful? You should have heard him making me see things," said Douglas. "Yours are faint and feeble to the ones he taught me. Refused me at every point and marched away, leaving me in utter rout." 
Outside, wanting you for my wife? More than anything else on earth, I wanted Mickey for my little brother. You have him, comforted the girl. The Lord arranged that. You remember he said all men are brothers. And wasn't it Tolstoy who wrote, If people would only understand that they are not the sons of some fatherland or other, nor of governments, but are sons of God? You and Mickey will get your brotherhood arranged to suit both of you some of these days. Exactly, conceded Douglas. But I wanted Mickey at hand now. I wanted him to come and go with me, to be educated with what I consider education. It will come yet, prophesied Leslie. Your ideas are splendid. I see how fine they are. The trouble is this. You had a plan mapped out at which Mickey was to jump. Mickey happened to have preconceived ideas on the subject, so he didn't jump. You wanted to be the king on the throne and stretch out a royal hand, laughed Leslie. You wanted to lift Mickey to your level and with the inherent fineness in him have him feel eternal love and gratitude toward you? That sounds different, but it is the real truth. And Mickey doesn't care to be a brother to kings. He doesn't perceive the throne even. He wants you to understand at the start that you will take as well as give. Refusing pay for tidying your office was his first inning. That me to you was great. I can see the accompanying gesture. It was the same one he used in demolishing my doll. Something vital and inborn. Something loneliness, work, the crowd and raw life have taught Mickey that we don't know. Learn all you can from him. I've had one good lesson. I'm receptive and ready for the next. Let's call the car and drive an hour. That will be pleasant, agreed Douglas. Anywhere in the suburbs to avoid the crowds was Leslie's order to her driver. Slowly, under traffic regulations, the car ran through the pleasant spring night. The occupants, talking without caring where they were, so long as they were together, in motion, and it was May. They were passing residences where city and country met. The dwellings of people city-bound, country determined. Homes where men gave so many hours to earning money, and then sped away in swift cars to train vines, prune trees, dig in warm earth, and make things grow. Such men now crossed green lawns and talked fertilizers, new annuals, tree surgery, and carried gifts of fragrant blooming things to their friends. Here the verandas were wide, and children ran from them to grassy playgrounds. On them, women read or sat with embroidery hoops or visited in small groups. Let's move, said Leslie. Let's coax Daddy to sell our place and come here. One wouldn't ever need to go summering. It's cool and pleasant always. I'd love it. There's a new house and a lawn under old trees to shelter playing children. Isn't it charming? Quite, but that small specimen seems refractory. Leslie leaned forward to see past him. In an open door stood a man clearly silhouetted against the light. Down the steps sped a screaming boy about nine. After him ran another five or six years older. When the child saw he would be overtaken, he headed straight for the street. As the pursuer's hand brushed him, he threw himself kicking and clawing. The elder boy hesitated, looking for an opening to find a hold. The car was half a block away when Leslie turned a white face to Douglas and gasped inarticulately. He understood something was wrong, so signaled the driver to stop. Turn and pass those children again, ordered Leslie. As the car went by slowly the second time, the child still fought. The boy stepped back, while James Minturn, with grim face, bent under the light, and by force took into his arms the twisting, fighting boy. Heaven help him! Cried Douglas. Not a sign of happy reconciliation there. Leslie tried to choke down her sobs. Oh, Nellie Minturn, poor woman! She wailed. So that's what he was doing, marvelled Douglas. A house he has built to suit himself, training his sons personally with the assistance of his little brother. That boy was William. I see him in Minturn's office every day. Oh, I think he might have given her a chance," protested Leslie. "Remember how she was reared. Think what a struggle it was for her even to contemplate trying to be different. 
"'Evidently she was too late,' said Douglas. "'He must have been gone before you returned from the swamp. "'I'm going back there and tell him a few things. "'I think he might have waited. "'Douglas, I'm afraid he did wait. "'She said he told her he wanted to talk with her when she came back. "'And, oh, Douglas, she said he had a small box, "'and he threatened to freeze her soul with its contents.' "'Douglas, what could he have had?' "'Freeze her soul? Let me think,' said Douglas. "'I met Professor Tickner and Dr. Wills coming from his office a few days ago, "'while well, he's just back from a trip that he didn't tell me he was taking. "'You mean Tickner the scientist? Wills the surgeon?' "'Yes,' answered Douglas. "'But those children, aren't they perfectly healthy? "'They look it.' "'Lord, Leslie,' cried Douglas, "'I have it. "'He has made good his threat. "'He has frozen her soul. "'What you want to do is go to her, Leslie. "'Douglas, tell me,' she demanded. "'I can't,' said Douglas. "'I may be mistaken. "'I think I'm not. "'But there is always a chance. "'Wait!' "'He leaned forward. "'Drive to the Minturn residence,' he ordered. "'They found a closed, dark pile of stone.' "'Go past that place where the children were again,' said Leslie. "'The upper story was quiet. "'Outlined by veranda lights, "'the massive form of James Minturn "'paced back and forth under the big trees. "'His hands clasped behind him, "'his head bowed, and he walked alone. "'Douglas, I'm going to speak to him. "'I'm going to tell him,' declared Leslie. "'But you're now conceding that she saw him,' "'Douglas pointed out. "'Then what have you to tell him that she would not?' If she couldn't move him with what she said, and while you don't know his side, what could you say to him? Nothing, she conceded. Precisely my opinion, said Douglas. Remember, Leslie, I'm a little ahead of you in this. You know her side. I know all you have told me of her. Also, I know what he has told me. Well, putting what I have seen and heard at the office, and him here with the boys... "'In a house she would consider too plebeian for words. "'No, Douglas, no, she's changed,' cried Leslie. "'Completely changed, I tell you. "'She said she would wipe Malcolm's nose and fix James's studs.' "'Mere figures of speech,' remarked Douglas. "'They meant she was ready to work with her own hands for happiness,' said Leslie indignantly. "'I think she's too late,' said Douglas.' "'I'm afraid she is one of the unhappiest women in the world tonight.' "'Douglas, it wrings my heart,' cried Leslie. "'Mine also, but what can we do?' he answered. "'For ten years she has persisted in having her way, you tell me. "'What could she have expected?' "'That he would have had some heart,' protested Leslie. "'That he would forgive when he was asked, as all of us are commanded to do.' "'Does it occur to you that he might have confronted her "'with something that prevented her from asking?' "'suggested Douglas. "'She may never have reached her flowers "'and her proposed concessions. "'What makes you think so?' queried Leslie. "'What I see and surmise, and a thing I know. "'What can I do?' asked Leslie. "'Nothing,' Douglas said with finality. "'If either of them wants you, they know where to find you. "'But you're tired now. Let's give the order for home.' "'Shan't sleep a week tonight,' prophesied Leslie. "'I was afraid of that,' exclaimed Douglas. "'There may be a message there for you that will be a comfort.' "'So there may be. Let's hurry,' urged the girl. "'There was. They found a brief penciled note. "'Dear Leslie, after today it was due you to send a word. "'You tried so hard, dear, and you gave me real joy for an hour. "'Then James carried out his threat.' He did all to me he intended, and more than he can ever know. I have agreed to him taking full possession of the boys, and going into a home such as he thinks suitable. They will be far better off, and since they scarcely know me, they can't miss me. Before you receive this, I shall have left the city. I can't state just now where I'm going, or what I shall do. You can realize a little of my condition. If ever you are tired of home life and faintly tempted to neglect it for society, use me for your horrible example. Goodbye, Nellie Minturn. Leslie read this aloud. 
"'It's a relief to know that much,' she said with a deep breath. "'I can't imagine myself ever being faintly tempted, but if I am, "'surely she is right about the horrible example. "'Douglas, whatever did James Minturn have in that box? "'I could tell you what I surmise, but so long as I don't know, I'd better not,' he answered. "'As our mutual friend Mickey would say, "'Nick's on the swell dames for me,' said Leslie determinedly. Thank God with all my heart, cried Doug. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter Chapter 8 Big Brother Try grin instead of grouch just one day and see if the whole world doesn't look better before night. Mickey I've no time to talk, said Douglas Bruce, as Mickey appeared the following day. My work seems too much for one man. Can you help me? Sure, said Mickey. "'wadding his cap into his back pocket. "'Then he rolled his sleeves a turn higher, "'lifted his chin a trifle, and stepped forward, ready for action. "'Say what?' "'It caught Douglas so suddenly that there was no time for concealment. "'He laughed heartily. "'That's good,' he cried. "'Mickey grinned in comradeship, even as his cheek flushed slightly. First, these letters to the box in the hall.' Next, Mickey queried as he came to the door. This package to the room of the clerk in the city hall, and bring back a receipt bearing his signature. Mickey saluted, laid the note inside the cover of a book, put it in the middle of the package, and a second later his gay whistle receded down the hall. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it, Douglas quoted. Mickey has been trained until he would make a good trainer himself. In one half the time the trip had taken the messenger boys Douglas was accustomed to employing, Mickey was back like the gulf in the forum demanding more. See what you can do for these rooms until the next errand is ready, suggested Douglas. Mickey gave the chambers a glance and began gathering up the morning papers. From them he advanced on the rugs and curtains and arrangement of furniture. "'Hand this check to the janitor,' said Douglas. "'Mickey started, and Douglas realized that in all probability the boy would not look at it. "'And Mickey, kindly ask him if two dollars was what I agreed to pay him for my extras this week,' he added. "'Sure,' said Mickey. "'Douglas would have preferred, yes, sir, but sure was a permanent ejaculation decorating the tip of Mickey's tongue. "'The man watched closely.' did not fail to catch the flash of interest and the lifting of the boy figure as he paused for instructions. When he returned, Douglas said casually, While I'm at it, I'll pay off my messenger service. Take this check to the address and bring a receipt for the amount. Mickey's comment came swiftly. Gee, that boy would be sore if he lost his job. Messenger service agency, Douglas said, busy at his desk. "'No boy would lose his job.' "'Oh!' exclaimed Mickey comprehendingly. "'His face lighted at the information. "'Next he carried a requisition for books to another city official "'and telephoned a neighboring café to deliver a pitcher of lemonade "'and some small cakes, "'and handed the boy who brought the order a dime. "'Why didn't you send me for that and save your silver?' "'I did not think,' answered Bruce.' "'Someone gets a tip. You might as well have had it.' "'I didn't mean me have it. I meant you save it.' "'Mickey,' said Douglas, "'you know perfectly well I can't take your time "'unless you accept from me what I am accustomed to paying other boys.' "'Letting others bleed you, you mean,' said Mickey indignantly. "'Why, I'd have been a glad to brought the juice for five. "'You never ought to paid more.' "'Should have paid more,' corrected Douglas.' 
"'Should have paid more,' repeated Mickey. "'Thanks.' "'Now try this,' said Douglas, filling two glasses. "'Tain't usual,' said Mickey. "'You drink that yourself, or save it for friends that may drop in.' "'Very well,' said Douglas. "'Of course you might have had it instead of the boy who comes after the pitcher. "'But if you don't like it—' "'All right, if it's that way,' agreed Mickey, picking up the glass which had been offered him. He retired to a window seat, enjoying the cool drink, and nibbled the cake, his eyes deeply thoughtful. When offered a second glass and cake, Mickey did not hesitate. Nope, he said conclusively, a fellow's head and heels work better when his stomach is running light. I can earn more not to load up with a lot of stuff. I eat at home when my work is finished. She showed me that. She showed you a good many things, didn't she? Sure, said Mickey. She was my mother, and we had to look out for ourselves. When you got nothing but yourself between you and the wolf, you learn to fly, and you keep your think tank in running order. She knew just what was coming to me, so she showed me, and every single thing she said has come, and then some. I see, said Douglas, a wise mother. Sure, agreed Mickey. "'But I guess it wouldn't have done either of us much good "'if I hadn't remembered and kept straight on doing what she taught me.' "'You're right, it wouldn't,' conceded Douglas. "'That's where I'm going to climb above some of the other fellows,' "'announced Mickey confidently. "'Either they didn't have mothers to teach them, "'or else they did and forget, "'or think the teaching wasn't worth anything. "'Now me, I know she was right. "'She always proved it. She'd been up against it longer than I had, and she knew. So I'm going to go right along doing as she said, and so I'll beat them and carry double at that. How double, Mickey? inquired Douglas. Mickey slowly shook his head. I didn't mean to say that, he explained. That was a slip. There's something, something I'm trying to do that costs more than it does to live. I'm bound to do it, so I gotta run light and keep my lamps polished for chances. What next, sir? Call 940X and order my car here, said Douglas. He bent over his papers to hide his face when from an adjoining room drifted Mickey's voice in clear enunciation and suave intonation. Mr. Douglas Bruce desires his car to be sent immediately to the Iroquois building. His mental comment was, the little scamp has drifted to street lingo when he lacked his mother to restrain him. He can speak a fairly clean grade of English now if he chooses. Next, briskly inquired Mickey. Now look here, said Douglas. This isn't a horse race. I earn my livings with my brains, not my heels. I must have time to think things out. And when your next job arrives, I'll tell you. If you are tired, take a nap on the couch in there. "'Asleep at the switch,' marveled Mickey. "'He went to the adjoining room, but did not sleep. "'He quietly polished and straightened furniture, "'lingering before bookcases, "'and was at Douglas's elbow as he turned to call him. "'Then they closed the offices "'and went to the car, each carrying a load of ledgers. "'You do an awful business,' commented Mickey. "'Your car?' "'Yes,' answered Douglas.' You're doing grand for young as you are. I haven't done it all myself, Mickey, explained Douglas. I happened to select a father who was an acquisitive turn of mind. He left me enough that I can have a comfortable living in a small way from him. Gee, it's lucky you got the joy lady then, exclaimed Mickey. Maybe you wouldn't ever work if you didn't have her to scratch for. I always have worked and tried to make something of myself, said Douglas. "'Yes, I guess you have,' conceded Mickey. "'I think it shows when a man does. "'It just shows a lot on you.' "'Thank you, Mickey. Same to you.' "'Ah, nix on me,' said Mickey. "'I ain't nothing on looks. "'I ain't ever looked at myself enough "'that if I was sent to find Michael O'Halloran, "'I mightn't bring in some other fellow. "'But you're enough acquainted with yourself "'that you wouldn't bring in a dirty boy "'with a mouthful of swearing and beer,' suggested Douglas. "'Well, not this evening,' cried Mickey. "'On a gamble, that ain't my picture.' 
"'If it were, you wouldn't be here,' said Douglas. "'No, nor much of any place else, "'set the gutters, alleys, and the police court,' affirmed Mickey. "'That ain't my style. "'I'd like to be, well, about like you.' "'You are perfectly welcome to all I have and am,' said Douglas. "'If you fail to take advantage of the offer, "'it will be your own fault.' "'Yes, I guess it will,' reflected Mickey. "'You gave me the chance.' I'm to blame if I don't cop out onto it and get in the game. I like you fine. Your work is more interesting than odd jobs in the street, and you pay like a plute. You're being worked, though. You pay too much. If I worked for you, it would save you money to let me manage that. I could get you help and things a lot cheaper than you could spend what you save on the joy lady, making her more joyous. "'You are calling Miss Winton the Joy Lady?' "'Yes,' said Mickey. "'Doesn't she just look it?' "'She surely does,' agreed Douglas. "'It's a good title. "'I know only two that are better. "'She sows happiness everywhere. "'What about your lily girl and her doll?' "'Doll doesn't go. "'That's a precious child.' "'I see. "'Lily is a little girl you like, Mickey?' "'Lily is the littlest girl you ever saw,' answered Mickey, "'with a bad back so she hasn't ever walked. "'And she's so sweet. "'She's the only thing I've got to love, "'so I love her till it hurts. "'Her back is one thing I'm saving for. "'I'm going to have it caroled as soon as I get money, "'and she grows strong enough to stand it.' "'Caroled?' queried Douglas, wonderingly. "'You know the man who put different legs on a dog?' said Mickey. I often read about him in papers I sell. I think he can fix her back, but not yet. A sunshine nurse I know says nobody can help her back till she grows a lot stronger and fatter. She has to have milk and be rubbed with oil and not be jerked for a while before it's any use to begin on her back. And has she the milk and the oil and the kindness? You just bet she has, said Mickey. Her family tends to that. And she has got a bed and a window and her precious child and a slate and books. That's all right then, said Douglas. Any time you see she needs anything, Mickey, I'll be glad if you would tell me or Miss Winton. She loves to do kind things to little sick children to make them happier. So do I, said Mickey, and Lily is my job. But that isn't robbing Miss Joy Lady. She can love herself to death if she wants to on hundreds of little sick, cold, miserable children in every cellar and garret and tenement of the east end of Multiopolis. The only kind thing God did for them out there was to give them the first chance at sunrise. Multiopolis hasn't ever followed his example by giving them anything. You mean Miss Winton can find some other child to love and care for? asked Douglas. Sure, said Mickey emphatically. It's hands off Lily. Her family is taking care of her, so she's got all she needs right now. That's good, said Bruce. Here, we unload. They entered a building and exchanged the books they carried for others, which Douglas selected with care. Then, returning to the office, locked them in a safe. Now, I am driving to the golf grounds for an hour's play, said Douglas. Will you go and caddy for me? I never did. I don't know how, answered Mickey. You can learn, can't you? suggested Douglas. Sure, said Mickey. I've seen boys carrying golf clubs that hadn't enough sense to break stone right. I can learn, but my learning might spoil your day's sport. It would be no price to pay for an intelligent caddy, replied Douglas. Mr. Bruce, what price is an intelligent caddy worth? Our Scotch club pays fifty cents a game, and each man employs his own boy if he chooses. The club used to furnish boys, but since the Big Brother movement began, so many of the men have boys in their offices they are accustomed to, and want to give a run over the hills after the day's work, that the rule has been changed. I can employ you if you want to serve me. I'd go to the country in the car with you every day you play? "'And carry your clubs?' asked Winky wonderingly. "'Yes,' answered Douglas. "'Over real hills where there's trees, grass, cows, and water?' questioned Mickey. "'Yes,' repeated Douglas. "'What time would we get back?' he asked. 
"'Depends on how late I play "'and whether I have dinner at the clubhouse. "'Say seven as a rule, "'maybe ten or later at times. "'Nothing doing,' said Mickey promptly. "'I got to be home at six by the clock every day, "'even if we were engaged in hurling back the enemy, see?' "'But, Mickey, that spoils everything,' cried Douglas. "'Of course you could work for me the remainder of the day if you wanted to, "'and I could keep my old clubhouse caddy. "'But I want you. "'You want the ride in the country. "'You want the walk. "'You need the change and recreation. "'You are not a real boy if you don't want that. "'I'm so real. "'I'm two boys if wanting it counts, but it doesn't,' said Mickey. "'You see, I got a job for evening. "'I'm promised. "'I'd rather do what you want more than anything "'I ever saw or heard of except just this. "'I've given my word, and I'm depended on. "'I couldn't give up this work, "'and I wouldn't if I could. "'Even golf ain't in it with this job that I'm on. "'What is your work, Mickey?' "'Oh, I ain't ever exactly certain,' said Mickey. "'Sometimes it's one thing, sometimes it's another.' "'But always it's something, and it's work for a party I couldn't disappoint. "'Not no ways, not for all the golf in the world.' "'You're sure?' persisted Douglas. "'Dead sure with no changing,' said Mickey. "'All right, then. I'm sorry,' exclaimed Douglas. "'So am I,' said Mickey, "'but not about the job.' "'Douglas laughed. "'Well, come along this evening and look on.' "'I'll be back before six, and I'll run you where we did last night, "'if that is close to your home.' "'Thanks,' said Mickey. "'I'd love to. "'But you needn't bother about taking me home. "'I can make it if I start at six. "'Shall I take the things back to the café?' "'Let them go until morning,' said Douglas. "'What becomes of the little cakes? "'Their fate is undecided. "'Have you any suggestions?' "'I should worry,' he exclaimed. "'They'd fit in my pocket.' I could hike past the hospital and ask the sunshine lady if she said so. I could take them to Lily. Bet she never tasted anything like them. If it's between her and the cafe selling them over, suppose she takes the cake? Mickey's face was one big, insinuating, suggestive smile. Douglas was another. Suppose she does, he agreed. I must wrap them, said Mickey. Have to be careful about Lily. If she's fed dirty, wrong stuff, it will make her fever, so her back will get worse instead of better. Will a clean envelope do? suggested Douglas. That would cost you two cents, said Mickey. Haven't you something cheaper? What about a sheet of paper? hazarded Douglas. Fine, said Mickey, and only half as expensive. So they wrapped the little cakes and closed the office. Then Douglas said, now this ends the work for the day. Now comes playtime. Then before we begin to play, we ought to finish business, said Mickey. I have been thinking over what you said the other day, and while I was right about some of it, I was mistaken about part. I ain't changing anything I said about Mintern men and his sort, and millionaire men and their sort. But you ain't that kind of a man. Thank you, Mickey, said Douglas. "'No, you ain't that kind of a man,' continued Mickey. "'And you are just the kind of man I'd like to be. "'So if the door ain't shut, guess I'll stick around in the afternoons.' "'Not all day?' inquired Douglas. "'Well, you see, I'm in the paper business, and that takes all morning,' explained Mickey. "'I can always finish my first batch by noon, lots of times by ten. "'From this on to six, I could work for you.' "'Don't you think you could earn more with me, "'and in the winter at least be more comfortable?' asked Douglas. "'Winter!' cried Mickey, his face whitening. "'Yes,' said Douglas. "'The newsboys always look frightfully cold in winter.' "'Winter!' it was a piteous cry. "'What is it, Mickey?' questioned Bruce kindly. "'You know, I forgot it,' he said. "'I was so took up with what I was doing and thinking right now.' "'that I forgot a time was ever coming "'when it gets blue cold and little kids freeze. "'Gee, I almost wish I hadn't thought of it. "'I guess I'd better sell my paper business "'and come with you all day. "'I know I could and more. "'I just sort of hate to give up the papers. "'I've been at them so long. "'I've had such a good time. 
I like to sell papers. That's the way I always start my cry, and I do. I just love to. I sell to about the same bunch every morning, and most of my men know me. And they always say a word, and I like the rush and excitement and the things that happen, and the looking for chances on the side. There's messenger work in my business. I see. I like that. I like your work all right, said Mickey. Give me a few days to sell my route to the best advantage I can, and I'll come all day. I'll come for about a half what you're paying now. But you admit you need the money urgently. Well, not so urgently as to skin a friend to get it. Not even with the winter I hadn't thought of coming. Gee, I don't know just what I'm going to do about that. For yourself, Mickey? inquired Douglas. Well, in a way, yes, hesitated Mickey. There are things to think about. Gee, I gotta hump myself while the sun shines. If you say so, then I'll get out of the paper business as soon as I can, and I'll begin work for you steady at noon tomorrow. I've seen you pay out over seven today. I'll come for six. Is it a bargain? No, said Douglas, it isn't. The janitor bill was for a week of half done work. The messenger bill was for two days. No caddying at all. If you come, you will come for not less than eight, and what you earn extra over that. I don't agree to better service for less pay. If you will have things between us on a commercial basis, so will I. Oh, the big brother business would be all right with you, conceded Mickey. But I don't just like the way it's managed mostly. God didn't make us brothers no more than He did all men, so we better not butt in and try to fix things over for Him. Looks to me like we might cut the brother business and just be friends. I could be an awful good friend to you, honest I could. And I to you, Mickey said Douglas Bruce, holding out his hand. Have it as you will, friend. Then, look for you at noon tomorrow. Now we play. Hop in and we'll run to my rooms and get my clubs. Shall I sit up with your man? Asked Mickey. My friend, sit beside me. Said Douglas. Mickey spoke softly. Yes, but if I watched him sharp, maybe I could get the hang of driving for you. Think what a lump that would save. When I'm going, I'd love to drive just for the fun of it. And I wouldn't allow you to drive for less than I pay him," said Douglas. "I don't see why," exclaimed Mickey. "When you grow older and know me better, you will." While the car was running its smoothest, while the country Mickey had not seen save on rare newsboy excursions flashed past, while the wonder of the clubhouse, the links, and the work he would have loved to do developed, he shivered and cried in his tormented little soul. Gee, how will I ever keep Lily warm? Douglas noticed his abstraction and wondered. He had expected more appreciation of what Mickey was seeing and doing. He was coming to the realization that he would find out what was in the boy's heart in his own time and way. On the home run, when Douglas reached his rooms, he told the driver to take Mickey to the end of the car line. The boy shyly interposed to ask if he might go to the Star of Hope Hospital, so Douglas changed the order. Mickey's passport held good at the hospital. The sunshine nurse inspected the cakes and approved them. She was so particular; she even took a tiny nibble of one and said, "Sugar, flour, egg, and shortening." All right, Mickey. Those can't hurt her. And how is she today? Fine," cried Mickey. "She's getting a lot stronger already. She can sit up longer and help herself better. And she's got ribbons, the prettiest you ever laid eyes on, that a lady gave me for her hair. And they make her pink and nicer." And she's got a baby doll in long, clean white dresses to snuggle down and stay with her all day, and she's got a slate and a book, and she knows cows and milk and my name. And today she's learning bread. Tomorrow I'm going to teach her baby, and she can say her prayer too nice for anything. Once we got it fixed so she'd say it at all. What did you teach her, Mickey? Now I lay me. Only、Mil、Lily wouldn't say it the way she taught me. You see, Lily was all alone with her granny when she winked out, and it scared her more stiff. So when I got to that, if I should die before I wake, line, she just went into fits. And remembering what I'd seen myself, I didn't blame her, so I changed it for her till she liked it. 
"'Tell me about it, Mickey,' said the nurse. "'Well, you see, she has a window, so she can see the stars and the sun. "'She knows them, so I just shifted the old, sad, scary lines to. "'Guard me through the starry night. "'Wake me safe with sunshine bright.' "'But, Mickey, that's lovely,' cried the nurse. "'Wait till I write it down. "'I'll teach it to my little people. "'Half of them come here knowing that prayer, "'and when they are ill, they begin to think about it. "'Some of them are old enough to worry over it. "'Why, you're a poet, Mickey.' "'Sure,' conceded Mickey. "'That's what I'm going to do when I get through school. "'I'm going to write a poetry piece about Lily "'for the first sheet of the Herald.' That'll be so good, they'll pay me to write one every day, but all of them will be about her. Mickey, is there enough of such a little girl to furnish one every day? asked the nurse. Surest thing you know, cried Mickey enthusiastically. Why, there are the hundred gold rings on her head, one for each, and her eyes, tender and teary and sad and glad, one for each, and the color of them different a dozen times a day and her little white face, and her lips, and her smile, and when she's good and when she's bad. Why, miss, there's enough of Lily for a big book, big as Mr. Bruce's biggest law book. Well, Mickey, cried the girl, laughing, there's no question but you will write the poetry, only I can't reconcile it with the kind of hustler you are. I thought poets were languid, dreamy, up-in-the-clouds kind of people. So they are, explained Mickey. That comes later. First, I got her hustle to get Lily's back caroled, and us through school, and ready to write the poetry. Then it will take so much dreaming to think out what is nicest about her, and how to say it best, that it would make any fellow languid. You can see how that would be. Yes, I see, conceded the nurse. Mickey, by caroling her back, do you mean Dr. Carol? Sure, cried Mickey. You see, I read a lot about him in the papers I sell. He's the biggest man in the world. He's bigger than emperors and kings. They, why, the biggest thing they can do is to kill all their strongest, bravest men. He's so much bigger than kings that he can take men they shoot to pieces and put them together again. Killing men ain't much. Anybody can do killing. Look at him making folks live. Gee, he's big. "'And you think he can make Lily's back better?' "'Why, I know he can,' said Mickey earnestly. "'That wouldn't be a patching to what he has done. "'Soon as you say she's strong enough, "'I'm going to write to him and tell him all about her. "'And when I get the money saved, he'll come and fix her. "'Sure he will. "'If you could get to him and tell him yourself, "'I really believe he would,' marveled the nurse. "'But you see, it's like this, Mickey. "'When men are as great as he is, just thousands of people want everything of them and write letters by the hundreds. And if all of them were read, there would be time for nothing else. So a secretary opens the mail and decides what is important. And that way the big people don't always know about the ones they would answer if they were doing it. He's been here in this very hospital. I've seen him operate once. Next time a perfectly wonderful case comes in that is in his peculiar line... No doubt he will be notified and come again. Then if I could get word to you, and you could get Lily here, possibly, just possibly, he would listen to you. And look at her, of course. I can't say he surely would, but I think he would. Why, of course he would, triumphed Mickey. Of course he would. He'd be tickled to pieces. He'd just love to. Any man would. Why, a white little flowersy girl who can't walk? If you could reach him, I really think he would, said the nurse positively. Well, just you give me a hint that he's here, and see if I don't get to him, said Mickey. Is there any place I'd be certain to find you quickly? If a chance should come, she asked. One never can tell. He might not be here in years, but he might be called and come tomorrow. Why, yes, cried Mickey. Why, of course. Why, the telephone. Call me where I work. "'But I thought you were a newsie,' said the nurse. "'Well, I was,' explained Mickey, lifting his head. "'But I've give up the papers. I've graduated. "'I'm going to sell out tomorrow. "'I'm going to work permanent for Mr. Douglas Bruce. "'He's the biggest lawyer in Multiopolis. 
He's got an office in the Iroquois building, and his call is 500X. Write that down, too, and put it where you can't lose it. He's just a grand man. He asked about Lily today. He said any time he'd do things for her. Sure he would. He'd stop saving the taxpayers of Multiopolis and take his car and go like greased lightning for a little sick girl. He's the grandest man, and he's got a joy lady that puts in most of her time making folks happy. Either of them would. Why, it's too easy to talk about. You call me, and I take a car and bring her scootin'. If I'd see Lily standin' on her feet, steppin' right out like other folks, I'd be so happy. I'd almost bust wide open. Honest, I would. If he does come, you'd try hard to get me a chance, wouldn't you? I'd try as hard for you as I would for myself, Mickey. I couldn't promise more, she said. Lily's as good as fix, exulted Mickey. Why, there is the big easy car standing down in the street waiting to take me home right now. Does Douglas Bruce send you home in his car? Oh, no, not regular. This is extra. Work is over for today, so we went to the golf links. Then he lets his man take me while he bathes and dresses to go to his joy lady. Gee, I gotta hurry or I'll make the car late. But I can talk with you all you will. I can send the car back and walk or hop a tricity wagon. Which is a street car? queried the nurse. Sure, said Mickey. Well, go hop it, she laughed. I can't spare any more time now. But I won't forget Mickey, and if he comes, I'll keep him till you get here, if I have to chain him. You go to it, cried Mickey, and I'll begin praying that he comes soon. And I'll just pray and pray so long and so hard, the Lord will send him quick to get rid of being asked so constant. No, I won't either. Well, wouldn't that rattle your slats? What, Mickey? asked the nurse. Why, don't you see? cried Mickey. No, I don't see, admitted the girl. Well, I do, said Mickey. What would be square about that? Why, that would be asking the Lord to make maybe some other little girl so sick the Carol man would be sent for. So I'd get my chance for Lily. That ain't business. I wouldn't have the cheek. What would the Lord think of me? He wouldn't come in a mile of doing it. I wouldn't come in ten miles of having the nerve to ask him. I do get up against it till my head swims. And there is winter coming, too. The nurse put her arm around Mickey again and gently propelled him toward the elevator. Mickey, she said softly, her lips nipping his fair hair. God doesn't give many of us your clear vision and your big heart. I'd have asked him that, with never a thought of who would have to be ill to bring Dr. Carroll here. But I'll tell you, you can pray this with a clean conscience. You can ask God, if the doctor does come, to put it into his heart to hear you and to examine Lily. That wouldn't be asking ill for anyone else so that you might profit by it. And, dear laddie, don't worry about winter. This city is still taking care of its taxpayers. You do your best for Lily all summer, and when winter comes, if you're not fixed for it, I will see what your share is, and you can have it in a stove that will burn warm a whole day and lots of coal, plenty of it. I know I can arrange that. Gee, you're great, he cried. This is the biggest thing that ever happened to me. I see now what I can ask him on the square. So it's business and all right. And Mr. Bruce or Miss Leslie will loan me a car. And if you see about the stove and the coal the city has for me, in came Mickey's royal flourish. Why, dearest nurse, Lily is as good as walking right now. Gee, in my place, would you tell her? I surely would, said the nurse. It will do her good. It will give her hope. Dr. Carroll isn't the only one who can perform miracles. If he doesn't come by the time Lily is strong enough to bear the strain of being operated, we can try some other great man. And if she is shy and timid from having been alone so much, expecting it will make it easier for her. By the way, wait until I bring some little gifts. I and three of my friends have made for her in our spare time. I think your mother's night dresses must be big and uncomfortable for her, even as you cut them off. Try these. Give her a fresh one each day. It is going to be dreadfully hot soon. 
"'When she is used to, bring them here, "'and I'll have them washed for you.' "'Now nix on that,' said Mickey. "'You're a shining angel bright to sew them for her. "'I'm crazy over them, but I wash them. "'Mother showed me. "'That will be my share. "'I can do it fine, and they will be better. "'She's so lost in mothers. "'I have to shake them to find her.' They laughed together, then Mickey sped to the sidewalk and ordered the car back. It's been too long, he said. Nurse Lady had some things to tell me about a little sick girl, and I was glad to miss my ride for them. Mr. Bruce will be ready by now. You go where he told you. I got twenty-seven minutes yet, said the driver. I can take you at least almost there. Hop in. Mither a mite, cried Mickey. Is that all there is to it? Gee, how I'd like to have a try at it. "'Are you going to be in Mr. Bruce's offices from now on?' asked the driver. "'If I can sell my paper line,' answered Mickey. "'Got a good route?' inquired the man. "'Best of any boy in my district,' said Mickey. "'I like to sell papers. I got it down fine.' "'I guess you have,' said the driver. "'I know your voice, and everybody on your street knows that cry. "'Your route ought to be worth a fair price. "'I got a kid that wants a paper start.' "'What would you ask to take him over your round "'and tell the men you are turning your business over to him "'and teach him your cries?' "'Hmm,' said Mickey. "'My cry is whatever has the biggest headlines on the front page, "'mixed in with a lot of joyous fooling, "'and I'd have to see your boy for I'd say if I could teach him. "'Is he a clean kid with a joyous face "'and his anatomy decorated with a fine large hump? "'That's the only kid that gets my job.' I won't have my nice men made sore all day because they start it by seeing a kid with a boiled owl face. You think a happy face sells most papers? Know it, said Mickey, because I wear it on the job and I get away with the rest of them three times in coming. Same everywhere as with the papers. A happy face would work with your job if you'd loosen up a link or two and tackle it. It may crack your complexion if you start too violent, but taking it by easy turns and greasing the ways for you cut your cable, I believe you'd survive it. Mickey flushed and grinned in embarrassment when people half a block away turned to look at his driver, and the boy's mouth opened as a traffic policeman smiled in sympathy when he waved his club, signaling them to cross. Mickey straightened up reassured. Did you get that? he inquired. I got it, said the driver. "'but it won't ever happen again. "'McFinley has been on that crossing for five years, "'and that's his first smile on the job. "'Then make it your business to see that it ain't his last,' advised Mickey. "'There's no use growing morgue lines on your mug, "'with all May running wild just to please you and the man in the moon. "'Loosen up. "'If you have to tickle your liver with a torpedo, start you. "'You brass monkey,' said the driver. "'You climb down right here before I'm arrested for a plain drunk.' "'Don't you think it?' cried Mickey. "'If you like your job, man, cotton up to it. "'Chuckle it under the chin and get a real familiar, see? "'Try grin instead of grouch just one day "'and watch if the whole world doesn't look better before night.' "'Thanks, kid. I'll think it over,' promised the driver. "'Mickey hurried home to Peaches. "'He hid the cake and the hospital box "'under the things he bought for supper "'and went to her with empty hands.' He could see she was tired and hungry, so he gave her a drink of milk and proceeded to the sponge bath and oil rub. These rested and refreshed her so that Mickey demanded closed eyes while he slipped the dainty night robe over her head and tied the pink ribbon on her curls. Then he piled the pillows, leaned her against them, and brought the mirror. Now open your peepers, flowersy girl, and tell me how Miss O'Halloran strikes you, he exulted. Peaches took one long look. She opened her mouth, then she turned to Mickey and shut her mouth, shut it and clamped both hands over it, so that he saw the very act of strangling a phrase he would have condemned. That's a nice lady, he commented in joy. Now let me tell you, you got four of these gorgeous garments, each one made by a different nurse lady while she was resting. Every day you get a clean one, and I wash the one you wore last, careful, and easy not to tear the lacy pieces. Ain't they the gladdest rags you ever saw? Peaches gasped. Mickey, I'll bust! Go on and bust, then, conceded Mickey. Bust if you must. But don't you dare say no words that ain't for the ladiest of ladies. 
in that beautiful softy white dress. Peaches set her lips, stretching her arms widely. She sat straighter than Mickey had ever seen her, lifting her head higher. Gradually a smile crept over her face. She was seeing a very pinched white little girl with a shower of yellow curls bound with a pink ribbon tied in a big bow, wearing a dainty nightdress with a fancy yoke run with pink ribbons tied under her chin and at her elbows. She crooked an arm, primped her mouth, and peered at the puffed sleeves, then hastily gulped down whatever she had been tempted to say. Again Mickey approved. Despite protests, he removed the mirror, then put the doll in her arms. Now you line up, he said. Now you look alike. After you get your supper comes the joy part for sure. More joyous than this? Peaches surveyed herself. Yes, miss, the joyous thing of all the world that could happen to you, he said. But Mickey, love us, she cried in protest. You know, you know what that would be. Sure I know, said Mickey. I don't believe it. It never could, she cried. There you go, said Mickey in exasperation. You make me think of them Texas Broncos kicking at everything on earth in the Wild West shows every spring. Honest you do. Mickey, you forgot my poetry piece tonight, she interposed hastily. What you want a poetry piece for with such a dress and ribbon as you got, he demanded. I like the poetry piece better than the dress or the ribbon, she asserted positively. You'll be saying better than the baby next. Yes, and better than the baby. You look out, miss, marveled Mickey. You got to tell true or you can't be my family. Sure and true, said Mick Peaches emphatically. Well, if I ever, cried B Mickey, I didn't think you was that silly. Taint silly, said Peaches. The poetry pieces is you. Taint silly to like you better than a dress and a ribbon or a precious child. I want my piece now. Well, I've been so busy today, I forgot your piece, said Mickey. Enough things have happened to make me forget my head if it wasn't fast. I forgot your piece. I thought you'd like the dress and the joyous thing better. Then you didn't forget it, cried Peaches. You thought something else, and you thought what ain't. So there. I want my poetry piece. Well, do you want it worse than your supper, demanded Mickey. Yes, I do, said Peaches. Well, use me for a mop, cried Mickey. Then you'll have to wait till I make one. Go on and make it, ordered the child. Well, how do you like this? Once the stubborn little kicker kicked until she made me snicker. If she had wings, she couldn't fly, cause she'd be too stubborn to try. A belligerent look slowly spread over Peach's face. That's no poetry piece, she scoffed, and I don't like it at all. And I won't write it on my slate, not if I never learn to write anything. Mickey, lovest, please make a nice one to save for my book. It's going to have three on every page, and a nice piece of sky like right up there for backs, and maybe, maybe a cow on it. Sure, a cow on it, agreed Mickey. I saw a lot today. I'll tell you after supper. Give me a little time to think. I can't do nice ones right off. You did that one right off, said Peaches. Sure, answered Mickey. I was a little, a little provoked. And you said that wasn't a nice one. And so it wasn't, asserted Peaches positively. If I have a nice one ready when I bring supper, will that do, questioned Mickey. Yes, said Peaches, but I won't eat my supper till I have it. Now don't you get too bossy, Miss Chicken, warned Mickey. There's a surprise in this supper like you never had in all your life. I guess you'd eat it if you'd see it. I wouldn't till I had my poetry piece. In consideration of the poetry piece, Mickey desisted. The inference was too flattering. Between narrowed lids, he looked at Lily. You fool, sweet little kid, he muttered. Then he prepared supper. When he set it on the table, he bent over and taking both hands, he said gently, Flowersy girl of moonbeam white, Golden head of sunshine bright, dancing eyes of skies on blue, no other flower in the world like you. Get the slate, cried Peaches. Get the slate. Now that's a poetry piece. That's the best one yet. I'm going to put that right under the cow. Sure, said Mickey. I think that's the best yet myself. 
"'You see, you make them come better every time "'cause you get so much sweeter every day. "'Then why did you make the bad one?' she pouted. "'Well, every time you just yell, I won't, "'without ever giving me a chance to tell you "'what I'm going to do or why,' explained Mickey. "'If only you'd learned to wait a little, you'd do better. "'If I was to tell you that Carol Man was at the door "'with a new back for you, "'if you turn over and let him put it in, "'I suppose you'd yell, I won't. "'The first tinge of color Mickey had seen, "'almost invisibly faint, "'crept to the surface of Peach's white cheek. "'Just you try it, Mickey Lovish,' she exclaimed. "'Finish your supper and see what I try.' "'Peaches obeyed. "'She had stopped grabbing and cramming. "'She ate slowly, m masticating every morsel "'as the nurse told Mickey she should. "'Tonight he found her so dainty and charming "'as she instinctively tried to be as nice as her dress "'and supper demanded, "'that he forgot himself until she reminded him. "'Then he rallied and ate his share.' He presented the cakes, and while they enjoyed them, he described every detail of the day he thought would interest her, until she had finished. He told her of the nurse and the dresses, and what she wanted to see the others. He said, No, sir, you got to wait till you are bathed and dressed each evening, and then you can see yourself. And that will be more fun than taking things all at once. You needn't think I'm coming in here every night with a great big lift-the-roof surprise for you. Most nights there won't be anything for you, only me and your supper. But, Mickey, them's the nicest nights of all, said Peaches. I like thinking about you better than nurse ladies or joy ladies, or my back even, if it wasn't for having supper ready to help you. There you go again, exclaimed Mickey. Cut that stuff out, kid. You'll get me so broke up I won't be fit for nothing but poetry, and that's tough eating. "'There's a lot more to come, for I'd just make a business of it. "'Now, miss, you brace up and get this. "'The Carol man has been in this very burg, see? "'Our nurse lady at the Star of Hope has watched him making someone over. "'Every time anybody is brought there with a thing the matter with them "'that he knows best how to cure, "'the big head knifers slip it over to him. "'So he comes and does it to get practice on the job. "'He may not come for a long time.' He might come tomorrow, see? Oh, Mickey, would he? gasped Peaches. Why, sure he would, cried Mickey with his most elaborate flourish. Sure he would. That's what he lives for. He'd be tickled to pieces to make over the back of a little girl that can't walk. Sure he would. What I ain't sure of is that you wouldn't gig back and say I won't if you had a chance to be fixed. Peaches spoke with deliberate conviction. "'Mickey, I'm most sure I've about quit that.' "'Well, it's about time,' said Mickey. "'What you got to do is eat and sleep and be bathed and rubbed "'and get so big and strong that when I come chasing up the steps "'and say, He's here, Lily, clap your arms around my neck "'and come to the china room and the glass table and be fixed, "'you just take a grip and never open your head, see? "'You can be a game, little kid, the gamest I ever saw.' "'You will, then, Lily, won't you?' "'Sure,' she promised. "'I'll just grab you, and I'll say, "'Go, Mickey, go, huh!' "'Whoop, whoop, there, lady,' interposed Mickey. "'Look out, there's a submarine coming. "'Sink it, sink it!' "'Mickey, what's a submarine?' asked Peaches. "'Why, it's like this,' explained Mickey. "'There's places where there's water, "'like I bring to wash you only miles and miles of it. "'Such a lot. It's called an ocean.' "'Sure, crossed it where the kings is making people kill themselves,' cried Peaches. "'Yes,' agreed Mickey. "'And on the water, sailing along like a lady, is a big, beautiful ship. "'Then there's a nasty little boat that can creep under the water. "'It slips up when she doesn't know it's coming and blows a hole in the fine ship, "'and sinks her all spoiled. "'But if the nice ship sees the submarine coming and sinks it, "'why, then she stays all nice and isn't spoiled at all, see?' "'Submarines spoil things?' ventured Peaches. "'They were just invented for that and nothing else. "'Mickey, I'll just say, hurry, run fast. "'Mickey, can you carry me that far?' she asked anxiously. "'No, I can't carry that far,' admitted Mickey. "'But Mr. Douglas Bruce, that we work for after this, "'will let me take his driver and his nice easy car, "'and it will beat street cars a mile.' "'and we'll just go sailing for the Star of Hope "'and get your back made over. "'And then comes school and everything girls like, see?' 
"'Mickey, what if he never comes?' wavered Peaches. "'Yes, but he will,' said Mickey, positively. "'Mickey, what if he should come and wouldn't even look at my back?' she pursued. "'Why, he'd be glad to,' cried Mickey. "'Don't be silly. Give the man some ch- This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 9 James Jr. and Malcolm. Malcolm, being rich as put us ten miles behind where we ought to be, we're girl baby softies. We wouldn't have faced the guns and not told where the soldiers were. We'd have bellered for cake. James. Nellie Minturn returned to her room two days to realize her suffering. She intended doing something. The fringed orchids reminded her. She rang for water to put them in, and her maid with shaking fingers dressed her, then ordered the car. The girl understood that some terrible thing had happened and offered to go with the woman who moved so mechanically she proved she scarcely knew what she was doing. No, said Mrs. Minturn, no. The little soul has been out there a long time alone. Her mother had better go alone and see how she is. She entered the car, gave her order, and sank back against the seat, dumbly enduring almost insufferable heartache. When the car stopped, she descended and found the gates guarding the doors of the onyx vault locked. She shook the gates, but they were bronze, cemented in marble. She pushed her flowers between the bars, dropping them before the doors, then wearily sank on the first step, leaning her head against the gate, trying to think, but she could not. Near dawn, her driver spoke to her. "'It's almost morning,' he said. "'You've barely time to reach home before the city will be stirring.' She paid no attention, so at last he touched her. "'You, Weston?' she asked. "'Yes, madam,' he said. "'I'm afraid for you. "'I ventured to come closer than you said. "'Excuse me.' "'Thank you, Weston,' she answered. "'Let me drive you home now, madam,' he begged. "'Just where would you take me if you were taking me home, Weston?' "'Where you came from,' he replied." "'Do you think that has ever been a home, Weston?' "'I have thought it was the finest home in Multiopolis, madame,' said the driver in surprise. "'She laughed bitterly. "'So have I, Weston, and today I have learned what it really is. "'Help me, Weston, take me back to the home of my making.' "'When he rang for her, she gave him an order. "'Find Mr. John Haynes and bring him here immediately.' "'Bring him now, madam?' he questioned. "'Immediately,' I said, she repeated. "'I will try, madam,' said Weston. "'You will bring him at once if he is in Multiopolis,' she said with finality. "'Weston knew that John Haynes was her lawyer. "'He had brought him from his residence or office at her order many times. "'He brought him again. "'At once John Haynes dismissed all the servants in the Minturn household, "'arranged everything necessary,' and saw Mrs. Minturn aboard a train in company with a new maid of his selection. Then he mailed a deed of gift of the Minturn residence to the city of Multiopolis for an endowed children's hospital. The morning papers briefly announced the departure and the gift. At his breakfast table, James Minturn read both items, then sat in deep thought. Not like her was his mental comment. I can understand how that place would become intolerable to her, but I never knew her to give a dollar to the suffering. Now she makes a princely gift, not because she is generous, but because the house has become unbearable, and as usual, with no thought of any one save herself. If the city dares accept, how her millionaire neighbors will rage at disease and sickness being brought into the finest residence district. Probably the city will be compelled to sell it and build somewhere else. But there is something fitting in the reparation of returning a building that has been a place of torture to children into one of healing. 
It proves that she has a realizing sense. He glanced around the bright, cheerful breakfast room, with its carefully set, flower-decorated table, at his sister at its head, at a son on either hand, at a pleasant-faced young tutor on one side, and his little brother on the other. For so had James Minturn ordered his household. Mrs. Winslow had left a home she loved to come at her brother's urgent call for help to save his boys. The tutor had only a few hours of his position, and thus far his salary seemed the only attractive feature. James, Jr. and Malcolm were two days to be natural for a short time. They had been picked up bodily and carried kicking and screaming to this place, where they had been bathed and dressed in plain, durable clothing. Malcolm's bed stood beside little brothers in a big, sunny room. James was near the tutors in a chamber the counterpart of the other, save for its bookcases lining one wall. There was a schoolroom not yet furnished with more than tables and chairs, its floors and walls bare, its windows having shades only. When worn out with the struggle, the amazed boys had succumbed to sleep on little hard white beds with plain covers, had awakened to a cold bath at the hands of a man, and when they rebelled and called for Lucette and their accustomed clothing, were forcibly dressed in linen and khaki. In a few minutes together before they were called to breakfast, James had confided to Malcolm that he thought if they rushed into William's back with all their strength, on the top step they could roll him downstairs and bang him up good. Malcolm had doubts, but he was willing to try. William was alert, because as many another newsy, he had known these boys in the park. So when the rush came, of movement too quick for untrained eyes to follow, swung him around a newel post, and both boys, bumping, screaming, rolled to the first landing and rebounded from a wall harder than they. When no one hastened at their screams to pick them up, they arose fighting each other. The tutor passed, and James tried to kick him, merely because he could. He was not there either, but he stopped for this advice to the astonished boy. If I were you, I wouldn't do that. This is a free country, and if you have a right to kick me, I have the same right to kick you. I wouldn't like to do it. I'd rather allow mules and vicious horses to do the kicking. Still, if you're bound to kick, I can. But my foot is so much bigger than yours, and if I forgot and took you for a football, you'd probably have to go to the hospital and lie in a plaster cast a week or so. If I were you, I wouldn't. Let's go watch the birds till breakfast is called instead. The invitation was not accepted. The tutor descended alone, and as he stepped to the veranda, met Mr. Minturn. Well, that general asked tersely. Mr. Tower shook his head. He was studying law. He needed money to complete his course. He needed many things he could acquire from James Minturn. It's a problem, he said guardedly. You draw your salary for its solution, Mr. Minturn said tartly. Work on the theory I outlined. If it fails after a fair test, we'll try another. Those boys have got to be saved. They are handsome little chaps with fine bodies and good ancestry. What happened just now? They tried to rush William on the top step, and William evaporated, so they took the medicine themselves. They intended for him. Exactly right, commented Mr. Minturn. Get the idea and work on it. Every rough, heartless thing they attempt, if at all possible, make it a boomerang that returns to strike them their own blow. But you reserve blows as a last resort. There is the bell. Mr. Minturn called. James, Malcolm, the breakfast bell is ringing. Come. There was not a sound. Mr. Minturn nodded to the tutor, and together they ascended the stairs. They found the boys hidden in a wardrobe. Mr. Minturn opened the door and gravely looked at them. Boys, he said, you're going to live with me after this, and you're to come when I call you. And you're going to eat the food that makes men of boys, where I can see what you get. 
and you are going to do what I believe best for you until you are so educated that you are capable of thinking for yourselves. Now what you must do is to come downstairs and take your places at the table. If you don't feel hungry, you needn't eat, but I would advise you to make a good meal. I intend to send you to the country in the car. You'll soon want food. With me, you will not be allowed to lunch at any hour, in cafes and restaurants. If you don't eat your breakfast, you will get nothing until noon. It's up to you. Come on. Neither boy moved. Mr. Minturn smiled at them. The sooner you quit this, the sooner all of us will be comfortable, he said casually. Observe my size. See Mr. Tower, a college athlete, who will teach you ball, football, tennis, swimming in lakes and riding, all the things that make boys manly men. Better stop sulking in a closet and show your manhood. With one finger, either of us can lift you and carry you down by force, and we will. But why not be gentlemen and walk down as we do? Both boys looked at him and then at each other, but remained where they were. Time is up, said Mr. Minturn. They've had their chance, Mr. Tower. If they won't take it, they must suffer the consequences. Take Malcolm. I'll bring James. Instantly, both boys began to fight, and no one bribed them to stop, struck them, or did anything at all according to precedent. They raged until they exposed a vulnerable point. Then each man laid hold, lifted, and carefully carried down a boy and placed him on a chair. James instantly slid to the floor. Take James' chair away, ordered Mr. Minturn. He prefers to be served on the floor. Malcolm laughed. I don't either. I slipped, cried James. Then excuse yourself, resume your chair, and be mighty careful you don't slip again. James looked at his father sullenly, but at last muttered, "Excuse me," and took the chair. With bright, inflamed eyes, they stared at their almost unknown father, who now had them in his power, at a woman they scarcely knew, whom they were told to call Aunt Margaret, at a strange man who was to take Lucette's place, and who had a grip that made hers seem feeble, and who was to teach them the things of which they knew nothing, and therefore hated, and at a boy their own size and years, whom their father called William. Both boys refused fruit and cereal and rudely demanded cake and ice cream. Margaret Winslow looked at her brother in despair. He placidly ate his breakfast and remarked that the cook was a treasure and the food excellent. As he left the table, Mister Minturn laid the papers before his sister, indicating the paragraphs he had read, and calling for his car, he took the tutor and the boys and left for his office. He ordered them to return for him at half past eleven, and with minute instructions as to how they were to proceed, Mister Tower and William drove to the country to begin the breaking in of the Minturn boys. They disdained ball, did not care for football, improvised golf clubs and a baseball were not interesting, further than the use of clubs on each other, which was not allowed. They did not care what the flowers were. They jerked them up by the roots when they saw it annoyed Mr. Tower, and every bird in range flew from a badly aimed stone. They tried chasing a flock of sheep, which chased beautifully for a short distance, and then a ram declined to run further and butted the breath from Malcolm's small body until it had to be shaken in again. They ran amuck and, on finding they were not pursued, gave up and stopped on the bank of a creek. There they espied tiny shining fish swimming through the water and plunged in to try to catch them. When Mister Tower and William came up, both boys were busy chasing fish. From a bank where they sat watching came a proposal from William. I'll tell you, fellows. I believe if we would build a dam, we could catch 'em. The boys stopped and looked at him. Gather stones and pile them up till I get my shoes off. Instantly, both boys obeyed. Mister Tower and William stripped their feet and rolled their trousers. Into the creek they went, setting stones, packing with sod and muck, using sticks and leaves until, in a short time, they had a dam before which the water began rising, then overflowing. 
"'Now we must wait until it clears,' said William. "'So they sat under a tree and watched "'until in the clean pool it formed "'they could see little fish gathering and darting around. "'Then the boys lay on the banks "'and tried to catch them with their hands "'and succeeded in getting a few. "'Mr. Tower suggested they should make pools, "'one on each side of the creek for their fish, "'and they eagerly went to work. They pushed and slapped each other, they fought over the same stone, but each constructed with his own hands a stone and mud enclosed pool in which to pen his fish. They were really interested in what they were doing. They really worked, and soon they were really tired, and no question at all, but they were really hungry. With one loud imperative voice they demanded food. "'You forget what your father told you at breakfast,' reminded Mr. Tower. "'He knew you were coming to the country where you couldn't get food. "'William and I are not hungry. "'We want to catch these little fish and see who can get the most. "'We think it's fun. "'We can't take the car back until your father said to come. "'You take us back right now and order meat and cake and salad and ice cream, lots of it,' stormed James." "'I have to obey your father,' said Mr. Tower. "'I just hate fathers,' cried James. "'I'll wager you do,' conceded Mr. Tower. "'James stared open-mouthed. "'I can see how you feel,' said Mr. Tower, companionably. "'When a fellow has been coddled by nurses all his life "'and has no muscle and no appetite except for the things he shouldn't have "'and never has done anything but silly park-playing, "'It must be a great change to be out with men and do as they do.' "'Both boys were listening, so he went on. "'But don't feel badly, and don't waste breath hating. "'Save it for the grand fun we are going to have. "'And next time good food is before you, eat like men. "'We don't start back for an hour yet. "'See which can catch the most fish in that time.' "'Where is Lucette?' demanded James.' "'Gone back to her home across the ocean. "'You'll never see her again,' said Mr. Tower. "'Wish I could have busted her head before she went,' said James regretfully. "'No doubt,' laughed Mr. Tower. "'But break your own and see how it feels before you try it on anyone else.' "'I wish I could break yours,' cried James angrily. "'No doubt again,' agreed the tutor. "'But if you do, the man who takes my place "'may not know how to make bows and arrows "'or build dams or anything that's fun, "'while he may not be so patient as I am.' "'Being hungry ain't fun,' growled Malcolm. "'That's your own fault,' Mr. Tower reminded him. "'You wouldn't eat. That was a good breakfast.' "'Wasn't a thing Lucette gave us,' scoffed James. "'But you don't like Lucette very well,' said Mr. Tower.' "'After you've been a man six months, "'you won't eat cake for breakfast, "'or much of it at any time.' "'Lucette is never coming back?' "'marveled Malcolm. "'Never,' said Mr. Tower, conclusively. "'How soon are we going home?' "'demanded James. "'Never,' replied Mr. Tower. "'You are going to live where you were last night "'after this. "'Where's Mama? cried Malcolm. "'Gone for the summer,' explained Mr. Tower.' "'I know. She always goes,' said James. "'But she took us before. I just hate it. I like this better. "'We make no difference to her anyway. Let her go.' "'Ain't we rich boys any more?' inquired Malcolm. "'I don't know,' said Mr. Tower. "'That's your father's business. "'I think you have as much money as ever, "'but from now on you are going to live like men.' "'We won't live like men,' cried both boys.' "'Now look here,' said Mr. Tower kindly. "'You may take my word for it "'that a big boy almost ten years old "'and another nearly his age "'who can barely read, who can't throw straight, "'who can't swim or row or walk a mile "'without puffing like an engine, "'who begins to sweat over lifting a few stones, "'is a mighty poor specimen. "'You think you are wonders "'because you've heard yourself called big fine boys. "'You are soft fatties.' I can take you to the park and pick out any number of boys half your size and age who can make either of you yell for mercy in three seconds. You aren't boys at all. If you had to get on your feet and hike back to town, before a mile you'd be lying beside the road bellowing worse than I've heard you yet. 
"'You aren't as tough and game as half the girls of your age, I know.' "'You shut your mouth!' cried James in rage. "'Mother'll fire you!' "'It is you who are fired, young man,' said the tutor. "'Your mother is far away by this time. "'She left your boys with your father, "'who pays me to make men of you, so I'm going to do it. "'You are big enough to know that you'll never be men "'motoring around with nurses like small babies.' "'eating cake and ice cream "'when your bones and muscles are in need of stiffening and toughening. "'William, peel off your shirt and show these chaps "'how a man's muscles should be.' "'William obeyed, swelling his muscles. "'Now you try that,' suggested Mr. Tower to James, "'and see how much muscle you can raise.' "'I'm no gutter snipe,' he sneered. "'I'm a gentleman. I don't need muscle. "'I'm never going to work.' "'But you've just been working,' cried the tutor. "'Carrying those stones was work. "'And you'll remember it took both of you to lift one that William, "'who was only a little older than you, James, moved with one hand. "'You can't play without working. "'You've got a pull to row a boat or hold a horse. "'You must step out lively to play tennis or golf or to skate. "'Well, if you try to swim without work, you'll drown.' "'I ain't going to do those things,' retorted James. "'No, you're going to spend your life riding in an automobile with the nurse feeding you cake,' scoffed the tutor. William shouted and turned a cartwheel so flashingly quick that both boys jumped. James' face colored a slow red, so the tutor took hope. "'I see that makes you blush,' he said. "'No wonder. You should be as tough as leather and spinning along this creek bank like William. Instead, you're a big, bloated softy. "'You carry too much fat for your size "'while you are mushy as pudding. "'If I were you, I'd show my father "'how much of a man I could be "'instead of how much of a baby.' "'Father isn't a gentleman,' announced Malcolm. "'Lucette said so.' "'Hush!' cried Mr. Tower. "'Don't you ever say that again. "'Your father is one of the big men of this great city, "'one of the men who think, plan, and make things happen.' "'that result in health, safety, and comfort for all of us. "'One of the men who is going to rule not only his own home, "'but this city and this whole state one of these days. "'You don't know your father. "'You don't know what men say and think of him. "'You do know that Lucette was fit for nothing "'but to wash and dress you like babies, "'big boys who should have been ashamed "'to let a woman wait on them.' "'You do know that she is on her way back where she came from "'because she could not do her work right. "'And you have the nerve to tell me what she said "'about a fine man like your father? "'I'm amazed at you.' "'Gentlemen, don't work,' persisted Malcolm. "'Mother said so.' "'I'm sorry to contradict your mother, "'but she forgot something,' said Mr. Tower. "'If the world has any gentlemen, "'it surely should be those born "'for generations of royal entitled blood.' "'and reared from their cradles in every tradition of their rank. "'Europe is full of them, and many are superb men. "'I know a few. "'Now will you tell me where they are today? "'They are down in trenches, six feet underground, "'shivering in mud and water, "'half dead for sleep, food, and rest, "'trying to save the land of their birth. "'The homes they own, to protect the women and children they love. "'They are marching miles, being shot down in cavalry rushes, "'and blown up in boats they are manning "'in their fight to save their countries. "'Gentlemen, don't work. "'You are too much of an idiot to talk with "'if you don't know how gentlemen of birth, rank, and by nature "'are working this very day.' "'The descent on him was precipitate and tumultuous. "'The war!' shouted both boys in chorus. "'Tell us about the war!' "'Oh, I just love the war!' cried Malcolm. "'When I'm a man, I'm going to have a big shiny sword "'and ride and fight and make the enemy fly. "'You ought to see Gretchen and Lucette fight. "'They ain't either one got much hair left.' "'The tutor could not help laughing, "'but he made room for a boy on either side of him "'and began on the war. "'It was a big subject. "'There were phrases of it that shocked and repulsed him, "'but it was his task to undo the wrong work of ten years.' "'he was forced to use the instrument that would accomplish that end. "'With so much material he could tell of things unavoidable, "'that men of strength and courage were doing, "'not forgetting the boys and the women, "'William stretched at his feet and occasionally made a suggestion "'or asked a question, "'while James and Malcolm were interested in something at last. 
When it was time to return, neither of them wanted to go. Your father's orders were to come for him at half past eleven, reminded Mr. Tower. I work for him, so I must obey. Nobody pays any attention to father, cried James. I order you to stay here and tell of the fighting. Tell about the French boy who wouldn't show where the troops were. Oh, I am to take orders from you, am I? queried Mr. Tower. All right, pay my salary and give me the money to buy our lunch. James stood thinking a second. I have all the money I want, he said. I go to Mrs. Ranger for my money. Mother always makes her give me what I ask for. You have forgotten that you have moved and brought only yourselves, said Mr. Tower. Your mother and the money are gone. Your father pays the bills now, and if you'll watch sharp, you'll see that things have changed since this time yesterday. Everyone pays all the attention there is to father now. What we have and do and want must come from him, and as it's a big contract and he's needed to help manage the city, we'd better begin thinking about father and take care of him as much as we can. Now we are to obey him. Come on, William, it's lunchtime and I'm hungry. The boys climbed into the car without a word, and before it had gone a mile, Malcolm slipped against the tutor, and shortly thereafter James slid to the floor, tired to insensibility and sound asleep. So Mr. Minturn found them when he came from his office. He looked them over carefully, wet, mud-stained, grimy, bruised, and sleeping in exhaustion. Poor little soldiers, he said. Your battle has been a hard one, I see. I hope to God you gained a victory. He entered the car, picked up James, and taking him in his arms, laid the tired head on his breast, leaning his face against the boy's hair. When the car stopped at the new house, the tutor waited for instructions. Wake them up, make them wash themselves, and come to lunch, said Mr. Minturn. Afterward, if they are sleepy, let them nap. They must establish regular habits at the beginning. It's the only way. Dashes of cold water helped, so William and the tutor, telling each other how hungry they were, brought two boys ready to eat anything to the table. Cake and cream were not mentioned. Bread and milk, cold meat, salad, and a plain pudding were delicious. Between bites, James studied his father, then suddenly burst forth, Are you a gentleman? I try to be, answered Mr. Minturn. "'Are you running this city?' put in Malcolm. "'I'm doing what I can to help,' said his father. "'Make Mr. Johnston take me home to get my money.' "'You have no home but this,' said Mr. Minturn. "'Your old home now belongs to the city of Multiopolis. "'It is to be torn up and made over into a place where sick children can be cured. "'If you are ever too ill for us to manage, we'll take you there to be doctored.' "'Will Mother and Lucette be there?' asked James." Malcolm nudged his brother. "'Can't you remember?' he said. "'Lucette has gone across the ocean, and she is never coming back. "'Goody, goody! "'And you know how much Mother cares when we are sick. "'She's coming the other way when anybody is sick. "'She just hates sick people. "'Let them go and get your money.' "'Thus reminded, James began again. "'I want to get my money,' he said. "'Your money came from your mother, and it went with your home, your clothes, and your playthings,' explained Mr. Minturn. "'You will have none until you earn some. "'I can give you a home, education, and a fine position when you're old enough to hold it, "'but I can't give you money. "'No one ever gave me any. "'I always had to work for mine. "'From now on, you are going to live with me, and if you have money, you'll have to work and earn it. Both boys looked aghast at their father. "'Ain't we rich any more?' they demanded. "'No,' said Mr. Minturn, "'just comfortable.' James leaned back in his chair and twisted his body in its smooth linen covering. He looked intently at the room, table, and people surrounding it. He glanced from the window at the wide green lawn, the big trees, and for an instant seemed to be listening to the birds singing there. He laid down his fork and turned to his brother. Then he exploded the bomb that shattered the family. "'Oh, damn being rich!' he cried. "'I like being comfortable a lot better. "'Malcolm, being rich has put us about ten miles behind where we ought to be. 
We're baby girl softies. We wouldn't have faced the guns and not told where the soldiers were. We'd have bellered for cake. Brace up. Let's get in the game. Father, have we got to go on the street and hunt work, or can you give us a job? James Minturn tried twice. And then, pushing back his chair, left the table precipitately. James Jr. looked after him doubtfully. He turned to Aunt、J、Margaret. "Please excuse me," he said. "I guess he choked. I'd better go pound him on the back like Lucette did us." Junior followed Senior. Malcolm looked at Aunt Margaret. "We are going to be gentlemen," he announced. "Mother won't let us work." It's like this, Malcolm," said Aunt Margaret gently. "Mother had charge of you for ten years, and the women she employed didn't train you as boys should be. So mother has turned you over to father, and for the next ten years you, you will try another plan, and after that you will be big enough to decide how you want to live. But now I think you will just love father's way if you will behave yourself long enough to find out what fun is." Mother won't like it," said Malcolm positively. "I think she does, dear, or she wouldn't have gone and left you to try it," said Aunt Margaret. "She knew what your father would think you should do. If she hadn't thought he was right, she would have taken you with her as she always did before. I just hate being taken on trains and boats with her. So does James. We like the dam and the fish. We're going to have bows and arrows and shoot at Mark." And we're going to swim and row," added William. "And we're going to be soldiers and hurl back the enemy," boasted Malcolm. "Ain't we, Mister Tower?" "Indian scouts are more fun," suggested the tutor. "And there is the money we must earn if we've got to," said Malcolm. "I guess Father is telling James how. I'll go ask him too. Excuse me, Aunt Margaret. Of all the surprises I ever did have, this is the biggest one," said Aunt Margaret. I was afraid I never could like them. I thought this morning it would take years. There is nothing in the world like the receptivity and plasticity of children," said the tutor. "This is my second experience with small boys. My first was very different, but I have taught school some, and I know that a child can settle in a new environment in a few hours." A little later, James Minturn appeared on his veranda with a small boy clinging to each hand. The trio came forth with red eyes, but firmly allied. "Call the car, if you please," William said. "Senior, I'm going to help build that dam higher, and see how many fish I can catch for my pool." Malcolm walked beside him and rubbed his head caressingly across his arm. "We don't have to go on the streets and hunt," he announced. "Father is going to find us work, but I guess while the war is so bad, we better drink milk and send most we earn to the boys who haven't any father. The war won't take our father, will it? Tonight we will pray God not to let that happen," said Aunt Margaret. "Is there room in the car for me too, James? I haven't seen one of those lovely little brook fish in years." James Jr. went to her and leaned against her chair. "I got three in my pool," he boasted. "You may see mine." I'll give you one to keep. I'd love to see them," said Aunt Margaret. "I'll go straight and get my hat, but I think you shouldn't give the fish away, James. They belong to God. He made their home in the water. If you take them out, you will kill them, and He wouldn't like that. Let's just look at them and leave them in the water." Malcolm, the fish belong to God," said James, turning to his brother. "We may play with them, but we mustn't take them out of the water and hurt them." Well, who's going to take them out of the water? cried Malcolm. I'm just going to scoot one over into Father's pool to start him. Will you give him one too? Yes, said James Jr. The next money I earn, I shall send to the war. But the first time I rake the lawn and clean the rugs, I'll give what I earn to Father, so he will have more time to play with us. Father is the biggest man in this city. It may take a few days to get a new regime started, said Father. I've lived only for work for so long, but as soon as it's possible, my day will be so arranged that some part of it shall be yours, boys, to show me what you are doing, and I think one day can be given wholly to taking a lunch and going to the country. 
With an ecstatic whoop, they rushed James Minturn again, and his wide aching arms opened. To This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 10 The Wheel of Life. What each woman honestly wants is her man, her cave, and her baby. Leslie. "'What are your plans for this summer, Leslie?' asked Mr. Winton over his paper at breakfast. "'The real question is, what are yours?' "'I have none,' said Mr. Winton, "'and the truth is I can't see my way to making any for myself. "'Between us strictly, Swain has been hit hard. "'He gave me my chance in life. It isn't in my skin to pack up and leave for the seashore or the mountains on the results of what he helped me to, and allow him to put up his fight alone. If you understood, you'd be ashamed of me if I did it, Leslie. But I do understand, Daddy, cried the girl. What makes you think I don't? All my life you've been telling me how you love Mr. Swain and what a splendid big thing he did for you when you were young. Is the war-making business awfully hard for you men? Close, my girl, said Mr. Winton, bedrock close. That is what cramps Mr. Swain, she continued. It is what cramps all of us, said Mr. Winton. It hit him with peculiar force because he had made bad investments. He was running light anyway in an effort to recoup. All of us are on a tension brought about by the result of political changes to which we were struggling to adjust ourselves when the war began working greater hardships and entailing millions of loss and expenses. I see, and that's why I said the real question was, what are your plans, explained Leslie, because when I find out, if perchance they should involve staying on the job this summer, why, I just wanted to tell you that I'm on the job too. "'and I've thought out the grandest scheme. "'Yes, Leslie, tell me,' said Mr. Winton. "'It's like this,' said Leslie. "'Everybody is economizing shamelessly, "'and that's a bully word, Daddy, "'for in most instances it is shameless. "'Open-faced, Lord save me and my wife "'and my son John and his wife. "'In our women's clubs and lectures, "'magazines and sermons, "'we've had a steady dose all winter "'of hard times and economy.' and I've tried to make my friends see that their efforts at economy are responsible for the very hardest crux of the hard times. You mean, Leslie, suggested Mr. Winton eagerly, I mean all of us quit using eggs, dealers become frightened, eggs soar higher. Economize on meat, packers buy less, meat goes up. All of us discharge our help, army of unemployed swells by millions. It works two ways, and every friend I've got is economizing for herself, and with every stroke for herself, she is weakening her nation's financial position and putting a bigger burden on the man she is trying to help. Well, Leslie, cried her father, the time has come for women to find out what it is all about, and then put their shoulders to the wheel of life and push. But before we gain enough force to start with any momentum, women must get tougher and decide what they want, what they are pushing for. Have you decided what you are pushing for? Unalterably, cried the girl. And what is it? asked her father. My happiness, my joy in life, she exclaimed. And exactly in what do you feel your happiness consists, Leslie? You and Douglas, my home and my men and what they imply, she answered instantly. As I figure it, it's homes that count, Daddy. If the nation prospers, the birth rate of America has got to keep up, or soon the immigrants will be in control everywhere as they are in places right now. Births imply homes. Homes suggest men to support them, women to control them. 
If the present unrest resolves itself into a personal question, so far as the women are concerned at least, if you are going to get to primal things, whether she realizes it or no, what every woman really wants, she learns, as Nellie Minturn learned when she took her naked soul into the swamp and showed it to her God, what every woman wants is her man, her cave, and her baby. If the world is to prosper, that is women's work. Why don't you men who are doing big things realize it and do yourselves what women are going to be forced from home to do? Mighty soon if you don't. Well, Leslie, cried Mr. Winton. You said that before, Daddy, exclaimed the girl. Yet what you truly want of a woman is a home and children. Children imply to all men that what I am to you. If some men have not reared their children so that they receive for them what you get for me, it is time for the men to realize this and change their methods of rearing their daughters and sons. A home should mean to every man what your home does to you. If all men do not get from their homes what you do, in most cases it is their own fault. Of course, I know there are women so abominably obsessed with self they refuse to become mothers and prefer a cafe with tangoing between courses to a home. Such women should have first the ducking stool, and if that isn't efficacious, extermination. They are a disgrace to our civilization and the weakest spot we have. They are at the bottom of the present boiling discontent of women who really want to be home, loving, home-keeping. They are directly responsible for the fathers, sons, brothers, and lovers with two standards of morals. A man reared in the right kind of home by a real mother who goes into other homes of the same kind, ruled by similar mothers, when he leaves his and marries the right girl and establishes for himself a real home, is not going to go wrong. It is the sons, lovers, and husbands of the women who refuse home and children and carry their men into a perpetual round of what they deem pleasure in their youth who find life desolate when age begins to come and who instantly rebel strongest against the very conditions they have made. I have been listening to you all my life, Daddy, and remembering Mother, reading, thinking, and watching for what really pays. And believe me, I've found out. I gave Nellie Minturn the best in my heart the other day, but you should see what I got back. Horrors, Daddy, just plain horrors. I said to Douglas that night when I read him the letter I afterward showed you, that if, as she suggested, I was ever faintly tempted to neglect home life for society, in her I would have all the horrible example I'd ever need. And rest assured, I shall. "'Poor woman!' exclaimed Mr. Winton. "'Exactly!' cried Leslie. "'And the poorest thing about it "'is that she is not to blame in the least. "'You and my mother could have made "'the same kind of a woman of me. "'If you had fed me cake instead of bread, "'if you had given me candy instead of fruit, "'if you had taken me to the show "'instead of entertaining me at home,' If you had sent me to summer resorts instead of summering with me in the country, you'd have had another Nellie on your hands. The world is full of Nellies, by their own parents. The world is full of Nellies, and where one woman flees too strict and monotonous a home to make a Nellie out of herself, ten are taken out and deliberately molded, drilled, and fashioned in Nellies by their own parents. I have lain awake at nights figuring this, Daddy. Some woman is urging me every day to join different movements, and I have been forced to study this out. I know the cause of the present unrest among women. And it is, suggested Mr. Winton. It is the rebound from the pioneer lives of our grandmothers. They and their mothers were at one extreme. We are at the widest sweep of the other. They were forced to enter the forest and in most cases defend themselves from savages and animals, to work without tools, to live with few comforts. In their determination to save their children from hardships, they lost sense, ballast, and reason. They have saved them to such an extent they have lost them. 
By the very method of their rearing, they have robbed their children of love for an interest in home life, and with their own hands sent them to cafes and dance halls where they should be at their own homes building their children for the fashioning of future homes. I tell you, Daddy. Leslie, tell me this, interposed Mr. Winton. Did you get any small part of what you have been saying to me from me? Do you feel what I have tried to teach you and the manner in which I have tried to rear you have put your love for me into your heart and such ideas as you are propounding into your head? Of course, Daddy, cried the girl. Who else? Mother was dear and wonderful, but I scarcely remember her. What you put into the growth of me, that is what is bound to come out when I begin to live independently. This is the best moment of my life, said Mr. Winton. From your birth you have been the better part of me, to me, and with all my heart I have tried to fashion you into such a woman for a future home as your mother began, and you have completed for me. Other things have failed me. I count you my success, Leslie. Oh, Daddy, cried the happy girl. Now go back to our start, said Mr. Winton. I must leave soon. You have plans for the summer, of course. I realized that at the beginning. Are you ready to tell me? I am ready to ask you, she said. Thank you, said Mr. Winton. I appreciate the difference. Surely a man does enjoy counting for something with his women. Spoiled shamelessly, dearest, that's what you are, said Leslie, a spoiled, pampered father. But to conclude, Mr. Swain helped you. Pay back, Daddy, no matter what the cost. Pay back. You help him, I'll help you. My idea was this. For weeks I've foreseen that you wouldn't like to leave business this summer. Douglas is delving into that investigation Mr. Minturn started him on, and he couldn't be dragged away. He's perfectly possessed. Of course, where my men are, like Ruth, there will be I also. So for days I've been working on a plan, and now it's all finished and waiting your veto or approval. Thrilling, Leslie, tell quickly I'm all agog. It's this. Let's not go away and spend big sums on travel, dress, and close the house, and throw our people out of work. Do you realize, Daddy, how long you've had the same housekeeper, cook, maid, and driver? Do you know how badly I'd feel to let them go and risk getting them back in the fall? My scheme is to rent, for practically nothing, a log cabin I know, a little over an hour's run from here, a log cabin with four rooms and a lean-to, and a log stable, beside a lake where there is grand fishing and swimming. But Leslie, protested Mr. Winton, now listen, cried the girl, the rent is nominal. We get the house, stable, orchard, garden, a few acres, and a rented cow. The cabin has two tiny rooms above, one for you, the other for Douglas. Below it has a room for me, a dining room, and a kitchen. The big log barn close beside has space in the haymow for the women and one side below for our driver, the other for the cars. Over the cabin is a loaded grapevine. Around it there are fruit and apple trees. There is a large, rich garden. If I had your permission, I could begin putting in vegetables tomorrow. That would make our summer supply. Rogers, you are not going to tell me Rogers would touch a garden, queried Mr. Winton. I'm going to tell you that Rogers has been with me in every step of my investigations, replied Leslie. Yesterday I called in my household and gave them a lecture on the present crisis. I found them remarkably well-informed audience. They had a very distinct idea that if I economized by dismissing them for the summer and leaving the house with a caretaker, what it would mean to them. Then I took my helpers into the car and drove out the Atwater Road. You know it well, Daddy, the road that runs smooth over miles of country, and then instead of jumping into a lake as it seems to be going to, it swings into a corduroy through a marsh, runs up on a little bridge spanning the channel between two lakes, lifts to Atwater Lake shore, then which none is more lovely. You remember the white sand floor and the clean water for swimming, climbs another hill, 
and opposite beautiful wood there stands a log cabin i told you of there i took them and explained they could go out and clean up in a day rogers could plant the garden and take enough on one truckload and in the big car for a beginning we may have wood for the fireplace by gathering it from the forest floor rogers again are you quite sure about rogers suppose you ride with him going down and ask him yourself suggested leslie rogers is anxious to hold his place you see it's like this all of them get regular wages have a chance at the swimming rowing gardening and the country the saving comes in on living expenses out there we have the cow flour fish and poultry from the neighbors fresh eggs butter and the garden i can cut expenses to one-fourth lights altogether moonshine and candles will serve cooking fuel gasoline daddy will you go tonight and see no i won't go tonight and see i'll go f- swim and fish said mr winton great heavens leslie do you really mean to live all summer beside a lake where a man can expand absorb and exercise i must get out my fishing tackle i wonder what douglas has i've tried that lake when bass were slashing around wild thorn and crab trees shedding petals and bugs it is man's sport there i like black bass fishing and i remember that water fine for swimming not the exhilaration of salt perhaps but grand clean old northern indiana water cool enough from springs i love it lord leslie why don't we own that place why haven't we homed there and been comfortable for years i shall go ahead then you should go a hurry miss hurry cried mr winton i'll give you just two days one to clean the other to move tomorrow night send for me I want to swim and cornbread, milk and three rashers of bacon for my dinner and nothing else. And can't the maids have my room and let me have a blanket on the hay? But father, the garden cautioned Leslie. Oh, drat the garden! cried Mister Winton. But if you go to dratting things, I can't economize. The girl reminded him. Rogers and I have that garden down on paper, and it's late now. Leslie, don't the golf links lie half a mile from there? Asked Mister Winton. Closer, Daddy said the girl. Right around the corner. I don't see why you didn't think of it before. He said. Have you told Douglas? Not a word. Exclaimed Leslie. I'm going to get his room ready. Invite him out when everything is in fine order. Don't make things fine, said Mister Winton. Let's have them rough. They will be rough enough to suit you, Daddy. Laughed Leslie. But a few things have got to be done. Then hurry and don't forget the snake question. People are and have been living there for generations. Common care is all that is required," said Leslie. "I'll be careful, but if you tell Bruce until I am ready, I'll never forgive you." Mister Winton arose. "Come to me, arms," he laughed, spreading them wide. "I wonder if Douglas Bruce knows what a treasure he is going to possess." Certainly not," said Leslie emphatically. "I wouldn't have him know for the world. I am going to be his progressive housekeeping party, to which he is invited every day after we are married, and each day he has got a new surprise coming that I hope he will like. The woman who endures and wears well in matrimony is the one who keeps something to herself. It's my opinion that modern marriages would be more satisfactory." If the engaged parties would not come so nearly being married for so long before they are, there is so little left for afterward in most cases that it soon grows monotonous. Leslie, where did you get all this? He asked. I told you from you mostly, explained the girl, and from watching my friends. Go on, Daddy, and send Rogers back soon. I want to begin buying radish, lettuce, and onion sets. So Leslie telephoned Douglas Bruce that she would be very busy with housekeeping affairs the coming two days, and with the enthusiastic support of her helpers began work. She made a list of what would be required for that day, left the maids to collect it, and went to buy seeds and a few tools. 
Then returning, she divided her forces, and leaving part to pack the bedding, old dishes, and things absolutely required for living, and stocking the pantry, she took the loaded car and drove to Atwater Lake. The owner of the land, a cultured, refined gentleman, who spoke the same brand of English used by the Wintons, and evinced a knowledge of the same books, was genuinely interested in Leslie and her plans. It was a landowner's busiest season, but he spared a man an hour with the plow to turn up the garden. Anne came down himself and with practiced hand swung the sigh and made sure about the snakes. Soon the maids had the cabin walls swept, the floors scrubbed, the windows washed, and that was all that could be done. The seeds were earthen folded in warm black beds with flower seeds tucked in for borders. The cut grass was raked back and spread to dry for the rented cow. When nothing further was to be accomplished there, they returned to Multiopolis to hasten preparations for the coming day. It was all so good Leslie stopped at her father's office to see if she could speak with him and poured a flood of clover bloom, bird notes, and water shimmer into his willing ears that very nearly spoiled his power of concentration for the day. She seldom went to Douglas Bruce's offices, but she ran up a few minutes to try in person to ease what she felt would be disappointment in not spending the evening with her. The day would be full far into the night with affairs at home. He would notice the closing of the house, and she could not risk him spoiling her plans by finding out what they were before she was ready. She found him surrounded by huge ledgers, delving and already fretting for Mickey. Mickey could do a thing in half the time. Mickey handed the right book. Mickey had sense enough to see when the light was in a fellow's eyes and shift the blind. She stood laughing in his doorway and was half piqued to find him so absorbed in his work and so full of the boy he was missing. That he seemed to take her news that she was too busy to see him that night with quite too bearable calmness. He was almost too cheerful about it and too ready with the suggestion that when he finished, he and Mickey would go to the golf grounds and have a game, and then he would spend the evening at the club. But his earnestness about coming the following night worked his pardon, and Leslie left laughing to herself over the surprise in store for him. Bruce bent over his work and prayed for Mickey. Everything went wrong without him. He was enough irritated by the boy who was not Mickey that when the boy who was Mickey came to his door, he was delighted to see him. He wanted to say, "Hello, little friend. Come, get in the game quickly." But two considerations withheld him. Mickey's manners were a trifle too casual. At times, they irritated Douglas. And if he took the boy into his life as he hoped to, he would come into constant contact with Leslie and her friends, who were cultured people of homing instincts. Mickey's manners must be polished, and the way to do it was not to drop to his level, but to improve Mickey. And again, the day before, he had told Mickey to sit down and wait until an order was given him. To invite him to get in the game now was a good alliteration. It pleased the formal Scotch ear, as did many another United States phrase of the street, so musical, concise, and packed with meaning as to be almost classic. But in his heart, he meant, as Mickey had suspected, to do him good, so he must lay his foundations with care. What he said was a cordial and cheerful "Good morning." Noon corrected Mickey. Right, ye are. Good, it is. What's my job? Excuse me, I won't ask that again. Plenty, Douglas admitted. But first, any luck with the paper route? All over, but killing the boy I sold it to if he doesn't do it right. I ain't perfectly crazy about him. He's a papa's boy and pretty soft, but maybe he'll learn. And it was a fine chance for me, so I soaked it. To whom did you sell, Mickey? Asked Douglas. To your driver for his boy, answered Mickey. We talked it over last night. Say, was your driver the same? Continued, or did you detect glimmerings of beefsteak and blood in him this morning? Why? Asked Douglas curiously. Oh, he's such a stiff. Explained Mickey. He looks about as lively as a salted herring. And did you make an effort to enliven him, Mickey? Sure, cried Mickey. 
The operation was highly successful. The patient made a fine recovery. Right on the job, right on the street, right at the thickest traffic corner, right at Dead Man's Crossing, he let out a whoop that split the features of a copper who hadn't smiled in years. It was a double play, and it worked fine. What I want to know is whether it was fleeting or holds over. It must be over, Mickey, said Douglas. Since you mention it, he opened the door with the information that it was a fine morning, and I recall that there was color on his face and light in his usually dull eyes. Good, cried Mickey. Then there's some hope that his kid may go and do likewise. The boy who takes your route has to smile, Mickey? Well, you see, most of my morning customers are regulars, and they're used to it, said Mickey. The minute one gets into his paper, he's lost till knockin' off time. But if he starts on a real wide-awake, soulful smile, he's a chance of reproducing it before the day is over. Leastwise, he has more chance than if he never smiles. So it is part of the contract that the boy smiles at his work? questioned Douglas. It is so, exclaimed Mickey. I asked Mr. Chuffner at the Herald office what was a fair price for my route. You see, I've sold the Herald from the word go, and we're pretty thick. So he told me what he thought. It lifted my lid, but when I communicated it to Henry, casual-like, he never batted an eye. So I'm going to try his boy till I'm satisfied, and if he can swing the job, it's a go. Your customers should give you a vote of thanks. And so they will, cried Mickey. You see, the men who buy of me are the top crust of Multiopolis, the big fine men who can smile, and open their heads and say a pleasant word, and they like to. It does them good. I live on it. I always get my papers close home as I can, so I have time coming down in the cars to take a peep myself. And nearly always there are at least three things on the first page that hit you in the eye. Once, long ago, I was in the Herald office with a note to Chuffner, the big chief, and I gave him a little word jostle as I passed it over, and he looked at me and laughed good-natured-like. So I handed him this. Are you the big stiff that bosses the makeup? He says, mostly. I can control it if I want to. All right for you, I said. I live by selling your papers, but I could sell a heap more if I had a better chance. Chance in what way, said he. Building your first page, said I. He said, sure. What is it that you want? I'll show you, said I. I'll give you the call I used this morning. Then I cut loose, and just like on the street, I cried it, and he yelled some himself. What more do you want, he asked me. A lot, I said. You see, I only got a little time on the cars before my men began to get on, and my time is precious. I can't read second, third, and forty-eleventh page, hunting up eye-openers. I must get them first page, cause I'm short time, and I got my pack to hang on to. Now make an up, if you'd have put that Germans driven from the last foot of Belgian soil first, it would have been better, cause that's what every living soul wants. That's the biggest thing about ourselves. Place it prominent in big black letters where I can get it quick and easy, and then put me in a scream. Get me a laugh in my call, and I'll sell you out all by myself. Folks are spending millions per annum for the glad scream at night. They'll pay just the same morning. Give them a chance. I live on a laugh, said I to Chefner. He looked me over, and he said, When you get too big for the papers, you come to me, and I'll make you a top-notch reporter out of you. Thanks, boss, said I. You couldn't graft that job on me with asphaltum and a buzzsaw. I'm going to be on your front page fore you know it, but it's going to be a poetry piece that will raise your hair. I ain't going to frost my cake, poking into folks' private business, telling shameful things on them that half kills them. Lots of times I see them getting their dose on the cars, and they just shiver and go white and shake. Nick's on the printing about shame and sin and trouble in the papers for me. I said, and he just laughed and looked at me closer, and he said, All right, bring your poetry yourself, and if they don't let you in, give them this. And he wrote a line I got at home yet. Is that all about Chaffner? 
asked Douglas. Oh, no, said Mickey. He said, Well, here is a batch of items being written up for first page tomorrow. According to you, I should give Belgian citizens flocking back to search for devastated homes the first place? That's got the first place in the heart of every man in God's world. Giving it first place is putting it where it belongs. Here's the rest, said he. What do you want next? At same glance, I always take this, said I, pointing to where it said, Movement on foot to eliminate graft from city offices. You think that comes next, said he? Sure, said I. Hits the pocketbook. Sure, heart first, money next. Are you so sure it isn't exactly the reverse, asked he? Know it, says I. Watch the crowds any day, and, and every clip you'll see that loving a man's country and his home and his kids and getting fair play comes before money. Yes, I guess it does, he said thoughtful-like. Least it should. We'll make it the policy of this paper to put it that way anyhow. What next? Now your laugh, said I, and while you're at it, make it scream. All right, he said. I haven't anything funny in yet, but I'll get it. Now show me where the, you want these spaced. So I showed him, and every single time you look, you'll see Mr. Harold is made up that way. And you ought to hear me trolling out that Belgian line soft and easy, snapping in the graft quick-like, and then yelling out to scream. You bet it catches them. If I can't get that kid on his job, spect I'll have to take it back myself. Least if he can't get on, he's doomed to get off. I gave him a three days try, and if he doesn't catch by that time, he never will, see? But how are you going to know? asked Douglas. I'm going down early and follow him and drill him like a Dutch recruit, and he'll wake up my men and interest them and fetch the laugh, or he'll stop. You think you got a fair price? asked Douglas. Know it, and it's worth. And it looks like a margin to me, said Mickey. That's all right then. And thank you for telling me about the paper, said Douglas. I enjoyed it immensely. I see you are a keen student of human nature. About all the studying I get a chance at, said Mickey. You'll have opportunity at other things now, said Douglas. Since you mention it, I see your point about the papers. But if that works on businessmen going to business, it should work on a jury. I think I've had it in mind that if I was to be a compendium of information and impress on a judge or jury what I know and why what I say is right, you give me the idea that a better way would be to impress on them what they know. Put it like this. First, soften their hearts. Next, touch their pockets. Then make them laugh. Is that the idea, Mickey? Duck again, you're doing fine. I ain't made my living selling men papers for this long not to know the big boy's sum and more. Each man is different, but you can cod him or bluff him or scare him or let down the floodgates. Some way you can put it over if you take each one separate and hit him where he lives. See? Finding his dwelling place is the trouble. Mickey, I do see, cried Douglas. What you tell me will be invaluable to me. You know, I am from another land, and I have personal ways of thinking, and the men I'm accustomed to are different. What I have been centering on is myself and what I can do. Won't work here. What you got to get a beat on here is the other fellow and how to do him, see? Take these books and fly, said Douglas. I've spent one of the most profitable hours of my life. But concretely, it is an hour, and we're going to the country club tonight, and may stay as long as we choose, as you can, I mean, and we're going to have a grand time. You like going to the country, don't you? Ain't words for telling, said Mickey, gathering his armload of books and speeding down the hall. When the day's work was finished with a load of books to deliver before an office closed, they started on the run to the clubhouse. Bruce waited in the car while Mickey sped in with the books, and returning to save opening the door and crossing before the man he was fast beginning to idolize, Mickey took one of his swift cuts across the back end of the car. While his hand was outstretched and his foot uplifted to enter, from a high-piled passing truck toppled a box. 
not a big box, but large enough to knock Mickey senseless and breathless when it struck him between the shoulders. Douglas had Mickey in the car with orders for the nearest hospital, toward which they were hurrying. When the boy opened his eyes and sat up, he looked inquiringly at Douglas across whose knees he had found himself. What, what happened? he questioned with his first good in drawing of recovered breath. A box fell from a truck loaded past reason and almost knocked the life out of you, cried Douglas. Knocked the life out of me, repeated Mickey. You've been senseless for three blocks, Mickey, said Douglas indignantly. A slow horror spread over Mickey's face. His eyes almost protruded. His mouth fell open, and he was not a pleasant sight as the inrush of blood receded. What, what are you going to do? He wavered. Running for the hospital, said Douglas. Suppose my head had been busted, and I'd been stretched on the glass table, and maybe laid up for days or knocked out altogether, demanded Mickey. You'd have the best surgeon in Multiopolis and every care, Mickey, assured Douglas. Ugh! Mickey collapsed utterly. Must be worse hurt than I thought, was Douglas' mental comment. He couldn't be a coward. But Mickey almost proved that very thing by regaining his senses again and immediately falling into spasms of long-drawn, shuddering sobbing. Douglas held him carefully. "'every moment becoming firmer in his conviction of one of two things. "'Either he was hurt worse, or he was... "'He would not let himself think it. "'But never did a boy appear to less advantage. "'Douglas urged the driver to speed, and Mickey heard and understood. N "'Never mind,' he sobbed. "'I'm all right, Mr. Bruce. I ain't hurt, not much. "'I'll be all right in a minute.' "'If you're not hurt, what is the matter with you?' "'A minute!' gasped Mickey as another spasm of sobbing caught him. "'I am amazed,' cried Douglas. "'A little jolt like that? "'You're acting like a coward, Mickey.' "'The word straightened Mickey. "'Drive on,' he said. "'I tell you I ain't hurt.' "'Then he turned to Douglas. "'Coward? "'Who, me?' he cried. "'Me that's made my way since I can remember? "'Coward, did you say?' "'Of course not, Mickey,' cried Douglas. "'Excuse me, I shouldn't have said that, but it was unlike you. "'What the devil is the matter with you?' "'I helped carry in a busted head and saw the glass table once,' he cried. "'Inch more and it would have been my head, and I might have been knocked out for days. "'Oh, Lord, what will I do?' "'Mickey, you're not afraid,' asked Douglas. "'Afraid? Me? About as good as a coward,' commented Mickey.' "'What is the matter with you?' demanded Douglas. "'Mickey stared at him amazedly. "'Oh, Lord,' he panted, "'you don't suppose I was thinking about myself, do you?' "'I don't know what to think,' exclaimed Douglas. "'Sure, how could you?' conceded Mickey. "'He choked back another big dry sob. "'Give me a minute to think,' he said. "'Oh, God, what have I been doing? "'I see now what I'm up against.' Mickey, said Douglas Bruce suddenly, filled with swelling compassion, I am beginning to understand. Won't you tell me? I guess I got to, panted Mickey, but I'm afraid. Oh, Lord, I'm so afraid. Afraid of me, Mickey? asked Douglas gently now. Yes, afraid of you, said Mickey, and afraid of her. Afraid of her more than you. You mean Miss Winton? pursued Douglas. "'Yes, I mean Miss Winton,' replied Mickey. "'I guess I don't risk her or you either. "'I guess I stop here and go to the nurse lady. "'She's used to folks in trouble. "'She's trained to know what to do. "'Why, sure, that's the thing.' "'Your back hurts, Mickey?' questioned Douglas. "'My back hurts? "'Ah, oh, forget my back,' cried Mickey roughly. "'I ain't hurt. Honest, I ain't.' "'Mickey began gnawing his fingers in nervous excitement.' Douglas took a long, penetrating look at the small, shaking figure. Then he said softly, "'I wish you wanted to confide in me, Mickey. I can't tell you how much you mean to me, or how glad I'd be if you'd trust me. But if you have someone else you like better, where is it you want to be driven?' "'Course there ain't anyone I'd like better than you, except—' He caught a name on the tip of his tongue and paused. 
"'You see, it's like this,' he explained. "'I've been to this nurse lady before, "'and I know exactly what she'll say and think. "'If you don't think like I do, and if you go and take—' "'Gracious heaven, Mickey, you don't think I'd try to take anything you wanted, do you?' demanded Douglas. "'I don't know what you'd do,' said Mickey. "'I only know what one swell dame I struck wanted to do.' "'Mickey,' said Douglas, "'when I don't know what you are thinking about, I can't be of much help. "'But I'd give considerable if you felt that you had come to love me enough to trust me.' "'Trust you? Sure I trust you about myself. "'But this is—' cried Mickey. "'This is about someone else?' asked Douglas casually. Mickey leaned forward, his elbows on his knees, his head bent with intense thinking. "'Much as you're doing for me,' he muttered. "'If you really care, if it makes a difference to you, "'of course I can trust you. "'If you don't think as I do, you surely can,' cried Douglas Bruce. "'Now, Mickey, both of us are too shaken to care for the country.' "'Take me home with you, and let's have supper together and become acquainted. "'We can't know each other on my ground alone. "'I must meet you on yours, and prove that I'm really your friend, "'and can accommodate myself to any circumstance you can. "'Let's go where you live and clean up and have supper.' "'Go where I live? You?' cried Mickey. "'Yes,' said Douglas. "'You come from where you live fresh and clean every day. "'So can I.' "'Take me home with you and stop at the nearest good grocery, "'and we will get something to eat. "'I want to go dreadfully, Mickey. Please?' "'Well, I ain't such a cat. I'm afraid for you to see how I live,' he said. "'That wouldn't kill you, though you wouldn't want to come more than once. "'That ain't what I was thinking about.' "'Think all you like, Mickey,' said Douglas. "'Henry, drive to the end of the car line where you've gone before.' On the way he stopped at a grocery, then a café, and at each place piles of tempting packages were placed in the car. Mickey's brain was working fast, and one big fact was beginning to lift above all others. His treasure was slipping from him, and for her safety it had to be so. If he had been struck on the head, forced to undergo an operation, and had lain insensible for hours— Mickey could get no further with that thought. He had to stop and proceed with the other part of his problem. Of course she was better off with him than where she had been. No sane person could dispute that. She was happy and looking improved each day, but could she be made happier and cared for still better by someone else and cured without the long wait for him to earn the money? If she could... What would be the right name for him if he kept her on what he could do? So they came at last, as near as the car could go, to Mickey's home in Sunrise Alley. At the foot of the last flight, Mickey paused, package-laden. Now I'll have to ask you to wait a minute, he said. He ascended, unlocked the door, and stepped inside. Peach's eyes gleamed with interest as the packages, but she waved him back. As Mickey closed the door, she cried, "'My poetry piece! Say it, Mickey!' "'You'll have to wait again,' said Mickey. "'I got hit in the back with a box, and I knocked the poetry out of me. "'You'll have to wait till after supper tonight, and then I'll fix the grandest one yet. "'Will that do?' "'Yes, if the box hit hard, Mickey,' conceded Peaches. "'It hit so blame hard, Miss Chicken, that it knocked me down and knocked me out.' "'and Mr. Bruce picked me up and carried me three blocks in his car "'before I got my wind or knew what ailed me. "'Peach's face was tragic, and her hands stretched toward him. "'Mickey was young, and his brain was whirling, "'so it whirled off the thought that came first. "'And if it had hit me hard enough to bust my head, "'and I'd have been carried to a hospital to be mended, "'and wouldn't have knowed what hurt me for days like sometimes, "'who'd have fed and bathed you, miss?' Peaches gazed at him, wordless. "'You close your mouth and tell me, miss,' demanded Mickey, brutal with emotion. "'If I hadn't come, what would you have done?' Peaches shut her mouth and stared with it closed. At last she ventured a solution. "'You'd have told our nurse lady,' she said. Mickey made an impatient gesture. 
"'Hospitals by the dozen, kid,' he said, "'and not a chance in a hundred I'd be took to the Star of Hope. "'And times when your head is busted, "'you don't know a thing for most a week. "'What would you do if I didn't come for a week? "'I'd have to slide off the bed if it killed me "'and roll to the cupboard and make the things do,' said Peaches. "'You couldn't get up to it to save your life,' said Mickey, "'and there's never enough for a week. "'And you couldn't get to the water, and not enough. "'What would you do?' "'Mickey, what would I do?' wavered Peaches. "'Well, I know if you don't,' said Mickey, "'and I ain't going to tell you. "'But I'll tell you this much. "'You'd be scared and hurt worse than you ever was yet, "'and it's soon going to be too hot for you here, "'so I got to move you to a cooler place.' "'and I don't risk being the only one knowing where you are another day, "'or my think tank will split. "'It's about split now. "'I don't want to do it, miss, but I got to. "'So you take your drink and let me straighten you "'and wash your face and put your pretties on. "'Then Mr. Douglas Bruce, that we work for now, "'is coming to see you and he's going to stay for supper. "'Now cut it out. Shut right up. "'You needn't beller nor get scared.' "'nor have a tantrum. "'He's sitting out there on the hot steps "'where it's a lot worse than here, "'and this is bad enough, "'and we ain't got time. "'And he won't get you, you needn't ask. "'What would he want of you? "'Here, let me fix you, and you see, miss, "'that you act a lady, girl, "'and don't make me lose my job with my boss, "'or we can't pay our rent. "'Hold still till I get your ribbon right "'and slip a fresh necktie on you. "'There!' "'Mickey,' began Peaches. "'Shut up,' said Mickey in desperation. "'Never mind you, miss. "'You belong to me. "'I'm taking care of you. "'You answer what he says to you pretty "'or you'll not get any supper this night. "'And look at that bundles he's got. "'Sit up and be nice. "'This is a party.' "'Mickey darted around, arranging the room, "'setting back the dishes from Peaches' lunch, "'pulling up a chair.' Then he flung the door wide and called, Ready! Douglas Bruce climbed the stairs and entered the door. As Mickey expected, his gaze centered and stopped, and for as long as a gentleman requires to recover himself, it remained centered. Mickey began taking packages from his hands, and still gazing, Douglas yielded them. Then he stepped forward and Mickey placed the chair and said, Mr. Douglas Bruce, this is Lily. This is Lily Peaches O'Halloran. Will you have a chair? Douglas was conscious that Mickey was making a better appearance than he, as he strove to collect his thought and frame a speech that would not set the wildly frightened little creature before him shrieking. Mickey intervened. He turned to Peaches, put his arm around her, and drew her to him as he bent and kissed her. "'He's all right, flowersy girl,' he said. "'We like to have him come. "'He's our friend, our big, nice friend, "'who won't let a soul on earth get us. "'He doesn't even want us himself, "'cause he's got one girl. "'His girl is the moonshine lady that sent you the doll. "'Maybe she will come some day, too, "'and maybe she'll make the precious child a new dress. "'Where is she?' Peaches clung to Mickey and passed him, peered at her visitor, and the visitor smiled his most winning smile on the tiniest girl, with the most delicately cut and molded face, the softest big eyes, and the silkiest golden curls he had ever seen. He recognized Leslie's ribbon, and noted the wondrous beauty of the small white face, now slowly flushing the faintest pink with excitement. Still clinging, she smiled back. Wordlessly, Douglas reached over and picked up the doll. Then the right thought came at last. Has the precious child been good today, he asked. Peaches released Mickey and dro dropped back against her pillows, her smile now dazzling. Just as good, she said. Fine, said Douglas, straightening the long dress. "'And that's my slate and lesson,' said Peaches. "'Fine,' he said again, as if it was the only adjective he knew. "'Mickey glanced at him curiously and grinned. "'She does sort of knock you out,' he said. "'Sort is rather poor. Completely would be better,' said Douglas. 
"'She's the loveliest little sister in all the world, Mickey. "'But she doesn't resemble you. "'Is she like your mother?' "'Lily isn't my sister, only as you wanted me for a brother,' said Mickey. "'She was left, and nobody was taking care of her. "'And she's my find, and you bet your life I'm going to always keep her.' "'Oh, and how long have you had her, Mickey?' asked Douglas. "'Now that's just what the Orphings Home Dame asked me,' said Mickey with finality. "'And we are nicks on those dames, and they're asking.' "'Lily is mine, I tell you, my family. "'Now you visit with her, and I'll get supper.' "'Mickey pushed up the table and began opening packages "'and setting forth their contents, "'watching as he moved swiftly and with assurance. "'His head high and his lips even, "'a slow, deep respect for the big soul and the little body "'began to dawn in the heart of Douglas Bruce. "'Understanding of Mickey came in rivers swift and strong.' And while he wondered, and while he watched entranced, over and over in his head went the line, Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. With every gentle act of Mickey for the child Douglas's liking for him grew, and when he went over to the supper and with the judgment of a skilled nurse selected the most delicate and suitable food for her, with each uplift of her adoring eyes to Mickey's responsive face, in the heart of the Scotsman swelled the marvel and the miracle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 11 The Advent of Nancy and Peter. A thing I can't understand is why, when the Lord was making mothers, He didn't cut all of them from the same piece He did you. Mickey. When Leslie began the actual work of closing her home, except a room for the caretaker, packing what moth and dust would corrupt, putting in safety deposit what thieves might break in and steal, and loading what would be wanted for the country, she found the task too big for the time allotted, and wisely telephoned Douglas that she would be compelled to postpone seeing him until the following day. Leslie, laughed Douglas over the telephone, did you ever hear of the man who cut off his dog's tail an inch at a time so it wouldn't hurt so badly? I do seem to have heard Father refer to that particular dog, retorted the girl. Well, this process of cutting me out of seeing you a day at a time reminds me of that particular dog, and evokes my sympathy for the canine as never before. It's a surprise I'm getting ready for you, Douglas, explained Leslie. If you'll wait patiently one day more, I promise you that I'll be at the office with the car at four tomorrow, and all you've missed I'll make up to you. It is a surprise, all right, answered Douglas. I'll promise to wait. I can't say how patiently. I'll be on the curbstone at four, and bear of morning I have got a surprise for you, too. Oh, goody, cried Leslie, I adore surprises. You'll adore this one. "'Douglas, you might give me a hint,' she suggested. "'Very well,' he laughed. "'Since last I saw you, I have seen the loveliest girl of my experience.' "'Delightful. Am I to see her also?' asked Leslie. "'Undoubtedly,' explained Douglas. "'And you'll succumb to her charms, just as I did.' "'When may I meet her?' asked Leslie eagerly. "'I can't just say, but soon now,' replied Douglas. "'All right,' agreed the girl. "'Be ready at four. Leslie sat in frowning thought a moment before the telephone, and then her ever-ready laugh bubbled. Why didn't I think of it while I was talking, she wondered. Of course Mickey has taken him to see his Lily, and she's a beautiful child. I must visit her soon and see about that wrong back before bone and muscle grow harder. Then she began her task, and for the remainder of the day was so busy she made lists and worked on schedule. By evening she had a gasoline stove set up, the kitchen provisioned, 
her father's room ready, an arrangement sufficiently completed that she sent the car to bring him to his dinner of cornbread and bacon under an apple tree, scattering pink petals with every lake breeze beside the kitchen door. Then they took a boat, and with Leslie at the oars and her father casting, they landed three black bass. Douglas Bruce did not mind one day so much, but he resented too. When he greeted Mickey that morning, it was not with the usual salutation of his friends. So the boy knew there was something not exactly right. He was not feeling precisely jovial himself. He was under suspended judgment. He knew that when Mr. Bruce had time to think and talk over the situation with Miss Winton, both of them might very probably agree with the woman who said the law would take Lily from him and send her to a charity home for children. Mickey, with his careful drilling on the subject, was in rebellion. How could the law take Lily from him? Did the law know anything about her? Was she in the care of the law when he found her? Wouldn't the law have allowed her to die, groveling in filth and rags, inside a few more hours? He had not infringed on the law in any way. He had merely saved the life the law had forgotten to save. Now, when he had it in his possession, and in far better condition than he found it, how had the law power to step in and rob him? Mickey did not understand, and there was nothing in his heart that could teach him. He had found her, he would keep her. The Orphings Home could not have her. The law should not have her. Only one possibility had any weight with Mickey. If someone like Mr. Bruce or Miss Winton wanted to give her a home of luxury, could provide care at once, for which he would be forced to wait years to earn the money, if they wanted her and the Carol Man of many miracles would come for them, did he dare leave her lying an hour when there was even a hope she might be on her feet? There was only one answer to that with Mickey, and it made a pain in his heart. So his greeting lacked its customary spontaneity. On this basis they began the day, but work performed by two people, each with his thought elsewhere, was not a success. By noon Bruce was irritable, and Mickey was as nearly sullen as it was in his nature to be. At two o'clock Bruce surrendered, summoned the car, and started to the golf grounds. He had played three holes when he overtook a man who said a word that arrested his attention, and both of them stopped, and with notebooks and pencils under the shade of a big tree, began discussing the question that meant more to Douglas than anything save Leslie. He dismissed Mickey for the afternoon, promising him that if he would be ready by six, he should be driven back to the city. Mickey made his way to the car, left the clubs he was carrying, and looked around him for a way to spend three hours. In his mood, unemployed caddies did not interest him. He wanted to be alone and concentrate on his problem. But people were everywhere and more coming by the carload. He could see no place that was then or would be undisturbed. The long road with grassy sides gave big promises of leading somewhere to the quiet retreat he sought. "'telling the driver that if he were not back by six "'he would be waiting down the road. "'Mickey started on foot. "'In thought so deep he scarcely appreciated the grasses he trod, "'the perfume in his nostrils, the concert in his ears. "'What did at last arouse him was the fact that he was very thirsty, "'and that made him realize that this was the warmest day of the season. "'Instantly his mind flew to the might of a girl lying so patiently watching the clock for his coming, living for the sound of his feet. Mickey stopped and studied the landscape. A cool, gentle breeze crossed the clover field beside the way and refreshed him in its passing. He sucked his lungs full and lifted his cap, shaking the hair from his forehead. It was so delightful he stuffed the cap into his pocket and walked slowly along, intending to stop at the nearest farmhouse and ask for water. But the first home was not to Mickey's liking. He went on and passed another and another. Then he came to land that attracted him. The fences were so straight, 
the corners were so clean where they were empty, so delightful where they were filled with alder, wild plum, hawthorn, attractive locations for birds of the bushes that were field and orchard feeders. Then the barn and outbuildings looked so neat and prosperous. Grazing cattle in rank meadows were so sleek, and then a big white house began to peep from the screen of vines, bushes, and trees. "'Well, if the water here gives you fever, it will anywhere,' said Mickey, and turning in at the open gate started up a walk having flower beds on each side. There was a wide grassy lawn, and the big trees scattered around afforded almost complete shade. Mickey had never seen a home like it closely. He walked slowly, looking right and left, drinking in the perfect quiet peace and rest. He scarcely could realize that there were places in the world where families lived alone like this. He tried to think how he would feel if he belonged there, and when he reached the place where he saw Lily on a comfort under a big bloom-laden pear tree, his throat grew hard. "'his eyes dry and his feet heavy. "'Then the screen to the front door swung back "'and a smiling woman in a tidy gingham dress "'came through and stood awaiting Mickey. "'I just told Peter when he came back alone, "'I bet a penny you got off at the wrong stop,' she cried. "'I'm so glad you found your way by yourself, "'but you must be tired and hot walking. "'Come right in and have a glass of milk "'and strip your feet and I'll ring for Junior.' For one second, Mickey was dazed. The next, he knew what it must mean. These people were the kind whom God had made so big and generous they divided home and summer with tenement children from the big city thirty miles away. Some boy was coming for a week, maybe, into what exactly filled Mickey's idea of heaven. But he was not the boy. Most breaks my heart to tell you, he said, but I ain't the boy you're expecting. I'm just taking a walk, and I thought maybe you'd let me have a drink. I've wanted one past the last three houses, but none looked as if they'd have half such good cool water as this. Now don't that beat the nation, exclaimed the woman. The Multiopolis papers are just oozing sympathy for the poor city children who are wild for woods and water, and when I got myself nerved up to try one, and thought it over till I was really anxious about it, and got my children all worked up, too. Here, for the second time, Peter knocks off plowing and goes to the trolley to meet one, and he doesn't come. I've got a notion to write that editor of the Herald and tell him my experience. I think it's funny. But you wanted water. Come this way. Mickey followed a footpath, white with pear petals, around the big house, and standing beside a pump, waited while the woman stepped to the back porch for a cup. He took it and drank slowly. Thank you, ma'am, he said as he handed it back and turned to the path. Yesterday had weakened his nerve. He was going to cry again. He took a quick step forward, but the woman was beside him, her hand on his shoulder. Wait a minute, she said. Sit on this bench under the pear tree. I want to ask you something. Excuse me and rest until I come back. Mickey leaned against the tree, shut his eyes, and fought with all his might. He was too big to cry. The woman would think him a coward as Mr. Bruce had. Then things happened as they actually do at times. The woman hurriedly came from the door, sat on the bench beside him, and said, I went in there to watch you through the window, but I can't stand this a second longer. "'You poor child, you. Now tell me right straight, what's the matter?' Mickey tried, but no sound came. The woman patted his shoulder. "'Now doesn't it beat the band?' she said, to the backyard in general. "'Just a little fellow, not in long trousers yet, and bearing such a burden he can't talk. "'I guess maybe God has a hand in this. "'I'm not so sure my boy hasn't come after all.' "'Who are you, and where are you going? "'And don't you want to send your ma word "'you will stay here a week with me?' "'Mickey lifted a bewildered face. "'Well, I couldn't, lady,' he said brokenly, "'but gaining control as he went on. "'I must work. "'Mr. Bruce needs me. "'I'm a regular plute compared with most of the newsies. "'You wouldn't want to do anything for me who has so much. "'But if you're honestly thinking about taking a boy "'and he hasn't come... How would you like to have a little girl in his place? 
a little girl about so long and so wide, with a face like Easter church flowers and rings of gold on her head, and who wouldn't be half the trouble a boy would, because she hasn't ever walked, so she couldn't get into things. Oh, my goodness, a crippled little girl? She isn't crippled, said Mickey. She's as straight as you are, what there is of her. She had so little food and care, her back didn't seem to stiffen, and her legs won't walk. She wouldn't be half so much trouble as a boy. Honest, dearest lady, she wouldn't. Who are you? asked the woman. Mickey produced a satisfactory pedigree and gave unquestionable references which she recognized, for she slowly nodded at the names of Chuffner and Bruce. And who is the little girl you were asking me to take? Mickey studied the woman and then began to talk, cautiously at first. "'ashamed to admit the squalor and the awful truth "'of how he had found the thing he loved. "'Then gathering courage, he began what ended in an outpouring. "'The woman watched him and listened, "'and when Mickey had no further word, "'She is only a tiny girl?' she asked wonderingly. "'The littlest girl you ever saw,' said Mickey. "'Perfectly helpless?' marveled the woman. "'Oh, no, she can sit up and use her hands,' said Mickey. She can feed herself and write on her slate and learn her lessons. It's only that she stays put. She has to be lifted if she's moved. You lift her, queried the woman. Could with one hand, said Mickey tersely. You say this young lawyer you work for, for whose name I see in the Herald connected with the investigation going on, is at the clubhouse right now, she asked. Yes, answered Mickey. He's coming past here this evening, she pursued. Mickey explained. About how much waiting on would your little girl take, she asked next. Well, just at present, she does the waiting on me, said Mickey. You see, dearest lady, I have to get her washed and fix her breakfast and her lunch beside the bed, and be downtown by seven o'clock, and I don't get back till six. Then I wash her again to freshen her up and cook her supper, and then she says her lesson and her prayers and goes to sleep. "'So you see, it's mostly her waiting on me. "'A boy couldn't be less trouble than that, could he?' "'It doesn't seem like it,' said the woman. "'And no matter how much bother she was, "'I guess I could stand it for a week, "'if she's such a little girl and can't walk. "'The difficulty is this. "'I promised my son Junior a boy, "'and his heart is so set. "'He's wild about the city. "'He's going to be gone before we know it. He doesn't seem to care for anything we have or do. I don't know just what he hoped to get out of a city boy, but I promised him one. Then I felt scared and wrote Mr. Chuffner how it was and asked him to send me a real nice boy who could be trusted. If it wasn't for Junior, Mary and the little man would be delighted. Well, never mind, said Mickey. I'll go see the nurse lady and maybe she can think of a plan. Anyway, I don't know as it would be best for Lily. If she came here for a week, seems like it would kill me to take her back, and I don't know how she'd bear staying alone all day after she got used to company. And pretty soon now it's going to get so hot, top floors in the city, that if she had a week like this, going back would make her sick. You must give me time to think, said the woman. Peter will soon be home to supper, and I'll talk it over with him and with Junior and see what they think. Where can you be found in Multiopolis? We drive in every few days. We like to go ourselves, and there's no other way to satisfy the children. They get so tired and lonesome in the country. Mickey was aghast. They do? Why, it doesn't seem possible. I wish I could trade jobs with Junior for a while. What is his work? He drives the creamery wagon, answered the woman. Oh, Lord, Mickey burst forth. Excuse me, ma'am. I mean, oh, my... "'Drives a real live horse along these streets "'and gathers up the cream cans we pass at the gates "'and takes them to the trolley?' "'Yes,' she said. "'And he'd give up that job for blacking somebody's shoes "'or carrying papers or running errands "'or being shut up all summer in a big hot building? "'Oh, my!' "'When will you be our way again?' asked the woman. "'I'll talk this over with Peter.' If we decide to try the little girl, and she did the waiting, as you say, she couldn't be much trouble. I should think we could manage her, and a boy, too. I wish you could be the boy. I'd like to have you. 
I've been thinking if we could get a boy to show Junior what it is he wants to know about a city, he'd be better satisfied at home. But I don't know. It's just possible it might make him worse. Now such an understanding boy as you seem to be, maybe you could teach Junior things about the city that would make him contented at home. Do you think you could? Dearest lady, I get you, said Mickey. Do I think I could? Well, if you really wished me to, I could take your junior to Multiopolis with me for a week and make him so sick he'd never want to see a city again while his palpitator was running. Humph, said the lady slowly, her eyes on far distance. Let me think. I don't know, but that would be a fine thing for all of us. We have land enough for a nice farm for both boys, and the way things look now, land seems about as sure as anything. We could give them a farm apiece when we are done with it, and the girl the money to take to her home when she marries. I would love to know what that junior was going to live on land, as his father does, but all his life he's talked about working in the city when he grows up. Hmm. Well, if you want him cured of that, give me the job, he grinned. You see, lady, I know the city inside and out, and outside in again. I've been playing the game with it since I can remember. You can't tell me anything I don't know about the lowest, poorest side of it. Oh, I could tell you things that would make your head swim. If you want your boy dosed just sick as a horse on what a working man gets in Multiopolis between Sunrise Alley and Biddle Boulevard, just you turn him over to me a week. I'll fix him. I'll make the creamery job look like Lija charioteering for the angels to him. Honest, I will, lady. And he won't even know it, either. He'll come through with a lump in his neck and a twist in his stomach that means mother and home. See? The woman looked at Mickey in wide-eyed and open-mouthed amazement. Well, if I ever, she gasped. If you don't believe me, try it, said Mickey. Well, well, I'll have to think, she said. I don't know, but it would be a good thing if it could be done. Well, don't you have any misgivings about it being done, said Mickey. It's being done every day. I know men, hundreds of them, just scraping and slaving and half-starving to get together the dough to pull out. I hear it on the cars and on the streets, and I see it in the papers. They're jumping their job and going every day, while hundreds of Schmetzel shimmers, O'Lotteries, Hansons, and Pietros are coming in to take their places. Multiopolis is more than half filled with crowd-outs from across the ocean now, instead of home folks, cradles as it should be. If Junior has got a hankering for Multiopolis that is going to cut him out of owning a place like this and bossing his own job, dearest lady, cook him, cook him quick. Would you come here, she questioned. Would I? cried Mickey. Well, try me and see. I'm deeply interested in what you say about Junior, she said. I'll talk it over with Peter tonight. Well, I don't know, said Mickey. He might put the grand kibosh on it hard. But if Junior came back asking polite for his mush and milk and offering his Christmas pennies for the privilege of plowing or driving the cream wagon, believe me, dear lady, then Peter would fall on your neck and weep for joy. Yes, in that event he would, said the lady, and the temptation is so very great that I believe if you'll give me your address, I'll look you up the next time I come to Multiopolis, which will be soon. I'd like to see your lily before I make any promises, and if I thought I could manage, I would bring her right out in the car. Tell me where to find you, and I'll see what Peter thinks. Mickey grinned widely. You ain't no suffragette lady, are you? he commented. Well, I don't know about that, said the lady. There are a good many things to think of these days. Yes, I know, said Mickey. But as long as everything you say swings the circle and rounds up with Peter, it's no job to guess what's important in your think tank. Peter must be pumpkins. Come to think of it, he is, Mickey, she said. Come to think of it, I do sort of revolve around Peter. We always plan together. Not that we always think alike. There are some things I just can't make Peter see. That I wish I could, but I wouldn't trade Peter. No, I guess you wouldn't, laughed Mickey. I guess he's top crust. He is so, said the woman. How did you say I could reach you? Well, the easiest way would be this. Here, I'll write the number for you. 
Fine, said the woman. I'll hurry through my shopping and call you. When would it suit you best? Never mind me, said Mickey. For this, I'll come when you say. What about three in the afternoon, then? Sure, cried Mickey. Suits me splendid. Most quit for the day, then. But, ma'am, I don't know about this. Lily isn't used to anybody but me. She may be afraid to come with you. And I may think I would scarcely want to try to take care of her for a week when I see her, said the woman. You may think that now, but you'll change your mind when you see her, said Mickey. Dearest lady, when you see a little white girl that hasn't ever walked, smiling up at you shy and timid, like a baby bird peeping from under a leaf, you'll just pick her up tender and lay her on your heart, and you'll want to stick to her just like I do. And you won't be any more anxious for orphings' homes and charity places to swallow her up than I am. Not a bit. All I must think of is what Lily will say about coming. She's never been out of my room since I found her, and she hasn't seen anyone but Mr. Bruce, and she'll be afraid and worried. You, why, you'll be down on your prayer bones just like he was. Seeing her is all I ask of you. What I'm up against is what she's going to say, and how I'm going to take her back after a week here, when it will be hotter there and lonesomer than ever. Gee, I do get up against it. I'll stop at the hospital tonight and talk it over with the sunshine lady. You surely give one things to think about, commented the woman. Do I? queried Mickey. Well, I don't know as I should. Probably with Peter and three children of your own and this farm to run, you are busy enough without spending any of your time on me. The command in the good book is plain. Bear ye one another's burdens, quoted the woman. Oh, yes, burdens, of course, agreed Mickey. But that couldn't mean Lily, cause she's nothing but joy, just pure joy. All about her is that a fellow loves her so, that it keeps him laying awake at nights thinking how to do what would be best for her. She's mine and I'm going to keep her, that's the surest thing you know. If I take you to see Lily, and if I decide to let you have her a few days, to rest her up and fresh her up, you wouldn't go and want to put her among the orphans' homes, kids, would you? You wouldn't think she ought to be took from me and raised in a flock of every kind from every place, would you, lady? No, I wouldn't, said the lady. I see how you feel, and I am sure I wouldn't want that for one of mine. Well, there's no question about her being mine, said Mickey. But I like you so. Maybe I'll let you help me a little. A big boy that can run and play doesn't need you, dearest lady, half so much as my little girl. Do you think he does? No, I think the Lord sent you straight here, and if you don't stop, I'll be so worked up I can't rest, and I may come tomorrow. Mickey arose and held out his hand. Thank you, dearest lady, he said. I must be getting out where the car won't pass without my seeing it. You wait at the gate a minute, she said. I want to send in a little basket of things tonight. I'll have it ready in a jiffy. Mickey slowly walked to the gate. When the woman came with a basket covered with a white cloth, he thanked her again, and as he took it, he rested his head against her arm and smiled up at her with his wide, true eyes. A thing I can't understand is, he said, why when the Lord was making mothers, he didn't cut all of them from the same piece he did you. I'll just walk on down the road and smell June beside this clover field. Is it yours? Yes, she said. Would you care if I'd climb the fence and take just a few to Lily? asked Mickey. They smell so sweet, and I know she never saw any. Take a bunch as big as your head if you want them, said the woman. Lily is so little, three will do her just as well. Besides, she's got to remember how we are fixed, and she needn't begin to expect things to come to her by baskets and bunches, said Mickey. She's bound to be spoiled bad enough as it is. I can't see how I'm going to come out with her, but she's mine, and I'm going to keep her. Mickey, laughed the woman, don't you think you swing around to Lily just about the way I do to Peter? Well, maybe I do, conceded Mickey. What kind of a car did you say Mr. Bruce has, she asked casually. Oh, the car is dark green like wet leaves in August, and the driver has sandy hair, and he was chunky and sour. But lately he changed his mind, and sitting up makes him taller, and smiling makes him pleasanter. And Mr. Bruce, why, you'd know him anywhere. 
You could pick him out at Chicago or Philadelphia. Just look for the finest man you ever saw, if you are out when he goes by, and that will be Mr. Douglas Bruce. I guess I'll know him if I happen to be out, said the lady. I just wondered if I would. Sure, lady, you couldn't miss him, replied Mickey. Carefully holding his basket, he went down the road. The woman made supper an hour late, standing beside the gate, watching for a green car with an alert driver. Many whirled past, and at last one with the right look came gliding along. Then she stepped out and raised her hand for a parley. The man smiled, said a word to the chauffeur, and the car stopped. Mr. Douglas Bruce, she asked. At your service, madam, he answered. Just a word with you, she said. He arose instantly, swung open the car door, and stepping down, walked with her to the shade of a big, widely branching maple. The woman looked at him and smiled, such a pleasant smile, and then she said, flushing and half confused, Please to excuse me for halting you, but I had a reason. This afternoon, such an attractive little fellow stopped here to ask for a drink in passing. Now Peter and I have decided we'd try our hand at taking a city boy for a week or so for his vacation, and twice Peter has left his work and gone to the trolley station to fetch him, and he failed us. I supposed Peter had missed him, and when I saw the boy coming, just the first glimpse, my heart went right out to him. Very likely, assented Mr. Bruce. He sure is the most winning little chap I ever saw, with his keen blue eyes and that sort of white light on his forehead, said the woman. I've noticed that, put in the man. Yes, she said, anybody would see that almost the first thing. So I thought it was the boy I was to mother coming, and I went right at the job. He told me quick enough that I was mistaken, but I could see he was in trouble. Some way I'd trust him with my character or my money. But I gotta be perfectly sure before I trust him with my children. You see, I have three, and if ever any of them go wrong, I don't want it to be because I was careless. I thought I'd like to have him around some. My oldest boy is bigger, but just about his age. He said he might be out this way with you this summer, and I wanted to ask him in, and do what I could to entertain him. But I just wanted to inquire of you. I see, said Douglas Bruce. I haven't known Mickey so long, but owing to the circumstances in which I met him, and the association with him since, I feel that I know him better than I could most boys in a longer time. The strongest thing I can say to you is this. Had I a boy of my own, I should be proud if Mickey liked him, and would consider being friends with him. He is absolutely trustworthy, that I know. Then I won't detain you further, she said. Thank you very much. Mickey, cheered in mind and heart, had walked ahead briskly with his basket, and as he went he formulated his plans. He would go straight to the sunshine lady and tell her about the heat and his possible chance to take Lily to the country for a week, and consult with her as to what the effect of the trip might be, and what he could do with her afterward, and then he would understand better. He kept watching the clover field beside the way. And when he decided he had reached the finest, best perfumed place, he saw a man plowing on the other side of the fence, and thought it might be Peter, and that Peter would wonder what he was doing in his field. So Mickey set the basket in a corner and advanced. He was wonderfully elated by what had happened to him, and the conclusions at which he had arrived. As he came across the deep grasses beside the fence, where the pink of wild rose and the snow of alder commingled, where song sparrows trilled and larks and quail were calling. He approached smiling in utter confidence, and as he looked at the man, at his height, his strong open face, his grip on the plow, he realized why the world of the little woman revolved around Peter. Mickey could have conceived a few happier fates than being attached to Peter. And he thought in amazement of the boy who wanted to leave him. Then a slow grin spread over his face, and by this time Peter had stopped his horses and was awaiting him with an answering smile and a hand outstretched. Why, son, I'm glad to see you, he cried. How did I come to miss you? Did you get off at the wrong stop? Mickey shook his head and he took the proffered hand. You were Peter, he asked. 
"'Yes, I'm Peter,' confirmed the man. "'Well, you're making the same mistake your pleasant lady did,' explained Mickey. "'She thought I was the boy who had been sent to visit you, "'and she gave me the glad hand, too. "'I wish I was in his shoes. "'But I'm not your boy. "'Gee, your lady is a nice, gentle lady.' "'You're all correct there,' answered Peter. "'And so now you are not the boy who was sent to us? "'Pshaw, now! I wish you were. I'm disappointed.' "'I've been watching you coming down the road, "'and the way you held together and stepped up so brisk and neat took my eye. "'I've been stepping up brisk and neat to sell papers, run errands, hop cars, dodge cars, and automobiles, "'and climbing fire escapes instead of stairs, and keeping from underfoot since I can remember,' laughed Mickey. "'You learn on the streets in Multiopolis to step up and, and watch sharp without knowing you were doing it. "'You're a newsboy?' asked Peter. "'I was all my life till a few days ago,' said Mickey. "'Then I went into the office of Mr. Douglas Bruce. "'He's a corporation lawyer in the Iroquois building. "'He's the grandest man.' "'Hm, I've been reading about him,' said Peter. "'If I ever have a case, I'm going to take it to him.' "'Well, you'll have a man that will hang on and dig in and sweat for you,' said Mickey." "'Just now he's after some of them big office holders "'who are bleeding the taxpayers of Multiopolis. "'And some of these days, if you watch your herald sharp, "'you're going to see the lid fly off of two or three things at once. "'He's on a hot trail now.' "'Why, I have seen that in the papers,' said Peter. "'He was given the job of finding who is robbing the city. "'By James Minturn, I remember his name. "'And you work for him? "'Well, well, sit down here and tell me about it. "'I can't now,' said Mickey. "'I must get back to the road. "'His car may pass any minute, and I'm to be ready. "'Your pleasant lady said I might take a few clover flowers "'to my little sick girl. "'And just as I came to the finest ones in the field, "'I saw you, and I thought maybe I'd better tell you what I was doing "'so you wouldn't fire me.' "'Sure,' said Peter. "'Take all you want. "'I'd like to send the whole field, larks and all, "'to a little sick girl.' I'd like a special to send her some of those clowny bobble-link fellows to puff up and spill music by the court for her. I guess nobody else runs so smooth except water. I don't know what she'd say, said Mickey, gazing around him. You see, she hasn't ever walked, and all she's seen in her life has been the worst kind of bare, dark tenement walls, till lately. She's got a high window where she can see sky, and a few sparrows that come for crumbs. This... Mickey swept his arm across the landscape. I don't know what she'd say to this. Pshaw now, cried Peter. Why, bring her out. You bring her right out. That's what we've been wanting to know. Just what a city child would think of country things she'd never seen before. Bring her to see us. She's a little bit of a thing, and she can't walk, you know, explained Mickey. Poor little mite, that's too bad, lamented Peter. Wonder if she couldn't be doctored up some. "'It's a shame she can't walk, but taking care of her must be easy.' "'Oh, she takes care of herself,' said Mickey. "'You see, she is alone all day from six till six. "'She must take care of herself. "'So she studies her lessons and plays with her doll. "'I mean her precious child.' "'Too bad,' said Peter. "'By jacks, that's a sin. "'Did you happen to speak to Ma about her?' "'We did talk a little,' admitted Mickey. "'She was telling me of the visitor boy who didn't come, "'and your son who doesn't think he'll want to stay. "'So we got to talking, and she said just what you did "'about wanting to see how a city child, "'who had never seen a chicken or a cow or horse, would act.' "'Good Lord!' cried Peter. "'Is there a child in Multiopolis "'who hasn't ever seen a little chicken or a calf?' Hundreds of them, said Mickey. "'I've scarcely seen a cow myself, "'only in droves going to stockyards.' "'I've seen hens and little chicks in shop windows at Easter time. "'But not in the orchard in June?' queried Peter. "'No, not in the orchard in June,' said Mickey. "'Well, well, there's nothing so true as that one half doesn't know how the other half lives. "'I've heard that, but didn't quite sense it. "'And I don't know as I do yet. "'You bring her right out. "'Your pleasant lady talked about that, "'but you see, bringing her out and showing her these things,' "'and getting her used to them is one thing. "'Then taking her back to a room so hot "'I always sleep on the fire escape, "'and where she has to stay all day alone is another. 
I don't know, but so long as she must go back to what she has now, it would be better to leave her there. Humph! I see. What a pity! exclaimed Peter. Well, if you'll be coming this way again, stop and see us. I'll talk to Ma about her. We often take a little run to Multiopolis. Junior wouldn't be satisfied till we got a car, and I can't say we ain't enjoying it ourselves. It does give one the grandest sense of getting there. Makes you feel like Johnny on the spot. It does so," agreed Peter. "And what was that you were saying about my boy not thinking he'll stay? She told me," said Mickey, "about the city bug he had in his system. Why don't you swat it immediate? What do you mean?" inquired Peter. "Turn him over to me a week or two," suggested Mickey. "I can give him a dose of working in a city that will send him hiking back to home and mother." "It's worth considering," said Peter. I know that what I got of Multiopolis would make me feel like von Hindenburg if I had a job of handling the ribbons of your creamery wagon, and so I know about what would put Sunny back on the farm, tickled most to death to be here. By gum! Well, I'll give you just one hundred dollars if you'll do it," exclaimed Peter. "You see, my grandfather and father owned this land before me, and we've been on the plowing job so long we have it reduced to a system." So it comes easy for me, and I take pride and pleasure in it. And I had supposed my boys would be the same. Do you really think you could manage it? Sure," said Mickey. "Only if you really mean it, not now, not ever, do you want your son to know it. See, the medicine wouldn't work if he knew he took it. Well, I'll be jiggered," laughed Peter. "I guess you could do it if you went at it right. Well, you trust me to do it right," grinned Mickey. Loan me Sunny for a week or two, and you can have him back for keeps. Well, it's worth trying," said Peter. "Say, when will you be back this way?" "Most any day," said Mickey. "And your lady said she'd be in Multiopolis soon, so we are sure to have a happy meeting before long. I think that is Mr. Bruce's car coming. Goodbye. Be good to yourself." With a spring from where he was standing, Mickey arose in air. And alighted on the top rail of the division fence. Then, balancing, he raced down it toward the road. Peter watched him in astonishment, then went back to his plowing with many new things on his mind. Thus it happened that after supper, when the children were in bed, and he and his wife went to the front veranda for their usual evening visit and talk over the day, she had very little to tell him. As was her custom, she removed her apron. Brushed her waving hair and wore a fresh dress. She rocked gently in her wicker chair, and her voice was moved to unusual solicitude as she spoke. Peter had also performed a rite he spoke of as brushing up for evening. He believed in the efficacy of soap and water, and his body as well as his clothing was clean. He sat on the top step, leaning against the pillar, and the moonlight emphasized his big frame. Accented the strong lines of his face and crowned his thick hair, as Nancy Harding thought it should be with glory. Peter, she said, did you notice anything about that boy this afternoon, different from other boys? Yes, answered Peter slowly. I did, Nancy. He didn't strike me as being one boy. He has the best of three or four concealed in his lean person. He's had a pretty tough time, I judge, said Nancy. Yet you never saw a boy who took your heart like he did, and neither did I," answered Peter. Mickey, holding his basket and clover flowers, was waiting when the car drew up, and a Bruce's inquiry answered that a lady where he stopped for a drink had given him something for Lily. He left the car in the city, sought the nurse, and luckily found her at leisure. She listened with the greatest interest to all he had to say. It's a problem," she said as he finished. "To take her to such a place for a week and then bring her back where she is would be harder for her than never going." I got that figured," said Mickey. "But I've about made up my mind after seeing the place and thinking over the folks that it wouldn't happen that way. Once they see her and find out how little trouble she is, they're not people who would send her back till it's cool if they'd want to. Then, and there's this too." There are other folks who would take her now and see about her back. Have I got the right to let it go a day, waiting to earn the money myself when someone else, maybe the moonshine lady or Mister Bruce, would do it now, 
"'and not put her in an orphan's home either?' "'No, Mickey, you haven't,' said the nurse. "'Just the way I have it figured,' said Mickey. "'But she's mine, and I'm going to keep her. "'If her back is fixed, I'm going to have it done. "'I don't want anyone else meddling with my family. "'You haven't heard anything from the Carol man yet?' "'No,' she said. "'My, I wish he'd come,' cried Mickey. "'So do I,' said the nurse. "'But so far, Mickey, I think you are doing all right. "'If she must be operated, she'd have to be put in condition for it. "'And while I suspect I could beat you at your job, "'I am positive you are far surpassing what she did have.' "'Well, I know that, too,' said Mickey. "'But surpassing nothing at all isn't going either far or fast. "'I must do something.' "'If you could bring yourself to consent to giving her up,' suggested the nurse. "'Well, I can't,' interposed Mickey. "'Just for a while,' continued the nurse. "'Not for a minute,' cried Mickey. "'I found her. She's mine.' "'Yes, I know, but,' began the nurse. "'I know, too,' said Mickey. "'Give me a little time.' "'Mickey studied the problem till he reached his grocery. "'There he thriftily lifted the cloth and peeped and with a sigh of satisfaction pursued his way. Presently he opened his door to be struck by a wave of hot air and to note a flushed little face and drawn mouth as he went into Peach's outstretched arms. Then he delivered the carefully carried clover and the following. I got these from a big pink field bewildering that God made a purpose for cows and childering. Her share is being consumed by the cow. Let's go roll in ours right now. Again, demanded Peaches. Mickey repeated slowly. How could we, asked Peaches. Easy, said Mickey. Easy, repeated Peaches. Just as easy, reiterated Mickey. Did you see it, demanded Peaches. Yes, I saw it today, said Mickey. It's like this. You see, some folks live in houses all built together and work at selling things to eat and wear and making things and doing other things that must be done, like doctors and lawyers and hospitals, and that's a city. Then to feed them, other folks live on big pieces of land, and the houses are far apart with streets between, and beside them the big fields where the wheat grows for our bread. "'and our potatoes and the grass and the clover like this to feed the cows. "'Today Mr. Bruce didn't play long, so I went walking and stopped at a house for a drink. "'And there was the nicest lady. "'We talked some, and she gave me our supper in that pretty basket. "'And she sent you the clovers from a big pink field, so sweet-smelly it would most make you sick. "'And there are trees through it, and lots of birds sing.' "'and there are wild roses and fringy white flowers, "'and it's quiet except the birds, "'and the roosters crowing, "'and the wind comes in like little perfumey blows on you, "'and such milk. "'Better in our milk?' asked Peaches. "'Their milk is so rich it makes ours look like a poorhouse relation,' scoffed Mickey. "'Tell me more,' demanded Peaches. "'Wait till I get the water to wash you. "'You are so warm, Lily.' "'Yes, it, it's getting some hot, but tain't nothing like on the rags last summer. "'It's like a real lady here.' "'A pretty warm lady just the same,' said Mickey. "'Then he brought water, and leaving the door ajar for the first time, "'he soon started a draft that was coming of cooler evening, "'lowered the child's temperature, and made her hungry. "'As he worked, Mickey talked. "'The grass, the blooming orchard, the hen and her little downy chickens— the big cool porch, the wonderful woman and man, and the boy whom they expected and who did not come. And then cautiously, slowly, making sure she understood, he developed his plan to take her to the country. Peaches drew back and opened her lips. Mickey promptly laid the washcloth over them. Now don't you begin to say you won't like a silly baby, he said. Try it and see. "'and if you don't like it, you can come right back. "'You want to ride in a grand automobile "'like a millionaire lady, don't you? "'All the swells go to the country for the summer. "'You got to be a swell lady. "'I ain't going to have you left way behind.' "'Mickey, would you be there?' she asked. 
Yes, lady, I'd be right on the job, said Mickey. I'd be there a lot more than I am here. You go the week they wanted that boy, and he didn't come. Then if you like it, I'll see if they won't board you, and you can have a nice little girl to play with, and a fat, real baby, and a boy bigger than me. And you should see Peter. Peaches opened her lips. Mickey reapplied the cloth. Calm down now, he ordered. I've decided to do it. We gotta hump ourselves. This is our chance. Why, there's milk and butter and eggs and things to eat there like you never tasted. And to have a cool breeze and to lie on the grass. Oh, Mickey, could I? cried Peaches. Sure, silly, why not? said Mickey. There's a big field of it, and the cows don't need it all. You can lie on the grass or the clover and hear the birds and play with the children, and I'll take a day and get things started right before I leave you to come to work like I'll have to. When I come at night, I'll carry you outdoors. Why, I'll take you down to the water and you can kick your feet in it where it's nice and warm. All the time you can have as many flowers as your hands will hold and such bird singing. Why, Lily Peaches O'Halloran, there are birds as red as blood, yes, ma'am, and yellow as orange peel, and light blue like this ribbon, and dark blue like that one. Hold still till I fix you. And such singing. Mickey, would you hold me? wavered Peaches. Smash anybody that lays a finger on you unless you say so, said Mickey promptly. And you'd stay a whole day? she asked anxiously. Sure, cried Mickey. And if I was afraid you'd bring me back, she went on. Sure, right away, he promised. And they wouldn't anybody get me there? Way out there among the clover, scoffed Mickey. Why, it's here they'll get you if they're going to. Nobody out there wants you but me. Mickey, when will you take me? she asked eagerly. Before so very long, promised Mickey. You needn't be surprised to hear me coming with the nice lady to see you any day now, and to be wrapped in a sheet and put in a big car, and just scooted right out to the very place that God made especial for little girls. Tonight we put in another blesses, Lily. We'll pray, bless the nice lady who sent our supper, won't we? Yes, Mickey, and for you come, I didn't want any supper at all, and now I do, said Peaches. You were too warm, honey, said Mickey, instantly alert. We'll just fix this old hot city. We'll run right away from it, see? Now we'll have the grandest supper we ever had. Mickey brought water, plates, and forks, and opened the basket. Peaches, bolstered with her pillows, cried out and marveled. There was a quart bottle of milk wrapped in a wet cloth. There was a big loaf of crusty brown country bread. There was a small blue bowl of yellow butter, a square of honey even yellower, a box of strawberries and some powdered sugar, and a little heap of sliced cold boiled ham. Mickey surveyed the table. Now, Miss Chicken, here's how, he warned. I found you all warm and feverish. If you load up on this, you'll be sick sure. You get a cup of milk, a slice of bread and butter. Some berries and a teeny piece of meat. We can live from this a week if the heat doesn't spoil it. You fix me, said Peaches. And Mickey answered, All right. Then they had such a supper as they neither one ever had known, during which Mickey explained wheat fields and bread, bees and honey, cows and clover, pigs and ham, as he understood them. Peaches repeated her lesson and her prayers, and then, as had become her custom, demanded that Mickey write his last verse on the slate, so she might learn and copy it on the morrow. She was asleep before he had finished. Mickey walked softly, cleared the table, placed it before the window, and taking from his pocket an envelope Mr. Bruce had given him, drew out a sheet of folded paper, on which he wrote long and laboriously, Then locking Peaches in, he slipped down to the mailbox and posted this letter. Dear Mr. Carroll, I saw in papers I sold how you put different legs on a dog. I have a little white flowersy girl that hasn't ever walked, 
"'It's her back. "'A nurse lady told me at the Star of Hope "'how you came there sometimes. "'And the next time you come, "'I guess I will let you see my little girl, "'and maybe I'll have you fix her back. "'When you see her, you will know "'that to fix her back would be the biggest thing "'you ever did or ever could do. "'I got a job that I can pay her way and mine "'and save two dollars a week for you. I couldn't pay all at once, but I could pay steady, and if you lose all you had in any way, it would come in real handy to have that skating in steady as the clock every week for as long as you say, and as soon as I can, I'll make it more. I'd give all I got or ever can get to cure Lily's back, and because you fix the dog, I'd like you to fix her. I do hope you will come soon. "'but of course I don't wish anybody else would get sick, so you'd have to. "'You can ask if I am square of Mr. Douglas Bruce, "'Iroquois Building, Multiopolis, Indiana, "'or of Mr. Chuffner, editor of the Herald, "'whose papers I've sold since I was big enough.' This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 12 Feminine Reasoning. I can furnish the logic for one family, and most men I know feel qualified to do the same. James Minturn With vigor renewed by a night of rest, Leslie began her second day at Atwater Cabin. She had so many and such willing helpers that before noon she could find nothing more to do. After lunch she felt a desire to explore her new world. Choosing the shady side, she followed the road toward the clubhouse, but one thought in her mind. She must return in time to take the car and meet Douglas Bruce as she had promised. She felt elated, positively proud of herself that she had so planned her summer as to spend it with her father, and of course it was going to be delightful to have her lover with her so much. So going, she came to a most attractive lane that led from the road between tilled fields back to a wood on one side and open pasture on the other. Faintly, she heard the shouts of children, and yielding to sudden impulse, she turned and followed the grassy path. A few more steps, and she stopped and surprised. An automobile was standing on the bank of a brook. On an Indian blanket under a tree sat a woman of fine appearance, holding a book, but instead of reading she was watching with smiling face the line of the water, which spread in a wide pool above a rudely constructed dam, and overflowed it in a small waterfall. Stretched on his front on either bank lay one of the Minturn boys, muddy and damp, trying with his hands to catch something in the water. Below the dam, in a blue ball brigand bathing suit, stood James Minturn, his hands filled with a big piece of sod which he bent and applied to a leak. Leslie untied the ribbons of her sunshade, and rumpling her hair to the little breeze, came forward laughing. Well, Mr. Minturn, she cried, what is going to become of the taxpayers of Multiopolis while their champion builds a sod dam? Whether the flush on James Minturn's face as he turned to her with, was exertion, embarrassment, or unpleasant memory, Leslie could not decide. But she remembered, after her impulsive greeting, that she had been with his wife in that early morning meeting the day of the trip to the swamp on the last occasion she had seen him. She thought of many things as she went forward. James Minturn held out his muddy hands and said laughingly, "'You see, I'm not in a condition for our customary greeting.' "'Surely,' cried Leslie. "'It is going to wash off, isn't it? "'If from you, why not from me?' "'Of course, if you want to play,' he said. 
playing you honestly queried leslie honestly playing answered the man the honestest playing in all the world not the political game not the money game not anything called manly sport just a day off with my boys being a boy again heavens leslie i'm wild about it i could scarcely sleep last night for eagerness to get started but let me make you acquainted with my family my sister mrs winslow a friend of mine miss leslie winton my son's tutor mr tower my little brother william minturn my boys junior and malcolm anyway we can shake hands said leslie to mrs winslow the habit is so ingrained i'm scandalized on meeting people if i'm forced to neglect it will you share my blanket asked mrs winslow thanks yes for a little time said leslie i'm greatly interested in what is going on here so am i said mrs winslow we are engaged in the evolution of an idea a real do the boys hall it seems to be doing them good commented leslie never mind the boys said mr minturn i object to such small men monopolizing your attention look at the good this is doing me and would you please tell me why you are here instead of disporting yourself at say lennox how funny laughed leslie i am out in search of amusement and i'm finding it i think i'm perhaps a mile from our home for the summer you amaze me cried mr minturn i saw douglas this morning and told him where i was coming and he never said a word he didn't know one to say on this subject explained leslie you see i rented a cabin over on atwater and had my plans made before i told even father what a delightful thing was in store for him but how did it happen asked mr minturn through my seeing how desperately busy daddy and douglas have been all spring daddy especially replied leslie douglas is bad enough but father is just obsessed so much so that i think he's carrying double i know he is said mr minturn and so you made a plan to allow him to proceed with his work all day and then have the delightful ride fishing and swimming in atwater morning and evening how wonderful and of course douglas will be there also of course agreed leslie at least he shall have an invitation i'm going to surprise him with it this very evening how do you think he'll like it i think he will be so overjoyed he won't know how to express himself said james minturn but isn't it going to be lonely for you won't you miss your friends and your frocks and your usual summer round you forget said leslie my friends and my frocks always have been for winter all my life i have summered with father how will you amuse yourself he asked it will take some time each day to plan what to do the next that will bring most refreshment and joy i often will be compelled to drive in of mornings with orders for my housekeeping and when other things are exhausted i'm going to make an especial study of wild bird music that is an attractive subject said mr minturn he came to her side and looked down at her have you really made any progress little more than verifying a few songs already recorded replied leslie i hear smatterings and snatches but they are elusive and i'm not always sure of the identity of the bird but the subject is thrillingly tempting it surely is conceded mr minturn i could see that nelly was alert the instant you mentioned it come over here to the shade and tell me what you think and how far you've gone you see i've undertaken the boy's education malcolm inherits his mother's musical ability to a wonderful degree it is possible that he could be started on this and so begin his work while he thinks he is playing leslie walked to the spot indicated far enough away that conversation would not interrupt mrs winslow's reading and near enough to watch the boys she and mr minturn sat on the grass and talked it may be the very thing said leslie whatever gives even a faint hope of attracting a boy to an educational subject is worth testing one thing i missed i always have regretted said mr minturn i never had educated musical comprehension 
Nellie performed and sang so well, and in my soul I knew what I could understand, and liked in music she scorned. Sometimes I thought if only I had known enough to appreciate the right thing at the right time, it might have formed a slender tie between us. So I want the boys to both recognize good music when they hear it, but they also have so much to learn all at once, poor little chaps, I scarcely see where to begin. And in a musical way, I don't even know how to begin. Tell me about the birds, Leslie. Just what is it you are studying? The strains of our famous composers that are lifted bodily for measures at a time from the song of a bird or indisputably based upon it, answered Leslie. Did you and Nellie have any success? Indeed, yes, replied Leslie. We had the royal luck to hear exactly the song I had hoped. And besides, we talked of many things, and Nellie settled her future course in her mind. When she went into the swamp alone and came out with an armload of lavender-fringed orchids she meant to carry to Elizabeth, and her heart firmly resolved to begin a new life with you, she told me she felt like flying, that never had she been so happy. Leslie paused and glanced at James Minturn. He seemed puzzled. I don't understand, but nothing matters now. Tell me about the birds, he said. And it is what you admit you don't understand that I must tell you of, said Leslie. I've been afraid, horribly afraid, you didn't understand, and that you took some course you wouldn't have taken if you did. What happened in the swamp was all my fault. The birds, Leslie, tell me of the birds, commanded James Minturn. You can't possibly know what has occurred that separated Nellie and me. No, I don't know your side of it, but I do know hers, and I don't think you do, persisted Leslie. Now, if you would be big enough to let me tell you how it was with her that day, and what she said to me, your mind would be perfectly at rest as to the course you have taken. My mind is perfectly at rest now as to the course I have taken, said Mr. Minturn. I realize that a man should meet life as it comes to him. I endured mine in sweating humiliation for years. I would have gone on to the end if it had been a question of me only. But when the girl was sacrificed, and the boys in a fair way to meet a worse fate than hers, the question no longer hinged on me. You have seen my sons during their mother's regime, when they were children of wealth in the care of servants. Look at them now and dare to tell me they are not greatly improved. Surely they are, said Leslie. You did right to rescue them from their environment. All the fault that lies with you so far is that you did not do from the start what you are doing now. The thing that haunts me is this, Mr. Minturn, and I must get it off my mind before I can sleep soundly again. You will let me tell you. You won't think me meddling in what must be dreadful heartache. Oh, you won't, will you? No, I won't, said Mr. Minturn, but it is prolonging heartache to discuss this matter, and wasting time better used in the building of a sod dam. Indeed, Leslie, tell me about the birds. I will, if you'll answer one question, said Leslie. Dangerous, but I'll risk it, replied Mr. Minturn. I must ask two or three minor ones to reach the real one, explained the girl. Oh, Leslie, laughed Mr. Minturn, I didn't think you were so like the average woman. A large number of men are finding the average woman quite delightful, said it, Leslie. Men respect a masculine, well-balanced, argumentative woman, but every time they love and marry the impulsive, changeable, companionable ones. Provided she is endowed with truth, character, and common mother instinct enough to protect her young. Yes, I grant it, and glory in it, said Mr. Minturn. I can furnish logic for one family, and most men I know feel qualified to do the same. Surely, agreed Leslie, you were waiting for Nellie the night she came from the Tamarack Swamp with me, and she told me you had a little box and that with its contents you had threatened to freeze her soul if she had a soul. I'll be logical and fair, and ask but the one question I first stipulated. Here it is. Did you wait until you had made sure she had a soul worthy of your consideration before you froze it? 
James Minturn's laugh was ugly to hear. My dear girl, he said, I made sure she had not three years ago. And I made equally sure that she had, said Leslie. In the tamarack swamp where she wrestled as Jacob at Peniel against her birth, her environment, her wealth, and triumphed over all of them for you and her sons, I can't go on with my own plan for happiness until I know for sure, if you perfectly understand, that she came to you that night to confess to you her faults, errors, mistakes, sins if need be, and ask you to take the head of your household and to help her fashion each hour of her life anew. Did she have a chance to tell you all this? No, said Mr. Minturn, but it would have made no difference if she had. It came too late. You have not the right to say that to any living, suffering human being, protested Leslie. I have a perfect right to say it to her, said Mr. Minturn, a right that would be justified in any court in the world, either of lawyers or people. Then thank God Nellie gets her trial higher. He will understand and forgive her. You don't know what she did, said Mr. Minturn. What she stood before me and the officers of the law and admitted she did. I don't care what she did. There were men forgiven on the cross because they sincerely repented. God had mercy on them, and he will on her. And what's more, he won't have any on you unless you follow his example and forgive when you are asked by a woman as deeply repentant as she was. Her repentance comes too late, said Mr. Minturn with finality. Her error is not reparable. There is no such thing as true repentance being too late, insisted Leslie. You are distinctly commanded to forgive. You have got to do it. There is no error that is not reparable. Since you hint tragedy, I will concede it. If she had been directly responsible for the death of her child, it was a mistake, criminal carelessness, but not a thing purposely planned, and she could repair it by doing her best for you and the boys. Any mother who once did the things she did is not fit to be trusted again. What nonsense! James Minturn, you amaze me, said Leslie. That is a little too cold masculine logic. That is taking from the whole human race the power to repent of and repair a mistake. There are some mistakes that cannot be repaired. I grant it, said Leslie. There are. You are making one now. That's the most strictly feminine utterance I ever heard, said Mr. Minturn with a short laugh. Thank you, retorted Leslie. The compliment is high, but I accept it. I ask nothing better at the hands of fate than to be the most of feminine of women, and I've told you what I feel forced to. You can now go on with your plans, knowing they are exactly what she had mapped out, hastily but surely. She said to me that she must build from the foundations which meant a new home. You are fatuously mistaken, said Mr. Minturn. She said to me, reiterated Leslie forcefully, that for ten years she had done exactly what she pleased, lived only for her own pleasure. Now she would do as you dictated for a like time. Live your way. I never was farther from a mistake in my life. If you think it doesn't take courage to tell you this, and if you think I enjoy it, and if you think I don't wish I were a mile away, I still maintain I know the lady better than you do, said Mr. Minturn. But you are wonderful, Leslie, and I shall always respect and honor you for your effort in our behalf. It does credit to your head and heart. I envy Douglas Bruce. If ever an hour of trial comes to you, I would feel honored for a chance to prove to you how much I appreciate. Don't talk like that, wailed Leslie. It's all a failure if you do. Promise me that you will think this over. Let me send you the note Nellie wrote me before she went away. Won't you try to imagine what she is suffering today? In the change from what she went to you hoping and what she received at your hands? Let me see, said James Minturn. 
At this hour, she is probably enduring the pangs of wearing the most tasteful afternoon gown on the veranda of whatever summer resort suits her variable fancy. Also, the discomfiture of the woman she induced to bid high and is now winning from at bridge. I am particularly intimate with her forms of suffering. You see, I judge them by my own and my children's during the past years. Then you think I'm not sincere? asked Leslie. Surely, my girl, said Mr. Minturn, with all my heart I believe you. I know you are loyal to her and to me. It isn't you I disbelieve, child. It is my wife. But I've told you over and over she's changed. And I refuse to believe in her power to undergo the genuine and permanent change that would make her an influence for good with my sons. Or anything but an uncontrollable element in my home, said Mr. Minturn. Why, Leslie, if I were to hunt Nellie up and ask her to come to my house, do you think for a minute she would do it? I know she would be most happy, said Leslie. Small, plain rooms, wait on herself, children over the house and lawn at all times, Nellie Minturn? You amuse me, he said. There's no amusement in it for me. It's a pitiful tragedy, said Leslie. She is willing. She has offered to change. You are denying her the opportunity. You don't think deeply enough, said the man. Suppose, knowing her as I do, I agreed to her coming to my house. Suppose I filled it with servants to wait on her and ruin and make snobs of the boys. It could only result in a fiasco all around. And bring me again to the awful thing I have been through once, enforcing a separation. The present is too good for the boys, and just now they are my first consideration. So I see, said Leslie. Nellie isn't getting a particle, and she is their mother. And once she really awakened to the situation, she was hungry to mother them, and to take her place in their hearts. I don't know where she is, but feeling as she did when we parted, I know she's not at any summer resort playing bridge at this minute. You are a friend worth having, Leslie. I congratulate my wife on so staunch an advocate, said James Minturn. And I'll promise you this. I'll go back to the hateful subject just when I felt I was free from it. I'll think on both sides, and I'll weigh all you've said. If I see a glimmering, I will do this much. I will locate her and learn how genuine was the change you witnessed. And I rather think I'll manage for you to see also. Will that satisfy you? That will make me radiant, because the change I witnessed was genuine. And I know that wherever Nellie is today, And whatever she is doing, she is still firm as when she left me in her desire for reparation toward you and her sons. Please, Mr. Minturn, think fast and find her quickly. Leslie, you're incorrigible. Go bring Douglas to his surprise. He has a right to be happy. So have you, insisted Leslie, more than he, because you have had such deep sorrow. Goodbye, and please do hurry. Then Leslie took leave of the others, returned to the cabin, and hurried to her room to dress for her trip to bring her lover. Douglas Bruce was waiting when she stopped at the Iroquois, and his greeting was joyous, to such an extent that Leslie felt she must be very nice to make up for the time he had missed her. Mr. Winton was cordial. But Douglas noticed that he seemed tired and worried, and inquired if he was working unusually hard. He replied that he was, and beginning to feel the heat a little. Then we will drive to the country before dinner to cool off, said Leslie, seeing her opportunity. Both men agreed that would be enjoyable, and after a few minutes of casual talk, relaxed while they made smooth passage over city streets. And the almost equally level highways of the country. At the end of half an hour, Douglas sat upright and looked around him. I don't recognize this, he said. Have we been here before, Leslie? I think not, she answered. 
I don't know why. It is one of my best-loved drives. Always before we have taken the road to the clubhouse or some of its branches. They began a gentle ascent, and directly across the way stretched the blue water of a lake. Is here where we take the plunge? inquired Douglas. No, indeed, answered Leslie. Here we speed until we gather such momentum that we shoot across the water and alight on the opposite bank without stopping. Make your landing neatly, Rogers. Why have we never been here before? marveled Douglas. I don't remember any other road one half so inviting. Just look ahead here. See what a beautiful picture. He indicated a vine of creeping blackberries spreading over gold sand, its rough, deeply serrated leaves of most artistic cutting, with tufts of snowy bloom surrounding dark tipped stamens in their centers. Isn't it? answered Mr. Winton. You know what Whitman said of it? I'm not so well read in Whitman as you are, which is your distinct loss, said Mr. Winton. It was he who wrote, A running blackberry would adorn the parlors of heaven. And so it would, exclaimed Douglas. What a freeze that would make for a lit dining room. Have you ever seen it used? Never, answered Leslie. Or many other of our most exquisite forms of wild growth. What beautiful country, Douglas commented a minute later as the car sped from the swamp, ran uphill and down the valley between the stretches of tilled farmland on either side, sloping back to the lakes now growing distant, and then creeping up a gradual incline until Atwater flashed into sight. Man, that's fine, he said, rising in the car to better admire the view, at which Leslie signaled the driver to run slower. I don't remember that I ever saw anything quite so attractive as this, and if ever water invited a swimmer, that white sand bed seems to extend as far into the lake as you can see. Jove, wasn't that a black bass under that thorn bush? Leslie's eyes were shining, and her laugh was as joyous as any of the birds. He need not say more. There was a bathing suit in his room. In ten minutes he could be cleaving the water to the opposite shore and have time to return before dinner. The car sped down where the road ran level with the water, and a flock of waders arose and circled the lake. On the right was the orchard, the newly made garden, the tiny cabin with green lawn, hammock swinging between trees, Indian blankets spread, and the odor of cooking food in the air. The car stopped, the driver opened the door, Douglas sprang out and offered his hand as he saw Leslie intended descending. She took the hand and kept it in her left. With her right she included woods, water, orchard, and cabin. These are my surprise for you, she said. I am going to live here this summer and keep house for you and Dad while you run and reform the world. Welcome home, Douglas. He slowly looked around, then at Mr. Winton. Do you believe her? he asked incredulously. Yes, indeed. Leslie has the faculty of making good. And I'm one day ahead of you. She tried this on me last night. Hurry into your bathing suit and we'll swim before dinner. And then we'll fish. It was great going in this morning. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Enjoy it, cried Douglas. Here is where the paucity of our language is made manifest. Too happy herself for the right word, Leslie showed Douglas to the clean little room with its white bed and row of hooks against the wall, on one of which hung the bathing suit. Then she went to put on her own and they hurried to the lake. You are happy here, Leslie? asked Douglas. Never in my life have I been so happy as I am this moment, said Leslie, skiffing the clear water with her hands while she waited for her father before starting the swim to the opposite shore. I've got the most joyous thing to tell you. Go on and tell, Bear of Morning, he said. I am so delighted I'm modeling. Right over there on the road to the clubhouse while seeking new worlds to conquer this afternoon, I ran into James Minturn wearing a bathing suit to his knees in mud and water building a sod dam for his boys. 
"'You did?' cried Douglas. "'I did,' said Leslie. "'Here's the picture. "'A beautiful winding stream, "'big trees like these on the banks, "'shade and flowers, "'birds and air aplenty. "'A fine-appearing woman he introduced as his sister. "'A mintern boy, "'catching fish with his bare hands on either bank. "'The brother mintern must have been adopted legally "'since he gave him his name. "'He did,' interrupt Douglas. "'He told me so. "'I was sure of it,' said Leslie. "'And an interesting young man, a tutor, bringing up more sod. "'The boys acted quite like any other agreeably engaged children. "'But Minturn himself, looking like a man I never saw before, "'down in the sand and water building a sod dam. "'A sod dam, I'm telling you. "'I've noticed that you were telling me,' cried Douglas. "'It is duly impressing me. "'Dam is all I can think of. "'It's no wonder,' exclaimed Leslie. "'What did he say to you?' queried Douglas. "'It wasn't necessary for him to say anything,' said Leslie. "'I could see. "'He is making over his boys, "'and in order to do it sympathetically "'and win their confidence and love, "'he is being a boy again himself. "'And he has the little chaps under control now. "'There is love and admiration in their tones "'when they speak to him, and they obey him. "'Think of it!' "'It is something worth thinking of,' said Douglas. "'He was driven to action, and his methods must have been heroic, "'but they seem to have worked. "'Yes, for him and the boys,' said Leslie, "'but they are not all his family. "'The remainder of his family always has looked out for herself "'to the exclusion of everything else in life, you have told me. "'I imagine she is still doing it with wonderful success,' hazarded Douglas.' "'It amazes me how men can be so unfeeling. "'So you talked to him about it?' "'I surely did,' asserted Leslie. "'And I'll wager you wasted words,' said Douglas. "'Not one,' cried the girl. "'He will remember each one I spoke. "'And if I don't hear of him taking some action soon, "'I'll find another occasion and try again. "'He must divide the pleasure of remaking those boys with their mother.' She will respectfully, I mean disdainfully, decline. You don't believe she was in earnest in what she said to me then, asked the girl. I'm quite sure she was, he answered. But a few days of her former life with her old friends will take her back to her previous ways with greater abandon than ever. You mark my words. Bother your words, cried Leslie emphatically. I tell you, Douglas, I went through the fire with her. "'and I watched her soul come out white. "'You've got to promise me that if ever he talks to you, "'you won't say anything against her, will you?' "'It would be a temptation,' he said. "'Mintern is a different man. "'So is she a different woman. "'Come on, Dad, we are waiting for you,' called Leslie. "'What kept you so?' A paper fell from my pocket, and I picked it up, and in glancing at it, I became interested in a thought that hadn't occurred to me before, and I forgot. You must forgive your old daddy. His hands are about full these days. Between my job for the city and my own affairs, and those of a friend, I have all I can carry. Now let me forget business. I call this great of the girl. And one of the biggest appeals to me is the bill of fare. I had a dinner for a king last night. What have we tonight? But won't anticipation spoil it, she asked. Not a particle, he declared. It's the fish we caught last night. Baked potatoes, crest salad from Minturn's Brook, strawberries from Atwater's, cream from our rented cow, real clover cream, Mrs. James says, and biscuit. That's all. Glory cried Mr. Winton. Doesn't that thrill you? Let's head for the tallest tamarack of the swamp and then have a feast. In line, they leisurely swam abreast across the lake. On the opposite bank, they rested a few minutes, then returned to dinner. Afterwards, with Rogers rowing for Mr. Winton and Leslie for Douglas, they went bass fishing. When the boats passed on the far shore, Leslie and Douglas had three, and Mr. Winton five. This did not prove that he was the better fisherman, only that he worked constantly. They lost much time in conversation, which interested them, 
but as they enjoyed what they had to say more than the sport, and Leslie only wished them to take the fish they would use, it was their affair. The girl soon returned to the Minturns, and secured a promise from Douglas that if Mr. Mintern talked with him, at least he would say nothing to discourage his friend about the sincerity of his wife's motives. Leslie's thoughts then turned to the surprise Douglas had mentioned. "'Oh, that pretty girl?' he inquired casually. "'Yes, Lily,' she said. "'Of course, Mickey took you to see her. "'Is she really a lovable child and attractive? "'And could you get any idea of what her trouble is?' "'Douglas carefully reeled and looked at Leslie with a speculative smile. "'You refuse to consider an attractive young lady of greater beauty "'than I have previously seen?' he queried. "'Absolutely. Don't waste time on it,' she said. "'You'll have to begin again and give me one, one at a time,' he laughed. "'What was your first? "'Is she really a lovable child?' repeated Leslie. "'She most certainly is,' said Douglas. "'I could love her dearly, and it's plain that Mickey adores her. "'Why, when a boy gives up trips to the country "'and the chance to pick up good money "'in order to stand over, wash, and cook for a little sick girl, "'what is the answer?' "'The one you have given that he adores her,' conceded Leslie. "'The next was, is she attractive?' "'Wonderfully,' cried Douglas. "'And what she would be in health with flesh to cover her bones "'and color on her lips and cheeks is now only dimly foreshadowed. "'She must have her chance,' said Leslie. "'I was thinking of her today. "'I'll go to see her at once and bring her here.' I will get the best surgeon in Multiopolis to examine her, and a nurse if need be, and then Mickey can come out with you. Would you really, Leslie? asked Douglas. But why not? cried she. That's one of the things worthwhile in the world. And I'd love to go havers with you, proposed Douglas. Let's do it. When will you go to see her? In a few days, said Leslie. The last one was, could you get any idea of what the trouble was? "'Very little,' said Douglas. "'She can sit up and move her hands. "'He is teaching her to read and write. "'She had her lesson very credibly copied on her slate. "'She practices in his absence on poems Mickey makes.' "'Poems?' marveled Leslie. "'Doggerel!' exclaimed Douglas. Four lines at a time. "'Some of it is pathetic. "'Some of it is witty. "'Some of it presages possibilities. "'He may make a poet.' She requires a verse each evening, and he recites it and writes it out, and she uses it for copy the next day. The finished product is to have a sky-blue cover and be decorated either with an English sparrow, the only bird she has seen, or a cow. She likes milk, and the pictures of cows gives her an idea that she can handle them like her doll. Oh, Douglas, protested Leslie. I believe she thinks a whole herd of cows could be kept on her bed, and she finds them quite suitable to decorate Mickey's volume, said Douglas. Why, hasn't she seen anything at all? She has been on the street twice in her life that she knows of, answered Douglas. It will be kind of you to take her and cure her if it can be done, but you'll have to consult Mickey. She is his find, and he claims her. Belligerently, I might warn you. Claims her? "'He has her?' marveled Leslie. "'Surely, in his room, on his bed, "'taking care of her himself and doing a mighty fine job of it. "'Best she ever had, I'm quite sure,' said Douglas. "'But Douglas!' cried Leslie in amazement. "'But me no buts, my lady,' warned Douglas. "'I know what you would say. Save it. You can't do anything that way. "'Mickey is right. She is his.' He found her in her last extremity in rags on the floor in a dark corner of an attic. He carried her home in that condition to a clean bed his mother left him. Since he has been her gallant little knight, lying on the floor on his winter bedding, feeding her first and most, not a thought for himself. God, Leslie, I don't stand for anything coming between Mickey and his child. His family, he calls her. He's the biggest small specimen I ever have seen. I'll fight his cause in any court in the country, if his right to her is questioned, as it will be the minute she is taken to a surgeon or a hospital. How old is she? asked Leslie. Neither of them knows. 
About ten, I should think. How has he managed to keep her hidden this long? He lives in an attic. The first woman he tried to get help from started the home question and frightened him, so he appealed to a nurse he met through being connected with an accident. She gave him supplies, instructions, and made Lily gowns. But why didn't she? began Leslie. She may have thought the child was his sister, said Douglas. She's the loveliest little thing, Leslie. Very little? Tiny is the word, said Douglas. It's the prettiest sight I ever saw to watch him wait on her and to see her big, starved, scared eyes follow him with adoring trust. Adoration on both sides, then, laughed Leslie. You imply I'm selecting two big words, said Douglas. Wait till you see her and see them together. It's a problem, said Leslie. Yes, I admit that, conceded Douglas, but it isn't your problem. But they can't go on that way, cried Leslie. I grant that, said Douglas. All I stipulate is that Mickey shall be left to plan their lives himself. And in a way that makes him happy. That's only fair to him, said Leslie. Now, you are grasping and assimilating the situation properly, commented Douglas. When they returned to the cabin, they found Mr. Winton stretched in a hammock, smoking. Douglas took a blanket and Leslie a cushion on the steps, while all of them watched the moon pass slowly across Atwater. How are you progressing with the sinners of Multiopolis? asked Mr. Winton of Douglas. Fine, he answered. I've found what I think will turn out to be a big defalcation. Somebody drops out in disgrace with probably a penitentiary sentence. Oh, Douglas, how can you? cried Leslie. How can a man live in luxury when he is stealing other people's money to pay the bills? he retorted. Yes, I know, but Douglas... I wish you would buy this place and plow corn or fish for a living. Sometimes I have an inkling that before I finish with this, I will wish so too, replied he. What do you think, Daddy? asked Leslie. I think the way of the transgressor is hard, and that, as always, he pays in the end. Go ahead, son, but let me know before you reach my office or any of my men. I hope I have my department in perfect order. But sometimes a man gets a surprise. Of course, agreed Douglas. Look at that water, will you? Just beyond that ragged old sycamore? That fellow must have been a whale. Isn't that great? The best of life, said Mr. Winton, stooping to kiss Leslie as he said good night to This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran, Chapter 13, A Safe Proposition. Suppose you do own a grouch. What's the use of displaying it on your show window? Mickey. When Mickey posted his letter, in deep thought he slowly walked home, and that night his eyes closed with a feeling of relief. He was certain that when Peter and his wife and children talked over the plan he had suggested, they would be anxious to have such a nice girl as Lily in their home for a week. He even went so far as the vague thought that if they kept her until fall, they never would be able to give her up and possibly she could remain with them until he could learn whether her back could be cured and make arrangements suitable for her. In his heart he felt sure that Mr. Bruce or Miss Leslie would help him take care of her, but he had strong objections to them. He thought the country with its clean air, birds, flowers, and quiet the best place for her. If he allowed them to take her, she would be among luxuries which would make all he could do useless and unappreciated. She wasn't born to things like that. What's the use to spoil her with them, he argued. Of course, they haven't spoiled Miss Leslie, but she wasn't a poor kid to start on, and she has a father to take care of her, 
and Mr. Bruce. Lily has only me, and I'm going to manage my family myself. Pretty soon those nice folks will come, and if she likes them, maybe I'll let them take her till it's cooler. Mickey had thought they would come soon, but he had not supposed it would be the very next day, as it was. He went downtown early, spent a little time drilling his protege in the paper business, and had the office ready when Douglas Bruce arrived an hour late. During that hour, Mickey's call came, and he made an appointment to meet Mr. and Mrs. Peter Harding at Marsh and Jordan's at four o'clock. Peter must have wanted to see her so bad he quit plowing to come, commented Mickey, as he hung up the receiver. He couldn't have finished that field last night. They're just crazy to see Lily, and when they do, they'll be worse yet. But of course they wouldn't want to take her from me, cause they got three of their own. I guess Peter is the safest proposition I know. Of course he wouldn't ever put a little flowersy girl in any old orphan's home. Sure he wouldn't. He wouldn't put his own there. Of course he wouldn't mine. Mickey, what do you think? asked Douglas as he entered. I've moved to the country. Mickey stared. Then came his slow comment, Gee, the cows and the clover gets all of us. I can beat that, said Douglas. I'm going to live beside a lake where I can swim every night and morning and catch big bass and live on strawberries from the vines and cream straight from the cow. I thought you'd get to the cow before long. And you were invited to go out with me as often as you want to. And you may arrange to have Lily out, too. Won't that be fine? Mickey hesitated, and his eyes grew speculative, before he answered with his ever-ready, Sure. Miss Swinton made a plan for her father and me, explained Douglas. She knew that both of us would lose our vacations this summer, so she took an old cabin on Atwater and moved out. We are to go back and forth each morning and evening. I never was at the lake before, but it's not far from the clubhouse, and it's beautiful. I think most of all I shall enjoy the swimming and fishing. I haven't had experience with water enough to swim in, said Mickey. A tub has been my limit. You'll have a fine time, all right, and thank you for asking me. I think Miss Winton is great. Ain't it funny how many fine folks there are in the world? Most everyone I meet is too nice for any use. But I don't know any swell dames. My people are just common folks. You wouldn't call Miss Winton a swell dame, then? Well, I should say nix, cried Mickey. You wouldn't catch her motoring away to a party and leaving her baby to be slapped and shook out of its breath by a mad nurse lady. Cause she left it herself where the sun hurt its eyes. She wouldn't put a little girl that couldn't walk in any orphan's home where no telling what might happen to her. She'd fix her a precious child and take her for a ride in her car and be careful with her. Are you quite sure about that, Mickey? Surest thing you know, said Mickey emphatically. Why, look her straight in the eyes and you can tell. I saw her coming away down the street, and the minute I got my peepers on her, I picked her for a winner, and I guess you did, too. I certainly did, said Douglas, but it is the most important that I be perfectly sure, and would like to have your approval of my choice. I guess you're kidding now, ventured Mickey. No, I'm in earnest, said Douglas Bruce. You see, Mickey, as I have said before, your education and mine have been different, but yours is equally valuable. What shall I do now? Excuse me, I mean, what do I mean? asked Mickey. To wait until I'm ready for you, suggested Douglas. Sure, conceded Mickey. It's because I'm used to hopping so lively on the streets. Do you miss the streets? inquired Douglas. Well, not so much as I thought I would, said Mickey. Sides, in a way, I'm still on the job. But I guess I'll get Henry's boy so he can do it all right. He seems to be doing fairly well. So does the old man. Have you got him in training, too? asked Douglas. Oh, it's his mug, explained Mickey impatiently. Suppose you do own a grouch. What's the use of displaying it on your show window? These things are dangerous. They're contagious. 
Seeing a fellow on the street looking like he'd never smile again makes other folks think of their woes, and pretty soon everybody gets sorry for themselves. I'd like to see the whole world happy. Mickey, what makes you so happy today? I sent something nice in the air, said Mickey. I hear the rumble of the joy wagon coming my way. You surely look it, declared Douglas. It's a mighty fine thing to be happy. I am especially thinking that because it looks like this last batch you brought me has a bad dose in it for a man I know, he won't be happy when he sees his name in letters an inch high on the front page of the Herald. No, he won't, agreed Mickey, his face dulling. That comes in my line. I've seen men forced to take it right on the cars, open a paper, slide down, turn white, shiver, then take a brace and try to sit up and look like they didn't care. When you could see it was all up with them. Gee, it's tough. I wish we were in other business. But what about the men who work hard for their money, not to mince matters, that these men you are pitying steal? Yes, I know, said Mickey. But there's a big bunch of taxpayers, so it doesn't hit any one so hard. It's tough on them, but honest, Mr. Bruce, it ain't as tough to lose your coin as it is to lose your glad face. You could earn more money or slide along without so much. But once you get the slick shame look on your show window, you can't ever wash it off. Since your face is what your friends know you by, it's an awful pity to spoil it. That's so too, Mickey, laughed Bruce. But keep this clearly in mind. I'm not spoiling anyone's face. If any man loses his right to look his neighbor frankly in the eye from the job we're on, it's his fault, not ours. If men have lived straight, we can't find defalcations in their books, can we? Nope, agreed Mickey. Just the same, I wish we were plowing corn instead of looking for them. That plowing job is awful nice. I watched a man the other day, the grandest big bunch of bone and muscle, driving a team it took a gladiator to handle. First time I ever saw it done at close range, and it got me. He looked like a man you'd want to tie to and stick till the war is over. If he ever has a case, he's going to bring it to you. But where he'll get a case out there ten miles from anybody, with the bluest sky you ever saw over his head, and black fields under his feet, and clover and cows on one side, and sheep and meadows on the other, I can't see. Yes, I wish we were plowing for corn instead of trouble. You little dunce, laughed Douglas. We'd make a fortune plowing corn. What's the difference how much you make if something black keeps kayaying at your heels about how you make it, asked Mickey. There's a good strong kick in my heels, and the kayaying is for the feet of the man I'm after. Yes, I know, said Mickey. But fore we get through with this, I just got a hunch that you'll wish we had been plowing corn too. What makes you so sure, Mickey? asked Douglas. Oh, things I hear men say when I get the books keep me thinking, replied Mickey. What things? queried Douglas. Oh, about who's going to get the axe next, said Mickey. But what of that? asked Douglas. Why, it might be somebody you know, he cried. When you find these wrong entries, you can't tell who made them. I know that the man who made them deserves what he gets, said Douglas. Yes, I guess he does, agreed Mickey. Well, go on. But when I grow up, I'm going to plow corn. What about the poetry? queried Douglas. They go fine together, explained Mickey. When the book is finished, I believe I'd like clover on the cover better than the cow. But if Lily wants the livestock, it goes. Of course, assented Douglas. But when she sees a real cow, she may change her mind. Right in style. Ladies do it often, conceded Mickey. I've seen them so changeful they couldn't tell when they called the a taxi where they wanted to be taken. Mickey, your observations on human nature would make a better book than your poetry. Oh, I don't know, said Mickey. You see, I ain't really got at the poetry job yet. I have to be educated a lot to do it right. 
What I do now I wouldn't show to anybody else. It's just fooling for Lily. I got an address that gives me a look in on the paper business if I ever want it. I ain't got at the poetry yet, but I've been on the human nature job from the start. When you go cold and hungry, if you don't know human nature, why, you know it, that's all. You surely do, said Douglas. Now let's hustle this forenoon, and then you may have the remainder of the day. I'm going fishing. Thank you, said Mickey. I hope you get a bass as long as your arm, and I hope the man you are chasing breaks his neck before you get him. Mickey grinned at Douglas's laugh and went racing about his work happily. Then he helped on his paper route until near four, when he hurried to his meeting with Nancy and Peter. When everybody is so nice, if you give them any show at all, I can't understand where the grouchers get their grouch, muttered Mickey, as he hopped from one toe to the other and tried to select the car at the curb, which would be Peter's. Hey, you, presently called a voice from one of them, and Mickey sent a keen glance over a boy who had just come up and entered the car. Straw you, retorted Mickey, and landed on the curb in a flying leap. Is your name Mickey? inquired the boy. Yep. Is your father's name Peter? asked Mickey. Yep. And mine is Peter, too. So to avoid two Peters, I'm Junior. Come on, in, till the folks come. Formalities were over. Mickey laughed appreciatively as he entered the car and straight away began an investigation of its machinery. Now any boy is proud to teach another something he wants to know and does not. So by the time the car was thoroughly explained, any listener would have thought them acquaintances from birth. Hurry, cried Junior when his parents came. I want to get home with Mickey. I want him to show me. Don't you hurry your folks, Junior, said Mickey. I'll show you all right. Well, it's about time I was seeing something. Sure it is, agreed Mickey. Come on with me here, and I'll show you what real boys are. Say, father, I'm coming, you know, cried Junior. I'm tired poking in the country. Just look what being in the city is made of Mickey. Yes, just look, cried Mickey, waving both hands and bracing on feet wide apart. Do look. Your age or more and about half your beefsteak and bone. But you got muscle. I bet I couldn't throw you. I bet you couldn't either, retorted Mickey, cause I survived Multiopolis by being Johnny not on the spot. I've dodged for my life and my living since I can remember. I'm champeen on that. But you come on with me, and I'll get you a job and let you try yourself. I'm coming, said Junior. Then remembering he was not independent, he turned to his mother. Can't I take a job and work here? Mrs. Harding braced herself and succumbed to habit. That will be as your father says. Junior turned toward his father, doubt in his eye, and received a shock. There was not a trace of surprise or disapproval on the face of Peter. Now maybe that would be the best way in the world for you to help me out, he said. You see me through planting and harvest, and then I'll arrange to spare you, and you can see how you like it till fall. But of course you are too young yet to give up school. I don't agree to you interrupting your education. I don't want the kind of a numbskull on my hands who thinks Christopher Columbus signed the Declaration of Independence. Mrs. Harding entered the car. Now, Mickey, she said as she distributed parcels, you sit up there with Peter and show him the way, and we will see if we want to undertake the care of your little girl for a week. Drop the anchor, furl the sail right here, directed Mickey when they reached Sunrise Alley. You know, I told you, dearest lady, about how scared my little girl is, having seen so few folks, and not expecting you. So I'll have to ask you to wait a few minutes till I go up and get her used to your being here, and then I'll have to sort of work her up to you one at a time. I expect you can't hardly believe that there's anything in all the world so little and so white that's lived to have the brain she has. and yet hasn't seen the streets of this city but for a piece in a streetcar twice in her life, and for all I know hasn't talked to half a dozen people. She may take you for a bear, Peter. You will be quiet and easy, won't you? Why, Mickey, said Peter, why, of course, son, why, I can hardly sense it like you say, 
"'but by Jove I do feel my knees going down. "'I guess I am going to kneel to her.' "'Yes, I guess you are,' said Mickey dryly. "'I saw one peep at her bring Mr. Douglas Bruce to his prayer bones, "'and maybe yours ain't any stiffer.' "'Mickey bounded up the stairs and swung wide his door. "'Again the awful heat hit him in the face. "'He swallowed a mouthful and hastily shut the door. "'It's hard on Lily,' was his mental comment. "'But I guess I'll just save that for Mr. and Mrs. Peter. "'I think a few gulps of it will do them good.' It will show them better than talking why once she's out of it she shouldn't come back till cold weather at the least, if at all. Yes, I guess. Most baked, honey, he asked, taking her hot hands and bending over the child. Mickey, taint near six, she panted. No, it's two hours early, said Mickey. But you know, flowersy girl, I'm going to take care of you. Now it's getting too hot for you here. "'Don't you remember what I told you last night? "'About laying on the grass and the clover flowers?' "'Exactly yes,' said Mickey. "'Fore we melt, let's roll up this sheet and go, Lily. "'What do you say?' "'Has has the red berry folks come?' she cried. "'They're downstairs, Lily. They're waiting.' "'Peaches began climbing into his arms. "'Mickey, Mickey, love has told me tight,' she panted. "'Mickey, I'm scared, just God damned! "'Whoop, whoop, lady, none of that!' cried Mickey, aghast. "'The place where you're going, there's a nice little girl "'that never said such a word in all her life, "'and if she did, her mammy would wash the badness out of her mouth with soap, "'just like I'll have to wash out yours if you don't watch. "'You can't go in the big car being held tight by me, "'else you promise cross your heart never, not never to say that again.' "'Mickey will soap and take it out?' wailed Peaches. "'Well, my mammy took it out of me that way. "'Mickey, get the soap and wash and scour it all out now so as I can't ever. "'Mickey, quick, before the nice lady comes that has flower fields and red berries and honey lasses. "'Mickey, hurry!' "'Oh, you fool little sweet kid,' he half laughed, half sobbed. "'You fool little precious child kid, I can't. There's a better way.' I'll just put on a kiss so tight that no bad swearings will ever pop out past it. There, like that. Now you won't ever say one for the nice little girl, and when I don't want you to so bad, will you? Not ever, Mickey. Not never, 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 protested Peaches. The folks can't wait any longer, said Mickey. Here, quick, I'll wash your face and comb you and get a clean nighty on you and your sweetest ribbon. "'Then it's pink,' declared Peaches decidedly. "'And, Mickey, make me a pretty girl "'so as the nice lady will like me to drink her milk.' "'Greedy,' said Mickey. "'How can I make you pretty when the Lord ain't?' "'Ain't I pretty any at all?' queried Peaches. "'Maybe you would be if you'd fatten up a little,' said Mickey judicially. "'Can't anybody be pretty that's got bones sticking out all over em? "'Mickey, is the girl where we're going pretty?' "'I don't know,' said Mickey. "'I haven't seen her. "'She's a fine little girl, "'for she's at home taking care of her baby brother, "'so that her mammy can come and see "'if you were nice enough to go to her house "'and not spoil her children. "'See?' "'Peaches nodded comprehendingly. "'Mickey, I won't again,' she insisted. "'I said not. "'Never, never, never. "'Didn't you hear me?' "'Yes, I heard you,' said Mickey, applying the washcloth, "'slipping on a fresh nightdress, brushing curls, "'and tying the ribbon with fingers shaking with excitement and haste. "'Yes, I heard you. "'But that stuff seems to come awful easy, miss. "'You got to be careful no end. "'Now I'm going to bring them. "'You just keep still and smile at them. "'And when they ask you, tell them the right answer nice. "'Will you, honey? Will you sure?' "'Surest thing you know,' quoted Peaches promptly. "'Ah!' groaned Mickey. "'That ain't right. "'Miss Leslie wouldn't have ever said that. "'You got that from me, too. "'Guess I better soap out my own mouth, "'for I begin on you. "'Yes, ma'am, is the answer. "'Now you remember, I'll just bring in the lady first. "'I want to see Peter first, announced Peaches. "'Well, if I ever cried Mickey, "'Peter is a great big man, about twice as big as Mr. Bruce. "'You don't either. 
"'You want to see the nice lady first, "'cause it's up to her to see if she'll take care of you. "'She may get mad and not let you go at all "'if you ask to see Peter first. "'You want to see the nice lady first, don't you, Lily?' "'Yes, if I got to, to see the cow. "'But I don't,' said Lily. "'I want to see Peter. "'I like Peter best.' "'Now you look here, Miss Chicken, don't you start a tantrum,' cried Mickey. "'If you don't see this nice lady first and be pretty to her, "'I'll just go down and tell them you like lying here roasting, "'and they can go back to their flower fields and berries, see?' "'Peaches drew a deep breath, but her eyes were willful. "'A wave of heat seemed to envelop them. "'Sweat it out right now,' ordered Mickey. "'When people do things for you because you are in such a fix, "'they are sorry for you.' It's up to you to be polite, to pay back with manners at least, see? Peach's smile was irresistible. Mickey, I feel so polite. I'll see the nice lady first. Now there's a real sure enough lady. Mickey stooped to kiss Peaches again, take a last look at the hair ribbon and straighten the sheet. Then he ran, but he closed in the heat quickly as he slipped through the doorway. A few seconds later, with the Harding family at his heels, he again approached it. Then he made his second speech. He addressed it to Peter and Junior. "'Cause she's so little and so scared. I guess the nice lady better go in first and make up with her. And then one at a time you can come, so seeing so many strangers won't all upset her.' Peter assented heartily, but with a suffocating gesture removed his coat, and Junior followed his example." Mickey cut short something about extreme heat on the lips of Mrs. Harding by indicating the door and opening it. He quickly closed it after her and advanced to Peaches. "'Lily, this is the nice lady I was telling you of, who has got the bird singing in the flower fields,' he began. Peaches drew back and shrank in size, her eyes wide with wonder and excitement, but her mind followed Mickey's lead, and she shocked his sense of propriety by adding— and the good red berries. But Mrs. Harding came from an environment where to have good red berries, spicy smoked ham, fat chickens, and golden loaves constituted a first test of efficiency. To have her red berries appreciated did not offend her. If peaches had said the sweetest, biggest red berries in Noble County, the woman would have been delighted, because that was her private opinion but she was not so certain that corroboration was unpleasant. She advanced, gazing at the child and consciously gasping the stifling air. She took one hurried glance at the room in its scrupulous bareness, with waves of heat from miles of city roof pouring in the open window, and bent over peaches. "'Won't you come out of this awful heat quickly and let us carry you away to a cool, shady place, dear little girl?' "'Don't you want to come?' she questioned. "'Is Mickey coming, too?' asked Peaches. "'Of course Mickey is coming, too,' said the lady. "'Will he hold me?' "'He will if you want him to,' said Mrs. Harding. "'But Peter is so much bigger it wouldn't tire him a mite.' "'Mickey shifted on his feet and gazed at Peaches. "'As her eyes sought his, the message he telegraphed her "'was so plain that she caught it right.' "'Mickey is just awful strong,' she said. "'I'll go if he'll hold me, but I want to see Peter. "'I like Peter.' "'Why, you darling,' cried the nice lady. "'And I like Junior that Mickey told me about, "'and your sweet little girl that I mustn't ever, never, never say no swa "'Peter promptly applied the flat of his hand to the lips of the astonished child. "'And you like the little girl and the fat toddly baby,' he prompted. Yes, agreed Peaches enthusiastically, twisting away her head. And I like the milk and the meat. Gee, I like the meat. Only Mickey wouldn't give me but a tiny speck till he asked the sunshine nurse lady. You blessed child, cried Miss Nancy Harding. Call Peter quickly. Mickey opened the door swiftly. He was still conserving heat and signaled Peter and Junior. She likes you. She asked for you. "'You can both come at once,' he announced, "'holding the door at a narrow crack until they reached it, "'both red-faced, dripping and fanning with their hats. "'Peter gasped for air. 
"'My God, has any living child been cooped up in this all day?' he roared. "'Get her out! Get her out quick! Get her out first and talk afterwards. "'This will give her scarlet fever!' A shrill shout came from behind the intervening lady, who arose and stepped back, as Peaches raised to her elbow and stretching a shaking hand toward Peter. "'Gee, Peter, you get your mouth soaped out first, she cried. "'Gee, Peter, I like you, Peter.' Peter bent over her, and stooping to her level, he explored her with astonished eyes, as he cried, "'Why, child, you ain't big enough for an exclamation point.' Peaches didn't know what an exclamation point was, but Mickey did, and his laugh brought him again into her thought. "'Mickey, let's beat it! Take me quick!' she panted. "'Take me first and talk afterwards. "'Mickey, we just love these nice people. "'Let's go drink their milk and eat their red berries.' "'Well, Miss Chicken,' said Mickey, turning a dull red. "'The Harding family were laughing. "'All right, everybody, move,' said Peter. "'What do you want to take with you, Mickey?' "'That basket there,' he said, "'and that box. "'You take that, Junior, "'and you take the precious child. "'And the slate and the books, dearest lady, "'and I'll take my family. "'I ain't so sure about this lady. "'She's sweaty now, "'and writing is the coolingest thing you can do. "'We mustn't make her sick. "'She must be well wrapped up.' "'Why, she couldn't take cold today,' began Peter.' "'You and Junior shoulder your loads and go right down to the car,' said Mrs. Harding. "'Mickey and I will manage this. He is exactly right about it. "'To be taken from such heat to the conditions of motoring might—' "'Sure,' interposed Mickey, dreading the next word for the memories it would awaken in the child's heart. "'Sure, you two go ahead. We'll come in no time.' "'But I'm not going to lug a basket and have a little chap like you carrying a child.' "'You take this, and I'll take the baby.' "'Mickey's wireless went into an instant action, "'and Peaches promptly rebelled. "'I ain't no baby,' she said. "'Miss Leslie Moonshine Lady sent me her hair ribbons, "'and I spec she's been crying for them at back every day. "'And my name what Granny named me is Peaches, so there.' "'Corrected, beg pardon,' said Peter. "'Miss Peaches, may I have the honor of carrying you to the car?' "'Nope,' said Peaches with finality. "'Nobody, not nobody, whatever, "'not the biggest millionaireinest. "'Nobody alive can't ever carry me, "'Nelson Mickey says they can, "'and he is away off on the cars. "'I like you, Peter. "'I just like you heaps, but I'm Mickey's, "'and I got to do what he says, "'cause he makes me, just like he ort, "'and nobody can't ever, not ever, "'tend me like Mickey.' "'So that's the ticket,' mused Peter. "'Yes, that's the ticket,' repeated Peaches. "'I ain't heavy. Mickey carried me up. Down is easier.' "'Sure,' said Mickey. "'I take my own family. You take yours. We'll be there in a minute.' Peter and Junior disappeared with thankfulness and speed. Mrs. Harding and Mickey wrapped Peaches in the sheet and took along a comfort for shelter from the air stirred by motion. Steadying his hand, which he wished she would not, they descended. Did she think he wanted Peaches to suppose he couldn't carry her? He ran down the last flight to show her, frightening her into protest, and had the reward of a giggle against his neck, and the tightening of small arms clinging to him. He settled in the car, and without heeding Peter, wrapped Lily in the comfort until she had only a small peep of daylight, and they started. Mickey knew from Peach's labored breathing and the grip of her hands how agitated she was. But as the car glided smoothly along, driven skillfully by mentality, guided by the controlling thought of tiny lame back, she became easier and clutched less frantically. He kept the comfort over her head. She had enough to make the change, to see so many strangers all at once, without being excited by having her attention called to unfamiliar things that would bewilder and positively frighten her. Mickey stoutly clung to a load that soon grew noticeably heavy, while over and over he repeated in his heart with fortifying intent, She is my family. I'll take care of her. I'll let them keep her for a while because it's too hot for her there. "'but they shan't boss her, and they gotta know it first off, 
and they shan't take her from me, and they gotta understand it. Right at that point, Mickey's grip tightened until the child in his arms shivered with the light of being so enfolded in her old and only security. She turned her head to work her face level with the comfort and whisper in chortling glee, "Mickey, we are going just stylish like merely near folks, ain't we?" "You just bet we are," he whispered back. "Mickey, you won't let them get me, would you?" "Not on your life," said Mickey, gripping her closer. And Peter wouldn't let them get me. No,、nope, Peter would just wipe them clear off the slate if they tried to get you. Comforted Mickey. We're in the country now, Lily. Nobody will ever think of you away out here. Mickey, I want to see the country," said Peaches. "No, Miss, I'm scared now," replied Mickey. "It was awful hot there, and it's lots cooler here, even slow and careful as Peter's driving." If you get all excitement and rearing around and take a chill, and your back gets worse, just when we have such a grand good chance to make it better, you duck and lay low. And if you're good and going out doesn't make you sick, after supper when you rest up, maybe I'll let you have a little peepy yellow chicken in your hand to hold a minute, and maybe I'll let you see a cow. I guess you'd give a good deal to see the cow that's going on your book, wouldn't you? Peaches snuggled down in pure content, and proved her femininity as she did every day. Yes, but when I see them, maybe I'll like a chicken better and put it on. All right with me," agreed Mickey. "You just hold still so this doesn't make you sick, and tomorrow you can see things when you are all nice and rested." Mickey," she whispered. Mickey bent, and what he heard buried his face against Peaches a second. And when lifted, it radiated a shining glory light, for she had whispered, "Mickey, I'm going to always mind you and love you best of anybody." Because she had expected the trip to result in the bringing home of the child, Mrs. Harding had made ready a low folding davenport in her first floor bedroom, beside a window where grass, birds, and trees were almost in touch, and where it would be convenient to watch and care for her visitor. There, in the light, pretty room, Mickey gently laid Peaches down and said, "Now, if you'll just give me time to get her rested and settled a little, you can see her a peep. But there ain't going to be much seeing or talking tonight. If she has such a lot she ain't used to and gets sick, it would be a bad thing for her, and all of us. So we better just go slow and easy." "Right, you are, young man," said Peter. "Come out of here, you kids." Come to the back yard and play quietly. When little Miss White Butterfly gets rested and fed, we'll come one at a time and kiss her hand, and wish her pleasant dreams with us. And then we'll every one of us get down on our knees and ask God to help us take such good care of her that she will get well at our house. I can't think of anything right now that would make me prouder. Mickey suddenly turned his back on them and tried to swallow the lump in his throat. Then he arranged his family so it was not in a draft, sponged and fed it, and failed in the remainder of his promise, because it went to sleep with the last bite and lay in deep exhaustion. So Mickey smoothed the sheet, slipped off the ribbon, brushed back the curls, shaded the light, marshaled them in on tiptoe, and with anxious heart studied their compassionate faces. Then he telephoned Douglas Bruce to ask permission to be away from the office the following day, and ventured as far from the house as he felt he dared with Junior. But so anxious was he that he kept in sight of the window, and so manly and tender was his scrupulous care, so tiny and delicate his small charge, as she lay waxen, lightly breathing to show she really lived, that in the hearts of the Harding family grew a deep respect for Mickey. And such was their trust in him that when he folded his comfort and stretched it on the floor beside the child, not even to each other did they think of uttering an objection. So Peaches spent her first night in the country, breathing clover air, watched constantly by her staunch protector, and carried to the foot of the throne on the lips of one entire family, for even Bobby was told to add to his prayer, "God bless the little sick girl, and make her well at."
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 14 An Orphan's Home. She clung to her traditions and rearing. I contended there was a better way. Leslie. "'Margaret, I want a few words with you sometime soon,' said James Minturn to his sister. "'Why not right now?' she proposed. "'I'm not busy, and for days I've known you were in trouble. "'Tell me at once, and possibly I can help you.' "'You would deserve my gratitude if you could,' he said. "'I have suffered until I'm reduced to the extremity that drives me to put into words "'the thing I have thrashed over in my heart day and night for weeks.' "'Come to my room, James,' she said. "'James Minturn followed his sister "'and took the easy chair she offered him beside a window. "'Now go on and tell me, boy,' she ordered. "'Of course it's about Nellie.' "'Yes, it's about Nellie,' he repeated. "'Did you hear any part of what that young, very charming young lady "'had to say to me at our chosen playground not long ago?' "'Yes, I did,' answered Mrs. Winslow. "'but not enough to comprehend thoroughly. "'Did she convince you that you were mistaken?' "'No, but this she did do,' said Mr. Minturn. "'She battered the walls of what I had believed "'to be unalterable decision "'until she made this opening. "'I must go into our affairs again. "'I have got to find out where my wife is "'and what she is doing. "'And if the things Miss Leslie thinks are true? "'Margaret, I thought it was settled.' I was happy, in a way actually happy. No biblical miracle ever seemed to me half so wonderful as the change in the boys. The difference in them is quite as much of a marvel as you think it is, agreed Mrs. Winslow. It is greater than I would have thought possible in any circumstances, said Mr. Minturn. If we had accomplished as much in a year as we have in this short time, I would have been gratified. "'and they cling to me and exhibit every evidence of childish love for me. "'Do they ever mention their mother to you?' "'Incidentally,' she replied, "'just as I do maids, footmen, or governess, "'in referring to their past life, "'they never ask for her in the sense of wanting her, that I know of. "'Malcolm resembles her in appearance, "'and anyone could see that she liked him best.' She always discriminated against James in his favor if any question between them was ever carried to her. Malcolm is like her in more than looks. He has her musical ability in a marked degree, said Mr. Minturn. I have none, but Miss Winton suggested a thing to me that Mr. Tower has been able to work up some. And while both boys are deeply interested, it's Malcolm who is beginning to slip away alone and listen to and practice bird cries until he deceives the birds themselves. Yesterday he called a cat bird across an orchard and to within a few feet of him by reproducing the notes as uttered and inflected by the female. I know it was a triumph he told me about it, said Mrs. Winslow. "'James is well named,' said Mr. Minturn. "'He is my boy. "'Already he's beginning to ask questions "'that are filled with intelligence, solicitude, "'and interest about my business. "'What things mean, what I'm doing, and why. "'He's going to make the man who will come into my office, "'who in a few more years will be offering his shoulder "'for part of my load. "'You can't understand what the change is "'from the old attitude of regarding me "'as worth no consideration.' not even a gentleman, as my wife's servants were teaching my sons to think. Margaret, how am I going to go back even to the thought that I may be making a mistake? Wouldn't the unpardonable error be to risk those boys an hour again in the company and influence which brought them once to what they were? You poor soul, exclaimed Mrs. Winslow. Never mind that, warned Mr. Minturn. I'm not accustomed to it, and it doesn't help. "'Have you any faith in Nellie?' "'None whatever,' exclaimed Miss Winslow. "'She's so selfish it's simply fiendish. "'I'd as soon bury you as to see you subject to her again.' 
and I'd much sooner be buried were it not that my heart is set on winning out with those boys, said Mr. Minturn. There is material for fine men in them, but there is also depravity that would shock you inexpressibly, instilled by ignorant, malicious servants. I wish Leslie Winton had kept quiet. And so do I, agreed Mrs. Winslow. I could scarcely endure it, as I realized what was going on. While Nellie had you, there was no indignity, no public humiliation at which she stopped. For my own satisfaction, I examined Elizabeth before she was laid away, and I held my tongue because I thought you didn't know. When did you find out? A newsboy told me. He went with a woman who was in the park where it happened to tell Nellie, and they were insulted for their pains. Some way my best friend, Douglas Bruce, picked him up and attached him, as I did William. It was at my suggestion. Of course, I couldn't imagine that out of several thousand newsies, Douglas would select the one who knew my secret and who daily blasts me with his scorn. If he runs into an elevator where I am, the whistle dies on his lips. His smile fades and he actually shrinks from my presence. You can't blame him. A man should be able to protect the children he fathers. What he said to me stunned me so he thought me indifferent. In my place, would you stop him some day and explain? I most certainly would, said Mrs. Winslow. A child's scorn is withering, and you don't deserve it. I have often wondered what or how much he told Bruce, said Mr. Minturn. Could you detect any change in Mr. Bruce after the boy came into his office? asked Mrs. Winslow. Only that he was kinder and friendlier than ever. That probably means that the boy told him and that Mr. Bruce understood and was sorry. No doubt, he said. You'd talk to the boy then? Now what would you do about Nellie? What was it Miss Winton thought you should do? See Nellie, take her back, he exclaimed. Give her further opportunity to exercise her brand of wifehood on me and motherhood on the boys. James, if you do, I'll never forgive you, cried his sister. If you tear up this comfortable, healthful place where you are honored ahead of your house and put your boys back where you found them, I'll go home and stay there and you can't blame me. Miss Winton didn't ask me to go back, he explained. That couldn't be done. I saw and examined the deed of gift of the premises to the city. The only thing she could do would be to buy it back, and it's torn up inside, and will be in shape for opening any day now, I hear. The city needed a children's hospital to get a place like that free in so beautiful and convenient a location and her old friends are furious at her for bringing sickness and crooked bodies among them. No doubt they would welcome her there, but they wouldn't welcome her anywhere else after that. She must have endowed it liberally. No hospital in the city has a staff of the strength announced for it. James, you are wandering, she interrupted. You started to tell me of what Miss Winton asked you. That I bring Nellie here, he explained that I make her mistress of this house, that I put myself and the boys in her hands again. Oh, good Lord, ejaculated Mrs. Winslow. James, are you actually thinking of that? Mind, I don't care for myself. I have a home and all I want. But for you and those boys, are you really contemplating it? No, he said. All I'm thinking of is whether it is my duty to hunt her up and once more convince myself that she is heartless vanity personified and utterly indifferent to me personally as I am to her. Suppose you do go to her and find that through pique, because you made the move for separation yourself, she wants to try it over or to get the boys again. She's got a mint of money. Do you know just how much she has? I do not, and I never did, he replied. Her funds never in any part were in my hands. I felt capable of making all I needed myself, and I have. I earn as much as it is right I should have. But she'd scorn my plan for life and what satisfies me, and she'd think the boys disgraced living as they are. 
James, was there an hour even in your honeymoon when Nellie forgot herself and was a lovable woman? It is painful to recall, but yes, yes indeed, he answered. Never did a man marry with higher hope. Then what? marveled Mrs. Winslow. Primarily her mother, then her society friends, then the power of her money, he answered. Just how did it happen? He, she queried. It began with Mrs. Blondin's violent opposition to children. When she knew a child was coming, she practically moved in with us and spent hours pitying her daughter, sending for a doctor at every inevitable consequence, keeping up an exciting rush of friends coming when the girl should have had quiet and rest, treating me with contempt, and daily holding me up as the monster responsible for all these things. The result was nervousness and discontent bred by such a course at such a time until it amounted to actual pain and lastly unlimited money with which to indulge every fancy. From the regime Mrs. Blondin installed in our home, you would have thought that bringing a child into the world was a rare, unheard of occurrence happening for the first time in the history of the world. On the least natural development of which it was necessary to call in six specialists and rally all her world to support her daughter. In such circumstances, delivery became the horror they made of it, although several of the doctors told me privately not to have the slightest alarm. It was simply the method of rich, selfish women to make such a bugbear of childbirth. A wife might well be excused for refusing to endure it. Sifted to the bottom, that was exactly what it was. I didn't know until the birth of James that they had neglected to follow the instructions of their doctors and made no preparation for nursing the child. As a result, when I insisted that it must be done, shrieks of pain, painful enough as I could see, resulted in a nervous chill for the mother, more inhumanity in me, and the boy was turned over to a hired woman with his first breath and to begin unnatural life. I watched the little chap all I could. He was strong and healthy, and while skilled nurses were available, he upset every rule by thriving, which was one more count against me. And the lesson pointed out and driven home that no young wife could give a child such attention, so the baby was better off in the hands of the nurse. That he was reared without love, that his mother took not an iota of responsibility in his care, devoted not a trait of motherhood, simply went on being a society bell, had nothing to do with it. He did so well, Nellie escaped so much better than many of her friends, that in time she seemed to forget it, and didn't rebel at Malcolm's advent or Elizabeth's. But by that time I had been practically ostracized from the nursery. Governesses were empowered to flout and insult me. I scarcely saw my children, and what I did see made me furious. So I vetoed more orphans bearing my name and gave up doing anything. Then came the tragedy of Elizabeth. Surely you understand just how it was done, Margaret? Of course I had an idea, but I never before got just the perfect picture, and now I have it. Though it's the last word I want to say to you, God made me so that I'm forced to say it, although it furnishes one more example of what is called inconsistency. Be careful what you say, Margaret. I must say it, she replied. I've encouraged you to talk in detail, because I wanted to be sure I was right in the position I was taking, and you've given me a different viewpoint. Why, James, think it over yourself in the light of what you have just told me. Nellie has never been a mother at all. Her heart is more barren than that of a woman to whom motherhood is a physical impossibility, yet whose heart aches with maternal instinct. Margaret, cried James Minturn. James, it's true, she persisted. I never have understood. For fear of that, I led you on, and now look what you've told me. Nellie never had a chance at natural motherhood. The thing called society made a foolish mother to begin with, and she in turn ruined her daughter. And if Elizabeth had lived, it would have been passed on to her. 
"'You throw a new light on Nellie. "'As long as she was herself, "'she was tender and loving, and you adored her. "'If you had been alone and moderately circumstanced, "'she would have continued being so lovable "'that after ten years your face flushes "'with painful memory as you speak of it. "'I've always thought her abandoned "'as to wifely and motherly instinct. "'What you say proves she was a lovable girl, "'ruined by society.' "'through the medium of her mother and friends. "'If she cared for me as she said, "'she should have been enough of a woman,' "'began Mr. Minturn. "'Maybe she should, "'but you must take into consideration "'that she was not herself when the trouble began. "'She was, as are all women, "'even those most delighted over the prospect, "'in an unnatural condition.' In so far that usual conditions were unusual, and probably made her ill, nervous, apprehensive, not herself at all. Do you mean to say that you are changing? Worse than that, she said emphatically, I have positively and permanently changed. Even at your expense, I will do Nellie justice. James, your grievance is not against your wife. It is against the mother who bore her, the society that molded her. Amazing as it seems to you and to me, the fact that what you have just told me is proof positive that your wife was your mate, and started right, and then was wrecked by society as emulated by her mother. When you think it over, you will admit that this is the truth. She should have been woman enough, he began. Left alone, she was, insisted Mrs. Winslow. With the ills and apprehensions of motherhood upon her, she yielded as most young, inexperienced women would yield to what came under the guise of tender solicitude and no doubt eased or banished pain which all of us avoid when possible and the pain connected with motherhood is a thing in awe of which the most practiced physicians admit themselves almost stunned. The woman who would put aside pampering and stoically endure what money and friends could alleviate is rare. Jim, pain or no pain to you, you must find your wife and learn for yourself if she is heartless or whether in some miraculous way someone has proved to her what you have made plain as possible to me. You must hunt her up and if she is still under her mother's and society's influence and refuses to change, let her remain. But, but if she has changed, as you have just seen me change, then you should give her another chance if she asks it. I can't, he cried. You must, she persisted. The evidence is in her favor. What do you mean, he demanded impatiently. Her acquiescence in your right to take the boys and alter their method of life. Her agreement that for their sakes you might do as you chose with no interference from her. Both those are the acknowledgment of failure on her part, and willingness for you to repair the damages if you can, she explained. Her gift of residence, the furnishings of which would have paid for the slight alterations necessary to transform a modern home into the most beautiful of modern hospitals, in a wonderfully lovely location, and leave enough to start it with as fine a staff as money can provide, that gift is a deliberately planned effort at reparation. The limiting of patients to children under ten is her heart trying to tell yours that she would atone. Oh, Lord, cried James Minturn. Yes, I know, said Mrs. Winslow. Call on him. You need him. There is no question but that he put into her head the idea of setting a home for the healing of little children in the most exclusive residence district of Multiopolis, where women of millions are forced to see it every time they look from a window or step from their door. Have you seen it yourself, James? Naturally, I wouldn't haunt the location. I would, and I did, said Mrs. Winslow. A few days ago I went over it from basement to garret. You go and see it. And I recall now that her lawyer was there with sheets of paper in his hand, talking with foremen. 
I think he's working for Nellie, and that she is probably directing the changes and personally evolving a big white shining reparation. It's a late date to talk about reparation, he said, which simply drives me to the truism, better late than never, and to the addition of the comment that Nellie is only thirty, and that but ten years of your lives have been wasted. If you hurry and save the remainder, you should have fifty apiece coming to you. If you breathe deep, sleep cool, and dine sensibly, said Mrs. Winslow. She walked out of the room and closed the door. James Minturn sat thinking a long time. Then he called his car and drove to Atwater alone. He found Leslie in the orchard, a book of bird scores in her hands, and several sheets of music beside her. Her greeting was so cordial, so frankly sweet and womanly, he could scarcely endure it. Because his head was filled with thoughts of his wife, and he knew that she could be even more charming than Leslie Winton if she chose. You are still at your bird study, he asked. Yes, it's the most fascinating thing, she said. I know, he conceded. I want the titles of the books you're using. I mentioned it to Mr. Tower, our tutor, and he was interested instantly, and far more capable of going at it intelligently than I am, because he has some musical training. Ever since we talked it over, he and the boys have been at work in a crude way. You might be amused at their results, but to me they are wonderful. They began hiding in bird haunts and listening, working on imitations of cries and calls, and reproducing what they heard, until in a few weeks' time, why, I don't even know the repertoire, but they can call quails, larks, owls, orioles, whippoorwills, so perfectly they get answers. James will never do anything worthwhile in music. He's too much like me. But Malcolm is saving his money and working to buy a violin, and he's going to read a music score faster than he will a book. I'm hunting an instructor for him who will start his education on the subjects which interest him most. Do you know anyone, Leslie? No one who could do more than study with him. It's a branch that is just being taken up. But I have talked of it quite a bit with Mr. Dovesky, the harmony director of the conservatory. If you go to him and make him understand what you want along every line, I think he'd take Malcolm as a special student. I'd love to help him as far as I've gone, but I'm only a beginner myself, and I've no such ability as it is very possible he may have. He has it," said Mr. Minturn conclusively. "He has his mother's fine ear and artistic perception. If she undertook it, what a success she could make! I never saw her so interested in anything as she was the, that day at the Tamarack Swamp," said Leslie. "And her heart was full of other matters too. But she recognized the songs I took her to hear." She said she had never been so attracted by a new idea in her whole life. Leslie, I came to you this morning about Nellie. I promised you to think the matters over, and I've done nothing else since I last saw you. Hateful as has been the occupation, you're still sure of what you said about her then? Positively, cried Leslie. Do you hear from her? He asked. No, she answered. You spoke of a letter. He suggested. A note she wrote me before leaving explained Leslie. You see, I'd been with her all day, and we had raced home so joyously. And when things came out as they did, she knew I wouldn't understand. Might I see it? He asked. Surely, said Leslie. I spoke of that the other day. I'll bring it. When Leslie returned, James Minturn read the missive several times. Then he handed it back, saying. What is there in that, Leslie, to prove your points? Three things," said Leslie with conviction: the statement that for an hour after she reached her decision, she experienced real joy, and expected to render the same to you; the acknowledgment that she understood that you didn't know what you were doing to her, in your reception of her, and the final admission that life now held so little for her that she would gladly end it if she dared. Without making what reparation she could, 
What more do you want? You're very sure you are drawing the right deductions, he asked. I wish you would sit down and let me tell you of that day, said Leslie. I have come to you for help, said James Minturn. I would be more than glad if you'd be so kind. At the end, I don't think I've missed a word, said Leslie. That day is and always will be sharply outlined. You've not heard from her since that note, he asked. You don't know where she is? No, said Leslie. I haven't an idea where you could find her, but because of her lawyer superintending the hospital repairs, because of the staff announced, because of the wonderful way things are being done, Daddy thinks it's sure that the work is in John Haynes' hands and that she is directing it through him. If it were not for the war, I would know, said Mr. Minturn. But understanding her as I do, I think of instead of understanding her so well, you scarcely know her at all, said Leslie gently. You may have had a few months of her real nature to begin with, but when her rearing and environment ruled her life, the real woman was either perverted or had small chance. Do you ever stop to think what kind of a man you might have been if all your life you had been forced and influenced as Nellie was? Good Lord, cried Mr. Minturn. Exactly, agreed Leslie. That's what I'm telling you. She has got to the realization of the fact that her life has been husks and ashes, and she went to beg you to help her in a better way, and you failed her. I'm not saying it was your fault. I'm not saying I blame you. I'm merely stating facts. Margaret blames me, said Mr. Minturn. She thinks I'm enough at fault that I never can find happiness until I locate Nellie and learn whether she is with her mother and friends or if she really meant what she said about changing enough to go ahead and be different from principle. Her change was radical and permanent. I've got to know, said Mr. Minturn. But I've no faith in her ability to change and no desire to meet her if she has. Humph, said Leslie. That proves that you need some changing yourself. I certainly do, said James Minchern. If I could have an operation on my brain which would remove that particular cell in which is stored the memory of the past ten years. You will when you see her, said Leslie, and she'll be your surgeon. Impossible, he cried. Go find her, said Leslie. You must to regain peace for yourself. James Minturn returned a troubled man, but with viewpoint shifting so imperceptibly he did not realize what was happening. On his way he decided to visit the hospital, repugnant as the thought was to him. From afar he was amazed at sight of the building. He knew instantly that it must have been the leading topic of conversation among his friends purposely avoided in his presence. Marble pillars and decorations had been freshly cleaned. The building was snowdrift white. It shone through the branches of big trees surrounding it like a fairy palace. At the top of the steps leading to the entrance stood a marble group of heroic proportions that was wonderful. It was a seated figure of Christ, but cut with the face of a man of his station, occupation, and race, garbed in simple robe and in his arms, at his knees, leaning against him, a group of children, the lean, sick, and ailing, such as were carried to him for healing. Cut in the wall above it, in large gold-filled letters, was the admonition, Suffer little children to come unto me. The group was the work of a student and a thinker who would carry an idea to a logical conclusion and then carve it from marble. The thought it gave James Minturn arrested before it was not the stereotyped idea of Christ, not the conventional reproduction of childhood. It impressed on Mr. Minturn's brain that the man of Galilee had lived in the form of other men of his day and that such a face, filled with infinite compassion, was much stronger and more forceful than that of the mild feminine countenance he had been accustomed to associating with the Savior. He entered the door to find his former home filled with workmen, 
and the opening day almost at hand. Everywhere was sanitary whiteness. The reception hall was ready for guests, his library occupied by the matron, the dining hall, a storeroom, the second and third floors in separate wards, save the ballroom, now whiter than ever, its touches of gold freshly gleaming, beautiful flowers in tubs, canary singing in a brass house filling one end of the room, tiny chairs, cots, every conceivable form of comfort and amusement for convalescing little children. The pipe organ remained in place. Music boxes and wonderful mechanical toys had been added. Rugs that had been in the house were spread on the floor. No normal man could study and interpret the intention of that place unmoved. All over the building was the same beautiful whiteness, the same comfort, and thoughtful preparation for the purpose it was designed to fill. The operating rooms were perfect, the whole the result of loving thought, careful execution, and uncounted expense. He came in time to the locked door of his wife's suite, and before he left the building he met her lawyer. He offered his hand and said heartily, My sister told me of the wonderful work going on here. She advised me to come and see for myself, and I'm very glad I did. There's something bigger than the usual idea in this that keeps obtruding itself. I think that too, agreed John Haynes. I've almost quit my practice to work out these plans. They are my wife's, by any chance? All hers, said Mr. Haynes. I only carry out her instructions as they come to me. Will you give me her address, asked Mr. Minturn. I should like to tell her how great I think this. I carry a packet for you that came with a bundle of plans this morning, said Mr. Haynes. Perhaps her address is in it. If it isn't, I can't give it to you, because I haven't it myself. She's not in the city. All her instructions, she sends someone, possibly at her mother's home, and they are delivered to me. I give my communications to the boy who brings her orders. Then I'll write my note, and you give it to him. I'm sorry, Minturn, said Mr. Haynes, but I have my orders in the event you should wish to reach her through me. She doesn't wish to hear from me? I'm sorry no end, Mr. Minturn, but possibly this contains what I want to know, said Mr. Minturn. Thank you, and I congratulate you on your work here. It is humane in the finest degree. James Minturn went to his office and opened the packet. It was a complete schedule of accounting for every dollar his wife was worth. This divided exactly into thirds, one of which she kept. One she transferred to him and the other she placed in his care for her sons to be equally divided between them at his discretion. He returned and found the lawyer had gone to his office. He followed and showed him the documents. What she places to my credit for our sons, that I will handle with the utmost care, he said. What she puts at my personal disposal I do not accept. We are living comfortably and as expensively as I desire to. There is no reason why I should take such a sum at her hands, even though she has more than I would have estimated. You will kindly return this deed of transfer to her with my thanks and a note I will enclose. Sorry, Minturn, but as I told you before, I haven't her address. I am working on a salary I should dislike to forfeit, and my orders are distinct concerning you. You can give me no idea where to find her? Not the slightest, said the lawyer. Will you take charge of these papers, he questioned. I dare not, replied Mr. Haynes. Will you ask her if you may, persisted Mr. Minturn. Sorry, Minturn, but perhaps if you should see my instructions in the case, you'd understand better. I don't wish you to think me disobliging. Mr. Minturn took the sheet and read the indicated paragraph written in his wife's clear hand. Leslie Winton was very good to me my last day in Multiopolis. She was with me when I reached decision concerning my future relations with Mr. Minturn, as I would have arranged them. And I am quite sure, when she knows of our separation, she will feel that it would not have occurred had James known of this decision of mine. It would have made no difference, but I am convinced Leslie will think it would, and that she will go to James about it. I doubt if it will change his attitude, but if by any possibility it should... 
and if in any event, whatever, he comes to you seeking my address or me, I depend on you to in no way help him if it should happen that you could. For this reason, I am keeping it out of your power unless I make some misstep that points to where I am. I don't wish to make any mystery of my location or to disregard any intention that it is barely possible Leslie could bring Mr. Minturn to concerning me. I merely wish to be left alone for a time, to work out my own expiation, if there be any, and to test my soul until I know for myself whether it is possible for a social leopard to change her spots. I have got to know absolutely that I am beyond question a woman fit to be a wife and mother before I again trust myself in any relation of life toward anyone. Mr. Minturn returned the sheet, his face deeply thoughtful. I see your point, he said. I will deposit the papers in a safety vault until she comes, and in accordance with this I shall make no effort to find her. My wife feels that she must work out her own salvation, and I am beginning to realize that a thorough self-investigation and revelation will not hurt me. Thank you. Good morning. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 15. A Particular Nix. The country is all the heaven a body needs in June. Mickey. Peaches awakened early the next morning, but Mickey was watching beside her to help her remember, to prompt, to soothe, to comfort, and to teach. He followed Mrs. Harding to the kitchen, and from the prepared food selected what he thought came closest, filling the diet prescribed by the sunshine nurse. And then he carried the tray to a fresh, cool Peaches beside a window opening on the grassy, tree-covered lawn. Her room was bewildering on account of its many, and to the child, magnificent furnishings. She found herself stretching and twisting and filled with a wild desire to walk, to see the house, the little girl and the real baby, the lawn beyond her window, the flower field, the red berries where they grew, and the birds and animals from which came the most amazing sounds. After doing everything for Peach as he could, Mickey went to his breakfast. Mary Harding and Bobby were so anxious to see the visitor they could scarcely eat, and knowing it was no use to try forcing them, their mother excused them, and they ventured as far as the door. There they stopped and gazed at the little stranger, and she stared back at them, but she was not frightened because she knew who they were and that they would be good to her else Mickey would not let them come. So when Mary, holding little brother's hand, came peeping around the door casing, Peaches withdrew her attention from exploration of the strip of lawn in her range and concentrated on them. If they had come bounding at her, she would have been frightened, but they did not. They stood still, half afraid, watching the tiny white creature, till suddenly she smiled at them and held out her hand. I like you, she said. "'Did you have red berries for breakfast?' "'Mary nodded and smiled back. "'I think you're a pretty little girl,' said Peaches. "'I ain't half as pretty as you,' said Mary. "'No, of course you ain't,' she admitted. "'Your family don't put your ribbon on you till night, do they? "'Mickey put mine on this morning, "'cause I have to look nice and be just as good, "'else I have to be took back to the hot room. "'Do you have to be nice, too?' "'Yes, I have to be a good girl,' said Mary. "'What does your family do to you if you don't mind?' "'I ain't going to tell, but it makes me,' said Mary. "'What does yours do to you?' "'I ain't going to tell either,' said Peaches, "'but I get just as good. "'What's your name?' "'Mary.' "'What's his?' 
Bobby. Mostly we call him little brother. Ain't he sweet? asked Mary. Just a precious child. Let him mark on my slate. Mickey hurried to the room. As he neared the door, he stepped softly and peeped inside. It was a problem with him as to how far Mary and Bobby could be trusted. Having been with Peaches every day, he could not accurately mark improvements, but he could see that her bones did not protrude so far, that her skin was not the yellow, glisteny horror it had been, that the callous spots were going under the steady rubbing of nightly oil massage. And lately he had added the same treatment to her feet, if they were not less bony. If the skin were not soft and taking on a pinkish color, Mickey felt that his eyes were unreliable. Surely she was better. Of course she was better. She had to be. She ate more. She sat up longer. She moved her feet when first they had hung helpless. She was better, much better. And for that especial reason, now was the time to watch closer than before. Now he must make sure that a big, strong child did not drag her from the bed, and forever undo all he had gained. Since he had written Doctor Carroll, Mickey had rubbed in desperation not only nights but mornings also, lest he had asked help before he was ready for it. For the sunshine lady had said explicitly that the sick back could not be examined until the child was stronger. He was working according to instructions. One of the most beautiful things about Mickey was that from birth, he had been a little soldier of the cross. He could obey orders instantly, cheerfully, and unquestioningly. Mickey watched. Anyone could have seen the delicate flush on Peach's cheek this morning. The hint of red on her lips, the clearing whites of her lovely eyes. She was helping Bobby as Mickey had taught her, and Bobby approved mightily. He lifted his face, put up his arms, and issued his command: "Take Bobby!" "No, no, Bobby," cautioned Mary. "Mother said no. You must stay on the floor. Sister will take you. You mustn't touch Peaches till God makes her well. You asked him last night, don't you know?" Mother will spank something awful if you touch her. You must be careful till her back is well. Mother said so, and father too. Father said it much crosser than mother. Don't you remember? Mustn't touch," repeated Bobby, drawing back. Mickey was satisfied with what he had heard of Mrs. Harding's instructions, but he took the opportunity to emphasize a few points himself. He even slipped one white bony foot from under the sheet and showed Mary how sick it was, and how carefully it must be rubbed before it would walk. I can rub it," announced Mary. "Well, don't you try that," cautioned Mickey. "Why, go on and let her," interposed Peaches. "Go on and let her. After today, you said you'd be gone all day, and if rubbing in the morning and evening is good, maybe more would make me walk sooner." Mickey, I ain't ever said it, 'cause you do so much and try so hard. But Mickey, I'm just about dead to walk. Mickey, I'm so tired being lifted. Mickey, I want to get up and go when I want to, like other folks. Well, that's the first time you ever said that. Well, 'tain't the first time I ever could have said it if I'd a wanted to. Explained Peaches. I see, you game little kid, you said Mickey. All right, Mary. You ask your mother, and if she says so, I'll show you how. And maybe you can rub Lily's feet if you go slow and easy and don't jar her back a speck. Ma said I could already. Explained Mary. Ma said for me to. She said all of us would all the time we had while you were away, so she'd get better faster. Ma said she'd give a hundred dollars if Peaches would get so she could walk here. Mickey sat back on his heels suddenly. Who'd she say that to? He demanded. Pa, and he said he'd give five hundred. Ah! Marvelled Mickey. He did too, insisted Mary. This morning, before you came out, and Junior would too. He'd give all his bank, and he'd rub too. He said he would. Well, if you ain't the nicest folks, cried Mickey. Gee, I'm glad I found you. Just as glad," chimed in Peaches. "Mary, bring Robert here," called Mrs. Harding from the hall. Mary obeyed. 
Mickey moved up and looked intently at Peaches. Well, Lily, he asked, what do you think of this? I wouldn't trade this for heaven, she answered. The country is all the heaven a body needs in June, said Mickey. Mickey, bring in the cow now, ordered Peaches. Bring in the cow, queried Mickey. Sure, the little red cow in the book that makes the milk, said Peaches. I want you to milk her right here on my bed. Well, if I ever gasped Mickey, sure, I'll bring her in a minute, but a cow is big, Lily, awful great big. I couldn't bring her in here, but maybe I can drive her where you can see her, or I don't know what would be the harm in taking you where the cows are. But first one thing. Now you look right at me, Miss Chicken. There's something I gotta know if you got it in your head straight. Who found you and kept them from getting you? Mickey lovest, replied Peaches promptly. Then who'd you belong to, he demanded. Mickey, she answered instantly. Who you gotta do as I say, he continued. Mickey, she repeated. Whose family are you, he pursued. Mickey, she cried. Mickey, what's the matter? Mickey, I love you best. I'm all yours. Mickey, I'll go back and never say a word about the hotness or the longness or anything if you don't want me here. Well, I do want you here, said Mickey in slow, insistent tone. I want you right here, but you gotta understand a few things. You're mine. I'm gonna keep you. You gotta understand that. Yes, Mickey, conceded Peaches. And if it will help you to be rubbed more than I can rub you, will I gotta earn money to pay for our supper when we go home and fix your back and save for the seminary? I'll let the nice, pleasant lady rub you, and I'll let a good girl like Mary rub you. And if his hands ain't so big they hurt, maybe I'll let Peter rub you. He takes care of Bobby. Maybe he could you, and he's got a family of his own, so he knows how it feels. But it's nix on anybody else, Miss Chicken. See? They ain't nobody else," said Peaches. "There is too," contradicted Mickey. "Mary said Junior would rub your feet. Well, he won't. It's nix on Junior. He's only a boy. He ain't got a family. He hasn't had experience. He doesn't know anything about families. See? He carries Bobby, and I bet he's heavier than me." For the first time, Mickey lost his temper. Now you looky here, Miss Chicken," he stormed. "I ain't saying what he can do. I'm saying what he can't. See, you are mine, and I'm going to keep you. He can lift me for all I care, but he can't carry you nor rub your feet nor nothing, because he didn't find you and you ain't his. And I won't have it, not at all. Of course he's a good boy and he's a nice boy, and you can play with him and talk to him. I'll let you just be awful nice to him because it's polite that you should be." But when it comes to carrying and rubbing, it's nix on Junior because he's got no family and doesn't understand. See? Mm-hmm. Taunted Peaches. Well, are you going to promise? Demanded Mickey. Maybe she teased. Back you go and never see a cow at all if you don't promise. Threatened Mickey. Mickey, what's the matter with you? Cried Peaches suddenly. What are you getting a tantrum for? You ain't never had none before. That ain't no sign. I ain't just busting full of 'em," said Mickey. "Bad ones, and I feel an awful one as can be coming right now and coming quick. Are you going to promise me nobody who hasn't a family carries you and rubs you?" Peaches looked at him in steady wonderment. "I guess you're pretty tired, and you need to sleep a while or something," she said. "If you wasn't about sick yourself, you'd know as anybody except you'll get their damn gone hands ripped off if they touched me." Nels, you says so. Course you found me. Course they'd a got me if you hadn't took me. Course I'm yours. Course it's nix on Junior and it's nix on Peter if you say so. Mickey, I just love you and love you. I'll go back now if you say so. I tell you, Mickey, what's the matter? She stretched up her arms and Mickey sank into them. He buried his face beside hers and for the first time she patted him. And whispered to him as she did to her doll. She rubbed her cheek against his, crooned over him, and held him tight while he gulped down big sobs. Mickey, tell me, she begged like a little mother. Tell me, honey, are you got a pain anywhere? 
No, he said. Maybe I was kind of strung up getting you here and being so awful scared about hurting you. But it's all right now. You're here, and things are going to be fine. Only will you cross your heart always and forever? Remember this. It's Nick son Jr. or any boy who ain't got a family and doesn't understand. Yes, Mickey, cross my heart and forever and ever and... Mickey, you must get the soap. I slipped and said the worst yet. I didn't mean to, but Mickey, I guess you can't trust me. I guess you gotta soap me or beat me or something awful. Go on and do it, Mickey. Why crazy, said Mickey. You're mixed up. You didn't say anything. What you said was all rightest ever. Rightest of anything I ever heard. It was just exactly what I wanted you to say. I just loved what you said. Well, if I ever, cried Peaches. Mickey, you were so mixed up you didn't hear me. I got another chance. Goody, goody. Now show me the cow. All right, said Mickey. I'll talk with Mrs. Harding and see how she thinks I best go at it. Lily, you won't ever, ever forget that particular nix, will you? Not ever, she promised, and lifted her lips to seal the pact with a kiss that meant more to Mickey than all that had preceded it. Just how do you feel, anyway, flowersy girl? Fine, said Peaches. I can tell by how it is right now that it isn't going to get all smothery and sweatings here. Woo-hoo! It's so good, Mickey. Mickey bent over her, holding both hands, and whispered, Then you just keep right before your eyes where you came from, miss, and what you must go back to if you don't behave. You will be a good girl, won't you? Honest, Mickey, love is just as good. Well, how does it go with little white butterfly? asked Peter at the door. Mickey looked at Peaches and slightly nodded encouragement. Then he slipped from the room. She gave Peter a smile of wonderment and answered readily, Grand as a queen lady. You're just so nice and fine. Now Peter hadn't known it, but all his life he had been big and handled rough tools, tasks, implements, and animals. While his body grew sinewy and hard to cope with his task, his heart demanded more refined things. So if Peaches had known the most musical languages on earth, she could have not used words to Peter that would have served her better. He radiated content. Good, he cried, that's grand and good. I didn't take a fair look at you last night. It was so sissing hot in that place, and you went to sleep before I got my chores done. But now we must get acquainted. Tell me, honey, does any particular place in your little body hurt you? If there does, put your hand and show Peter where. Peaches stared at Peter in assimilating such gentleness from so big a source. Then she faintly smiled at him and laid a fluttering hand on her left side. Oh, shockings, mourned Peter. That's too bad. That's vital. Your heart's right under there, honey. Is there a pain in your heart? Peaches nodded solemnly. Not all the time, she explained. Only like now, when you are so good to me. Just so fine and good. Then and there Peter surrendered. He bent and kissed the hand he held, and said with tears saturating his words, just as tears do permeate speech sometimes. Pshaw now, little white butterfly, I never was more pleased to hear anything in my life. Ma and I have talked for years of having some city children here for a summer, but we've been slow trying it because we hear such bad reports from many of them, and it's natural for people to shield their own. But I guess instead of shielding, we may have been denying. I can't see anything about you children to hurt ours. And I notice a number of ways where it is beneficial to have you here. It's surely good for all of us. You're the nicest little folks. Peaches sat up suddenly and smiled on Peter. Mickey is nice and fine, she told him. Not even you or anybody is nice as Mickey. And I'm going to be. I'd like to be. But you see, I laid alone all day in a dark corner so long, and I got so wild-like, at when Granny did come, I done and said just like she did. But Mickey doesn't like it. He's scared, most stiff, fear I'll forget and say bad swearings. 
"'and you'll send me back to the hotness "'so's I won't get better. "'Would you send me back if I forgot just once, Peter?' "'Why, pshaw now,' said Peter. "'Pshaw, little soul. "'Don't you worry about that. "'You try hard to remember "'and be like Mickey wants you to. "'And if you make a slip, "'I'll speak to Ma about it, "'and we'll just turn a deaf ear, "'and a way out of here you'll soon forget it.' "'Just then Mickey, trailing a rope, "'passed before the window. "'There was a crunching sound. "'A lumbering cow stopped.' "'lifted a mouth half-filled with grass "'and bawled her loudest protest "'at being separated from her calf. "'Peaches had only half a glance, "'but her shriek was utter terror. "'She launched herself on Peter "'and climbed him until her knees were on his chest "'and her fingers clutching his hair. "'God, Jesus!' she screamed. "'It'll eat me!' Peter caught her in his arms and turned his back. Mickey heard and saw and realized that the cow was too big and it appeared too precipitately and bellowed too loudly. He should have begun on the smallest calf on the place. He rushed the cow back to Junior and himself to Peaches, who, sobbing wildly, still clung to Peter. As Mickey entered, frightened and despairing, he saw that Peter was much concerned. "'but laughing until his shoulders shook. "'And in relief that he was, "'and that none of the children were present, "'Mickey grinned, "'acquired a slow red, "'and tried to quiet Peaches. "'Shut that window!' she screamed. "'Shut it quick!' "'Why, honey, that's the cow you wanted to see,' "'soothed Mickey. "'That's the nice cow that gave you "'the very milk you had for breakfast. "'And Junior was going to milk her where you could see. "'We thought you'd like it. "'Don't let it get me!' cried Peaches. "'Why, it ain't going to get anything but grass,' said Mickey. "'Didn't you see me leading it? "'I can make that big old thing go where I please. "'Come on, be a game kid now. "'You ain't a baby coward, girl. "'It's only a cow. "'You are going to put it on your book.' "'I ain't,' sobbed Peaches. "'I ain't ever going to drink milk again.' I just bet the milk will get me. Be game now, urged Mickey. Mary milks the cow. Baby Bobby runs right up to her. Everything out here is big, Lily. I ran from the horses. I jumped on a fence and Junior laughed at me. Mickey, what did you say? wavered Peaches. I didn't say anything, said Mickey. I just jumped. Mickey, I jumped and I said it both. I said it right on Peter, she bravely confessed. Mickey, I said the worst yet. I didn't know I did till I heard it. But, Mickey, I got another chance. Peaches wiped her eyes, tremulously glanced at the window, and still clinging to Mickey, explained. I was just telling Peter about the swearings. And, Mickey, don't feel so bad. He won't send me back for just once. "'Mickey, Peter has got a deaf ear. "'He said he had. "'He ain't going to hear it when I slip a swearin's. "'And, Mickey, I am trying. "'Honest, I'm trying just as hard, Mickey.' "'Mickey turned a despairing face toward Peter. "'Just like she says,' assured Peter. "'We've all got our faults. "'You'll have to forgive her, Mickey.' "'Me, of course,' conceded Mickey. "'But what about you?' "'You don't want your nice little children to hear bad words.' "'Well,' said Peter, "'don't make too much of it. "'It's likely there are no words she can say "'that my children don't know. "'Just ignore it and forget it. "'She won't do it often. "'I'm sure she won't.' "'Are you sure you won't, miss?' demanded Mickey. "'Sure,' said Peaches. "'And in an effort to change the subject, "'Mickey, is that cow out there yet?' "'No. "'Junior took her back to the barnyard.' "'Mickey, I ain't going to put a cow on my book, "'but I want to see her again, a way off. "'Mickey, take me where I can see. "'You said last night you would. "'But the horses are bigger than the cows. "'The pigs and sheep are big enough. "'You'll get scared again. "'And with scaring and crying, you'll be so bad off, "'your back won't get any better all day. "'And tomorrow i got to leave you and go to work. "'Then I'll see all the things today.' 
and tomorrow I'll think about them till you come back. Please, Mickey. If things don't get Bobby and Mary, they won't get me. That's a game, little girl," said Mickey. "All right, I'll take you, but you ought to have." Have what, Mickey? She inquired, instantly alert. Well, never you mind what," said Mickey. "You be a good girl and lie still, so your back will be better. And watch the bundle I'll bring home tomorrow night." Peaches shivered in delight. Mickey proceeded slowly, followed by the entire family. Mickey, it's so big," she marvelled. "Everything is so far away and so." Big. Now isn't it? Agreed Mickey. You see, it's like I told you. Now let me show you the garden. He selected that as a safe proposition. Peaches grasped the idea readily enough. Mrs. Harding gathered vegetables for her to see. When they reached the strawberry bed, Mickey knelt and with her own fingers, Peaches pulled a berry and ate it. Then laughed, exclaimed, and cried in delight. She picked a flower, and from the safe vantage of the garden, viewed the cows and horses afar, and the fields and sheep were explained to her. Mickey carried her across the road. Mary brought a comfort, and for a whole hour the child lay under a big tree with pink and white clover in a foot deep border around her. When they lifted her, she said, "Mickey, tonight we put in the biggest blesses of all." What inquired Mickey? Bless the nice people for such grand things, and the berries, but never mind about the cow. But Lily, you like the milk, cried Mickey. You need it to make your legs stiff so that they'll walk. Don't be such a silly as to go back on milk because you thought a cow was smaller than a calf is. Well then, bless the cow, but I won't ever put one on my book. She said with finality. The cow is settled. Then Mickey took her back to the house. She awoke from a restful nap to find a basket of chickens waiting for her, barely down dry from their shells. She caught up a little yellow ball and with both hands clutched it, exclaiming and crying in joy, until Mickey saw the chicken was drooping, and pried open her excited little fingers. But the chicken remained limp. And soon it became evident that she had squeezed the life from it. Oh, peaches! You held it too tight," wailed Mickey. "I'm afraid you've made it sick." "I didn't mean to, Mickey," she protested. "I didn't drop it. I held it as tight as I could." Mrs. Harding reached over and picked the chicken from Mickey's fingers. "That chicken wasn't very well to begin with," she said. "You give it to me, and I'll doctor it up." While you take another one, which do you want? Yellow sniffed Peaches, but please hurry. And Mickey, you hold this one. Maybe I held it too hard. Yes, you did," laughed Peter. But we wanted to see what you'd do. One little chicken is a small price for the show you give. It's all right, Butterfly. Peter, you make everything all right, don't you? Well, honey, I would if I could," said Peter. "But that's something of a contract. Now you rest till after dinner, and if Ma and Mickey agree on it, we'll go see the meadow brook and hear the birds sing." "The water!" shouted Peaches. "Mickey, you promised." "Yes, I remember," said Mickey. "I'll see how cold it is, and if I think it won't chill you, yes." "Oh, gee!" chortled Peaches. "Another blesses." What does she mean? Asked Peter. Mickey explained. Can't see how it would hurt her a mite," said Peter. Water is warm. Nice day. It will be good for her. All right," said Mickey. Then we'll try it. But how about the plowing, Peter? Shouldn't I be helping you? Not today," said Peter. I never allow my work to drive me, so I get pleasure from life my neighbors miss, and I'll compare bank accounts with any of 'em. Tomorrow I'll work. Today I'm an entertaining company, or rather, they are entertaining me. I think this is about the best day of my life, isn't it, Great Ma? It just is. I can't half work myself," answered Nancy Harding. 
I just wonder if we could take a little run in the car after supper. What do you think about it, Mickey? asked Peter. Well, I can't see that coming out hurt her any. Then we'll go, said Peter. Do I have to be all covered? questioned Peaches. Not nearly so much, explained Mickey. I'll let you see a lot more. There's a bobolink bird down the street Peter wants to show you. Street? jeered Junior. That's a road! Sure, said Mickey. I got a lot to learn. You tell me, will you, Junior? Course, said Junior, suddenly changing from scorn to patronage. Now let's take her to the creek. Well, that's quite a walk, said Peter. We're not going there unless I carry the little white butterfly. You want me to take you, don't you? Peaches answered instantly. Mickey always carries me. He can. And of course I like him the best. But after him I like you best, Peter. And you may if he'll let you. So that's the way the wind blows, laughed Peter. Then, Mickey, it's up to you. Why, sure, said Mickey, since you are so big and got a family of your own, so you understand. What, Mickey? asked Peter. Oh, how to be easy with little sick people, answered Mickey, and that a man's family is his family, and he doesn't want anybody else button in. I see, said Peter, struggling with his facial muscles. Of course. But this sheet is going to be rather bunglesome. Ma, could you do anything about it? Yes, said Mrs. Harding. Mary, you run up to the flannel chest and get Bobby's little blue blanket. Peter lifted the child to his broad breast. She slipped her arms around his neck and laid her head on his shoulder with a sigh of content. Bloom time was past, but bird time was not. And the leaves were still freshly green and tender. Some of them reached to touch Peach's gold hair in passing. She was held high to see into nests and the bluebirds hollow in the apple tree. Peaches gripped Peter and cried, Don't let it get my feet! when the old turkey gobbler came rasping, strutting, and spitting at the party. Mickey pointed to Mary, who was unafraid, and Peaches' clutch grew less frantic, but she defended, well, I don't care. I bet if she hadn't ever seen one before, and then a big thing like that would come right at her, telling plain it was going to eat her alive, it would scare the livers out of her. Yes, I guess it would, conceded Peter. But you got the eating end of it wrong. It isn't going to eat us. We're going to eat it. About Thanksgiving we'll lay its head on the block and Ma will stuff it. I've quit stuffing turkeys, Peter, said Mrs. Harding. I find it spoils the flavor of the meat. Well, then it will stuff us, said Peter, all we can hold, and mince pie, plum pudding, and every good thing we can think of. What piece of turkey do you like best, butterfly? Mickey instantly scanned Peter, then Mrs. Peter, and tensely waited. Oh, stop! Stop! Is that a turkey bird? cried Peaches. Surely it is, said Mrs. Harding. Why, childy, haven't you ever seen a turkey either? No, I didn't ever, said Peaches. Can turkey birds sing? Just then the gobbler stuck forward his head and sang, Gahowl! Hobble! Hobble! Peaches gripped Peter's hair and began to ascend him again. Mrs. Harding waved her apron, and the turkey suddenly reduced its size three-fourths, skipped aside, and a neat trim board, high-stepping and dainty, walked through the orchard. Peaches suddenly collapsed in Peter's arms in open-mouthed wonder. Gosh, how did it cave in like that, she cried. Peter's shoulders were shaking, but he answered gravely, well, that's a way it has of puffing itself up and making a great big pretense that it is going to flop us. And then, if just little Bobby or Ma waves an apron or a stick, it gets out of the way in a hurry. I've seen Multiopolis Miliaries cave in like that sometimes when I waved a morning paper with an inch-high headline about them, commented Mickey. Peter Harding glanced at his wife, and they laughed together. Peter stepped over a snake fence, went carefully down a hill, crossed the meadow to the shade of a tree, 
sat on the bank of the brook and watched Peaches as she studied first the clear babbling water, then the grass trailing in the stream, the bushes, trees, and then the water again. Mickey, come here, she commanded. Put your head right down beside mine. Now, look just the way I do and tell me what you see. I see running water and grassy banks and trees and the birds and the sky and the clouds. The water shows what's above it like a mirror, Lily. Peaches pointed. Mickey watched intently. Sure, he cried, little fish with red speckles on them. Shall I catch you one to see? Taint my eyes, then, questioned Peaches. Your eyes, miss, asked Mickey, bewildered. Taint my eyes seeing things that yours doesn't? Mickey took her hand and drew closer. Well, it isn't any wonder you almost doubt it, honey, he said. I would, too, if I hadn't ever seen it before. But I've been on the trolley and on a few newsboys' excursions. And in the car with Mr. Bruce. And I've got to walk along the str- roads some, so I know it's real. Let me show you. Mickey slipped down the bank, scooped his hands full of water, and lifted them, letting it drip through his fingers. Then he made a sweep and brought up one of the fish, brightly marked as a flower and gasping in the air. Look quick, he cried. See it good. It's used to water and the air chokes it. Just like the water would you if a big fish would take you and hold your head under. I gotta put it back quick. Mickey, lay it on my hand just a little bit. Mickey obeyed and Peaches examined it hurriedly. Put it back, she cried. I guess that's as long as I'd want to be choked. While a fish looked at me. Mickey exchanged the fish for a handful of wet, vividly colored pebbles, then brought a bunch of cowslips yellow as gold, and a long willow whip with leaves on it. And when she had examined these, she looked inquiringly at Mrs. Harding. Nicest lady, may I put my feet in your water? How about the temperature of it, Mickey? inquired Mrs. Harding. It's all right, said Mickey. I've washed her in colder water lots of times. The sunshine lady said I should to toughen her up. Then go ahead, said Mrs. Harding. Peter, may I? asked Peaches. Surely, agreed Peter. Whole bunch may get in if Ma says so. Well, I don't say so, exclaimed Mrs. Harding. The children have their good clothes on, and they always get to romping and dirty themselves, and then it's bigger washings, and mine are enough to break my back now. Peter looked at his wife intently. Why, Nancy, I hadn't heard you complain before, he said. If they're too big, we must wear less and make them smaller. And I'll take an hour at the machine, and Junior can turn the ringer. All you children, listen to me. Your ma is feeling the size of the wash. That means we must be more careful of our clothes and help her better. If ma gets sick or tired of us, we'll be in a fix, I tell you. I didn't say I was sick or tired of you. I'm just tired of washing, said Mrs. Harding. I see, said Peter. But it is a thing that has got to be done like plowing and sewing. Yes, I know, said Mrs. Harding, but plowing and sewing only come once a year. Washing comes once and twice a week. Let me, said Mickey. I always help mother, and I do my own and Lily's at home. Of course I will here. And I can help you a lot with yours. Yes, a boy, scoffed Mrs. Harding. Well, I'll show you that a boy can work as well as a girl if he's been taught right, said Mickey. I wasn't bringing up any question of work, said Mrs. Harding. I just didn't want the children to dirty a round of clothing apiece. They may wade when their things are ready for the wash anyway. Go on, Peaches. Peter moved down the bank and prepared to lower her to the water, but she reached her arms for Mickey. He promised me, she said, back there on his nice bed in the hot room. He promised me this. So I did, said Mickey, radiating satisfaction he could not conceal. So I did. Now I'll let you put your feet in, like I said. Will the fish bite me? she questioned timidly. Those little things? What if they did? 
Thus encouraged, she put her toes in the water, gripping Mickey and waiting breathlessly to see what happened. Nothing happened, and the warm running water felt pleasant, so she dipped lower, and then did her best to make it splash. It wasn't much of a splash, but it was a satisfying performance to the parties most interested, and from their eagerness the watchers understood what it meant to them. Junior sidled up to his mother. Ain't that tough, he whispered. She bit her lip and silently nodded. Look at her feet, will you, he breathed. She looked at him instead, and suddenly her eyes filled with a mist like that clouding his. Think they'll ever walk, he questioned. I don't know, she said softly, but it looks as if God has given us the chance to make them if it's possible. Well, say, what's my share, he asked. Just anything you see that you think will help. If I be more careful not to dirty so many clothes, will it help, he asked. It would leave me that much more time and strength to give to her, she said. Will all I can save you in any way be helping her that much, he persisted. Surely, she said. Soon as he's out of sight, I'm going to begin on her. But don't let him hear. Junior nodded. He sat down on the bank, watching as if fascinated the feet trying to splash in the water. Mickey could feel the effort of the small body. You take her now, he said to Peter. Then he threw off his shoes and stockings, turned up his knee breeches, and stepped into the water, where he helped the feet to kick and splash. He rubbed them, and at last picked up handfuls of fine sand, and lightly massaged with it until he brought a pink glow. That's the stuff, endorsed Peter. Look at that. You're pulling the blood down. Where's the blood? asked Peaches. Peter explained the circulatory system and why all the years of lying with no movement had made her so helpless. He told her why scarce and wrong food had not made good blood to push down and strengthen her feet so they could walk. He told her the friction of the sand rubbing would pull it down while the sun, water, and earth would help. Peaches, with wide eyes, listened, her breath coming faster and faster, until suddenly she leaned forward and cried, Rub, Mickey! Rub till the blood flies! Rub em hot as hell! Well, Miss Chicken! he cried in despair. Peaches buried her shamed face on Peter's breast. He screened her with a big hand. Now never you mind, never you mind, he repeated. Everybody turn a deaf ear. That was a slip. Nobody heard it. You mean, little butterfly white, rub hard. Say rub hard and that will fix it. Mickey, she said in a faint voice, so subdued and contrite as to be ridiculous. Mickey, lovest, won't you please to rub hard? Rub just as hard? Mickey suddenly bent over the bony little foot he was chafing and kissed it. Yes, darling, I'll rub it till it almost bleeds, he said. When the feet were glowing with alternate sand rubbing and splashing in cold water, Peter looked at his wife. I think that's the ticket, he said. Nancy, don't you? That pulls down the blood with rubbing and drives it back with the cold water and pulls it down to be pushed back again. Ain't that helping the heart get in its work? Now if we strengthen her with right food and make lots of pure blood to run in those little blue canals on her temples and hands and feet, ain't we gaining ground? Ain't we making headway? We've just got to be, said Mrs. Harding. There's no other way to figure it. But this is enough for a start. Peaches leaned toward her and asked, May we do this again tomorrow, nicest lady? Well... I can't say as we can come clear here every day. I'm a mighty busy woman, and my spare time is scarce. And even light as you are, you'd be a load for me. I can't say as we can do this when Peter is busy plowing and harvesting, and Junior is away on the cream wagon, and Mickey is in town at his work. We can't do just this, but there is something we can do that will help the feet quite as much. We can bring a bucket of sand up to the house and set a tub of water in the sun, and you can lie in a comfort under an apple tree with Mary and Bobby to watch you. And every few hours we can take a little time off for rubbing and splashing. 
My job, shouted Junior, I get a bucket and carry up the sand. I bring the tub and pump the water, cried Mary. Me shoo turkey, announced Bobby. I lift the tub to the edge of the shade and carry out the butterflies, said Peter. And where do I come in, demanded Mickey. Why, Mickey, you let them, cried Peaches. You let them. And you earn the money to pay for the new back. When I get strong enough to have it changed and the carol man comes, don't you remember? Sure, boasted Mickey, taking on height. I got the biggest job of all. I got the job that really does the trick. And tomorrow I get right after it. Now I must take you back to the house to rest a while. Aw, come on to the barn with me, begged Junior. Let father carry her. Ain't you going to be any company for me at all? Sure, said Mickey. Wait a minute. I'd like to go to the barn with you. He dried Peach's feet with his handkerchief, stuffed his stockings in his pocket, and picked up his shoes. Lily, can you let Peter take you back to rest till supper time? And let me see what Junior wants to show me? Yes, I can, said Peaches. Yes, I can, because I'm a game kid, but I don't wish to. Now you look here, Miss Chicken. That hasn't got anything to do with it, explained Mickey. Every single time you can't have your way, because it ain't good for you. If all these nice folks are so kind to you, you must think part of the time about what they want. And just now, Junior wants me. So you march right along nice and careful with Peter, and pretty soon I'll come. Peaches pouted a second, then her face cleared by degrees, until it lifted to Peter with a smile. Peter, will you please to carry me while Mickey does what Junior wants, she asked with melting sweetness. Sure, said Peter. I'm the one to take you anyway, big and strong as an ox. But that's a pretty way to ask, and asking like a nice lady. Peaches radiated pride, while Peter returned her to the couch, brought her a glass of milk and a cracker, pulled the shade, and going out softly, closed the door. In five minutes, she was asleep. An hour before supper time, Mickey appeared, and without a word, began watching Mrs. Harding. Suddenly, her work lightened. When she was ready for water, the bucket was filled, saving her a trip to the pump. When she lifted the dishpan and started toward the back door, Mickey met her with the potato basket. When she glanced questioningly at the stove, he put in more wood. He went to the dining room and set the table exactly as it had been for dinner. He made the trip to the cellar with her, and brought up bread and milk while she carried butter and preserves. As she told Peter that night, no strange woman ever had helped her as quickly and understandingly. With dishwashing, he was on hand, for he knew that Peach's fate hung on how much additional work was made for Mrs. Harding. That surprised woman found herself seated in a cool place on the back porch, preparing things for breakfast, while Mickey washed the dishes and Mary carried them. Peaches was moved to the couch in the dining room where she could look on. Then, wrapped in Bobby's blanket and held closely in Mickey's arms, the child lay quivering with delight while the big car made the trip to the clubhouse and stopped under the trees to show Peaches where Mr. Bruce played. And then, slowly, ran along the country road with all its occupants talking at once, in their effort to point out to her everything. And no one realized how tired she was until, in calling her attention to a colt beside its mother, she made no response, and it was discovered that she was asleep. So they took her. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. Michael O'Halloran, Chapter Sixteen, The Fingers in the Pie. Strange how women folks get discouraged right on their job among their best friends, who would do anything in the world for them. Except just to see that a little bit of change would help them, Mickey. When Mickey went to the kitchen the next morning, 
to bring water for the inevitable washing, Mrs. Harding said to him, Is it possible that child is awake this early? No, she is sleeping like she'd never come to, said Mickey. I'll wait till the last minute before I touch her. You shouldn't wake her, said Mrs. Harding. But I must, said Mickey. I can't go away and leave her not washed, fed, and fixed the best I can. Of course, I understand that, said Mrs. Harding, but now it's different. Then you were forced. This is merely a question of what is best for her. Now, Mickey, we're all worked up over this till we're most beside ourselves, and we want to help. Suppose you humor us by letting us please ourselves a trifle. How does that proposition strike you? Square from the ground up, answered Mickey promptly, but what would please you? Well, said Mrs. Harding, it would please me to keep this house quiet and let that child sleep till the demands of her satisfied body wake her up. Then I'd love to bathe her as a woman would her own, in like case, and cook her such dainties as she should have, things with lots of lime in them. I think her bones haven't been built right. I believe I could make her fifty percent better in three months myself. And as far as taking her away when this week is up, you might as well begin to make a different plans right now. If she does well here and likes it, she can't be taken back where I found her till cool weather, if I can consent of my mind to let her go then. Of course, I know she's yours, and things will be as you say. But think a while before you go against me. If I do all I can for her, I ought to earn the privilege of having my finger in the pie a little bit. So far as Lily goes, said Mickey, I'd be tickled most to death. I ain't anxious to pull and haul and wake up the poor little sleepy thing. Every morning it most makes me sick. I'd a lot rather let her sleep it out, as you say. But while Lily is mine, and I've got to do the best by her I can, you are Peter's, and he must do the best by you he can. And did you notice how he jumped on that washing business yesterday? How are we going to square up with Peter? I'm perfectly willing to do what I said for the sake of that child who never has had the usual chance of a dog till you found her. I've come to be mighty fond of you, Mickey, in the little time I've known you. If I didn't like and want to help Peaches, I'd do a lot for her just to please you. Gee, you're something grand, cried Mickey. Just common clay, commonest kind of clay, Mickey, said Mrs. Harding. But if you want to know how you could square it with me, which will square it with Peter, I'll tell you. You may think I'm silly, but as we're made, we're made. And this is how it is with me. Of course, I love Peter, my children, my home, and I love my work. But I've had this job without jot or tittle of change for fifteen years, and I'm about stalled with the sameness of it. I know you'll think I'm crazy. I won't, interrupted Mickey. You go on and tell me. The sameness of it is getting you and... Just the way you flew around and did things last night perfectly amazed me. I never saw a boy like you before. You helped me better and with more sense than any woman I ever hired. And thinking it over last night, I said to myself, Now, if Mickey would be willing to trade jobs with me, it would give me a change. And it wouldn't be any more woman's work for him than what he is doing. Now never you mind about the woman's work part of it, said Mickey. That doesn't cut any ice with me. It's men's work to eat, and I don't know who made a law that it's any more woman's work to cook for men than it is their own. If there is a law of that kind, I bet a liberty bird the men made it. I hadn't had my show at lawmaking yet, but when I get it, there are some things I can see right now that I'm going to fix for Lily, and I'd sooner fix them for you too than not. Just what were you thinking? Mrs. Harding went to Mickey, took him by the shoulder, turned him toward the back door, and piloted him to the porch, where she pointed east, indicating an open line. It began as high as his head against the side of the Harding back wall and ran straight. It crossed the yard between trees that, through no design at all, 
happened to stand in line with those of the orchard, so that they formed a narrow emerald wall on each side of a green carpeted space that led to the meadow, where it widened, ran downhill, and crossed lush grass where cattle grazed. Then it climbed a far hill, tree crested, cloud capped, and in a midst of glory, the faint red of the rising sun worked color miracles. With the edges of cloud rims, tinted them with flushes of rose, lavender, streaks of vivid red, and a broad stripe of pale green. Alone on the brow of the hill stood one giant old apple tree, the remains of an early day orchard. It was wide branching, symmetrically outlined, backed and colored by cloud wonder above and around it. The woman pointed down the avenue with a shaking finger and asked. See that, Mickey? Start slow and get all of it. Every time I've stepped on this back porch for fifteen years, summer or winter, I've seen that just as it is now, or as it was three weeks ago when the world was blooming, or as it will be in the red and gold of fall, or the later grays and browns, and when it's ice coated, and the sun comes up, I think sometimes it will kill me. I've neglected my work to stand staring many's the time in summer. And I've taken more than one chill in winter. I've tried to show Peter, and a few times I've suggested, and watch sun up pretty soon. Things are going to be wrong at this house. He ought to have seen for himself that you should have had a window cut there the first thing," said Mickey. "Well, he didn't, and he doesn't," said Mrs. Harding. "But Mickey, for fifteen years there hasn't been a single morning of my life when I went to the back porch for water." And you ought to have had water inside fifteen years ago," cried Mickey. "Why, so I had!" exclaimed Mrs. Harding. "And come to think of it, I've mentioned that to Peter over and over too. But Mickey, what I started to say was that I've been perfectly possessed to follow that path and watch the sun rising while sitting under that apple tree, and never yet have I got to the place where there wasn't bread or churning or a baby or visitors." Or washing, or ironing, or some reason why I couldn't go. Maybe I'm a fool, but sure as you're a foot high, I've got to take that trip pretty soon now, or my family is going to see trouble. And last night, thinking it over for the thousandth time, I said to myself, since he's so handy, if he'd keep things going just one morning, just one morning, Mickey handed her a sun hat. Go on," he said gruffly. "I'll do your work, and I'll do it right. And Lily can have her sleep. Go on." The woman hesitated a second, pushed away the hat, took her bearings, and crossed the walk, heading directly toward the old apple tree on the far crest. Her eyes were set on the rising sun, and as she turned to close the yard gate, Mickey could see that there was an odd, unnatural expression on her face. He rolled his sleeves and stepped into the dining room. By the time Peter and Junior came with big buckets of milk, Mickey had the cream separator rinsed and together as he had helped Mrs. Harding fix it the day before. With his first glance, Peter inquired, "Where's Ma?" "She's doing something she's been crazy to do for fifteen years," answered Mickey calmly as he set the gauge and poured in the first bucket of milk, which ain't answering where she is. So taint," said Mickey, starting the machine. "Well, if you'll line up, I'll show you. Train your peepers down that green subway and out to glory, as presented by the Almighty in this particular stretch of country. And just beyond your cows, there you'll see a spot about as big as Bobby, and that will be your nice lady heading straight for sunrise. She said she wanted to go for fifteen years." And there's always had been churning or baking or something, so this morning, as there wasn't a thing but what I could do as good as she could, why she made it up that I'd finish her work and let her see her sunrise, since she seems to be set on it. And when she gets back, she's going to wash and dress Lily for a change. Strange how women folks get discouraged on their job among their best friends, who would do anything in the world for them. Step just to see that a little bit of change would help them. It will be a dandy scheme for Lily, 'cause it lets her get her sleep out, and it will be good for you, 
Cause if Mrs. Harding doesn't get to sit under that apple tree and watch sun up pretty soon, things are going to go wrong at this house. Peter's lower jaw slowly sagged. If you don't hurry, said Mickey, even loving her like you do and loving you as she does, she's going to have them nervous prostrations like the swell dames in Multiopolis get when they ask a fellow to carry a package and can't remember where they want to send it. She's not there yet. She's ahead of them now, for she wants to sit under that apple tree and watch sun up. But if she hadn't got there this morning or soon now, she'd have begun to get mixed. I could see that plain as the city hall. Mickey, what else can you see? asked Peter. Enough to make your head swim, said Mickey. Out with it, ordered Peter. Well, said Mickey gravely, and seemingly intent on the separator, but covertly watching Peter. Well, if you'd have cut that window she'd wanted for fifteen years, right over her table there where the line comes, she could have been seeing that particular bit of glory. You notice, Peter, that probably there's nothing niftier on earth than just the little spot she's been pining for. Look good yourself, and you'll see that she's just climbing the hill to the apple tree. Look at it carefully, and then step inside and focus on what she's been faced with instead. What else does she want? inquired Peter. She didn't mention anything but to watch sun up just once under that apple tree, said Mickey. I don't know what she wants. But from one day here, I could tell you the things she should have. Well, go ahead and tell," said Peter. "Will you agree not to break my neck till I get this cream in the can and what she keeps strained and these buckets washed?" asked Mickey. "I want to have her job all done when she gets back, 'cause I promised her, and that's quite a hike she's taken." "Well, I was riled for a minute, but I might as well hold myself," said Peter. "Looks like you were right." Strangers coming in can always see things that folks on the job can't," consoled Mickey. "Well, go on and tell me what you've seen here, Mickey." Mickey hoisted the fourth bucket. "Well, I've seen the very nicest lady I ever saw, excepting my mother," said Mickey. "I've seen a man about your size that I like better than any man I know, barring Mister Douglas Bruce. And the bar is such a little one it would take a microscope to find it." Peter laughed. Which was what Mickey hoped he would do, for he drew a deep breath and went on with greater assurance. I've seen a place that I thought was a new edition of heaven, and it is. Only it needs a few modern improvements. Yes, Mickey, the window and what else? You haven't looked at what I told you to about the window yet," said Mickey. "Well, since you insist on it, I will," said Peter. And while you're in there," suggested Mickey. "After you finish with that strip of brown oil cloth and the pans and skillets adorning it, cotton up to that cook stove and imagine standing over it while it is roaring to get three meals a day, and all the baking and fruit canning and boiling clothes and such. And tell me if Lily's bed was in so much hotter a place than your wife is, all but about three hours each day." Mickey, listening as intently as he could for the separator, he dared not stop. Heard not a sound for what seemed a long time, and then came amazing ones. He grinned sympathetically as Peter emerged, red-faced and raging. "And you're about the finest man I ever met, too," commented Mickey, still busy with the cream. "You can see what a comfort this separator must be, but it's the only thing your nice lady has got against so many for your work. It takes quite a large building to keep them in. Junior was showing me last night and telling me what all those machines were for. You know, Peter, if there was money for a hay rake and a manure spreader, and a wheel plow and a disk, and a reaper, and a mower and a corn planter, and a corn cutter and a cider press and a windmill and a silo and an automobile. You know, Peter, there should have been enough for that window and the pump inside, and a kitchen sink and a bread mixer and a dishwasher, and if there wasn't any other single thing, there ought to be some way you sell the wood, and use the money for the kind of a summer stove that's only hot under what you're cooking, and turns off the flame the minute you finish. Honest, there had, Peter. I got a little gasoline one in my room that's better than what your nice lady has. The things she should have would cost something, cost a lot for all I know, 
but I bet what she needs wouldn't take half the things in the building Junior showed me did, and it couldn't be the start of what a sick wife and a doctor bills and strange women coming and going and abusing you and the children would cost. Shut up, cried Peter. That will do. Now you listen to me, young man, since you are so expert at seeing things, and since you've traded work with my wife to rest her by changing her job. Suppose you just keep your eyes open and make out a list of what she should have to do her work convenient and easy as can be, and of course comfortably. That stove's hot yet, and breakfast's been over an hour too. Nothing like it must be going full blast and things steaming and frying. Sure, said Mickey. Watch a few days and then we'll talk it over. If it is your train time, ride down with Junior and I'll stay in the house till she comes. I guess little white butterfly won't wake up, and if she does, she'll be all right with me. Mary dresses herself and Bobby. Is Mary helping her ma right? Well, some said Mickey, not all she could, but her taking care of Bobby is a big thing. Junior could do a lot of things, but he doesn't seem to see them, and and so could I. Asked Peter, "Is that the ticket?" Yes, said Mickey. All right, young man," said Peter. "Fix us over. We are ready for anything that will benefit Ma. She's the pinwheel of this place. Now you scoot. I can see her coming. It's our secret, then?" asked Mickey. "Yes, it's our secret," answered Peter gravely. Mickey took one long look at Peaches and went running to the milk wagon. Junior offered to let him drive, so for the first time he took the lines and guided a horse. He was a happy boy as he spun on his heel, waiting a few minutes for the trolley. He sat in the car with no paper in which to search for headlines, no anxiety as to whether he could dispose of enough to keep Peaches from hunger that night, sure of her safety and comfort. The future, colored by what Mrs. Harding had said to him, took on such a rosy glow it almost hurt his mental eyes. He reveled in greater freedom from care than he had ever known. He sat straighter and curiously watched the people in the car. When they entered the city and the car swung down his street near the business center, Mickey stepped off and, hiding himself, watched for the passing of the boy on his old route. Before long, it came. I like to sell papers in such good imitation of his tone and call that Mickey's face grew grave, and a half jealous little ache began in his heart. Course we're better off," he softly commented. "Course I can't go back now, and I wouldn't if I could. But it makes me want to swat any fellow using my call and taking my men. Gee, the kid is doing better than I thought he could. Believe he's got the idea all right. I'll just join the procession." Mickey stepped into line and, following, pausing whenever a paper was sold, until he was sure that his men were patronizing his substitute. Then he overtook him. Good work, kid! He applauded. Been following you, and you're doing well. Let me take a paper a second. Yes, I thought so. You're leaving out the biggest scoop on the sheet. Here, give them a laugh on this. Chasing wrinkles. How did you come to slide over it and not bump enough to wake you up? Get on this sublime. Males seeking beauty doctors to renew youth. How would you cry? It asked the boy. Ah, looky, looky! Mickey shouted, holding his side with one hand and waving a paper with the other. All the old boys hiking to the beauty parlors, pinking up the glow of youth to beat Billy Burke. Corner on icicles, Billy gets left 'cause the boys are using all of them. Oh my, will a time oiled with cold cream and reversed with an icicle. Morning paper tells you how to put the cream on your face 'stead of in the coffee. Stick your head in the ice box at sixty and come out sixteen. Ah, get in line, gentlemen! Don't block traffic. When the policemen scattered the crowd, Mickey's substitute had not a paper remaining, and with his pocket full of change, he was running to the nearest stand for a fresh supply. Mickey went with him and watched with a critical eye while the boy tried a reproduction of what he called a daily scream. The first time it was rather flat. You ain't going at it right," explained Mickey. "Before you can make anybody laugh on this job, you must see the fun of life yourself. Beauty parlors have always been for the swell dames and the theater ladies who pink up while their gents hump to pay the bill. 
"'You ought always take one paper home and read it "'so you know what's going on in the world. "'Now from what I've read, "'I know that the getaway of the beauty parlor is cold cream, "'and one of the show ladies the boys are always wild over "'told the papers long ago "'about how she used icicles on her face to pink it up. "'Now if you'd have knowed this like you should, "'the minute you clapped your peepers on that chasing wrinkles, "'you'd have knowed where your laugh came in today.' Like I've told you over and over, you must get it. Bet Chuffner put that there on purpose for me, which same gives me an idea. You've been called the Hako Geezer War and the lightweight champion of Mexico and the psychological panic something fine. But did you sell out on them? Not on your top knot. You lost your load on the scream. Get the joke of life soaked in your system good. On this, you make yourself see the plutes, the magnates, the city officials leaving their jobs and hiking to the beauty parlors to beat the dames at their daily stunt of being creamed and icicled. And it's funny. When it's so funny to you that you just howl about it, why, it's catching. Didn't you see me catch them with it? Now go on and do it again and get the scream in. The boy began to cry with tears of laughter in his eyes. He kept it up as he handed out papers and took in change. Satisfied, Minky called to him. Tell your sire it's all over but polishing the silver. He started down the street, glancing at clocks he was passing, with nimble feet threading the crowd until he reached the Herald office. There he dodged in and making his way to the editorial desk he waited his chance. When he saw an instant of pause in the work of the busy men, he started his cry. Morning papers! I like to sell them! And so on to the chasing wrinkles. There, because he was excited, for he knew that his reception would depend on how good a laugh he gave them, Mickey outdid himself. Reporters waiting assignments crowded around him. Mr. Chuffner beckoned, and Mickey stepped to him. Found it all right, did you, young man? The scream lifted the load, cried Mickey. War and waste and wickedness didn't get a look in. I thought you'd like that, laughed the editor. Biggest scoop yet, said Mickey. Why, it took the police to scatter the crowd. They struggled to get papers till they looked like the bird on the coin they were passing in, trying to escape the awful things it goes through on the money, and get back to nature where perfectly good birds belong. Honest they did. Have you any poetry for me yet? No, but I'm headed that way, answered Mickey. How so? inquired the editor. Well, why, I got another kid, so he can do my stunt till nobody knows the difference. And I've gone into Mr. Bruce's office, and we're after the grafters. Douglas Bruce? queried Mr. Chuffner. Yes, said Mickey. He's my boss. And say, he's the finest man you ever met. And his joy lady is nice as he is, and prettier than moonshine on the park lake. I never saw a lady who could hold a candle to Miss Leslie Winton, and they just love to tell folks they're engaged. Suddenly the editor arose from his chair, gripped his desk, leaned across it toward Mickey, and almost kicked him from his feet with one word. What? Mickey staggered and stared. At last he recovered his breath. Mr. Bruce and Miss Leslie don't care if I tell it, he defended. They all the time tell it. What? Why is it they're going to be married? Soon as Mr. Bruce gets the grafter he's, who's robbing the taxpayers of Multiopolis and collects his big fee, that's what. As suddenly as he had arisen, Mr. Chuffner dropped back and in a stupefied way still looked at Mickey. And in equal days, Mickey watched him. Then, you come with me. Mr. Chuffner said, rising, as he entered a small room and closed the door. Now you tell me all about this engagement. Maybe they don't want it in the papers yet, said Mickey. I guess I'll let Mr. Bruce do his own talking. But you said they told everybody. So they do, said Mickey. And of course they'd tell you. You can call him. His number is 500X. The editor made a note of it and studied Mickey. Yes, that would be a better way, of course, he agreed. You have a long head, young man. And so you think Miss Leslie Winton is a fine young lady? Surest thing you know, said Mickey. Why, let me tell you. 
and then in a few swift words with broad strokes Mickey sketched in the young woman so intelligent she had selected him from all the other newsies by a description and sent him to Mr. Bruce how she had dolls ready to give away and poor children might ride in her car how she lived with darling old daddy and there Mickey grew enthusiastic and told of the rest house and then the renting of the cabin on Atwater by the most beautiful and considerate of daughters for her father and her lover and when he could not think of another commendatory word to say Mickey paused while a dazed man muttered a word so low this boy scarcely heard it I don't know why you say that cried Mickey oomph said Mr. Chuffner slowly I don't either only I didn't understand they were engaged it's my business to find and distribute news and gets it fresh scoop it as our term is and so Mickey when investigations are going on and everybody knows a de now a big surprise is coming in order to make sure that my paper gets in on the ground floor I make some investigation for myself and sometimes by accident sometimes by intuition sometimes by sharp deduction we happen to land before the investigators of course we have personal financial and political reasons for not spoiling the game now we haven't gone into the city hall investigation as bruce has and we can't show figures but we know enough to understand where he's coming out so when the gig upsets we have our side ready and will embroider his figures with what the public is entitled to in the way of news sure but I don't see why you act so funny oh it's barely possible that I've got ahead of your boss on a few features of his investigation ah said Mickey well I hope you ain't gonna rush in and spoil his scoop you see he doesn't know who he's after himself we talk about it a lot of times I tell him how I've sold papers and seen men like he's chasing get their dose and go sick and white and can't ev ever face men straight again but he says stealing is stealing and cut where it will those who rob the taxpayers must be exposed I told him maybe he'd be surprised and maybe he'd be sorry but he says it's got to be stopped no matter who gets hurt well he's got his nerve cried the editor yes agreed Mickey he's so fine himself he thinks no other men worth saving could go wrong I told him I wish the men he was after would break their necks for he gets them but he goes right on Mickey you figure closer than your boss does in one way I do conceded Mickey it's like this he knows books and men and how things should be but I know how they are see I certainly see said the intent listener Mickey, when it comes to the place where you think you know better than your boss, well, it's bad news for me to tell you. Keep your eyes open and maybe you can save him. Books and theories are all right, but there are times when a man comes a cropper on them. You watch, and if you think he's riding for a fall, you come skimming and tell me. Not over the phone. Come and tell me. Here, take this. It will get you to me any time, no matter where I am or what I'm doing understand you think mr. Bruce is going to get into trouble his job is to get other people into trouble but he says he ain't got a thing to do with it said Mickey he says they get themselves into trouble that's so too commented mr. Chuffner anyway keep your mouth tight shut and your eyes wide open and if you think your boss is getting into deep water you come and tell me I want things to go right with you because I'm depending on that poem for my front page soon Mickey held out his hand sure he agreed I'm in an awful good place now to work up the poetry piece being right out among the cows and clover and about mr. Bruce gee I wish he was a plowing corn I just hate his job he's doing now sure if I see rocks I'll make a run for you thanks boss Mickey had lost time and he hurried for things seemed to be happening for as he left the elevator and sped down the hall he ran into Mr. James Minturn with a hasty glance he drew back and darted for the office door Mr. Minturn's face turned a dull red one minute young man he called 
"'I'm late,' said Mickey shortly. "'I must hurry.' "'Bruce is late, too. "'I just came from his office, and he isn't there,' answered Mr. Minturn. "'Well, I want to get it in order before he comes.' "'In fact, you want anything but to have a word to say to me,' hazarded Mr. Minturn. "'Well, then, since you're such a good guesser, I ain't just crazy about you,' said Mickey shortly. "'And I'm tired of having you run for me as if I were afflicted with smallpox,' said Mr. Minturn. "'If your blood is right, smallpox ain't much,' said Mickey. "'I haven't a picture of myself running from that, if it really wanted a word with me. "'But you have a picture of yourself running from me?' "'Maybe I do,' conceded Mickey. "'I've noticed it on occasions so frequent and conspicuous "'that others, no doubt, will do the same,' said Mr. Minturn. "'If you are all Bruce thinks you, "'then you should give a man credit for what he tries to do.' "'You surprised me too deeply for words "'with the story you brought me one day. "'I knew most of your facts from experience "'better than you did, "'except the one horrible thing that shocked me speechless. "'But, Mickey, when I had time to adjust myself, "'I made the investigations you suggested "'and proved what you said. "'I deserve your scorn for not acting faster, "'but what I had to do couldn't be done in a day.' For the boy's sake, it had to be done as privately as possible. There's no longer any reason why you should regard me as a monster. I'm awful glad you told me, Mickey said. I surely did have you sized up something scandalous. And yet I couldn't quite make out how, if my view was right, Mr. Bruce and Miss Leslie would think so much of you. They are friends I am proud to have, said Mr. Minturn. "'and I hope you'll consider being a friend to me "'and to my boys also. "'If ever a time comes when I can do anything for you, "'let me know.' "'Now right on that point, pause a moment,' said Mickey. "'You are a friend to my boss?' "'I certainly am, and I'm under deep obligations to Miss Winton. "'If ever my home becomes once more what it was to start with, "'it will be her work. "'Could a man bear heavier obligation than that?' "'Well, hardly,' said Mickey. "'Course, there wouldn't likely ever be anything you could do for Miss Leslie that would square that deal. "'But I'm worried about my boss something awful.' "'Why, Mickey?' asked Mr. Minturn. "'That investigation you started him on. "'I did start him on that. What's the matter?' "'Well, the returns are about all in,' said Mickey, "'and the man who draws the candy suit is about ready to put it on, see?' "'Good, exactly what he should do.' "'Yes, exactly,' agreed Mickey dryly. "'But who do you figure it is? "'We got some good friends in the city hall.' "'Always is somebody you don't expect,' said Mr. Minturn. "'Don't waste any sympathy on them, Mickey.' "'Not unless in some way my boss gets himself into trouble,' said Mickey. "'There's no possible way he could.' "'About the smartest man in Multiopolis thinks yes,' said Mickey. "'I'd just been talking with him.' "'Who, Mickey?' asked Mr. Minturn instantly. "'Chuffner of the Herald,' said Mickey. "'What?' Mr. Minturn seized the boy's arm, shoved him inside his door, and closed it. Mickey pulled away and turned a belligerent face upward. "'Now Nick's on knocking me down with your what's,' he cried. "'I just been hammered mellow with his, and dragged into his room and shut up and scared stiff about twenty minutes ago.' "'The devil you say!' exploded Mr. Minturn. "'No, I said Chuffner,' insisted Mickey. "'Chuffner of the Herald. "'I'm going to write a poetry piece for his front page some day soon now. "'I've been selling his paper all my life. "'And so you're a friend of Chuffner's?' "'Oh, not bosom and inseparable,' explained Mickey. "'I haven't seen so awful much of him, but when I do, we get along fine.' "'And he said,' questioned Mr. Minturn. "'Just what I've been afraid of all the time,' said Mickey. "'That these investigations at times goes into places you didn't look for "'and made awful trouble, and that my boss might get it with his.' "'Mickey, you will promise me something?' asked Mr. Minturn. "'You see, I started Mr. Bruce on this trying to help him to a case "'that would bring him into prominence. "'So if it should go wrong, it's in a way through me.' "'If you think Douglas is unlike himself or worried, will you tell me? Will you?' 
Why, surest thing you know, cried Mickey. Why, I should say I would. Gee, you're great, too. I think I'll like you awful well when we get acquainted. Mickey was busy when Bruce entered, and with him was Leslie Winton. They brought the breath of spring mellowing into summer, freighted with emanations of real love, touched and tinctured with joy, so habitual it had been spontaneous on the part of Leslie Winton, and this morning contagious with Douglas Bruce. Mickey stood silent, watched them closely, and listened. So in three minutes, from ragged scraps and ejaculations effervescing from what was running over in their brains, he knew that they had taken an early morning plunge into Atwater, landed a black bass, had a breakfast of their own making, at least in so far as gathering wild red raspberries from the sand pit near the bridge, and then they had raced to the Multiopolis station to start Mr. Winton on a trip west to try to sell his interest in some large land holdings there, the care of which he was finding burdensome. "'Heavens, how I hope Daddy makes that sale!' cried Leslie. "'I've been so worried about him this summer.' "'I wondered at you're not going with him,' said Douglas. "'He didn't want me,' said Leslie. "'He said it was a flying trip, "'and he was forced to be back "'before some reports from his office were filed, "'and he wouldn't have a minute to rest or, or travel as we do, "'so he thought I wouldn't enjoy it. "'and for the first time in my life "'he told me distinctly that he didn't have time for me. "'Fancy, Daddy, I can't understand it. "'I've noticed that he has been brooding and preoccupied of late, "'not at all like himself,' said Douglas. "'Have you any idea what troubles him?' "'Of course, he told me,' said Leslie. "'It's Mr. Swain. "'When Daddy was a boy, Mr. Swain was his father's best friend.' And when Grandfather died, he asked him to guide Daddy. And he not only did that, but he opened his purse and started him in business. Now Mr. Swain is growing old, and some of his investments have gone wrong. Just when political changes made business close as could be, he lost heavily. And then came the war. There was no way but for Daddy to stay here and fight to save what he could for him. He told me early last fall, we talked of it again in the winter, and this spring, most of all, I've told you. Yes, I know. I wish I could help, said Douglas. I do, too. I wish it intensely, said Leslie. When Father comes, we'll ask him. We're young and strong, and we should stand by. I never saw Daddy in such a state. He must sell that land. He said so. He said last night he'd be forced to sell if he only got half its value, and that wouldn't be enough. "'Enough for what?' asked Douglas. "'To help Mr. Swain,' said Leslie. "'He's going to use his fortune?' queried Douglas. "'I don't know that Daddy has holdings large enough to deserve the word,' said Leslie. "'He's going to use what he has. I urged him to. It's all he can do.' "'Did you take into consideration that it may end in his failure?' asked Douglas. "'I did,' said Leslie, "'and I forgot to tell him. "'But I will as soon as he comes back.' He can have all Mother left me, too, if he needs it. Leslie, you're a darling, but have you ever eaten a small taste of poverty? asked Douglas. No, but I've always been curious, if I did have, to see if I couldn't so manage whatever might be my share, that it would appear to the world without that peculiar state of grime which always seems to distinguish it, said the girl. I'm not afraid of poverty, and I'm not afraid of work. It's dishonor that would kill me. Daddy accepted obligations, if they involve him, which includes me also. Then to the last cent we possess, we pay back. Mickey drew the duster he handled between vacuum days across a table, and steadily watched first Douglas, then Leslie, both of whom had forgotten him. That should be good enough for Daddy. What about me? asked Douglas. If ever I get in a close place, does the same hold good? "'If I know what you are doing, surely. "'I knew you were a bearer of mourning first time I saw you,' said Douglas. "'But we are forgetting Mickey.' "'Mickey promptly stepped forward, putting away the duster to be ready for errands. "'How are you this morning?' asked Douglas. "'Fine,' answered Mickey. "'I've taken my family to the country, too.' "'Why, Mickey, without saying a word?' cried Douglas. 
"'Well, it happened so fast,' said Mickey, "'and I didn't want to bother you "'when your head was so full of your old investigation "'and your own moving. "'Did you hear that, Leslie?' he asked. "'Mickey dislikes my investigation "'as much as the man who comes out short "'is going to any day now. "'So you've moved Peaches to the country? "'You should have told me first. "'I'm sorry if you don't like it,' said Mickey. "'You see, my room was getting awful hot.' I never was there days this time of year, and nights I slept on the fire escape. All right for me, but it wouldn't do for Lily. Why should I have told you? Because Miss Winton had plans for her, explained Douglas. She intended to take her to Atwater, and she even contemplating having her back examined for you. Mickey's eyes danced, and over his face spread a slow grin of comprehension. Well, ejaculated Douglas. Nothing, said Mickey. Well, demanded Douglas. Mickey laughed outright. Then he sobered suddenly and spoke gravely, directly to Miss Winton. Thank you for thinking of it and planning for her, he said. I was afraid you would. Thank me for something you feared I would do, Mickey? Aren't you getting things mixed? Thank you for thinking of Lily and wanting to help her, explained Mickey. But she doesn't need you. She's mine, and I'm going to keep her, and what I can do for her will have to be enough until I can do better. I see, said Leslie. But suppose that she should have attention at once that you can't give her, and I can. Then I'd be forced to let you, even if it took her from me, agreed Mickey. But thank the Lord, things ain't that way. I didn't take my say-so for it. I went to the head nurse for the Star of Hope. She's gone to the new Elizabeth home now. She loves to nurse children best. All the time from the first day she's told me how and showed me. So Lily has been taken care of right. You needn't worry about that. And where she is now, if she was a queen lady, she couldn't have had a grander. Honest she couldn't. But Mickey, how are you going to pay for all that? queried Douglas. Easy as falling off a car in a narrow skirt, said Mickey. Remember that big house where things are heaven white and a yard full of trees and the fence corners are cut with the shears and the street, I mean the road, swept with a broom, this side of the golf grounds about two miles? Yes, said Douglas. The woman there halted my car one evening and spoke to me about you. Oh, she did? exclaimed Nicky. Well, I hope you gave me a good send-off, because she's a lady I'm most particular about. You see, I stopped there for a drink the day you figured instead of playing, and she told me about a boy who was to be sent out by the Herald and hadn't come. And as she was ready and interested, she was disappointed. So I just said to her if the boy didn't come, how she'd like to have a nice good little girl that wouldn't ever be the least bother. Next day she came to see us and got on her knees just like you did. And away Lily went sailing to the country in a big automobile. And she isn't coming back till my rooms are cool, if she can be spared then. But how are you going to pay, Mickey? Most people only take children for a week. Yes, I know, said Mickey. But these folks haven't ever tried it before, and they don't know the ropes. So we're doing it our own way, and it's worked something grand. If they are suited, said Douglas. She seemed a good woman, and that place is far better than where we feel so comfortable. We started this morning, said Mickey. The lady and I traded jobs. She sat on a hill under an apple tree and watched sunrise. I washed the dishes, separated the cream, and scrubbed the porch for her. When Lily wakes up, the lady is going to bathe and rub and feed her, and see to her like she owned her to pay me back. It's a bargain. You couldn't beat it, could you? Of course, if you want to turn yourself into a housemaid, said Douglas irritably. Mickey laughed, and Leslie sent a slightly frowning glance toward Douglas. You can search me, cried the boy, throwing out his hands in his familiar gesture. Why, I just love to. I always help mother. Pay? I'll pay, all right. The nice lady will say I do, and so will Peter. It's my most important job to make her glad of me as I am of her. And if you put it up to me, I'd a lot rather have my job than yours. And I bet I can get more joy from it for my family. Croker laughed Bruce. 
"'Tain't good to be a scream for the fellow who comes short. "'So you're planning not to allow me to do anything for Lily?' inquired Miss Winton. "'Well, there's something you can do this minute if you'd like,' said Mickey. "'I was going to hurry up and see my sunshine nurse, "'but it's a long way to the new hospital. "'And you could do as well if you would. "'Mickey, I'd love to. What is it? "'And may I see your family? "'You know I haven't had a peep yet.' "'Well, soon now you may,' said Mickey. "'You see, I ain't quite ready.' "'Mickey, what do you know about the new Elizabeth home?' asked Douglas. "'Only that a rich lady gave her house and money, "'and that my sunshine nurse is going to be there after this. "'I was going for my first trip tonight.' "'I wondered,' said Douglas. "'Mickey, when you get there, you'll find you've been there before.' "'My eyes!' cried Mickey. "'Fact!' "'Mr. Minturn did put his foot down and took his boys,' began Douglas. "'Yes, he was telling me this morning,' interrupted Mickey. "'That's what I get for stopping at the first page. "'And if I'd a looked inside, bet I'd have known that long ago.' "'He was telling you?' queried Douglas. "'Yes, I guess I must kind of shied at him till he noticed it. "'I didn't know I did, but he caught me and told me his troubles by force. "'We shook hands to quit on.' "'Say, he's just fine when you know him. "'And there doesn't seem to be a thing on earth "'he wouldn't do for you, Miss Leslie. "'Why, he said if he ever found happiness again "'and his home became what it should, "'it would be because you were sorry for him and fixed things. "'Mickey, did he really?' rejoiced the girl. "'Douglas, when may Mickey show me what he wants me to do?' "'Right now,' he answered. "'I got a load of books while he was away yesterday, "'and I haven't started them yet. Now is the best time. When Mickey made a leap from the trolley platform that night at what he already had named Cold Cream Junction, he was almost buried under boxes. He stepped high and prideful, for he had collected the money from his paper route and immediately spent some of it under Leslie Winton's supervision. Pillow bolstered on the front porch. On his comfort lay the tiny girl he loved. Mickey stopped and made a detailed inspection. He opened his lips and closed them for the lack of the right word. While he slowly and smilingly shook his head, Peaches leaned forward and reached toward him. Her greeting was indescribably sweet. Mickey dropped the bundles and went into her arms. Even in his joy, he noted a new strength in their grip on him, an unusual clinging. He drew back half-alarmed. "'You been a good girl?' he queried suspiciously. "'Just as good,' asserted Peaches. "'You didn't go and say any—' "'Not ever, Mickey Lovis, not one,' she cried. "'I ain't even thinked one. "'That will help. Peter says so.' "'You've been washed and fed and everything all right?' he proceeded. "'Just as right,' she insisted. "'You like the nice lady?' he went on. "'Just love the nice lady and Mary and Bobby and Peter?' "'And Junior, just love all of them,' she affirmed. "'Well, I hope I don't bust,' he said. "'I never was so glad as I am that everything is good for you. "'They's two thing that ain't good. "'Well, if things ain't right here, "'with what everybody's doing for you, they ought to be,' cried Mickey. "'You cut complaining right out, Miss Chicken. "'You forgot to set my lesson, "'and I ain't had my poetry piece for two days.' "'That ain't complaining.' "'No taint, honey,' conceded Mickey regretfully. "'No taint. That's just all right. "'I thought you were going to start kicking, "'and I wasn't going to stand for it. "'Course I'll set your lesson. "'Course I'll make up your piece. "'But you must give me a little time. "'I was talking with Mr. Chuffner of the Herald, "'our paper, you know, "'and he's beginning to get in a hurry about his piece, too.' "'I want mine first, demanded Peaches. "'Sure, you'll get it first, always, "'and I'm going to do something for you before I make it, "'cause I won't know how it goes till afterward, see?' "'What you gonna do?' she questioned. "'What's all the bundles? "'My, they look excitements!' "'And so they are,' triumphed Mickey. "'Where are all the folks? "'Do they leave you alone like this?' "'No, they don't leave me alone only when I'm asleep in the room,' said Peaches. "'They saw you coming and went away, "'cause they know families like to be alone sometimes. "'Ain't they smart to know that?' "'They are,' said Mickey. 
First you come to your bed a little while. I got something for you. Oh, Mickey, those bundles just look... Now you hold on, ordered Mickey. You wait and see, miss. Mickey carried her in and gently laid her down. Then he returned for the boxes. He opened one and from it selected a pair of pink stockings and slipped them on peaches. Then tiny soft buckskin moccasins embroidered and tied with ribbons to match the hose. Peaches squealed and clapped her hands over her mouth to muffle the sound. But Mrs. Harding heard and came to the door. Mickey asked for help. Young ladies who are going automobiling and taking walks are well enough to have dresses and things that all good girls have, he announced. But I'm a little dubious about how th these things go. Will you dress her? Yes, said Mrs. Harding. You fill the water bucket and the wood box and start the fire for supper. Mrs. Harding looked over the contents of the box and from plain soft pieces of underwear chose a gauze skirt, a dainty combination suit, and a tucked and trimmed petticoat, while Peaches laughed and sobbed for pure joy. Then Mickey came and Mrs. Harding went away. After various trials, he decided on a white dress with pink ribbons, run in the neck, sleeves, and belt, slipping it on her and carefully fastening it. "'Mickey, I want the glass,' she begged. "'Please, oh, please, hurry, Mickey.' "'Now you just wait, Miss Chicken,' said Mickey. Then he brushed her hair and put on a new pink ribbon, not so large as those she had, but much more becoming. He laid a soft, warm, little gray sweater with white collar and cuffs in reach, and in turning it, she discovered a handkerchief and a pair of gloves in one pocket. Immediately she searched the other and produced a purse with five pennies in it. Then, for no reason at all, Peaches began to cry. "'Well, Miss Chicken,' exclaimed Mickey in surprise, "'I thought you'd be pleased.' "'Pleased?' sobbed Mickey. "'Pleased? "'Mickey, I'm damn... I'm busted!' "'Oh, well, then, go on and cry if you want to,' agreed Mickey. "'But you'd look much nicer to show Mrs. Harding and Peter if you wouldn't.' "'Peaches immediately wiped her eyes. "'Mickey lifted her and carried her back to the porch, "'placing her in a pillow-piled big chair. "'Then he put the gloves on her hands, set a hat on her head, "'and tied the pink ribbons under her chin. "'Peaches both laughed and cried at that while the Harding family came in because they could not wait. Mickey raised and put in Peach's shaking fingers the crowning glory of any small girl, a wonderful little pink parasol. Peaches appeared for a minute as if a faint were imminent. Now do you see why I wouldn't come with a poetry piece when my head was so full of these things? Yes, Mickey, but we will before night, she begged. You want it even now, he marveled. "'More in a parasol, even,' she declared. "'Well, you fool little sweet kid,' cried Mickey, and choked. "'He fled around the house as Peter came out. "'In his ears as he went sounded Peter's big voice "'and the delighted cries of the family. "'I want Mickey!' wailed Peaches. "'He heard her call and ran back fast "'for fear he might be so slow reaching her that Peter would serve.' but to his joy he found that he alone would answer. "'I want to see me,' demanded Peaches. "'Sure you do,' cried Peter. "'I'll just hand down the big hall mirror "'so you can see all of you at once.' He brought it and set it before her, and Peaches stared and drew back. She cried, "Ah!" Oh! in a harsh, half-scared voice. She gripped Mickey with one hand and the parasol with the other. She leaned and peeped and marveled, and smiled at a fully clothed little girl in the glass as the image smiled back. Peaches thought of letting go of Mickey to touch her hat and straighten her skirt, but felt so lost without him that she handed Peter the parasol and used that hand while the other clung to her refuge. When Mickey saw the treasure go in his favor, he swallowed lumps of emotion so big that the Hardings could see them running down his throat. Peaches, intent on the glass, smiled, grimaced, tilted her head, and finally began flirting outrageously with herself, until all of them laughed and recalled her. 
She looked at Peter, smiled her most winsome smile, and exclaimed, Well, ain't I the... Now you go easy, Miss Chicken, warned Mickey. Mickey, if you hadn't stopped me, I'd have done it sure, sobbed Peaches, collapsing against him. If I had, would you a took these beautiful things away from me? No, I wouldn't, said Mickey. I couldn't to save me, but I should. Mickey, I'm so tired, she said. Take my hat and put it where I can see it, and my paysol, and my coat. Gee, I don't have to be wrapped in sheets no more. And lay me down. Quick, Mickey, I'm sick-like. Well, I ought to had sense not to spring so much all at once, said Mickey, but it all seemed to belong. Sure I will, you poor kid. And, Mickey, you won't forget the lesson in the poetry piece, she panted. No, I won't forget, promised Mickey, as he stretched her among her treasures and watched her fall asleep even while he slipped the gloves from her fingers. Next morning she found the lesson and the poetry piece on her slate. Mrs. Harding bathed and clothed her in the little garments and showed her enough more for the changes she would need, even two finer dresses for Sunday. She left the coat, hat, and parasol in reach, then Peaches resolutely took up her pencil and set herself to copy the lines without knowing enough of the words to really understand. But she was extremely well acquainted with one word that Mickey had said just flew out of his mouth when he looked at her, and in her supreme satisfaction over her new possessions, she was sure the lines must be concerning them. Most of all, she was delighted with her slippers, a hundred times that morning she looked down, wiggled her toes, and moved her feet to see them better, and each time her joy in having her feet shod for walking intoxicated her. Between whiles she copied over and over, Lily, Miss L. P. O'Halloran daily went walking, in slippers so nifty the neighbors were talking. The minute she raised her gay pink parasol, the old red cow began to friskily bawl. When they observed the neat coat on her back, all the guineas in the orchard cried, Rack, pot, rack. She was so lovely a bird flying her way, sang sweet, sweet, sweet all the rest of the day. Peter came in to visit a few times, and she gave him the slate to see if he could read her copy and by this ruse she found what the lines were. She was so overjoyed she opened her lips and then clapped both hands over them to smother the ejaculation on her tongue's end. To distract Peter, she stuck out her foot and moved it for him to see. Ain't they pretty and just as soft and fine, she asked. Yes, said Peter, they remind me of a flower called a lady slipper that grow along the edge of the woods. It's that shape and the prettiest gold yellow, but little, they'd about fit your doll. Oh, Peter, could you get me one? I want to see. Why, I would, but they're all gone now, honey, answered Peter. Next year I'll remember and bring you some when they bloom, but it's likely by that time you can go yourself and see them. Do you honest think it, Peter? asked Peaches, leaning forward eagerly. Yes, I honest think it, repeated Peter emphatically. But I won't be here then, Peaches reminded him. Well, it won't be my fault if you're not, said Peter.